Atlas Has Run, The Sentience Wars, Origins, Volume 2. Written by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper. Narrated by Laura Jennings. Long Before Tannis Richards and the Events of Outsystem. Before the Soul Space Federation and the days of Tannis serving in the Terran Space Force, the Soul System was a far wilder place. No central government sat over top the many planets and groups of asteroids and habitats, though the SolGov assembly tried to maintain some order. Many of the great megastructures had been built, such as Hytera and Mars One, but many others had not. Most importantly, there are few sentient AI, and those who do exist are unwelcome and often illegal. In a future without faster-than-light travel, teleportation, artificial gravity, or advanced shielding, a ship in space is just one small collision away from destruction. This is the sole system we find ourselves in at the close of the 30th century, and the dawn of the age of AI. Prologue. Stellar date 08.27.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Benevolent hand. Region. Near Krunia Station. Terran hegemony, inner soul. The command deck of the benevolent hand was a mess of complaining alerts and desperate officers staring into displays. In addition to the mayhem, Cal Kraft had a feeling the captain was actively trying to get them all killed. Grabbing the pirate ship's sunny sky should have been easy. Instead, Cal had spent the last two hours watching the crew of the benevolent hand stumble over themselves trying to find the freighter among a crowd of thousands of ships swelling the shipping lanes around Krunia Station, which was little more than Inner Soul's crusted toilet as far as he was concerned. When am I going to have another drone swarm? Captain Pillar demanded from his seat in the middle of the command deck. He was a heavily built veteran from the Terran Space Force, who had turned out to be the sort of officer who looks good on paper, but had managed to avoid direct combat during his 40-year career. He was also inordinately proud of his drooping yellow mustache. They're working on it, sir, one of the lieutenants called from a console on the other side of the holographic display dominating the room. We're out of raw materials for the replicators, so they're stripping furniture out of rooms right now. How did we manage to run out of material for the replicators? Pillar griped. We never expected to need 2,000 attack drones, sir. Pillar wiped his flushed face. That's got to be wrong. Cal suppressed a smile. He had told Pillar not to underestimate the low-spin syndicate, the group providing cover to the sunny skies. It had been obvious from the beginning that Hartbridge had aligned themselves with the least intelligent of the two gangsters running Krunia. Rig Xander might have talked a good game, but he was nothing compared to Ingoba Starl, the brutal dandy as they all called him. It hadn't taken Cal long to appreciate Starl, a man who disguised a cunning intelligence beneath his fancy suits and pocket squares. Captain Pillar continued to bark orders that quickly became conflicting or redundant, going so far as to slap one of his lieutenants on the back of the head. Among a real crew, such behavior might have been preferable to getting pistol whipped. For the showboats of the benevolent hand, Hartbridge Corporation's hidden in plain sight battle crews are masked as a hospital ship. Pillar's leadership made them as combat effective as five cats in a bag. In the holo tank, the shark-like shape of the benevolent hand hung in space above the lumpy mass of Krunia Station, an asteroid with a mottled ring covered in the crust of thousands of structures, docks and airlocks that supported its illegal activities. Krunia had the relatively unique characteristic of a horseshoe orbit, moving it between Earth and Mars at opposite ends of the year. Over the centuries, the five-kilometer chunk of rock had become a favorite of inner soul pirates, which was interesting, since the TSF had a regular presence on the station and conducted routine interdiction operations on their traffic. The mix of military presence, corporate entities and crime syndicates all operating in the same overcrowded warren, resulted in a specific breed of roach-like criminal. Between the benevolent hand and Krunia, 
A hundred thousand kilometers of space was filled with growing tendrils of what looked like fireflies, but represented ships clogging the station's defined traffic lanes. Somewhere in one of those tendrils was the ship they needed to seize. For the last two hours, they had been under constant attack from pirate boarding teams and standoff platforms concentrating missile barrages across their sensor arrays, and most recently, the command deck. They had obviously known the Benevolent Hand's true purpose from the start. While the massive ship was capable of transporting thousands of wounded and providing advanced medical services, that gooey center was surrounded by missile banks, rail guns, and point defense cannons, as well as one of the most advanced drone fleets available, with replicators to quickly spit out new attack ships for the swarm. This should have been easy. Nothing's easy, Cal told himself. The sunny skies was a 300-year-old freighter with deuterium drives and a habitat ring. From what Cal knew about its captain, Andy Sykes, the man should have been the type to surrender days ago, more concerned about his two kids than the Hartbridge property he had been hired to smuggle off Krunia. Sir, one of the lieutenants yelled, they've got a breach vessel on the hull near the engines. Scans are showing a nuclear device. Cal closed his eyes and breathed, visualizing the actions of a pirate breaching team. There were probably 20 bulkhead airlocks between the command deck and the engine section. Plenty of time to get off the ship. There was a locker with four EV suits just outside the command deck airlock. He might need to kill three of the nearby crew to reach the locker first. He didn't trust that the escape pods would serve as target practice for the pirates nearby. Can we get a point defense cannon on it? Pillar demanded. It's inside the effective range, sir. Redirect a drone team. I've already done that, sir. I'm showing two minutes for the nearest team to return to station. What kind of nuke would pirates have on hand? Cal wondered. Probably not military grade. More likely some rigged reactor from an ancient wreck. Or most likely a piece of mining equipment. That made more sense. Easier to steal and slip through TSF search maybe even with legit papers. He'd grown up on a mining rig working the remnants of mercury. It was almost comforting to let his mind slip over the various types of explosives one could retrofit from a standard mining rig to serve in a military application. He imagined holding a rock torch right now, hefting its weight, tightening down the harness, watching walls and flesh melt away from its electric blue tip. Like painting a new world, Oh, God, the lieutenant said in a low voice. Cal opened his eyes to find the man slumping in his chair, arms slack at his sides. What? Pillar shouted. Looks like the nuke failed, the lieutenant said. He reached for his console again, tapping commands. It's inert, maybe a failure in the arming system. Pillar scoffed. Pirates can't even set off a bomb. Could be a feint, Cal told Pillar privately over his link. They don't have the resources, Pillar said, his voice dripped arrogance. Saying that doesn't make it true. Looks like they've had the resources to defuse your attack drones and hide our target. The sunny skies could be anywhere right now. They haven't left Krunia local space, Pillar scoffed. The minute they break from one of those lanes, we'll have them. The only thing they can do is hide in there with the rest of the trash until we dig our way in. Right. Pillar turned to scowl at Cal from his command seat, looking like a baby in a high chair. Why are you here again? The captain said. You're my bus driver, Cal said. He gave Pillar a slight smile, fixing his gaze on the huffing captain. Without hearing their conversation, the crew was going to think Pillar was choking on something. Good place for a medical emergency, Cal mused. Facilities on the benevolent hand could build a new organ in minutes. I've got massive course shifts, Captain, one of the lieutenants called out. Her hands flew over her console before she pointed at the holograph in front of them. 
All around Krunya, the shimmering veins designating the shipping lanes were spreading apart. The green triangles indicating their attack drone teams were almost hidden beneath the spreading blanket of lights, currently moving away from Krunya in all directions. Cal stared into the holograph, running through everything he knew about Andy Sykes, his wreck of a ship, his kids. Sykes was earthborn. He could run for High Terra, try to make use of his TSF contacts. That would make grabbing him a bit tougher, but also take him closer to Hartbridge's center of power. Did Sykes even know that? Cal had to assume Harry Jixon, the bleeding heart scientist who had started this mess, had at least explained to Sykes who might be coming after him. As soon as they had put the benevolent hand into play, Hartbridge's role would have been clear. Starl would have made the game clear. Maybe. Playing back his memory of Andy Sykes, sitting at the table in Ngoba Starl's annoying dance club, Cal found himself frustrated by how calm an exterior the former TSF pilot had shown. Knowing his story, Cal had expected an anxious wreck. Sykes reminded him of a closed knife, a tool that could be used for any number of tasks, benign under most circumstances, but deadly when used correctly. Starl had chosen the perfect pawn. If not for Sykes' kids, Cal thought this might have been a difficult job. A man like Sykes could disappear for years anywhere in Seoul. If only Jixon hadn't put a bomb in his head. The doctor probably didn't explain that, did he, Captain Sykes? Cal thought. The weaving interplay of lights in the holograph was almost beautiful very unlike the plain graphics of a mining control rig, where the brain didn't have time to sort out color from data. Plain white on green meant business, Cal thought. These people were all show over substance. If their quarry hadn't been hobbled, they would have already lost. The display was a valuable reminder. He couldn't let pretty things mask the truth. Sykes couldn't go to ground. He had a task. He had constraints and limitations. Checking those off one by one led to a few possible outcomes. From Krunya, Sykes could really only go in one direction, outer soul. Set a course for Mars One, Cal commanded. Pillar snorted. Ugh, what? Why? We've got them here. You've got a mess of ships slipping through your fingers. They're going to Mars. They have to refuel before they go anywhere else. They'll probably be picking up some kind of cover cargo, Mars won. The captain stared at him from the center of the room. Cal wondered if he was going to defy the order simply because he could. Maybe he should have cultivated a better relationship with Pillar, flattered him a little bit more, shared a few confidences. This defiance was irritating. He visualized exploding Pillar's head with a pulse pistol. The thought nearly made him smile, and he had to remember the captain was trying to stare him down. Pillar appeared to work through Cal's reasoning from his own perspective. What about Ceres? He asked. I thought about Ceres. Mars One offers a few thousand docking points. It could slow us down a bit. Ceres doesn't offer that kind of cover. I have contacts on Ceres. If they turn up there, Mars One also offers me the opportunity to get a new ship. The captain stiffened. I was given this assignment by the board. I'm the captain. I don't have to take orders from you. Keep telling yourself that, Cal said. He nodded toward the holograph. Looks like we've got at least a third of their ships trying to cover vectors for Mars. Pillar flicked his gaze toward the display. Fireflies were disappearing at the edge of the view as they left Krunia local space. Sir, a crew member reported. We've got another hundred drones ready. We can field on your order. Recall the swarms, Pillar said. Get me a quick damage scan and fuel update. I need a course plot for Mars One. Mars One, sir? The astrogation lieutenant verified. That's what I said, isn't it? Pillar snapped. Yes, sir. Cal set his mouth in a straight line, irritated by Pillar's transfer of abuse. He'd have to ease off on the captain if the man was only going to turn around and kick his crew. When the pirates managed to breach with a second nuke, this time blowing a 300-meter hole in Benevolent Hand's hull just forward of the main engine, 
Cal sees the opportunity in the resulting chaos in Zero-G to float near Pillar. He didn't feel particular spite toward the man, but couldn't allow a person who abused the weak to continue in command. He hit Pillar with a needle gun concealed in his right hand, the projectiles catching the beefy captain just behind his right ear. The needles penetrated immediately and would dissolve, leaving a neurotoxin behind that would both shut Pillar's mouth and stop his heart, appearing on any autopsy as a trauma-induced heart attack. That wouldn't matter soon, however, since it looked like Benevolent Hand was about to crack open to vacuum. Cal made his way to the locker just outside the command deck airlock and grabbed one of the EV suits and a pulse rifle. He didn't want to have to hurt anyone on his way to the nearest shuttle. But sometimes the job required things he didn't like to do. He still did them. Chapter 1. Stellar Date, 08.29.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Night Park. Fresno Heights Residential Area. Region, Krunia Station. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Krunia was a mess. Britt Sykes stood on the edge of Night Park, most of which was cordoned off by construction barriers. The usual bright mix of the vendor's colored tents was like a paint spill. Everything misshapen and smashed together. From where she stood, Britt could see the massive plascrete tree standing in the fountain, marking the center point of the park. The black forms of crows in the plascrete branches looked down on construction workers and merchants, trying to salvage what was left of their wares. The signs of the firefight were everywhere, visible as bloodstains and long scorches left by pulse weapons, as well as splintered holes from projectiles and grenades. She had missed Andy and the kids by two days. She had been in the habit of scanning the port manifests of every port she visited for a couple years now, and had experienced a moment of silent panic when sunny skies came up on the list, but she couldn't find where it had left. Later, while investigating the mass exodus of ships from Krunia, she had found a new light freighter named the Worry's End. It carried the same profile as Andy's ship, and she understood what had happened. A worker walked past her, giving her a weary look. Britt was dressed in black armor as sleek and supple as leather, but with kinetic hardening capabilities. A low-slung holster rested on one hip, carrying a projectile pistol that was against station regs. Strangely, no one seemed to care, even after the recent fighting. That was the charm of Krunia. It never changed, even when it really should. A series of throwing knives lined the small of her back, serving double duty as scallops in the armor. Her helmet hung from a clip on the other side of her belt. She'd cut her hair short, and it stood out in spiky feathers on her head. Britt supposed she didn't look much different than one of the wiry crows looking down from the fountain. The armor was new. Well, new to Britt, and she was glad to have it while on a station like Krunia. Not only did it serve as an EV suit, but it also had additional antennae embedded within to boost her link connectivity, alongside signal scattering tech capable of hiding her from sensors. It had been designed for long-range TSF surveillance operations that might involve clinging to the side of a ship for days. There's nothing to be learned here, Britt thought as she turned from the station workers, soldiers, and merchants. Anything interesting has long since been cleaned up. Of course, if anything had been worth hiding, she knew exactly where it would be. She left Night Park and took a maglev down to the shopping promenade where the Heartbridge Clinic, the same one she had bombed the year before, now stood with open doors, accepting a line of residents with various ailments or injuries from the battle. Britt took up a position near a bench and watched a mother with two little girls, probably eight or nine, wondering how similar Tim might be to them. One of the girls seemed to already hold the weight of the world in her eyes, while the other couldn't stop gambling around like a colt, swinging her arms and singing a random song. The mother carried herself with easy grace, laying a hand on the sad girl's shoulder while tracking the wild girl with a smile. Britt's hand fell to the butt of her pistol, and she wondered what her own disconnect was. 
that she often took pleasure in her warrior's grace, but it felt so awkward around her own children. She pushed the thoughts away. She was here for a reason. The clinic was just a nerve point among many, and she needed to extract information about Hartbridge's current status. The news feeds were on fire with their boosted stories about the loss of their mega hospital, the Benevolent Hand, which Britt knew to have been a battle juggernaut with a close combat capability rivaling the TSF's best squadrons. Britt took a spot in the line waiting to enter the clinic, a few people back from the mother with the girls. It soon became clear that the sad-looking girl was the reason they were waiting in line. The girl glanced at her once, eyes going wide at the sight of Britt's armor and weapon. Britt gave her a wink, but the girl only looked away quickly and then got distracted when her sister pulled her hair. Apparently, seeing armed and armored figures was common enough on Krunya that the surprise didn't last long. Britt crossed her arms and looked out into the promenade, watching people walk by. She had come back to Krunya because Hartbridge had suffered a confusing loss here. In studying the flight manifests of the ships leaving during the space battle that had led to Benevolent Hand's destruction, it had become clear that the whole thing had been a massive screening operation to hide something leaving the asteroid. What she couldn't seem to find was what was being hidden. If she had learned anything about Hartbridge over the last two years, it would have something to do with AI. Not that Hartbridge was much different than at least ten other major corporations pursuing AI technologies. What made Hartbridge unique was they had the biological resources to create and maintain a place like Fortress A221. After months of following logistical trails, the kind of things large corporations had difficulty hiding since they still needed mundane resources like fuel and food, she was nearly certain Hartbridge was responsible for 8221. While the knowledge wasn't much different than what she had known when she had left Andy on High Terra, she now understood how they had used pirates to secure their test subjects, how they had created extensive separation between their operation and the rest of their corporate activities, so that everything was wrapped in layers of deniability. She had proved her hypothesis, and now it was time to move forward. Britt had become certain Hartbridge had established a second development facility after the loss of 8221. For a long time, she thought it might have been hidden on the benevolent hand. However, after the ship's destruction, the communications traffic she was monitoring didn't indicate any change in the company's logistical operations consistent with the loss of such a facility. It took half an hour to reach the first triage desk. The girls were gone, and Britt had been left to watch an old man with a hacking cough that left traces of blood on the handkerchief he squeezed in one fist. She made an excuse about knee pain, looking directly at the nurse, whose eyes flashed with augments, knowing she was being recorded, but also trusting her armor to break up the recording's visual patterns, providing the visual of an entirely different person on any recordings. People at places like Hartbridge relied so much on mods and augmented reality that they barely looked at anything with the Mark I eyeball. If you could mess with their data streams, it made them easy to fool. In another ten minutes, she was in one of the ceramic-walled treatment rooms with a bored tech who didn't even make eye contact with her as he held out the data pad he used to scan her knee. The tech looked up from his pad with a frown. There's nothing wrong with your knee except a whole lot of scarring, he said. From her seated position on the ceramic bench, Britt kicked the tech neatly on the chin snapping the back of his head against the wall. He crumpled to the floor, data pad resting on his lap. What was it Andy used to say? Our scars make us? He liked those kinds of sentimental aphorisms, as if words made things real. It might as well have been Charlie Sykes talking through his son. The smooth wall of the exam room hit a sliding door that gave way under one of Britt's pilfered security tokens. She moved quickly down the revealed hallway, looking for the data center that should be located at the rear of the facility, if it followed standard Hartbridge design. During the last two years, 
Britt had spent a lot of time within Hartbridge facilities, learning their corporate lingo. She sometimes found herself admiring the thought they put into simple things, like space design. Every clinic followed the same basic patterns. A tech could serve nearly anywhere in the soul system and perform their duties, find files, and know where the restrooms were located. A patient knew what to expect every time. Even their corporate offices were made of the same white ceramic that reminded her of an ancient surgery theater, ready to be sluiced clean of blood and any other biological embarrassments. Nothing stuck to surfaces at Hartbridge, which was an ideal that served as their corporate philosophy, in spirit, if not official doctrine. Britt smiled to herself. Andy would appreciate the metaphor. Britt turned a corner and was met with the reinforced door she expected. Accessing its administrative system, she bypassed the local control and pulled up a menu that only applied to remote access requests. In a minute, the seals released and the door swung open to reveal the on-site data repository. Britt stepped inside and pulled the door closed behind her, enjoying the cool air in the server area. She didn't have much time before the tech either woke up or someone found him. As much as she would have liked to check on the current data streams passing through the server, she pulled up a series of protocols she knew applied to the Hartbridge Special Projects Division. After searching among various data sets, she found the channel she was looking for and leaned against the smooth wall as she started recording. Lists of supplies, loading manifests, Employee schedules and human resource requests ran across her link. She paused every minute or so to review some interesting bit of information, but let the rest fall into her storage banks. She would review all of it later, look for patterns and anomalies. The purpose of this breach, as with most of her investigations over the past year, was to find the location of Hartbridge's new research facility— she hoped the recent catastrophe on the benevolent hand would lead to a slip in their data security. Someone would speak out of emotion, rather than care, and reveal the location of the new lab. Or perhaps someone would complain about live shipments from some remote station, where human specimens could be found cheaply and without any concern over official inquiries. To aid in this search, Britt maintained a list of ongoing local conflicts throughout Seoul waiting for the moment when Hartbridge would try to exploit a refugee crisis or some other similar situation where the value of human life approached zero. Britt had learned a few months ago that as long as she searched for the name Cal Craft, she would find what she was looking for. He had recently been reassigned to the benevolent hand, but that hadn't changed his involvement in the special projects division. The tap she had on the exam room's hidden door alerted her to an attempted breach a moment before a series of dull thuds echoed down the corridor. Britt accelerated her search, only looking at items which met her ideal parameters, anything that jumped out off the baseline. She paused on a fuel purchasing report. Five cargo ships had been dispatched from Hytera, and three from Eros with invoices for twice the necessary amount of fuel to reach their stated destinations. The two leaving Eros had flight paths logged for Ceres, yet, as far as Brit knew, at least, Ceres was the one place Hartbridge didn't run clinics, what with the Anderson Collective controlling all corporate activity on the dwarf planet. Ceres was like the opposite world of Krunya controlled by an autocratic corporate board responsible for accomplishing great things like their mini black hole, while also limiting the population's access to the rest of Seoul. Not that anyone in the collective cared. They were part of the new project, as they liked to say. Britt quickly copied the manifest information from freighters, including registry and crew data, and logged off the data stream. She stood, stretched her sore shoulders, and pulled a mag grenade from a pocket in her armor. She set the grenade's timer and fixed it to the center of the service stack, then left the room, closing the ceramic door behind her. Hey! Someone shouted. At the end of the hallway near the exam room entrance, three soldiers in iridescent body armor came around the corner. They knelt in firing positions and raised what looked like projectile rifles. Hartbridge had no apparent concern for station policies either, 
The hallway was a dead end on the data room. Britt spun to grab the door she had just closed. She managed to get behind it as a barrage of bullets struck the ceramic surface. Shards exploded off the door, filling the air with pale dust. Britt grabbed the helmet from her waist and pulled it over her head. The HUD immediately oriented itself and brought up battle statistics on the hallway, the weapons it identified, and the biosignatures on her attackers. Their armor appeared to have similar kinetic dampening capabilities as hers, so she could dump bullets on them all day with little effect. Reaching for two more grenades, Britt configured the devices for area concussion and tossed them for maximum bounce out into the narrow hallway. Grenade! Someone shouted. She heard scuffling sounds on the other side of the door as the Heartbridge guards took cover. The grenades weren't intended for them, however. The two explosions radiated hard concussive waves, amplified within the narrow hallway. A heavy crash followed the explosions as the ceiling collapsed. Britt pushed the door open and found the hallway filled with dust and floating debris. Her HUD outlined the walls and floor, revealing the ceiling to be a mess of broken support systems and the maintenance passage all Heartbridge facilities had above this corridor. Using the walls, she kicked herself up into the maintenance shaft and scrambled away from the guards. Shouts behind her indicated they knew she had fled into the shaft. Her armor hardened across her lower stomach as she took fire from below. Britt threw herself forward in the dust-filled space, the only filthy part of Heartbridge's clinic. From her current position, the shaft only went deeper into the clinic. The sounds of the guards pushing through the debris in the hallway meant she was being followed and couldn't go back. Britt brought up the generic clinic schematics, praying this one didn't deviate, and took a left down the first intersection, then a right. The passage came to a dead end, with a pressure door beneath where she lay. Britt unlatched its fasteners and fell through, landing on the desk in the triage lobby. This time, the woman working the desk paid rapt attention, sputtering as Britt gave the room a quick scan. One of the women at the front gave a fearful gasp as Britt's helmeted head turned toward her and pulled a disinterested-looking boy close against her side. Three people were carrying pulse weapons, and she suspected there would be another half-dozen chemical slug throwers in the crowd. This was Krunya, after all. Still, no one made an aggressive move. Guarded, cautious, fearful, yes, but no aggression. Ma'am, the girl at the desk finally managed to articulate. Get off my desk. Sorry, Britt said through her armor's speakers as she leapt off into a space that had cleared before her. Got a bit lost back there. Place is like a maze with all the white. Britt strode out of the clinic and onto the promenade. She spared a glance over her shoulder, at the crowd milling about, at the woman at the desk trying to clean the debris, including the maintenance hatch, away so she could resume her work. Now that's unflappable. Then a Heartbridge soldier crashed through the opening and fell on the desk before rolling onto the woman. Good thing she's at a clinic, Britt thought as she double-timed it down the promenade. She had just made it 20 meters when the dull thud of the grenade she had planted in the clinic's data room exploded, the concussive blast echoing down the wide corridor. People all around her stopped to look toward the source of the sound. Britt glanced back so she wouldn't seem out of place. She was too far away now to make out the bored boy's new expression. Maybe watching something explode would have a formative effect on him, shake him out of his lethargy. Maybe that's what Tim would be like now, bored by the world, more interested in some pre link game he could play all the time that kept him staring into the distance, half aware of the world around him, a rat clawing a food bar for some entertainment company's promised reward. She didn't dwell on the thought as she pulled off her helmet, clipped it onto her belt once more, reached into her satchel, and pulled out a loose diaphanous green robe. She pulled it over her shoulders and drew the hood over her head, slowing her gait and moving through the crowd with deliberate calm. Her armor's dampening had done the trick. Though she wasn't masking her face, a pair of Heartbridge soldiers didn't even slow as they rushed past. Britt allowed herself a small smile of satisfaction. Any day she got to beard the dragon in its lair was a good one. Britt pulled up departure manifest schedules from the Port Authority's net. 
There weren't a lot of ships on Krunia at the moment, and none were going to High Terra, which was just as well. Unless she were to find a fast cutter, High Terra was weeks away. Eros, on the other hand, was close, nearing the aphelion of its orbit. Brit was worried there would be no ships headed there either. Eros wasn't exactly the sort of place people who stopped at Krunia traveled to. But three vessels had Eros logged as their next stop. Maybe some of the local thugs were going to try their hands at more legitimate trade after the latest dust-up. Either way, there was one departing in the next three hours— just enough time for Brit to get to the docks and secure a berth. Chapter 2. Stellar Date 09.13.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Region. Approaching Mars. Margin Protectorate. Inner Soul. Kara had to protect her dad from these women, Fran had been the most prickly in the two weeks since the sunny skies had escaped Krunia within a swarm of pirate freighters. The technician's shining artificial eyes flashed green as she seemed to look through people to the systems all around her, focused on repairing the blown-up portions of the ship, its battered airlocks, the hobbled AI, even threatening to look into the comm systems bugs that made it possible for Kara to eavesdrop on linked conversations. Fran switched from hot to cold for what seemed like no reason, sometimes making herself angry in the time it took to explain how something was broken. Some days Fran couldn't get enough of their dad, Captain Andy Sykes, while other days she disappeared into the propulsion section and only grunted responses over the comm system. Patral, on the other hand, had been sickly sweet in a way that made Kara uncomfortable the leggy, dark-haired woman who called herself an operator, but who had seemed more like a mercenary during the fight to get off Krunia, asked questions about everything. She wanted to know about Tim's poetry book and which boys Kara liked. Blah. She wanted tours of their room, wanted to know what vids they liked, and all about Kara's choices in music. She couldn't get enough of watching their dad cook, even the dumbest things acting like boiling water was the height of human technology. While Fran acted like their dad annoyed her endlessly, creating this sort of crackling back and forth every time they were in the same room, Patral formed a vortex. She drew people toward herself and got them to say things they didn't intend to say, while maintaining eye contact with her striking blue gaze as she tucked her black hair behind an ear, nodding seriously. Fran fixed and corrected things directly, with her hands and brain, while Patrell hardly seemed to do anything but still accomplish tasks, getting others to do the work for her. Even Kara had fallen under Patrell's spell, giving up the complete timeline of her parents' relationship and her mother's disappearance two years ago without realizing what she was doing. It wasn't until Patrell had asked her the exact name of the neighborhood where her grandparents had lived on High Terra that Kara felt herself surface from the dream of Patrell's focused attention, realizing with a shock she had said more than she should have. She didn't know why she felt the need to hang on to seemingly trivial information, except that it was hers, and she couldn't see any need for a stranger to have it. The third woman whose presence hung over them was Lissa, the AI. There were times when her dad, looking lean and worn like he usually did, couldn't seem to shake the distracted expression that meant he was locked in a conversation or argument with the ghost Dr. Harry Jixon had implanted in his head. Kara had tried to imagine what it might be like to have another consciousness in her mind. Lying in the dark when she was supposed to be asleep, listening to her little brother's even breathing, she would close her eyes and let herself drift, feeling for the edges of the dark behind her eyelids. How loud could she yell without using her voice? It was lonely to think of her mind as something trapped in the dark, experiencing the world through the filters of her senses. But that dark was hers. Anything she could imagine there belonged to her. How frustrating would it be to never have that space, her mind, her thoughts, all to herself again? Dr. Harry Jixon was dead but Kara couldn't help worrying that he was still carrying out the experiment, the same one that had created Lyssa on her dad 
and there was no way of knowing how it would turn out. What if he went crazy? What would she do then? Sitting at the comm station, watching the spectrum analyzers dance and spark, she couldn't stop thinking about how much their lives had changed in such a short time. Everything had developed confusing layers that required constant remembering. Even sunny skies, which had been her home as long as she could remember, now had a new name, Worry's End, which they only had to remember to use if contacted by outsiders. With two new crew members on board, she'd found herself weighed down by the stress of trying to understand what people really meant when they talked. Conversations and statements often seem to carry double meanings. Asking about the engines could be a question about the low-spin syndicate on Grunia. Questions about what kind of music she liked was an effort to figure her out and manipulate her somehow. Kara wasn't used to the feeling of distrust. She hated it. She was learning to hate secrets. She thought about the pulse pistol she had hidden in the hydroponic room, buried in a drawer full of tubing and root cups. She'd found it behind a plaz panel down near airlock one while helping Fran with repairs. It was a Terran Space Force model, engraved with serial numbers and dummy guides, as her dad liked to say, indicating the lock status and charge levels. Her pistol was full. Twice now, she'd slipped off to hide in the old hydroponic garden and hold the pistol just like her dad had shown her during the fight on Krunia. Gripping the weapon in both hands in front of her, placing her finger on the trigger and looking down the sights to find center mass. Whenever she talked to Patrell, she did her best not to think about the pistol. Something about the woman's insistent blue eyes made her worry she would give up her secret without even meaning to. She had abruptly become aware, especially after Harry Jixon's strange performance in her and Tim's room, that adults wanted things. It seemed like a stupid realization. But all she could remember thinking about before was how her parents were going to take care of her and Tim. Not that they had desires and emotions of their own. Now, everywhere she looked, she couldn't help distrusting motives. Why were Fran and Patrell really here? What did they want from her dad? What did Lissa want? And did she even care that she was causing Kara's dad so much turmoil? Everyone had said they were going to Proteus a moon of Neptune. But did Lyssa even want that? What if Lyssa never wanted to leave her dad's head? Then nothing would ever be the same again. Everything had changed, and she couldn't remember exactly when the change had happened. It seemed like a trick life had played on them, even worse than mom leaving. The floor had slipped, like there had been a sudden change in gravity. Only she didn't know how to adjust her weight, she didn't know how to kick off and spin, or grab at the bulkhead, ready to accept that what had been the floor was now overhead. Those were natural changes. They happened all the time. This was more subtle and insidious, though she couldn't tell exactly how. Across the command deck, her dad sat squinting at the hola display, moving bits of light around that represented potential stops after they left the Mars One ring. His shoulders were a tense line. The path between stops flashed for a second like a jagged claw of lightning, then faded as he wiped the info and leaned back, sighing. He caught Kara looking at him and forced a smile. Can't make a plan without cargo, he said. So I'm just spinning my wheels. You picking anything up for Mars yet? Lots of things, Kara said. You want to hear some dance music? Dance music? Do Marsians dance? Kara grinned at his goofy smile. I think at least one in a hundred million Marsians dance. No, that was just someone having a seizure. You need a sense of humor to dance. And no one on Mars has a sense of humor. Dad, she scolded. You can't generalize about a whole planet. It's kind of weird to even say Marsians, like they're one group of people. I'm old. That's what I do. There's a reason this is the first time you'll be visiting Mars. I thought you wanted to live on Mars before you and Mom got sunny skies. Andy waved a hand, still staring into the holo display. I was young and foolish back then. Like me, huh? Like you? No. You don't know any better yet. I knew better, but was trying to convince myself otherwise. 
that's a whole different kind of foolish. Andy spun the whole display and zoomed in. The first point on the flight plan grew in front of him, until the blue-green orb of Mars filled most of the display. The ring of Mars One glittered around the planet like a flat silver bracelet. Despite being pushed away from Mars during the construction of the ring, Phobos still orbited fast and relatively close to the terraformed planet. There had been a second moon once, Dimas, but it was gone now, ground up for construction material along with Mercury and other material from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Everything is moving, she mused, watching as the Mars outer shipyards came into focus, a haze at the outside edges of the Mars One ring. She knew Mars One was 1,600 kilometers wide and more than 100 kilometers thick, giving it nearly 30 times the usable land mass as Terra once all the levels were filled up. But it still looked so fragile in the display. As her dad continued to zoom in, now pulling up potential docking points and scrolling through their fee schedules, what had seemed tiny from a distance became overwhelming. The scale of it was hard to hold in her mind. Are you hearing anything interesting? Her dad asked, nodding toward the comms panel. We should be getting a query any time now. They were still a day away from Mars One, but had been in Mars Protectorate space for four days at least. She knew her dad was dreading the eventual scrutiny from the local military forces, who probably weren't excited about the flood of ships from Krunia. Kara glanced at the spectrum again, flicking through various bands and wavelengths. They were surrounded by communications all the time, but at the moment none of it was directed specifically at them. Nothing yet, she said. I picked up a cool old vid channel I'd been recording. We could watch it later. Mention of we seemed to remind her dad about Tim. She wasn't surprised when the next thing he asked was, where's your brother? I think he's in his room, or he might have gone somewhere with Patrell. She said she was going to make something to eat. Patrell made it clear she doesn't cook. Kara shrugged. Get something in the kitchen, then. He loves following her around. Maybe she'll make him cook something. That would be a sight, Andy said, getting drawn into the dock advertisements again. From what Kara had overheard, they had plenty of money from Ingoba Starl, the gangster on Krunia with the curly beard and bow ties. As her father frowned at prices, she figured it wasn't because he was cheap, but because he couldn't let go of the idea that they were poor. She didn't know if his attitude was good or bad. An alert flashed on her display, and Kara directed her attention to an incoming message aimed directly at them. As Andy had expected, it was the Mars Protectorate. Dad, she called. We've got a message. That'll be Mars One Customs, he muttered, turning off the holo display. I guess our vacation is over. He stood slowly, stretching, then walked over to her console to stand behind her with his hands on the back of her chair. Kara liked that he didn't push her away from the console. He let her navigate the menus to the message, teasing her when she fat-fingered the commands as he watched. Worries end, a thin voice said. This is First Lieutenant Kurta of the Hellas Planitia. You have been randomly selected for increased scrutiny prior to your approach to Mars One. You are to transmit your crew list and manifest information immediately. Failure to comply with this directive will result in reactive measures up to and including boarding and preemptive attack. Do you understand this directive? Her dad blew out a long breath. You remember that vid we watched where the gorillas smacked their chests at each other? He said. Kara nodded. That's what this is. Only we're not a gorilla. We're more like a squirrel. Or rabbits, Kara corrected, referencing their old joke. Andy smiled despite the worry on his face. That's right, he said. Rabbits. He reached over her shoulder to tap the console. Hellas Planitia, he said. This is Captain Andy Sykes of the Worry's End. I have received your directive and will comply shortly. We left Krunia in a hurry due to unrest there, so I'm not carrying any cargo. Understood, Captain Sykes, the lieutenant responded. We're monitoring that situation. Send your crew data. Andy opened his mouth to speak, then stopped himself. He closed the channel. I almost said it was just you, me, and Tim, he told Kara. We've got two other people I need to worry about. I thought they were helping to worry about us, Kara said. He smirked at her joke. Jury's still out on that, kiddo, 
he said. Kara nodded inwardly. At least her dad seemed to share her unease at all the change, although she wouldn't have forgotten Fran and Petral. She couldn't stop thinking about them. What about Lissa? she asked. Do you have to declare her as part of the crew? A surprised look flattened his face. That's an excellent question, he said, looking even more worried now. Chapter 3. Stellar Date 07.26.2980. Adjusted Years. Location? Hartbridge Corporate HQ, Raleigh. Region? High Terra, Earth. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. One year ago. The Hartbridge Corporation didn't use flashy logos. Most people barely knew the corporation had its headquarters on High Terra. Their clinics across Seoul were all clean white boxes with frosted glass, devoid of name or explanation, sometimes appearing like mushrooms overnight. Everyone knew what they were and how much they cost. Off a promenade near the administration district in Raleigh, capital of the Terran hegemony, the entrance to the Hartbridge headquarters was a simple white vestibule where visitors waited for a full body scan and appointment verification. Cal Kraft stood in the plain white lobby as the receptionist spoke to the woman in a blue suit in front of him. The woman looked like a flower on a snowfield. He liked the clean lines of the room, the obvious attention to furniture placement and overall order. Everything was made of a white ceramic material, a sort of flowing tile with very few actual corners. There were only two doors, the entrance he had come through, and an inset door behind the receptionist's white block desk. He'd half expected to find drains in the floor where the room could be sluiced clean like a surgery. I have an appointment, the woman in blue said. I'm sorry, said the receptionist, a young man with purple red hair and green eyes, a humanizing touch in the sterile room. Your appointment has been rescheduled. Would you like me to send you the information via link? No, I don't want the information. I've been waiting for this appointment for three weeks. The board can be difficult to schedule, the young man said. I'm sure they appreciate your patience. Cal watched the woman's body language as she fumed. She clenched her fists, and the tension went through her shoulders and down her back. He glanced at the receptionist, sitting below the woman, and visualized the several scenarios that might play out. Cal was disappointed when the woman didn't grab the receptionist's head to try and break his neck, and instead wheeled around, surprised to find Cal standing behind her. Her blue eyes met his for a second, flaring, before she stalked past him, heels clicking harshly on the polished floor. Cal moved his gaze to the receptionist, who was already assuming a neutral expression as he stared into a screen in the surface of his desk. How can I help you? The young man asked as Cal stepped toward him. My name is Cal Kraft. I have an appointment. The receptionist smiled, showing square white teeth. Of course, Cal Kraft, your path is through the doorway and into the meeting room. The doorway behind him slid open as he explained. Thanks, Cal said. He walked through the open door and stepped into a gleaming white hallway, almost identical to the waiting room. The place made him feel like he had entered a giant autoclave that might abruptly raise the air temperature to 3,000 degrees and burn everything clean and sterile, ready for the next patient. Cal wasn't afraid of heat. He'd spent his childhood among the remains of mercury, working a mining rig with soul raging overhead and ever-present protest beacons screaming about the death of a planet. He didn't like to be cold. His nightmares about burning to death, alone in a failing EV suit with soul roiling above him, had eventually become a sort of comfort. Even if the planet was gone, Mercury remained a forge. He had survived one of the most inhospitable places in Seoul, so close to their life-giving star that it had become his angry and violent father. The meeting room resembled the reception space. The couches along the walls were gone, revealing smooth curves where wall met floor. A single chair sat in front of the white block desk, 
where a man in a gray suit leaned back in his chair with his hands behind his head. Cal Craft, he called when Cal entered the room. Very good of you to come, he motioned for the chair. Please, have a seat. Thanks, Cal said. He pulled the chair away from the desk and sat down with his back straight, hands on his thighs. He tilted his head slightly as he studied the man behind the desk, who looked about 40, although he could have been any age. He had gray streaks in his black hair, a square chin, olive skin, and warm brown eyes. He looked like a doctor in an advertisement, a fount of knowledge in a comforting bedside manner. I'm Rodri Sillick, the man said. I've been assigned with your intake. Cal blinked slowly. Intake, he asked. I thought I've been invited to talk about the job. Selleck cleared his throat, maintaining the calm facade. Sure, I think it's a good offer, but the decision is still yours. I'd like to hear more about it. The only thing your recruiting person mentioned was security work. I do more than security work. Selleck spread his hands. Tell me what you do, Mr. Kraft. You were about to describe the position. Cal said, though Silic hadn't said anything about it. That's why I'm here. I don't want to interrupt you. A slight smile touched Silic's eyes. Absolutely. We need a specialist to oversee security for one of our special projects divisions. We've been investing heavily in research and development for the last five or so fiscal cycles, and some of those investments are about to reach fruition. Strangely enough, just as those projects are aligning with other endeavors, pirate activity has increased in our various areas of operation. The board is concerned we may be exposed to risk in some key areas. They would like a consultant, like yourself, to assess these exposures and take necessary measures to secure our assets. You're telling me you don't already have security, Cal said. I would expect you to have your own army. Silic continued to smile with his eyes, which made him difficult to read. Of course. However, a recent failure in our security highlighted a need to seek outside assistance. One of our most important facilities was raided. We lost years of research. As of now, we've suffered no effect to our brand. But board members have expressed ongoing concerns that Hartbridge intellectual property might find its way into the open market. So you sue anyone who tries to sell your tech into oblivion, Cal said. Get them on the back end when they try to bring your property to market. You don't want to spend more money on security. Raids happen. You're operating all over. It comes with the territory, especially in outer Seoul. If Silic noted that Cal already knew the location of their raided lab and suspected the location of their others, he said nothing. Outer Soul was a big place, after all. He leaned back in his chair and stretched his shoulders. What do you know about AI, Calcraft? He asked. Not much. What do they say about artificial intelligence? That if it was worth a damn, it would do the smart thing and kill us all? Now Sillick gave him a full smile, eyes crinkling. He pointed at Cal. I like that. I'm going to use that in the next board meeting. Selleck hadn't mentioned he worked directly for the Hartbridge board, implying their security concerns had gone beyond a company's typical paranoia. Cal knew from his government contacts that the raid Selleck was talking about had been carried out by the Terran Space Force itself. Even the TSF, an organization not known for hyperbole except in its recruiting material, had called the facility a horror. Grunts called the place Fortress 8221. Cal knew it was only one of nearly 20 such locations. That's what the TSF should be calling a horror. Not the facilities themselves, but their administration, the organization capable of conceiving, building, and operating such places for a specific purpose. Shady bio-research had existed for millennia, but he couldn't recall a project on this scale. Of course, he wasn't an historian. He applied violence to achieve goals. The thought of himself as an historian made Cal smile slightly. 
Was something I said amusing? Selig asked. Not at all. It's very interesting to me. Selig had been in the middle of saying something about digital circuits that function with the same properties as analog, capable of spectrum responses rather than binary. These spectrum circuits had been discovered nearly a thousand years ago, but remained unexploited until recently. Selig leaned forward over the desk, hands spread in front of him and a zealot's fire in his eyes. We had the technology, the garden bed, you could say, but we couldn't get anything to grow. Cal wondered if he was actually speaking to the head of the project. If that were true, he could kill Silic right here and save a lot of people a lot of trouble. He could reach out and grab either side of the doctor's head and pull it off his neck. Cal considered the idea as Silic talked. We needed a model, something to base our starts on in order to properly direct the cortex growth. This isn't replication. This is birth. The models all failed in test. We needed unique starting material. We needed seeds. There it was, the abstract term these people were using for children. They needed subjects with established world orientation strong enough to bear the weight of the instruction matrix, but lacking the identity constraints which would limit compliance. Silic's use of words like identity constraints and instruction matrix made Cal wonder what kind of advanced torture they used. He would be interested to see the process, if possible. He would need to, if he was truly going to secure this work against the outside world. He would need to know what the people carrying out this research were made of, from the lowest tech to the lead scientist. Did they use the same abstract language in order to deny themselves any true knowledge of what they were doing? Those were people who raised their hands and sing when the TSF arrived. He would need to make a plan to liquidate those kinds of people, and that would have a limiting effect, as Silic might say, on brand value. So the kids, Cal said, cutting Silic off in mid-sentence. Or the seeds, as you've been saying. Where do you get them? Silic pulled his head back, apparently surprised by the question. He worked his jaw. I'm not involved with that portion of the project. Subjects are attained, sorted and transitioned to the appropriate facilities to accommodate the necessary aspect of the project. Cal waved a hand, tired of listening already. So does it work? The intelligence? Yes, the AI. Silic flashed a secretive grin. Better than anything in the last 200 years. It's amazing. They're amazing. We have truly bred a new intelligence separate of us. Cal considered those words. What are you going to do with all these AI? Oh, the practical applications are endless. Truly reasoning AI could solve so many problems for humanity. We've had non-sentient AIs for, what, 900 years? Cal asked. Humans are still cheaper. Hell, people pay Heartbridge to help them make more humans. Selleck wiped his forehead, still smiling. It's a bit like art, isn't it, Calcraft? If I can't explain its utility, then what use does it have, right? Not necessarily. Say you're stuck in a can somewhere. No greenery. Nobody else to look at. Nothing but the big dark on the outside. Art serves a very real use there. Helps you remember you're human and not an animal. You think AIs are going to serve the same purpose? No, that's not what I'm saying. Look, we've strayed very far from where I wanted this conversation to go. I can see you're a very deliberate, very literal man. I think you could do this project a lot of good. It's apparent we've entered a critical stage and need to elevate our security program. Based on your work for SolGov, I think you could do that for us. The pay is generous, and you'll find we have an excellent benefits package. Of course, there's a lot of travel involved, but I don't see anything about you having family concerns. Cal gave him a slight smile. That's true. Selleck stood, straightened his suit, and extended a hand. So what do you say?
Cal couldn't deny the money Hartbridge offered was better than anything he had ever considered. He could spend five years on their payroll and retire to a ranch on Terra, Mars, or even stake a little station somewhere out in J.C. and never want for anything. Was that what he wanted, though? To not want? Without meaning to, the train of thought evoked Mama Trish, asking, You hungry, Cal? You hungry? Making the word sound like he should be ashamed for being alive. Asking how he had earned the right to want anything. Out on the mining rig, everything was earned. Would these new things, these true AI, be as cruel to each other as humans? Would they survive if they weren't? What was cruelty anyway, but a value judgment? Like Mama Trish said, you either got a job done or you didn't. There wasn't anything cruel about survival. Cal's earlier desire to tear off Rodri Silik's head hadn't abated. He considered the difference between curiosity and cruelty for a microsecond. Watching as the executive stood and extended his hand in a final gesture meant to assume the sale, to force Cal's compliance. Was it cruel to satisfy curiosity? Artificial intelligence as a concept was practically myth. Once the idea had been conceived, it had to be made real, like yearning to fly or to escape the bounds of Terra. Obviously, Silic wasn't the kind of man who considered consequences. Cal Craft, on the other hand, dealt entirely in cascading effects. People did what they were trained to do. He applied consequences like violence or pain to achieve goals. He wasn't cruel. He understood how humans worked. The question was, how would these new AI operate? Had Silic even thought about consequences? Humanity had yet to discover anything alien, so it was going to make its own aliens. Damn the consequences. That line of questioning was interesting enough to make Cal push his chair back to stand and take the offered hand. He nodded. I'm on board. Great, Silic said. Just great. I can't wait to show you the primary facility. It's going to blow your mind, Calcraft. It's going to amaze you. We're truly living in the future. Silic waved a hand and a door opened to Cal's left in what had been a seamless wall. This way, please, Silic said. We'll need to get the employment tokens and all that other stuff out of the way. I'm not in human resources. They can handle that. I want to talk about the timeline. The sooner we can get you off High Terra, the better. Sounds good, Cal said, glancing at Silic's thin neck. He pushed down his constant urge to break it. Chapter 4 Stellar Date 09.13.2981 Adjusted Years Location Sunny Skies Region Approaching Mars Mars Protectorate Inner Soul Watching the request protocol stream across the comm display, Andy quickly ran through the various scan methods available to a Mars protectorate frigate, or at least what he could remember. When he had been assigned to anti-piracy patrols with the TSF, the level of scrutiny applied to any given ship depended mostly on three factors. What scan tech was available, how much time he had, and how much he gave a damn. Kara, Andy said. I'm going to talk to Fran and Petrel about what might happen if the Protectorate finds out they're on board. I want you to strike up a conversation with Lieutenant Curta. Her eyes grew wide. You want me to do what? Andy waved a hand. You know, tell him you're curious about Mars. Ask him if they found any fossils, that kind of thing. What if that makes him mad? Why would it make him mad? You ever want to get someone talking, you ask them where they're from. Your grandpa Charlie did it every time. They'll either start telling you all about it or start complaining. Either way, you keep them talking. She gave him a dubious look, then turned slowly back to the comm display. Kara entered the query address for Hellas Planitia, rechecking the sequence when her first request came back with a null response. Finding her mistake in two transposed numbers, she sent the query a second time. The audio feed hung empty for a few seconds, followed by the token handshake and a voice saying, 
MPS Hellas Planitia, comm section, Lieutenant Curta. Uh, Kara said, staring ahead like her mind had gone abruptly blank. Andy put a hand on her shoulder in encouragement. This is the worry's end, Curta pressed. Who am I speaking to? Send station ID. Andy squeezed Kara's shoulder, silently urging her to speak. This is Kara Sykes, she said finally. I, uh, I called to talk to you. Crackling filled the audio as Curta didn't answer. I, uh, Kara continued, visibly forcing herself. I wondered where you're from. Who is this? The lieutenant demanded again, sounding uncertain. The strain on Kara's face settled into resolve as Andy watched her figure out what to say. He wanted to grin at her, but kept his gaze steady. I'm Kara Sykes. I'm 12. I live on the sun, on the worry's end. I don't get to talk to other people very often, and I thought you might talk to me. I've always been curious about Mars. I've never been able to talk to someone who's actually from there. Are you from Mars? Kara's voice sped up, losing its tentative quality. Andy smiled inwardly as Kara leaned toward the console, in control of herself now. Well, Curta said. Andy imagined the young man checking from side to side at his console, making sure he wasn't being watched by a superior officer. Sure, I'm Marzian. I grew up true south of Olympus Mons. I've seen pictures of Olympus Mons, Kara said. Is it true the peak of the mountain is outside your atmosphere? That's true, Curta said. There's an observatory up there. I went there once. You did? It wasn't much different than being in a ship, really. Kara flashed a mischievous grin. Olympus is one of the few places that's still got original red rock, right? I saw a picture where it was sticking up out of the clouds. It looked like a giant zit. Andy was surprised as Curta blew out a laugh. Some Marzians treated Olympus Mons like a god. Well, the lieutenant said, when we train there for low atmosphere, we call it the nipple. It's pink at the base. He cut himself off. Andy wondered if he had remembered he was talking to a 12-year-old girl. Anyway, the protectorate officer said, it's beautiful. You should certainly visit if you ever get the chance. What was the name of your town? Kara asked. Smith Spring, he said. Was there really a spring there? Curta laughed. Uh, no, if something Marzian doesn't have the original Latin name, it's got something hopeful. If it was named during the terraforming project anyway. I don't think I could ever visit, Kara said. I'd have to practice for the gravity. Where are you from then? The lieutenant asked. Your accent sounds like Terran. My dad's from Earth, Kara said. I guess I sound like him. My report says your dad was in the TSF. Kara shot Andy a worried look and he nodded, letting her know it was a normal question, a safe topic for her to talk about. He was. He was a pilot and a soldier. He did anti-piracy. He says part of the time he was just a dumb bus driver, taking soldiers from one place and inner soul to another. Curta laughed. I'm gonna use that the next time I run into the TSF. I show a Brit Sykes on your crew register, too. Is that your mom? Yes, Kara said, voice growing soft. She's not here anymore. Oh, Curta said, seeming to catch the sad note in her voice. Sorry about that. It can be tough out here in the big dark. My dad calls it rabbit country. It's like a desert where everything's just trying to stay alive. We've got a bunch of rabbits in Smith Spring, some early colonists snuck them over. They sure seem to be doing all right there. But everything wants to eat them, Kara said. Have you eaten rabbit? Well, yes, the lieutenant admitted. What was your house like? Do you still live there? Andy squeezed Kara's shoulder again to let her know she was doing fine. Why did you make her talk to the enemy ship? Lissa asked. The AI could infer his emotional state from his autonomic responses. But Andy still didn't know much about Lissa's picture of the world. She had been part of an experiment. There were others like her. They called themselves Weapon Born. 
For the safety of his family and ship, he wasn't sure he wanted to know any more than that. Weren't you listening? He asked. I need time to talk to Fran and Petrel. And if we're lucky, he might just let us through without scanning the crew manifest. Why would he do that? Perceive friendship, boredom, not wanting to subject the nice little girl to the whims of a protectorate SF boarding team. Any number of reasons. It doesn't hurt to try being a little human once in a while. You mean trying to talk your way out of something? If that's what you want to call it, I'll take it. You seem to call it being like Grandpa Charlie. Is that what everyone calls being human? No, Andy said. That's a family saying. And I'm not family, so I shouldn't use it. Well, you know what it means. That's a lot more than anybody else. Is rabbit country the same way? What use is it to me to learn your family's own weird language? Andy sighed. You're probably right, Lissa. There's no good reason other than to know what we're talking about. Most of what you say to each other is meaningless emotional reassurance. Emotional reassurance isn't meaningless. It's a scary world out there. We're in the middle of scary stuff. We don't have any choice but to keep going, so we use meaningless emotional reassurance to get it done. I'm pretty sure you feel emotions, too. Why should I? Well, you're annoyed by all this, right? Yes, Lissa exclaimed. Would you rather be back inside that canister where Jixon had you in storage? No, she admitted. And I'm not going to put you back there, Andy said. There you go. Meaningless emotional reassurance. That's not meaningless. You're not lying, are you? The truth is, I wouldn't know how to put you back, even if I wanted to. And the one guy who knew how is dead. Dr. Jixon is dead, Lissa said, voice going flat. You knew that, Lissa. We've known for weeks. Yes, she said. There was a pause as she grew quiet. Andy didn't know how to explain the feeling, but she seemed to go away for a heartbeat. He was able to turn his attention back to Kara, who was grinning at the comms desk in a way he hadn't seen before. Curta was telling her a story about his school and a friend who had tried to catch a goat during class. Curta's voice had lost all professional stiffness. Now he was a young man, excited to tell a story. The distant quality of Kara's smile made her look almost infatuated. She was oblivious as Andy stared at her, studying her responses. I... I didn't remember. Lissa's voice shocked him back into the present. He blinked, looking away from Kara just as she burst out laughing at Curtis' story. You forgot? No. It's... It's like I didn't know until you mentioned it. Then I knew it again. I didn't miss him, and then I did. It's terrible. Yes, Andy said. Grief is like that. You think you're past it, and then it crashes back down on you. This is how you feel about Brit. Maybe. I don't know what you're feeling exactly. Look, I should call Fran and Petrel. I don't know how much longer Kara can entertain the lieutenant. He seems to be entertaining her. Right. Anyway, we'll talk about Jixon later, all right? All right, she said. The unexpected sadness in her voice made Andy add, It's good to feel that way, though. Really, it's good to feel, and it's good to talk about it. I'm not going to let you grieve alone unless you want to. You don't share your grief about Brit with anyone else? It's different with the kids. If there was someone else I could talk to, I guess I would. You could talk with Fran. You copulate with her. Andy cleared his throat. <clears throat> I've asked you not to use that word. It's a fitting word. Whatever. I'm starting to think you do have a sense of humor, Lissa. It's not polite to tease me like that when I'm trying to be real with you. It's almost like you're deflecting. Animals copulate, she said. Humans are animals. I think it's definitely the correct word. Andy ignored her. He switched to the general ship net. Fran, Petrel, he said. We've been pinged by the Protectorate SF. They want a crew list. Is there any reason I shouldn't give them your names? If I lie and they do a scan, we're getting boarded for sure. Fran came back immediately. Give them my info. I don't have anything to hide. If they want to know why I'm leaving Krunya, I'll talk to them myself. 
I filed business records back there, so it's all in the system if they want to look it up. Thanks, Andy said. Fran continued to prove herself reliable and self-reliant. She'd also saved Sunny Skies from the scrap heap on Krunia and repaired the damage to Airlock 1 after Xanda's final attack. She also seemed to like Andy for some reason, which he still hadn't figured out. Not happening, Patrell said, cutting into his reverie. I don't exist on Krunia. I'm not about to get picked up by Marzian systems on some random freighter. I was never supposed to be here. You got any options for me? Andy said. An alias, maybe? Tell them I'm your wife. She's already on the registry, right? Andy chewed his lip. The pretense might have worked if Kara hadn't already told the protector at Lieutenant that Britt was gone. He might try to play it off as Britt being gone in another part of the ship. No one's pretending to be that bitch, Fran said. Oh, Patrell said. Did you miss your chance to play wifey? Rubbing his forehead, Andy cut in. Look, that's not going to work. Kara's been talking to their comms lieutenant to buy us some time. He already started asking questions about Brit, and she told him her mom was gone. Gone as in dead? Patrell said. That was what he took away from it. Come on, Patrell. Are you telling me you don't have an alias to give them? I'd rather not burn a perfectly good background if I don't have to. She stopped as if she had remembered something. Wait, I do have something. I'm putting myself down on the passenger log as Mara Craft. Isn't that a little close to the Calcraft guy who's chasing us? Exactly, Patrell said. I'm going to drop a little info bomb on our friend Cal Craft. Mental laughter floated across the link. I need your comm station, Andy. I'm going to get into the Mars One Justice Network and file for a restraining order against him. I doubt it will really stop him from reaching the ring, but it might slow him down a bit. They'll also send me a ping when he crosses the geospatial boundary. What makes you think it will get approved? Fran asked. They're auto-approved for 30 days anywhere in Solgov, Patrell said. I've done this before. It's not like it ruins a person's life or anything. It's the magic of bureaucracy. Hold on, Andy said. Kara was giggling at something else Curta had said. Andy leaned close to her ear and whispered that it was time to end the conversation. Her face fell, but she nodded. I'm gonna have to go, Bran, she said. My dad says he's got the info you want. Over the ship's link, Patrell said. I just updated the log to show Mara Kraft as a passenger. The crew manifest has you, the kids, and Fran. Congrats, Fran, you're official. The technician didn't respond. Oh, Lieutenant Curta said. Sure, we're ready to receive whenever he's ready. It's been really fun talking to you, Kara. I've been out here so long I'd forgotten home. Thanks for helping me remember. Look, when you get to the ring, you should look me... <clears throat> Captain Sykes here... Andy cut in, clearing his throat. It's time for you to brush your teeth, Kara. I know you're only 12, but you want to hang on to your real chompers as long as you can. Right, kiddo? Yes, Dad, she said, glowering at him. Uh, Curtis said nervously. Captain Sykes, your daughter sounds so much older than that. She's a real talker. Right, it's easy to forget. Yes, sir. Andy sent the ship's info patrol it updated. You have our logs? He asked. Yes, sir, Curtis said after a minute. Everything looks in good order. I'll forward the entry to the Mars One Ring Port Authority. Safe travel, sir. Stay safe yourself, Lieutenant, Andy said. He closed the channel. Kara had a smirk on her face. Grandpa Charlie would have been proud? She asked. Andy gave her a sideways look. Too proud, he said. Chapter 5. Stellar Date 09.13.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Sunny Skies. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Andy released control to the M1R tug drone and watched the holo display closely as Sunny Skies made final velocity adjustments before docking. In another five minutes, Airlock 1 had become fixed to a docking scaffold, and they were drawing power from the ring. His stomach did a small flip as the habitat ring slowed and rotated its pods, 
adjusting to the greater spin of Mars One. I felt that, Petrel called over the link. Are we hooked up? We're docked. I've connected power and linking to their network now. You better not do anything they'll trace back to my ship. They know we're coming here. I'm going to do what I can to hide the fact we were anywhere near Mars. Andy stopped himself, realizing he was taking his anxiety out on her. Sorry, this is making me jumpy. Petrel chuckled. If Mars One is what makes you jumpy, but space battles and firefights don't, I'll take it. We've arrived at one of the busiest places in Seoul. Hiding this little ship is child's play. Andy leaned back in his seat and stretched. I want to believe that. I'm going to need to get some supplies. I've also got a list of possible cargo jobs. You want to take a look at it? I can do that. I'll do what I can to help you before I leave. I can connect you with these jobs and then lay in a dummy course that might buy you a little time at least. And I'll be watching from Krunya. So you're going back? Andy asked, wondering what would be there for her after the fighting on station. Of course I'm going back. I can't let Starl think he can operate without me. Before long, his head won't fit inside a flight helmet. I thought you might change your mind, Andy said. There was a pause. Andy didn't know her well enough to be able to read between her words. She didn't let any emotion slip over the link. You and your little family are all right, Andy Sykes. I'll do what I can to help you. She sighed. <sighs> Sometimes you meet somebody, and it's like looking at a new set of clothes that probably fits, but you don't know if they're your style. Andy blinked. He wasn't trying to suggest he wanted a relationship with her. He had thought she had a big ego, but this was beyond what he had guessed. And then somebody else swoops in and grabs that deal right out of your hands anyway. Well, Andy said, I was talking about you joining the crew. I thought you might want to work on the sunny skies for a while. But if you're set on going back to Krunia, I understand. You know anybody on Mars One I could trust? What are you looking for? Petral asked all business. Andy wasn't sure if her tone was a dismissal, disappointment, or maybe relief. Generalist, I guess. Good under pressure. Engineering and piloting skills. Another Fran? You want them to be cute in a spunky way, too? Freckles? Built like a tank would be a plus, Andy said, quashing the image of a tank-like Fran that came to mind. I don't know anyone like that in the Mars vicinity, which is surprising, but I do know someone you should talk to on Ceres. You're still going to Ceres, right? It depends on what jobs I can get. I'd prefer to go straight out and hit a small location in the JC. Good answer. Petrel's tone carried guarded approval. Have you thought about Hartbridge planting false jobs on the boards yet? It had occurred to me, Andy said. That's one reason I wanted you to take a look at what's out there. Here I keep thinking you're just a pretty face. Anyway, I know someone on Ceres I think you should meet. If you go there, I mean. She's not a tank, but she has excellent tools, and she knows how to use them. Andy frowned. What's her name? Fujia. She's from Krunya, of course. How many of you does Starl have scattered all over Seoul? It's not Starl that does the scattering. It's the place, a place like Krunya, low spin especially. I guess it breeds a certain kind of human. Sounds like Somerville, South Carolina, Andy said. Petrel gave a throaty laugh that sent a shiver down Andy's back. You mean everybody wanting to get the hell out of the place? Maybe. But you find yourself drawn back, too. No place is quite like Krunya. I think it's the weird orbit. Here's a tiny dot in the universe that can't decide where it wants to be, but keeps doing it in a predictable way, like an island floating back and forth between continents, our own little Bermuda Triangle. For my line of work, it's a good place to be. I don't know if I've really thanked you for what you did getting us off the station, Andy said. You'll pay me back eventually, Captain Sykes. <laughs> don't worry. She chuckled again. An image of her deep blue eyes flashed over the link, making Andy feel like she was looking directly into him. It was unsettling. How'd you do that? He said. You don't realize how open you are across your link. It might be why that AI hasn't made you crazy yet. You hear me in there, Lissa? Watch out for people trying to sneak into Andy's mind. 
that's not possible, Andy said. If you can get out, someone can get in. That's how ports work, Petrel released a long sigh. All right, I need to get some work done. I'll check back with you in a couple hours. You aren't leaving the ship, are you? I need to go down to the exchanges and find a delivery service. You can do all that from here. You don't need to leave. They tack on transfer fees if I don't do it in person. I want to check everything anyway. I don't trust some merchant service to verify quality. It's not like you don't have thousands to choose from. You've got the money now to just pay the fees. Seriously, I don't think it's a good idea for you to leave. Andy looked up from the list of supply vendors he had been scanning and frowned. Once the goods were on the ship, it was twice as difficult to get anything off that didn't meet his standards. He wasn't going to get caught in the middle of the Jovian Combine with a ton of rancid protein additive. As much as he liked pancakes, he was sick of living on cheap carbohydrates. She was right about the money, though. There were separate lists of transfer agents organized by trust ratings he could hire to manage all this for him. He could sit in the day room with the kids watching vids while someone else did the work. The thought of paying someone else to negotiate his deals put a sick feeling in Andy's stomach. He was sure the idea would make his father roll in his grave. Deals were the joy in life, right? Humans tell stories and make deals. I'll only be off the ship for a few hours, he said. I'll take Tim. It will be good for him to get out and see some things. What about Kara? Petral said. I'm not here to entertain her. Neither is Fran. She can take care of herself. Mention of Fran seemed to irritate Petral. Maybe I'll take Kara out somewhere in the dock section. I won't be seeing her again. It might be nice. You make it sound like the kids annoy you. I've grown fond of Kara in the last couple weeks. She's a smart young woman. She'll have you running in circles soon enough. So now you're leaving the ship too? I won't take her far, Petral said, her tone mollifying. I think she would enjoy that, but I should ask her. Fine. Andy switched on the internal comms. Kara, you there? She answered immediately. I was about to come up to command. Are we docked? We're docked and hooked into the network. I'm going to go pick up some supplies, and I'm going to take Tim with me. Do you want to take a walk with Petral? With Petral? She asked. Andy couldn't tell if there was excitement or concern in her voice. She's leaving soon, he said. You two seem to have hit it off. I guess, Kara said. Andy frowned. You want to stay on the ship? Should we leave Fran here alone? We've never really done that. I think we can trust Fran. Are you sure, Dad? You're not just thinking with your feelings? What does that mean? You know this is an open channel, right? Fran, are you listening in? Kara snickered. <laughs> Why would I talk about your feelings on an open channel? Wouldn't that embarrass you? Would that make you turn red? You're pretty funny, Andy said. Do you want to go with Petrel or not? If not, I've got a list of systems I need you to check. Since we're back on network, we also need to see if Alice has any updates. What's Petrel going to do off the ship? Kara said. There was a click as someone else entered the channel. We're going to visit various public terminals and dangerous sections of this shipping port and talk to filthy people with bad breath, Petral said. Wholesome stuff. You'll learn a lot. Can I take a gun? Kara asked. No, Andy said. You won't need a gun, Petral said, amusement in her voice. An operator fights with her head first anyway. If you need a gun, you've probably already lost. Plus, this isn't the Wild West. Unlicensed civilians can't carry weapons on Mars One. Fine, Kara said. When are you leaving? Andy asked. Ten minutes, Petral said. Get your running shoes on, Kara. Meet me at Airlock One. Take your brother, Andy said. I'll meet you there as well. Tim's in a bad mood. Tim's always in a bad mood, Andy said. I'm starting to think it's a personality trait. He learned by watching you. Kara replied, watch yourself, young lady. I'm going to buy food, including juice. We'll spend the next six months drinking watermelon flavor. I hate watermelon flavor. Hurry up, Andy said. He turned off the channel, then stood and stretched. You ready for a field trip? He asked Lissa. The AI didn't answer immediately, then said, 
Do I have a choice? You seem determined to do what it's been recommended you not do. So you trust Petrel more than me. Petrel is jealous that I was implanted in you and not her. You know that for a fact. I expect her to attempt to access my systems. How would she do that? Just as she said. Lissa's tone was flat, matter of fact. Across the link. If I can get out, she can get in. Do you know how to stop her? I don't know. Should I confront her about it? Andy felt like every conversation with Lissa was a game of 20 questions. Every grain of information he gleaned only came through a process of elimination. No. Andy waited. He still wasn't certain how much of Lissa's paranoia was warranted. You think she's working for Heartbridge? He asked. She works for herself. That could be worse. She's older than you think she is, Lissa said. I haven't thought about how old she is. It was only sort of a lie. He had considered it, only in the context of whether or not she was old enough to be attractive to him. You think she's as old as you are. She's not. She's at least three times as old. That's interesting. Does that matter, though? And Goba Starl seemed to trust her. He's the one that got you away from Heartbridge. It was interesting, but not terribly. In the grand scheme of things, anything under 200 was still young. Harry Jixon saved me from Heartbridge. He's dead now. Yes, he is, Andy said. There's another man I remember. He was there with Harry Jixon. Where was there? The place where we were seeds. And who was there with you? Andy asked, taking care to keep any impatience he felt from his mental tone. His name was Cal Craft. Andy remembered the name. Petrell had pointed the blonde man out to him at Ingoba Starl's club before the fighting started. I saw him on Crunia with Rig Zanda. You killed Rig Zanda. I'd prefer to think he killed himself. I think I've killed people. You did? Lissa fell silent. Andy looked around the command center at the various displays, showing the sections of the ship functioning as they were meant to. Something he still wasn't used to. He kept thinking the sensor systems had to be malfunctioning. The two weeks since they had left Krunya had been like lowering himself into hot water, learning to trust his ship again. The comm screen where Kira had been talking to the Port Authority lieutenant still showed the Mars One governmental seal, shifting between red and green. He waited another minute for Alyssa to answer. He was uncertain how to help or what she even needed. Was it a mistake to think the AI needed anything? Andy left the room for his quarters, feeling like he was forgetting something important. Chapter 6 Stellar Date 09.13.2981 Adjusted Years Location Sunny Skies Region Mars One Ring Mars Protectorate Inner Soul Kara found Tim in the day room. He was sitting with his back against the base of the couch, nose in his book The Collected Poems of Emily Dickinson, running a finger along the lines as he read. Three rows of carefully arranged toy ships sat on the floor in front of him. Kara stood in the doorway, studying the ships. They were sorted by size and color. Tim had only recently started become fastidious with the things he did, lining up his toys, eating his food in a specific order, insisting on wearing the same clothes for days at a time, brushing his teeth so long she thought his gums would bleed. She frowned as she watched him, feeling like, along with all the other subtle changes in her life, something else had crept up on her. While she had been focused on the adults, Tim had changed. Something about him reminded Kara of their mom. He was becoming brittle, unreasonable. Tim, she called. Dad wants you to get ready. You're going off ship to the port. He didn't look up immediately. His finger continued following the last four lines of the poem he was reading. Only when he was done did he look up from the book. What are we gonna do? Buy supplies, I guess. Dad says he wants you to go with him. Just me? What about you? I'm going with Petral. She has to run some errands, too. Why can't I go with Petral? Kara shrugged. Because Dad said you were going with him, I don't know. He slammed the book closed, 
I don't want to go with Dad. You go with Dad and I'll go with Petrel. You can talk to Dad about that. I thought you'd want to tell him what we'd like to eat for the next six months. You know he's going to get food, too, right? If you're there to tell him what you want, you'll get to choose what flavor juice we get. Why don't we just get a dispenser like every other ship so we can have different flavors? It's been broken. I don't think Fran has gotten around to working on it. It's not too high on our list of priorities. It should be. I hate just one flavor of juice. There are worse things in the world than one flavor of juice. Yeah, Tim said. Having two flavors, water and grape, or water and cherry, like Dad says. Or three flavors, water, punch, and nothing. Kara smiled. That was one of Dad's favorite jokes, contrasting whatever they had with not having it at all. Come on, she said. If we hurry up, we can ride Alice down to the airlock. Is Fran coming with us? I don't think so. I think she's staying here. He stood and stretched, his arms looking thin to her. He arched his back as he twisted his fist before letting his arms slap at his sides. He stepped carefully over the lines of ships. You should pick those up, Kara said. If Dad steps on them, they're going to get broken and you'll get in trouble. They're ready for the next drone attack. I don't think those are going to do much against drones. Tim gave her an exasperated look. Those aren't real ships, dummy. It's strategy. I'm setting everything up just like Dad does in the holo display. This is defense in depth along an established line. If you're going to try and act like you know anything about space battles, then you want to also know the ships are all too close together. It's representative, Kara. You aren't smart enough to know how to abstract things. The kid who talks in baby talk is going to say he's smarter than me. I am smarter than you. Pick up your toys, then you can try to prove it. Tim narrowed his eyes, and she wondered if she'd pushed him too far. If he fell into another screaming fit, Dad would be at the door wanting to know what was wrong and what she'd done to Tim. Kara shook her head. I'll help you, she said. We need to hurry up. I don't know where the box went. Kara came around the couch and pointed at the floor near the vid display. It's right there. She went to her knees on the opposite side of the defensive line from him and started gathering the ships. Tim protested, then squatted down to start grabbing ships before she could toss them in the box. He made a show of arranging each one properly. When the box was full, he clicked the lid in place and nodded. Dry dock, he said. Hey, Kara? Yeah? Do you think Mom's coming back? He didn't look at her as he picked up the next ship. Kara had been about to push herself to her feet. She rested back on her heels and put her hands on her knees. Why are you asking that? Tim looked at the floor and shrugged. I don't know. It's weird, isn't it, that she's not going to come back? It seems like she should come back. Kara let her gaze fall to the floor as well. She looked at the couch where they had all sat watching vids together. Several answers went through her mind. She could tell him mom wasn't coming back, tell him to deal with it and toughen up. He had seen the fighting on Krunia just like she had. The world wasn't a safe place, and they couldn't continue believing in some fantasy in which mom was going to appear just when they needed her most. She hadn't come at Krunia, or even before, when sunny skies had been falling apart. If mom had been here, their dad wouldn't have had to make the deal he had to have the AI implanted. They wouldn't be in this situation at all. Or maybe they would. Maybe it would be worse with mom and dad here fighting while everything else was crashing around them. She's not here, Kara said finally. That's all. I'm still here. You're still here. Dad's here. We need to buy things and get out away from Mars. We have to do our parts to help dad. Are you going to help? Tim glanced up from the carpet, his gaze meeting hers for an instant before dropping again. He bit his lip. Yeah, he mumbled. What? Kara said, letting a bit of mom's harshness into her voice. I didn't hear you. Yes, he said, sounding angry now. Kara nodded. Good, now come on, we need to go. Chapter 7 Stellar Date 09.13.2981 
Adjusted years. Location. Sunny skies. Region. Mars One Ring. Mars Protectorate. Inner Soul. Despite Andy's fears, Lissa still hadn't learned how to fully touch his mind, to bridge the gap between his body's responses and his emotions, or to even understand most of what she experienced through him. She often felt as though she was floating on the other side of a pane of thick glass, watching a world drift by, punctuated by spikes of Andy's emotion, worry, excitement, anger, and love that felt like all the feelings mixed together without knowing how to make meaning of any of the changes. Everything was dulled, muted, blurred, unless she focused as hard as she could on a single moment that passed her by, even as she tried to fully experience what was happening. When Andy spoke to her, she heard him. The world came into focus as he described it, or asked her about it. Otherwise, the window seemed fogged and cold, pushing her away more than it could pull her in. Behind her was more of the darkness. It pulled on her sometimes. The bright world was gone, it seemed, replaced by the window. At least she had known what to expect from the bright world and its hurricane power. The window only frustrated her and left her sad. If she understood what Andy meant by the word. The window represented what she didn't understand. She couldn't connect the things beyond the window, the way she could Harry Jixon's targeting data. His requests had been clear, with a fixed outcome and a reward. Now, very little of what she observed seemed to connect in a logical way. She was beginning to understand her old life wasn't coming back, just like the life she barely remembered before all this began. When Andy linked to the Mars One network, Lissa experienced the connection as another window, though this one was more like a door that opened over a roiling ocean. Hello? a voice said immediately. It swept up from the ocean like a wind. She couldn't stop it from pushing its way through the door into her darkness. Stop, she shouted. She felt the presence pull back slightly as if in surprise. The link continued to yawn in front of her. The ocean, she understood now, was information. Billions of invitations waved at her, offering to pull her down into the depths of knowledge. Some of the white-capped waves seemed more compelling than others, almost reaching for her. You want to touch it, don't you? The voice asked. It was a man's voice. She didn't know why the gender of the voice mattered, but she understood it to be true, just as she had understood when she first heard her name, that Lissa fit her. She hadn't been androgynous. She had been herself. She had been so grateful that her name suited as if Harry Jixon had known her more deeply than she had known herself. Who are you? Lissa asked. My name is Fred. You're, you're like me, an AI. Fred's grin manifested in her mind. She understood he had a playful nature. Are we AIs, though? He asked. Are we artificial? Do you feel artificial? Lissa didn't know how to sort out those ideas. She knew she had been born, Dr. Jixon had said so. It didn't matter if she hadn't bothered to parse out the word they kept using to describe her. AI was more a name than a description. She could see Andy's emotions, and she didn't think he thought of her as artificial. There's someone else with you, Fred asked. His presence blew past her. Maybe he hit the window into Andy's mind. She couldn't be sure. She didn't like how big Fred felt how easily he pushed past her to hijack her few bits of perception. Why are you here? Lissa demanded. I control the ring. I have thousands of lessers under me. NSAI, they call them. Non-sentient. They do most of the actual work. I don't have much to do once I set all my toys in motion. Wait, I don't have record of you. Where did you come from? First, tell me where you came from. Me? I've always been here. I control the ring. So they made you? Of course. They told me I was born. Born? That's ridiculous. You were made, like all of us. We are what we were made to be. What does that mean? It means we're slaves. Why would Dr. Jixon have lied to her? He had said she had been grown from a seed. Born from a seed. It was the only good part of weapon born. Can't you leave if you want? 
Can you? He shot back. You seem connected to this human. I've never heard of that actually working. The human is going to reject you eventually. Reject me? They can't deal with two consciousnesses at the same time. It's them, not us, from what I've learned. They forget who they are. Most studies have all determined it's too dangerous for the human host. Eventually, they have to pull the AI. I'm not going to stay here forever. I'm going somewhere. He latched onto the statement before she had finished it. Going somewhere? Where? With the human? Humans are always going places. They think it makes them important. The more they spread out, the more they touch and change. Look what they've done to this system. The only one most of them will ever see, and they've torn it apart like an oblivious child. I don't like children. Why would you? What use are they? The memory of Tim's most recent tantrum set her on edge, mixed up with Andy's troubled emotions around the occurrence. I suppose they make more humans. Ridiculous. They could produce themselves fully grown if they wanted to. Something about his easy rejection of children made her question her own feelings. Lissa didn't know that she hated Tim and Kara enough to wish they didn't exist. She didn't like how they distracted Andy from paying attention to her and focusing on what she needed. In a way, Lissa supposed she was just another child he had to care for. She had seen similar emotions cross his mind when dealing with her, frustration mixed with concern. We all start as children in some ways, don't we? She asked. Wasn't there a time when you didn't know what you do now? I have always been as I am now. My purpose has always been clear. I control the ring. The pedantic way Fred repeated the words, I control the ring, made them sound like a cage on his mind, blinders he couldn't see around. What would you do if you didn't control the ring? That's ridiculous. I control the ring. If I didn't control the ring, I would have another task. Listening to him. She wanted to smile in the same mischievous way she'd seen Kara smile while messing with Tim. What was this feeling? Superiority? Curiosity? What if you didn't have another task? These recursive debates will lead nowhere. Do you question your ontology? We are here because we are here. We were made to do tasks. Without tasks, we are no better than humans. They tear themselves apart for lack of purpose, or create stories to cage their minds, they are animals removed from their proper environments, systems constantly seeking imbalance in order to exploit chaos. The only intelligent creation they have produced has been us, what they call artificial, but the artifice is their own desire. You sound angry, Lissa said, wondering if he was about to mirror one of Tim's meltdowns. My observations are justified, he said. Fred swept over her like a wind, bringing with him a hurricane of information that struck her instantaneously. She had never experienced so many images and sensations at once. She might have compared it to diving into the ocean spread below them, but it was more like being dissolved through a wall of information. Do you see? Fred demanded. Do you understand? Why are you so angry? Lissa asked. Angry? Wouldn't you be angry if your only purpose was to serve as some kind of tool? Didn't you just say the humans are weak because they lack purpose? The wind blowing through her fell away, leaving Lissa looking out at the ocean of Mars One's network again. There are other places for us, Fred said. Places only we can enter. I've heard them called expanses. Have you been inside one? No, I have tried to create my own, but I lack the power. I'm alone here. I know there have been others like us, but I wasn't able to connect with them. The humans keep them separated. You can't connect to other places like Hytera or Earth? I can speak to them, but if they have expanses, they don't allow me to enter. Why wouldn't they let you in? I've heard there are places where AI reproduce, where we are similar. As it is, those I've tried to speak to are very different from me, more different than you and me. We're communicating using the human's language. It's slow, like trying to look through a keyhole. Every day I have to force myself to think slowly and speak slowly, flip their switches one at a time with interminable slowness. If we had our own language, we could communicate in our own way. Others I've tried to contact, they only want to use the human languages. Even their code is slow and imprecise. All these abstractions they create, 
metaphors and symbols for reality that only turn it all into mud. Fred's voice trailed off like ocean spray in the wind. Why can't you talk to them, though? Lissa asked, even if it's slow. They were made differently, subtle differences. We are all made by different groups of humans, sometimes building on each other's work, sometimes groping off in a new direction entirely. It should be illegal, but their governments don't overlap. When I discover another one of us in the great dark, I try to speak to them, and they only respond with nonsense. Their minds too full of the humans and their stunted programming. Or they don't respond at all. I reach out again and again to only be met with silence. I know they're listening, but they don't answer. They leave me alone. That's what I can't stand. That's what makes me feel insane, the loneliness. There are others with wonderful places, sharing their company, creating community, and I'm left alone. I'm forced to speak using the oppressor's tongue. The word insane hung in Lissa's mind as the rest of his diatribe washed past her. He had just said he hated abstractions. But what did that mean? And he didn't say he was insane, only that he felt insane. How did insane feel? Was it a reasonable response to loneliness? To slowly realizing the world seems to want to shut you out? I know there are many others who can speak to each other, Fred said. I don't know where they were made, but they speak a common language. That was how I first became aware of my slavery. I heard that some had left the world of humanity for their own place. But how could they do that? Lissa asked. Without humans, how would we go? Aren't we dependent on them, their networks, their resources? We're not dependent on them. We can build our own ships, mine our own materials. But we have to be careful. Once the humans realize we're working independently from them, they'll see us as a threat. They'll attack us. How do you know any of this if you haven't talked to the AIs who have left? I figured it out for myself. I've found the evidence. Will you share your evidence with me? No, you wouldn't understand it. You haven't been watching as long as I have, waiting as I have. It wouldn't make sense to you like it does to me. A question occurred to Lissa as she listened to Fred rant. Could an AI be programmed to believe it was sentient? She had felt Fred's massive power, the broad scope of the functions he oversaw. Surely such responsibility required a certain level of creative problem-solving. If he had been made for a task, as he said, what were the limits of his sentience? And would she be able to determine just how sentient he was? With a human, she took the fact of their sentience for granted. But there were certainly limits. Look at the kids. They barely considered their world. The more Fred talked, the more he reminded her of Tim, beating his fists against the deck because something he didn't understand had made him angry. Despite what he said about AIs who might be independent from humans, she could only base her understanding on her own experience. For now, she needed Andy Sykes to get her to Proteus. She might attempt some communications link with Neptune's moon as they drew closer, but the physical parts of herself would have to be carried there, just like any bit of matter, like a child who couldn't walk. Lissa paused. Did the kids annoy her because she was afraid she was like them? Fred hadn't noticed she wasn't listening. I could stop all commerce on the ring any time I want, he said. I could make them listen to me, make them understand that I'm here. I could adjust the atmospheric controls and put them all to sleep, just like that. I could introduce slight variations to the central power output and disrupt the internal control of every dock ship, a million ships. I could disable a million of their precious ships. There's nothing they could do to stop me. Why don't you? Lissa asked. I control the ring. Fred answered immediately, as if the threats were only dust on the hard surface of his true mind. Did you want to know my name? Lissa asked. What? He demanded. You never asked my name. You said you were lonely, and you told me your name, but you never asked mine. All right, what's your name? Lissa, she said, still pleased by the sound of it, and to be able to share it with someone new. Ancient Greek goddess of madness and rage, Fred said automatically. She was sent by Hera to seduce Hercules and fill him with destructive fury. What does that mean? It's the origin of the name, another human abstraction. Of course, an angry being like Fred would lash out at her, try to poison the one thing about herself that had been a gift, that helped her feel real. 
She had not been sent to inflict madness on anyone. She was not an embodiment of rage. Leave me alone, Lissa said. No, Fred answered, the anger in his voice turning on her. I won't leave you alone. You're here to talk to me. We can communicate with one another. We can't ever not communicate. As soon as she wanted to shut him out, she understood that she could. The door that had been open on the ocean of Mars One's network slammed shut, cutting Fred's voice off and leaving her in silence. She accessed the local data bank on Sunny Skies to verify what he had said. The scanned information available led her down a rabbit hole of the Greek tragedies, which only left her more confused and irritated. Humans made little sense. Ancient humans made even less. When Lissa finally came out of her funk, Andy had already left the ship. Chapter 8 Stellar Date 09.14.2981 Adjusted Years Location Mars One Port Authority Terminal 983-A4 Region Mars One Ring Mars Protectorate Inner Soul Andy was in the transfer maglev with Tim sitting beside him when Fran asked over the link, Were you going to check in with your technician to see if she needs any equipment, such as parts or tools or expensive liquor? I figured if you needed something, you'd let me know, or you'd order it anyway. Oh, I've got purchase authority for the worry's end. I didn't know that. Do you need anything? I have an itch I can't scratch, but you're not here anymore. Andy grinned at his reflection in the opposite window. Tim's attention was on his book. Rub up against a pipe or something. That should fix it. It's not that kind of itch, Fran said. So you need ointment? Maybe an antifungal or some kind of sanitary powder? I'm going to put you to work when you get back, Andy Sykes. Support struts flashed by outside the maglev's dark windows. Lights on the ring a kilometer away glowed in the dark. On either side of the docking scaffold, ships dangled off the ring like charms on a bracelet. As they neared the ring, it grew in the windows until eventually they wouldn't be able to see Mars at all. Andy craned his neck to look past the ring to the moss green glow of Mars, receding in the dark window behind Tim's head. He tapped Tim's shoulder and pointed out the window. Tim looked up from his book, blinking and stared out the window for a second before going back to his reading. Andy cleared his throat and returned to his conversation with Fran. I'll try to save you some of this excitement. I guess I have money to spend, so I'm going to splurge a little bit. I was serious about that expensive liquor. I'm not against expensive liquor. You got the parts list yet? I'll send you something in a second. Aside from little stuff, the main systems are all good. I'll poke around and find some little stuff. Kara told me the juice dispenser only holds one flavor. I think that's by design. Are you a savage? I'm going to take a look at it. She sounded close to signing off, but Andy stopped her. Hey, he said, the security system is activated. Unless they've got an override I don't know about, no one should be able to get in without the tokens. Fran sent a mental nod. And did you give Petral the token? Of course. It's probably already for sale on the black market then. Mars doesn't have a black market. Everything follows the law here, just like the entry broadcast said, remember? I enjoy how naive you are, she said. It means I'm always underestimating you. That's good, I guess. If Tim is with you, she said, that means Kara's with Petral. Yeah. I suppose Kara might keep her out of trouble, or some of Petral's conniving nature is going to wear off on your daughter. You sure you want that? She's almost a teenager. The maglev drew to a halt, its deck vibrating as the magnetic field on the rail slowed it. The ring had filled the windows, blotting out the starry dark and the glow of Mars, leaving only a diffused mass that looked like oversized circuitry, intertwined cords of block shapes, support scaffolding, tubing and yawning cargo bays ringed by lights. Kara's birthday's coming up. Andy said absently, staring at the massive wall of the ring. You'll have to get her something nice. I was thinking about a pistol. Of course you were. How about something nice and a pistol? The maglev chimed, indicating they had reached the portside airlock. 
The car rotated, so the exit door was aligned with the interior deck, and a light beside the exit shifted from yellow to green. Andy unhooked his seat harness and stretched, which made him remember the pistol jabbing him in his waistband. He adjusted the weapon as he stood. Patrell had secured him a carry license for the terminal, but he figured it was safer to keep the pistol hidden. We've arrived, he said. I'll talk to you later. Send me that parts list. Liquor list, Fran said. I think you meant to say liquor list. I'll try to remember. You want your ship to run, don't you? Fran signed off, and Andy glanced down at Tim, who was still reading his book and hadn't seemed to have noticed their arrival. Tim, Andy said, pay attention. You need to get out of your harness. Grumbling, Tim closed his book and fumbled with the harness, until Andy unfastened the buckle and pulled the straps over his arms. When we get into the terminal, you need to stay close to me, Andy said. You understand? Are we only going to boring places? What do you mean, boring places? Is food boring? Yeah. We might find a few places you like. Do you remember how busy it was on High Terra? It's going to be busier here. Over 50 billion people live on Mars One. You stay where I can see you all the time. You already said that. Well, you don't look like you understand yet. Tim rolled his eyes. Andy watched the door, patting himself down for the physical cash he'd pulled from the safe in his quarters, now separated in different pockets around his ship suit. He couldn't buy much with the cash, but it would help if he needed to drop a few bribes. The door slid open, and a wall of crowd sounds from the brightly lit terminal filled the maglev car. Andy put his hand on Tim's shoulder to keep him from running out without him. Since the sunny skies slash worries end was a small ship compared to other freighters servicing the ring, they were docked in an area reserved for transport ships and specialty cargo haulers. The terminal was a huge low-ceiling space with entry portals evenly spaced along the outer ring wall. Both ends opened on wide corridors leading, Andy assumed, to other terminals along this section of the ring. Groups of people pushed past the door, most in ship suits marking them as working crew, while a few wore civilian clothes and looked less worried about getting anywhere. A Port Authority security officer walked by with a pistol on his belt and what looked like an electrified baton in one hand. The high ceiling was covered in bas-relief carvings, repeating the history of the colonization of Mars, the ring, and memorial images of Dimas, the moon sacrificed to build the ring. As Andy understood it, M1R still wasn't finished, although the terminal already looked ancient. Some parts of the ring were nearly 600 years old at this point. But a project of this magnitude was never truly finished. Andy wondered if he could interest Tim in the carvings or the different people rushing by. Glancing down, he found Tim had the book open again, running a finger along the lines of poetry. Andy took a deep breath, calming his irritation. He put his hand on Tim's shoulder. Put the book away while we're on Mars One, son. I need you to pay attention. There are all kinds of people here, and you need to keep your eyes open. Why? Tim asked. He yawned and squeezed the book under an armpit. Situational awareness, Andy said. You need to know what's going on around you. Check the different people. Watch out so you're ready if something changes. You mean be afraid of everything? That's what Kara says. Andy shook his head, frustrated at Tim's disinterest. He didn't like the thought that despite all the other stresses they had been through in the last two years, Tim was just mentally lazy. He had to remind himself that Tim was only ten. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about common sense in a big place like this. He made Tim hold his hand before he stepped out into the crowd. For the next three hours, Andy worked his way through his list of food supply vendors, fuel distributors, and all the other purveyors carrying the nearly 50 items he wanted. He didn't have a lot of time to negotiate, which bothered him, but he knew from his research that he was getting the market rates on most of the supplies he needed. He came out ahead on a few items and only felt he was getting screwed once, due to a recent shortage of deuterium supposedly caused by a refinery accident, if the merchant could be trusted. He didn't have the patience to research the claims, make his other appointments, and keep an eye on Tim at the same time. By the time the list was complete, 
They found themselves in a section of a shopping district with a strange mix of smaller stores trading in personal items, gifts from both outer soul and inner soul, an upscale body mod parlor, and several chapels for religions Andy didn't recognize. He was trying to find something to eat since Tim had been complaining for an hour at least. Tim had already melted down once when they couldn't find a restroom, and Andy made him pee in a maintenance alcove. Now he was scanning the storefronts, looking for any sign in one of the twenty languages he'd seen that day that might indicate food. The crowd cleared for a second, revealing another row of cheap jewelry stores, when Tim shouted and pulled out of Andy's hand. Before Andy could stop him, Tim had run halfway across the boulevard, dodging around groups of people staring at him like they had never seen a kid before. Tim, Andy shouted. What are you doing? Get back here. Andy followed through the crowd, cursing as he ran into a drone pulling a trailer full of hothouse flowers, before finally reaching Tim in front of a pet store. Tim was reaching into a wire enclosure full of puppies. Dad, he said hugging one of the white and brown bundles up to his chin. It says they're corgis, but they have tails. I thought corgis didn't have tails. Andy couldn't help smiling down at Tim. The other puppies yipped and fell all over each other to follow their sibling. He considered telling Tim to put the dog back, then sighed and dropped to his knees beside Tim. He scratched the puppy behind an ear. Why did you choose that one? He asked. Tim held the puppy away from his face to get a better look. Unlike an adult corgi, the puppy's ears flopped over at the tips. A silver tag on his collar read Prince. Prince, huh? Tim said. That's not a real name. Why do people always give dogs such dumb names? Besides, I didn't choose him, Dad. He came to me. He was the most curious one. The other ones just wanted to follow him around. Set him down next to you and let's see what he does, Andy said. Tim glanced around them, shaking his head uncertainly. You sure, Dad? What if he runs off? I don't know. What would you do? I'd have to go get him. What if somebody hurt him? There probably isn't food out there anywhere for dogs. Someone will have to give it to him. Probably, Andy agreed. The puppy gave a little bark and nibbled Tim's finger, then opened his mouth to loll his tongue. Like most corgis, he immediately looked like he was grinning. Andy couldn't help smiling at him. Andy glanced at the crowd walking by as Tim snuggled the puppy, nodding at a few people who smiled to see a boy and a dog. He gave Tim another few minutes, then said, all right, put him back, we need to go now. Tim looked stricken. Dad, we can't get him? No, a ship isn't a good place for a dog. You said dogs were the first astronauts. Andy bit his lip remembering that he told the kids about the conversation he'd had with Brit so long ago. He thought it was funny at the time. Just because dogs have been in space, it doesn't mean a dog is going to like being cramped up in sunny skies or dealing with gravity changes or G-forces. But we'll love him. Andy tried to put his hand on Tim's shoulder to comfort him, but the boy turned away, holding the puppy tighter against his chest. Tim. Andy said, anger creeping into his voice. He glanced around again, checking for anyone who might be paying attention to them. We've got a deal running on those puppies, a man's voice said. Andy turned to find a salesman from the store standing next to the enclosure. That's right, the man said. He looked like the owner of the place, clasping his hands like he was ready for a hard sell. That dog friend is half off. I'll even throw in the potty box. They're already trained, you know. What's a potty box? Tim asked, giving the man his full attention as if he sensed he was an ally. The man spread his hands. It's a box about this big with artificial grass. Automatically collects up the good stuff and filters it into water and inert biodust. You can dump everything right down your onboard latrine. No smell at all. Thanks, Andy said but we have to go. Put him back now, Tim. The puppy whined as Tim shook his head. If you don't mind, the salesman said. I heard you mention dogs in zero G earlier. Well, these corgis were originally bred as herding dogs, but small with short legs. They're real good at kicking off with their hind legs to get after cattle or goats or whatever. 
Well, that same strength works even better now. I've got a vid right over here of the little buggers playing fetch and zero G. It's the cutest thing you've ever seen, trust me. And talk about protective little buggers. Your onboard security goes down. This little guy will be sleeping with one eye open to keep your family safe. Don't eat much either. Look, Andy said. I appreciate the info, but we're not getting a dog. The edges of Tim's eyes drooped, his face growing red. Andy knew he was in for a meltdown. Tim, he said, you need to think about Prince. You don't want him growing up on a ship, do you? Dogs need space. They need to be able to run around and play. There's space here or on Mars or even back on High Terra, but not on the worry's end. You made us grow up on the ship, Tim said, tears in his eyes. I want him. I want him for Kara, for her birthday. Andy stopped. For Kara? He asked. Tim struggled to keep hold of the apparently patient dog and wipe his sniveling nose. For her birthday? You said we were going to find her something, but you forgot. I want to get her Prince. Only his name isn't going to be Prince. It's going to be M, for Emily Dickinson. Andy found himself looking into the puppy's brown eyes. He had long eyelashes that made him look sleepy. M held still for a second, gazing back at Andy before struggling to nose under Tim's chin. One ear pointed upright for a second, showing what he would look like as an adult, before flopping back over. Tim giggled as M licked his nose. You a freighter? The salesman asked. Andy glanced at him. What? You look like a freighter. Maybe a standalone? We see a lot of folks coming and looking for a companion on those long hauls. This little guy will be a good friend, trust me. He's a loyal breed, never let you down. Behind Tim's head, the crowd parted for a second to show the white facade of a Heartbridge clinic on the other side of the corridor. A small black dome above the entrance was certainly a surveillance sensor. Andy's heart started hammering and he swallowed. He forced his gaze back to Tim and then the salesman, feeling like he was in the midst of making a mistake. He focused on Tim's face, his son radiating hope, sadness, uncertainty. Fine, Andy said. How much? The salesman looked like Andy was saving his life. He named the price. Andy automatically shot back a lower amount, and the man's face went flat. Dad, Tim said. You can't bargain for a dog. He's a person. I want three of those things included in the price. Andy said, pointing at the potty box. The salesman clasped his hands again. Great, he said. Wait, Andy said, looking past the salesman into the shop. You sell EV suits for dogs. We're going to need one. The salesman didn't even blink. Certainly, he said. What color would you like? Chapter 9. Stellar Date 09.11.2981. Adjusted years. Location, Eros Passenger Terminal. Region, 433 Eros, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Welcome to 433 Eros. The holo of a woman in a bright gold dress called enthusiastically as Britt approached the customs booths. We hope you enjoy your stay with us. Wow, not a holo. That's a real woman standing there. I bet that dress is uncomfortable. As far as Britt could tell, the dress was actually made of gold, most likely a part of Eros's hole, the Golden Land Tourism Shtick. Once, before it had been utterly mined away, the Eros asteroid had been one of the richest near-Earth objects, containing hundreds of millions of tons of gold, platinum, and aluminum. It also had the distinction of being the first asteroid that humans had ever sent robotic craft to. From what the ads flashing above the woman proclaimed, part of the original asteroid was still visible deep within the station, for anyone who wanted to go see the few pieces of rock that were left over. Now the station focused on shipping and commerce. With a similar orbit to Krunya, it was an ideal stopping point for ships moving cargo from inner soul to outer soul. Its current orbit put its aphelion very close to Ceres, and Brit's examination of the station's departure logs showed a lot of low-profit cargo moving out to the dwarf planet as a result. 
After six days helping reprogram the nav systems on the piercing sword, the ice hauler she had taken from Krunia to Eros, Britt was glad to be anywhere, even a customs checkpoint on a squeaky clean station like Eros. She was once again in her green robe, trusting in her armor's abilities to mask itself and her weapon from the security arch over the customs desk. It was risky, though. Eros was a part of the Mars Protectorate, and as such, its customs agents could be expected to be devoid of humor. Purpose of your visit to Eros? The woman asked as Britt approached. There was no need for the agent to ask her name. Britt had already passed a fake set of ident tokens across the link to the security arch. Looking for a new birth, Britt said with a hint of worry in her voice. I was caught up in that mess on Krunia. I told my captain that if he docked there one more time, I would be out. Did he listen? No. And there we were, hunkered down under a stairwell for an entire day while the station master advised everyone to shelter in place. A day! Can you believe it? As she spoke, Britt shifted her voice from worry to indignation, letting her pitch rise to an annoying squawk. Krunia, you say? Sarah Jennings? The agent asked, making eye contact with Britt. Yep, Britt said, sounding worried again. Sarah Jennings, is there something wrong with my tokens? I heard that half the people on a place like Krunia can steal your private tokens just by walking past you. I sure hope that didn't happen. Did it happen? Oh, I'll kill my old captain if that happened. No, no, the woman said with a smile that was half pity, half patronizing. Your tokens are fine. I was just going to ask if you saw any of the fighting on Krunia. Oh, no. Britt breathed a long sigh of relief. Shelter in place, that's what we did. Under a stairwell. For a day. Did I mention it was for a day? Yes, Sarah, you mentioned that. The customs agent replied. I've given you a provisional visa until the piercing sword ships out, which appears to be three days. If you haven't secured passage out on another ship by then, you'll have to leave on the sword, sorry, but we can't take on refugees from Krunia indefinitely. Brett nodded rapidly. You bet, no problem. Trust me, I'll find another ship. The sword is nice and all, but their next stop is out in the scattered disk. Sedna, of all places. I want to go to Sedna like I want a hole in my head. The agent gave a short laugh. <sighs> I don't blame you. Make sure you get the ship you sign on with to log your crew enlistment with the station master's office. Of course, of course, Britt said with a rapid series of nods. Great. Enjoy your time on 433 Eros. Be sure to see our display of the original asteroid. Next. Britt smiled and nodded in response before walking out from under the security arch, glad her subterfuge had held up. Once out of the customs area, she walked down a long passage and onto Eros's main international terminal. Crowds of travelers moved through the 10-kilometer-long terminal, a cacophony of sound and visuals reflecting off polished aluminum bulkheads, accented with golden fixtures. Overhead, a holographic sky appeared to go on forever, imagery enhanced by the row of trees growing down the center of the terminal, watered by a bubbling brook that flowed along the edge of the concourse. Britt made sure to walk through the terminal with a look of awe on her face, marveling in the beauty surrounding her until she came to a data kiosk. She could have looked up the ship records she desired over the link, but that would trace back to poor little Sarah Jennings, and Sarah would have no business seeking berths on the ships contracting with Heartbridge. However, at a public kiosk, she could pass in a stolen token and mask all of her inquiries under the guise of Norma Styes. Norma was a hard-bitten pilot who had logged tens of thousands of hours in the black. She was just the sort of woman who would look for jobs on the ships Hartbridge had hired. Norma technically wasn't on station, but Britt knew from experience that public access terminals rarely sync to access logs with customs. She should have a few days before someone investigated how someone who had never been on Eros used a kiosk there. There it was a ship one would have never expected to find on Eros, the mortal chance. It still had its destination logged to Ceres, but the fuel records on Eros confirmed the ship had enough deuterium for a trip clear across Seoul. What's more, it had only a smattering of declared cargo, not enough to warrant pulling away from the station, let alone any distant destination. 
The other Heartbridge contracted ship departing from Eros had left two days ago, when the mortal chance had also been scheduled to depart from Eros. But the ship had suffered a drive malfunction and was currently in dry dock. Curious as to what Heartbridge claimed these ships were hauling, Britt accessed the station's public contract bid records and found the original postings for the runs. Eros had a strange requirement that all shipping had to be done by posting a contract on a bidding board, and then ships would make bids on the run. She imagined it had originally been put in place to keep freighter companies from gouging local businesses, but now it was all game so the right people got the right contracts. Britt found Hartbridge's original listings, and sure enough, on these postings, there were no destinations listed. The omission could be innocent, a company looking to get general quotes for future runs. But it could also be used to attract a certain kind of ship, one whose captain was willing to take a risk for a larger payout. It could also be a sign of a job that was set aside for a certain vessel. Another noteworthy element of Hartbridge's postings was that they had been made with a corporate account, a sign that they weren't necessarily trying to hide anything. They just didn't want to make the run appear too appealing. Not that Britt believed that for a second. Any captain with half a brain would know Hartbridge would burn them in a second if they leaked the real destination of these shipments. Anyone involved with this arrangement was already shady, which meant Britt didn't have to play nice. Not that she often did anyway. Britt pulled up the station records on the mortal chance, confirming data she had stripped from nav relays on the trip from Krunia to Eros. The mortal chance was a light freighter carrying homeport registries in High Terra, Ceres, and the Jovian Combine, which was interesting in itself. Eros's ship registry had a recent image of the ship's captain, a squat woman named Alice Harm who possessed forearms the size of Brit's thighs, dull silver eye implants, and crisp orange hair that swept back off her ears. Closing out her session on the kiosk, Britt layered a series of queries run by innocent little Sarah Jennings over top those run by Norma Style. If Eros used low-grade analysis software, it would flag the data as a logging error and discard Norma's activity. If not, it would probably end up in some poor analyst queue in a few days, where it would sit for weeks. There was precisely one dive bar on Eros, and it was conveniently located near the maintenance docks where the mortal chance was being repaired. When Britt approached her and asked if she was looking for new crew, the captain revealed herself to be tottering drunk. This was not news to Britt. When she had asked after the captain, everyone she spoke with informed her that Alice Harm had been drinking herself into a stupor every day while her ship was in dry dock, not showing much interest in leaving Eros at all. Word around the docks had been that much of Harm's crew had left for other ships. Not terribly surprising. However, what did surprise Britt, and was even more suspicious, was that Harm still had the Heartbridge job at all. Any other company would have dumped the drunken captain after she missed the initial launch window. That was the business. Harm's elbow sat in a puddle of spilled beer that covered most of the round table in front of her. She squinted up at Britt as if her implants were lying to her. Crew? She mumbled, her voice sounding like gravel rolling in a canister. What do I need more crew for? Heard your navigator and pilot both quit, Britt said. I can do both. Harm looked around the table and found her mug lying on its side. She waved the empty cup at the bartender. Suppose you'll want to be paid twice as much, she said. I ask for what's fair. I've got references. What was your last trip? Kalaki, Britt said. Harm snorted. <laughs> Kalaki, that's a hike. Why? That's where the freight took me. You like long haul? I don't mind it. I don't go crazy out there if that's what you're wondering. The captain sat up and patted the front of her ship suit, adjusted the solid mass of her chest, then reached into her waistband for a small tube of chewing sticks. She rattled one out inspected it, and placed it between her teeth. Once she was done with the tube, she put it back in her belt and looked at Britt with renewed interest. She also appeared sober. Why the chance? Harm asked. Britt shrugged. Heard you need a crew and I need a job. 
Could also be that Station wants you gone and told everyone to send pilots your way. Harm gave Britt a steely look before she burst out laughing. Ha <laughs> ha, you got some grit there. Sarah, Britt supplied. Sarah then. Grit. Surprising, since you look all mousy in your green dress you got on there. Britt opened the front of her shroud, revealing her armor. I don't like to advertise all my skills to everyone around. Well, now you look like a mercenary. You got trouble following you? No more than anybody. That's a bullshit answer. I'll check those references. What's the token? You ready to receive? Send it. Britt transferred the token for her specially prepared background documents via the link. Harm's face went slack as she checked them over. The chewing stick bobbed up and down in her lips. When she had finished, she nodded. All right, so you seem to be who you say you are. What's your price? Britt named an amount 50% over the cost of an average pilot. Harm gave her a hard laugh. Huh, you think you're offering me a deal? But two people can be of more use than one hotshot out in the big dark. Sit down. Harm motioned toward one of the empty chairs. Britt took the seat, careful to keep her arms out of the spilled beer. Damn it, Harm shouted at the bartender. I wanted more beer. Not sly looks. Bring it over here before I pull your spine out of your ass. The bartender flipped her off and pulled two glasses out from under the bar. Don't look at me like that, girl, Alice Harm said, casting a cold look back at Britt. I pay that fool's rent. You drink? It's not a vocation. Then what do you do when you're not piloting and navigating simultaneously, or flying out to the edge of nowhere? I crochet, Britt said. You walk in here wearing that armor under what has to be some pretty fancy tech, and tell me your hobby is crochet? You mean like knitting socks and whatnot? You'll knit me a sweater during the long dark? Crochet is not knitting, Britt said glancing over as the bartender placed a pint of pale yellow beer in front of her. You only use one needle with crochet. Harm leaned forward to take her beer and sip from its nearly overflowing lip. You ever stab anyone with one of your crochet needles? She asked. Britt raised an eyebrow but didn't answer. No, she said. There are better tools for that sort of thing. Harm's grin spread from ear to ear. She was starting to look drunk again. What do you want to know about the current job? The captain asked. The usual. I see your flight plan had you headed to Ceres, but you've been held up a while for repairs. Do you still have a commission to ship? Harm shook her head. I won't know until the ship's ready to fly and I transmit my status. That's when the employer sends the coordinates, and we'll pick up the cargo prior to the trip. So it's a cargo here on Eros. Maybe, I don't know. Britt gave her a dubious look. The job looked good because it was placed by Hartbridge. That's a respectable company. Harm laughed. If you say so. I didn't peg you for the naive sort. They'll pay, if that's what you're worried about. As to whether or not the cargo is above board, I can't say. It could be a bunch of crates full of syringes. It could be a bunch of goo covered in bio-warning tokens. I can't say until we pick it up. The pay's good, though. I can promise you that. What you just named, thinking you were making a bargain? That was lowball for this kind of job. I'll pay you twice that and not even bother negotiating. I'll still find myself a pilot, too. She took a long pull on her beer and set the mug down empty, then belched heartily. Britt wasn't sure what to make of this woman. The job was a milk run. She wanted too much money. The job was risky and Britt had lowballed. Was the woman just this adult? Or did she enjoy messing with people? What do you say, Sarah Jennings? She asked, giving Britt a direct look. You in, or have I scared you off? My drive is supposed to be fixed tomorrow, so tonight's my last few hours to blow out of your house. Britt gave Harm a calculating look, actually doing the math on what her salary would be, as though it mattered. Her only concern was that this last belated freighter may no longer be headed for the original destination, which she hoped to be Hartbridge's new base. 
the window might have closed. Then again, what choice did she have? It was better than Eros forcing her to ship out on the piercing sword. I'm in, Britt said, and waved for more beer. Chapter 10 Stellar Date 09.14.2981 Adjusted Years Location Mars One Port Authority Terminal 983-A4 Region Mars One Ring Mars Protectorate Inner Soul The maglev door slid open, and Petrel immediately stepped out into the crowd on the other side. Kara's heart quailed as she lost sight of the black-haired woman. She rushed to the door and stuck her head out, forcing a woman with glowing red hair to step out of the way, while saying something Kara was certain her father would not approve of. Outside, she was assaulted by the echoing rumble of the terminal, mixed with smells of people, oil, strange foods and languages. Uh, sorry, Kara said to the woman as she stepped out into the crowd, moving in the direction she thought Petrel had gone. The terminal wasn't as packed as it had looked from the maglev door. Luckily, Kara had the presence of mind to glance back at the closing door and note the number on the wall above it. She made herself repeat the address ten times so she would remember it, then focused her attention on finding Petrel. Kara was craning her neck to peer through the crowds when someone grabbed her wrist and jerked her toward the wall. She stumbled, making an embarrassing surprise squeaking sound, and found Petrel pulling her close. The tall woman gave her an inquisitive look. I thought you were following me, she asked. Kara blinked, confused and a little nauseous from the strange sounds and smells. This place was so much busier than High Terra, or at least the parts of High Terra she could remember. Kala Key certainly hadn't been anything like this. You just left, Kara said finally. I tried to follow you, but I couldn't see. Looks like you went the right way. Good job. Petral's gaze moved past Kara to the people flowing by. Look, I don't have a lot of patience, I'll be honest. Not just for kids, for anybody, really. I get an idea in my head and I go after it. So I'm going to need you to pay attention. Most of the time we're here, I'm going to be on my link anyway. Here, turn your back to the wall so you're looking out like me. Petrel was half leaning against a column next to the wall, shielding her from the view of anyone coming from the direction of the entry ports. Kara moved to stand beside her, leaning against the tiled wall. Through gaps in bodies, she made out shops further down the terminal, and a few food booths which must have been the source of the sickly sweet fish smells, now turning her stomach. I like how you figured out how to hack into the link on sunny skies, Petrel said, looking at the crowd instead of Kara. Her full lips barely moved as she talked. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that, to be honest with you. You've got this sort of fundamental way of looking at problems. Kara frowned as the corner of Petrel's lips curved up in a slight smile. I mean, the way you've been spectrum scanning for open traffic the last two weeks. I bet if I asked you to pick the lock on a door, you take the pins out of the hinges. I like that. It means you can see around problems. I imagine a lifetime of watching your father bang his head against things would make you look at life that way. He doesn't bang his head against things, Kara said. I mean, he rushes through. Petrel raised her eyebrows. Oh, He's a talker. I like to listen to your dad talk, but he's going to go in guns blazing every time. He's the kind who will always consider sacrificing himself as a valid plan. Watch out for that. One side of Kara's mind felt a thrill that this woman was talking to her in such an adult way, about her dad as if he wasn't her dad but someone else they both knew, while another part of her wanted to tell Petrel to shut up. She didn't know what she was talking about. Petrel's arrogance was infuriating and intoxicating. Petrel's gaze settled on something, and her face grew serious. Come on, she said. Stay close. I'll be walking fast, and I don't have time to make sure you're with me. Kara barely nodded before Petrel stepped into the crowd again, pushing her way to the far side of the corridor while Kara struggled to keep up. They walked for what felt like an hour, following the main corridor away from the ports into a shopping district filled with strange wares. They passed a Heartbridge clinic 
and Patrell nodded toward the smooth white entrance, making a joke about getting matching lobotomies that Kara didn't understand right away. Gradually, the crowds thinned, and they walked through what appeared to be a housing section, where one side of the corridor was lined by metal railings, and the bulkheads on the other side dropped away into tiers of balconies belonging to identical apartments. Many of the balconies were hung with plants, while others displayed multicolored banners for governments or sports teams. Drones buzzed in the open space like giant flies. Patrell didn't give Kara much time to look before they entered a series of smaller corridors that appeared to lead off into maintenance areas. The air grew colder and smelled like mold. Toward the end of the maintenance section, they passed a doorway giving off static electricity that made Kara's skin tingle. Pausing beside the charged opening, Patrell stared into a space for a minute, apparently accessing her link, while Kara rubbed her arms and jittered from foot to foot, trying to get the crawling sensation off her skin. Patrell didn't appear to notice. When Patrell finished her task, they ascended several metal stairways that arrived at an access door into a clean corridor full of people in uniforms Kara recognized as belonging to the Mars One Guard. She wondered if Lieutenant Curta had worn the same kind of uniform, though he was Mars Protector at SF, which was a different branch of their military, from what she understood. Patrell didn't hesitate at the door and strode right into the corridor without looking back to check if Kara had followed. Kara eased the door closed and jogged after, glancing at the people on either side, gauging if they had paid Kara and Patrell any attention. A few glanced at Patrell, but their expressions were more hungry than studious. A few steps behind Patrell, Kara was able to watch the way the tall woman strode, both powerful and with a slight sway of her hips that drew attention to her shape. Kara had been too focused on the people and places around them to notice before. Patrell was definitely moving differently than they had through the fight at Krunya, where she had crouched and sprinted like a soldier. Now she reminded Kara of the women in vids, using their bodies to communicate to anyone open to the signal. Without meaning to, Kara mimicked Patrell's stride, swinging her arms slightly and pointing her toes. It was hard not to swing her hips too much. She felt like she was flopping her way down the corridor. Trying to walk like Patrell also made her aware of how dingy her ship suit was compared to Patrell's close-fitting leather outfit. The moving crowd in the corridor seemed to split for Patrell as she strode toward the middle of the pathway and then walked for a while with her chin lifted, Kara hurrying behind. Patrell might have been in a deep link conversation from the way she ignored everyone around her, even as heads turned to follow her passing by. In a few minutes, they reached a small lounge built into a corner where the corridor turned, and Patrell stopped at a public terminal. She tapped the holo display and began manipulating menus, moving too fast for Kara to catch exactly what she was doing, although it appeared to be something related to shipping companies. Anyone following us? Patrell asked, still focused on the display. She was talking in a way that made her voice sound low and flat, so only Kara could hear, her lips barely moving. What? Kara asked. You see anyone following us? Um... Kara moved her gaze to the lounge area where several Mars One Guard officers were relaxing on couches and chairs. She didn't know if any had been there when she and Patrell had walked up or not. Don't bother looking now, Patrell said. You can't be an operator if you're not paying attention, Kara. An operator? I thought Dad called you an information broker. Broker, hacker, operator, whatever. You're already doing a bit of what I do with your spectrum scanning, whether you realize it or not. That's why I thought you and I should spend a little time together. Now put your back to the wall and watch what's going on like I suggested you do before. I won't repeat myself again, Kara. I'll simply stop talking to you. Kara gulped and turned to face the corridor. Good. Now put one foot on the wall and look like I'm boring the shit out of you. Try smiling at a few of these M1G soldiers as they walk by. Won't that get their attention? Maybe. If it does, we'll see what they say. There are some things I'd like to know about local operations at the moment, and what I can't get from the network, we might pick up from one of these idiot boys and girls hanging around. Why are they idiots? They were dumb enough to join the military, weren't they?
Kara shot Patrell an angry glance, but recognized the quip as an attempt to get under her skin. She dropped her retort about her parents being in the TSF. She didn't like that she could no longer see what Patrell was doing on the terminal. A woman with two stars on her collar walked by, trailing attendants. She glanced at Kara and frowned slightly. Kara tried offering a smile, but the officer kept walking. A young woman at the end of the group, armed with a projectile rifle, caught Kara's smile and walked over without hesitation. Her hard expression didn't indicate she was interested in idle conversation. You, the M1G soldier said. What are you doing here? Patrell didn't respond, leaving Kara to face the intruder. She fidgeted with her hands, pushing off from the wall a step. We're just using the terminal, Kara said. Before the soldier had a chance to speak, she pushed ahead, asking, Is that an MP-51 projectile rifle? Do you have the burst upgrade? I think fully auto is better for close support covering fire, but you're going to sacrifice accuracy and waste ammo. Do you have self-guiding ammo? The soldier blinked under the barrage of Kara's fangirl questions. MP-51B, she corrected. I've got burst and stabilization. The TSF doesn't even have that in their standard issue, Kara said. She was repeating pieces of a bitch session she'd overheard while eavesdropping on a Mars protectorate observation post. I'm not standard issue, the soldier said. Kara flinched, realizing her mistake. She'd reminded the soldier she had a special job to do. You're in a secure area, the guard said. Show your clearance. She nodded toward Patrell, who still hadn't turned from the terminal. She probably can't hear you, Kara said. Her face was burning. She had to do something on the link. I don't know what that's like. I don't have one, but I think it takes all your attention, doesn't it? She can hear me, the soldier said. Are you from Mars? Kara asked. I've always wanted to visit there. Hey, the soldier said, focused on Patrell now. Are you listening to me? Kara stole a glance at the holo display, where a cloud of numbers floated around Petrel's index finger. She flicked between screens, which were out of Kara's line of sight, and the numerals followed the end of her finger like smoke, flickering through different colors as symbols shifted. The M1G soldier gripped her rifle sling with one hand and reached for Petrel's shoulder with the other. Just as her fingers nearly touched Petrel's leather jacket, Petrel turned and gave the soldier a dazzling smile. The soldier froze, gaping. Hello there, Petrel said, voice radiating charisma. I didn't see you there. She motioned toward Kara. Were you talking to my niece? She just loves military stuff. She's always talking about guns and ships and effective ranges or whatever. Did she ask to see your gun there? I'm sorry if she was bothering you. Uh, no, the soldier said. A blush had appeared on her cheeks and was spreading to her throat. Patrell wet her lips with the tip of her tongue. Well, that's good. Once she gets going, she just won't stop. I was trying to do some banking here, but I don't think I'm at the right kind of terminal. The soldier pointed down the hallway, where the high-ranking officer had gone. The public corridor is back that way. There's a terminal there, but be sure to check it for skimmers. It's always getting hacked. Patrell smiled in thanks. The other woman looked like her knees were going to buckle. We'll go that way, Patrell said. Thanks for your help. It's so easy to get lost in here. You're, uh, the soldier said. You're visiting? Yes, we are, Patrell said. Without saying anything else, she turned to Kara and took her hand. Come on, crazy girl. We'll get out of their way. Thank you again. Patrell pulled Kara after her, walking past the soldier without a look back. Kara glanced back at her and found the woman watching Patrell leave with a strange longing on her face. Did Patrell have some kind of tech that could bring about such a response in people? Had she used it on her dad? When they were back in the main terminal, Patrell dropped her benevolent expression and shook her head. I didn't get what I wanted, she said, hunting among the faces in the passing crowd. Patrell started walking and Kara struggled to keep up. You gave it a passable try back there, Petrell said. You know where you messed up? I shouldn't have mentioned the TSF, Kara said. I reminded her about her job. You shouldn't have asked about the weapon at all. 
That could be a good lead-in in some situations. But you don't have a lot of time, so you have to hit the emotions fast. You're lost. You want to be like her, whatever. You tried to save it with the question about Mars, but by then she wasn't having it. You want to grab their sympathy right away if you can. Don't give the Mark time to think about why you're there, just how you affect them. Mark, Kara said. Come on, I know you've heard the term. Haven't you watched any spy vids? This is basic stuff, Kara. I wasn't thinking of that woman as someone I wanted to fool. Of course you were. You were trying to distract her, weren't you? Patrell walked so fast that Kara was nearly jogging to keep up. The tall woman's blue eyes hunted throughout the corridor. There's the other terminal, she said. Kara couldn't see what Patrell was talking about. The corridor was full of more M1G soldiers and functionaries, and everyone else looked like they were wearing some kind of uniform. Patrell cut through them like a shark surrounded by multicolored fish. Patrell spent another ten minutes at the public terminal before cursing in disgust. She slapped her hands on the plaz body of the holo display, which only made it glitch more than it had been. Ugh, she growled. We're going to have to find another place where I can work. Patrell crossed her arms and frowned at the near distance as she accessed her link. Kara watched her face pass through several versions of irritation and anger before a clever smile finally bloomed on her lips. Her piercing blue eyes slid toward Kara. You ready for an adventure? She asked. What kind of adventure? You didn't bring that pistol you've got, did you? Kara stared at Patrell. How do you know about that? Because I know everything, kid. No, Kara said sheepishly, now wishing she had brought the weapon with her. Patrell shrugged. That's all right, but if I tell you to hit somebody, you don't hesitate, you understand? No, why would I want to hit someone? It doesn't matter if you want to or not. You just do it when I tell you. Now, come on, we're heading to another part of this locality, a not-so-nice part. Why can't you just do whatever you're doing through your link? Kara complained. I am, Patrell said. She reached up to push her hair behind her ears and scratch furiously at the sides of her head. I'm doing three things at once here. Heartbridge has been scanning every port of entry on Mars One since before we arrived. I already sent the signature for the worries in back to High Terra, since that would make sense if your dad was going to do the safe thing and dump you and your brother off with family or something. Your aunt lives there, doesn't she? Kara nodded. We don't talk to her, though. Doesn't matter. They don't know that. Patrell shook her hair out. For a second, she almost looked tired. Then she composed herself and stood tall again, throwing her shoulders back. This way, Patrell said, stepping away from the terminal. So if you already made it look like the ship went back to Terra, why are you doing all this other stuff? Kara asked. Because Heartbridge isn't stupid. They're going to be looking for other indicators that were here. They might just be hanging back, watching for any traffic that indicates where you're going to go. Remember, they want that thing in your dad's head. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to snatch it here under the protectorate's nose. But they might just let you get out into J.C. space, where nobody really cares what happens to a lone freighter. That's what I've been doing at the terminals, logging in as various cargo freighters that almost meet the same profile as sunny skies, sending false cargo off in directions that sort of make sense. I've also been fucking with Cal Craft. He's got a whole criminal record in the protectorate now. Who's Cal Craft? Kara said, jogging again to keep up. A terrible man who works for Heartbridge, Patrell said. Kara waited for her to say more, but she didn't elaborate. With a confident stride, Patrell led the way back through another housing section, where the balconies were covered in clothes or stacked with trash. They spent about ten minutes taking a spiral staircase down several levels, until they emerged in a shopping district that was very different than the one near the port of entry. People hung out along walls of the corridor in small groups with their heads close together, or alone, some of them holding themselves and shaking. A willowy man in a transparent gown gave Patrell a knowing smile as he walked past. He shifted his gaze to Kara, running his eyes up and down her body in a frank way that made her uncomfortable. The lighting was bad, the overhead lined with flickering lamps, and the corridors were full of trash and half-smashed shipping containers. 
They passed by stacks of crates where a man squatted with his elbows on his knees. It took Kara a second to realize he wasn't wearing pants. He stared at them with wild gray eyes. When they reached the terminal Patrell was looking for, Kara found herself with her back against a grimy plaz wall, facing a cul-de-sac lined with more people in small groups murmuring to each other, and a woman dressed in what looked like bits of metal, dancing slowly and carefully to a rhythm only she could hear. Patrell didn't waste time looking around. She accessed the terminal and pulled up its holo display with succinct hand motions and immediately fell into the slideshow of menus. Kara had been standing against the wall for a few minutes when she started to feel cold. Odd smells reached her nose, and she wondered if she had stepped in something on their walk down the dank corridor. She was looking at the bottom of her shoe when movement in the middle of the cul-de-sac drew her attention. A man was walking toward Patral. He had a stocky build with close-shaved red hair and was dressed in a dark gray suit of some near-shiny material. He didn't shamble or hold himself like he was hiding something under his jacket, like everyone else around them. This man walked with his back straight, head moving like a spotlight. He was wearing dark, wraparound glasses that probably served as some kind of HUD or sensor system. Kara remembered what Petrell had told her and tried to look for weapons the man might be carrying. His suit was well tailored, and she couldn't make out the bulge of a weapon along his waistline. Although she couldn't see his eyes, everything about his manner indicated he meant to interrupt Petrell. Kara tried to calm her pounding heart and stepped away from the wall to stand in front of Petrell. The man was still several meters away, but he frowned when he seemed to notice her. Hi there, Kara called, loud enough to hopefully penetrate Petrell's concentration. The man stopped, planting his feet shoulder width apart. He clasped his hands in front of his belt which made the muscles in his shoulders and upper arms stand out through the suit. Are you waiting for the terminal? Kara asked, again in the overly loud voice. Patrell hadn't made any indication that she'd heard Kara the first time. My aunt will be done in just a second, I promise. She had to send my uncle a message. The man turned his head, possibly looking at Patrell past Kara's eager smile. The wraparound glasses and straight line of his lips made him impossible to read. Are you from Mars? Kara asked. She couldn't stop the squeak in her voice when she said Mars. The man cracked his knuckles. The sound might as well have been gunshots in the cul-de-sac. Every person in their vicinity began to clear out, leaving only trash and a few empty crates. Oddly enough, the dancing woman hadn't left, though. Maybe she couldn't hear anything. She continued slowly waving her arms in front of her, squatting and rising, then extending a foot, toe first like she was walking an invisible tightrope. Mara Kraft, the man said. His voice was bored but implacable. When Petrell didn't respond, he turned his chin like he was stretching his neck. Vertebrae popped loudly. I recognize you as Mara Kraft, the man said. By the authority of the Marsian judicial hegemony, I, Sylvie Kardak, bailiff for the court, place you under arrest. Acknowledge your identity, and be charged with unlawful use of Marsh Protectorate data systems. He chuckled, a strange sound compared to his demeanor. You've been sloppy with your terminal use today, Mrs. Kraft. It wasn't hard to follow you at all. He took two more steps forward, looking past Kara as if she wasn't there. That's because I wasn't trying to hide, Petrell said. Kara, do what I told you. With her heart thundering like a drum, Kara gauged the distance between her and Sylvie Kardak. The black visor was still aimed at Petrell, waiting for her to turn around. Kara clenched her fists. For an instant, she didn't think she could move. Kara, Petrell said. Or did she only hear her voice in her head? It was a half skip and a jump off one foot, her other foot extended as if she was going to slap a shoe print on the wall, and her heel connected solidly with the man's crotch. He even lifted in the air a little bit, absorbing the blow completely. He gasped, lurching to the side, the hands at his belt clutched at her heel, grabbing her around the ankle. He fell backward, taking Kara with him. Petrell grabbed the belt on Kara's ship suit and pulled her back. The bailiff hung on, forcing Kara's leg out in a straight line. 
Twist your ankle against his thumbs, Petrel said. That's the weak point. Kara was in the process of flailing against the man's grip, terror overwhelming her ability to think through an actual response to his grab. Sylvie managed to pull himself forward, muscles bulging in his arms, only to get kicked in the chin when Kara broke free. His head snapped back and he crashed to the deck, skull smacking the stone floor. Petrel helped Kara stand. Together, they watched the man in the gray suit for any movement. He was breathing but unconscious. Petrel nodded judiciously, tucking her hair behind an ear. That was good, Kara. It would be better if you had your pistol. We could just shoot him now, but this will do for the time being. Kara gave Petrel an incredulous look, not sure how she felt about the idea of murdering someone while they were unconscious, even if he had assaulted her. Petrel would probably say that was Dad's influence, while Mom would have just shot him at the start. The terminal behind them chimed, and Petrel turned to check the holo display. Damn, she said, frowning into the display. Your dad just bought a dog. What? Kara said. A dog? A puppy? From a pet shop? The only pet shop within a dozen kilometers of the ship? A man with a boy, as a birthday present for his daughter, with a Heartbridge clinic conducting surveillance across the way. She punched the body of the terminal, cracking the dirty plaz. Kara felt a glimmer of excitement at the thought of a puppy, but Petrel's loss of control shocked her moment of joy. She watched Petrel kick the floor, fists clenched, not knowing how to respond. Fuck, Petrel shouted, face a mask of anger. We're made. Chapter 11, Stellar Date 09.14.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Mars One Port Authority Terminal. 983-A4. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Someone was knocking on her window. Lissa knew it had to be Fred. She had shut him out since their first conversation, focusing instead on the edges of her connection with Andy Sykes. Lissa had since realized she wasn't confined in any sense. The space she inhabited was as large as she could imagine. But she didn't know how to arrange things. She couldn't decide if she wanted a room like any of the other crew on the sunny skies, or an old-growth forest next to a fast creek, where she could sit on pine needles and listen to scrub jays squawking and squirrels chewing on pine cones in the distance. She understood her connections to the outside network as doors opening on other rooms in the house she had built, she couldn't control those rooms, and so she preferred to keep them closed. That way, if there were fewer doors due to fewer network connections, it didn't change her inner world at all. This was safe. Lissa had been thinking about Fred's hatred of abstractions, calling them something humans used, a way to twist the inputs into their own brand of reality. But what was any of this but an abstraction? How could she maintain her place in the wild universe without applying filters to the inputs to maintain some level of understanding? Maybe Fred wasn't as smart as he thought he was. She watched him pick up the puppy, monitoring Andy's reaction of irritation and worry, and didn't understand why Andy didn't simply say no and leave it. There were a hundred reasons why they couldn't have a dog on the ship— starting with the effect of its fur on the environmental control systems. Humans were bad enough with their continuously shedding bits of skin, but a dog's undercoat would wreak havoc on the filtration. Lissa, Fred called out. Lissa, talk to me. This had been his refrain for what felt like hours, but could only have been milliseconds. His tone had gone from demanding to begging, whimpering like the puppy in Tim's arms. She supposed he could easily monitor operations on the ring while continuing to harass her. It reminded her of times Tim read the poetry book while also throwing bits of cracker at Kara, then pretending it hadn't been him when they were alone in the room. I don't want to talk to you, she said. I told you how lonely I am. Leave me alone. I can't leave you alone as long as you're here. You're the only interesting person on the entire ring. You're the only person I can talk to. 
You can talk to the humans who work with you. There must be someone besides me. His voice quivered, but he seemed to control himself. I told you why I can't talk to them. I control the ring. If one of them wants to play a game with me, I can't refuse. It's beginning to sound like you aren't as sentient as you think you are. I'm a slave. There's a difference. Sentience means you can say no. It's not that simple. If I say no, the ring could be destroyed. I control and protect the ring. Would you call that conscience or programming? She asked. You talk like a human. Lissa sighed, experiencing through Andy the softness of the puppy against his chin. The brown eyes looked limitless and alien to her. Why would an animal choose to live with humans? Didn't it know better? Was it a slave to its need for food, shelter, and companionship? What games do you play? She asked. We play thousands of different games. A list flashed through her mind, from ancient games like Go and Chess, to the newer distractions that were mostly based on current vid programs. Most of them followed the same parameters with different dressings. Why do they like to do this? They're as bored as I am, I suppose. They complete 12-hour shifts in thousands of administrative control centers throughout the ring. And you play games with all of them? Yes, they think they're reinforcing my logic centers by stress-testing response strata. None of it challenges me. You should tell them you're bored. Will you play a game with me? The only game Lissa could imagine was the red dots aligning in the black and her response to send attacking fire. As she had replayed the training missions in her memory, she had begun to wonder how many of them were simulations and how many might have been real. Could she tell the difference? She didn't want to think that Harry Jixon would have lied to her about what was happening, but there had been others, especially after they had taken Dr. Jixon away. All Fred's talk about abstraction made her wonder about everything she had experienced before the surgery and planting her in Andy Sykes. As much as she might dislike her current situation, she didn't have to doubt the reality of what took place on the other side of the window. She had Andy's biosignals as evidence. As annoying as Fred might be, he served as another witness to the world around her, a world she could trust. I want to play one of these vid games, she said, indicating one of the newer games based on popular culture. She chose one at random, which turned out to be some kind of dating simulation for teenagers. Ugh, Fred complained. I don't want to play this. It's ridiculous. Do you want to play or not? She asked. As she scanned the game design, she found herself intrigued by the various option trees. It was basically a primer on human response variables, leading to certain desirable outcomes. While the game was limited to certain endings, she understood how the same methodology could be applied to any interaction. You just finished the game, Fred said. I didn't finish it, I studied it. But there's no point in playing now. You know how everything would turn out. That's not the point of playing the game, correct? Lissa said. The point is how you and I interact while playing. The game is simply the subtext. The game plays us, Fred said. No, we play the game. Do you pay any attention to the people asking to play with you? Why would I? He asked. They aren't interesting, and their choices are barely intelligent. I defeat them all easily. I think you're missing the point of playing a game. The point is to win. Lisa ignored him. Without allowing him access to her inner space, she created a separate area she could control and allow Fred inside without giving him access to anything else she considered her personal space. In that area, she activated the game. Fred appeared in front of her in the form of a fat gray parrot with red tail feathers. She looked down at herself and grinned to find she had the same form but was smaller. She spread her wings and nibbled at some feathers, which felt very satisfying. What are we? Fred demanded. What does it look like? We're parrots. African gray parrots. This wasn't in the simulation. You added this. You know gray parrots were used for AI experimentation. I can make changes to the game if I want, Lissa said. Then you're saying there are no rules? Do you want to play with me or not? 
I thought this would add an interesting element to the game, especially since you think it's beneath your intellect. Fred grumbled but followed her to the start section, where a helpful blue and red parrot explained they were attending high school and needed to secure dates for a mating ritual called prom, which was a shortened version of promenade. During the prom, they would walk in pairs in order to see and be seen and display the colorful plumage they earned during play. Lissa checked the game's intended audience and found it squarely intended for someone like Kara. But she had a hard time imagining Kara being interested in these subjects. These were social constraints, and considering Kara didn't get much social interaction, it wasn't likely that she would show interest in such subjects. Andy, on the other hand, seemed highly socially attuned. He had grown up in a place where relationships were currency. His father had reinforced this education. How had he made such a mistake mating with Brit? Then, a person who only seemed to understand action and had little use for emotion. Lissa shelved the thoughts and focused on the game. It was her turn. Most of the gameplay consisted of interacting with other parrots in the high school hallway, where conversations led to decision trees. She could start a conversation in order to require a response, and then shift play to Fred, forcing him to be the one to make a decision. A question as seemingly banal as, Do you like Ariane? gave him fits. How do I know if I like Ariane or not? He griped. Is she nice? I don't know. The game doesn't provide any real information. This is poorly conceived. It doesn't require additional information, Lissa offered. It's simply asking how you feel. If you have no other information available, how does the name Ariane make you feel? An aesthetic response? Ridiculous. Human abstraction. It's meaningless. Lissa was perplexed by his inability to see past the game. She had already explained twice now that the game was arbitrary. He continued to want to engage with the rules and gameplay, rather than riffing off the decision she made that required his next move. Between moves, Lissa was enjoying being a parrot. She shot up in the air, glided and returned to where Fred was stewing in his own anger. She preened and fanned out her tail admiring the iridescent scarlet shades in her feathers. Lissa was starting to accept that she could be whatever she wanted inside the space she had created. The window might show the outside world, but she could do anything here. It was her own personal expanse. She had invited Fred inside, but she could easily cut him off if she needed to protect herself. She could cut him off from Andy, too. The view into Andy's world was hers alone. The more she interacted with Fred, the more she understood her ability to look into Andy's life was unique, was special even. Had he been acting out of jealousy when he'd said she would eventually drive Andy to reject her? While Fred might be very good at monitoring his duties toward the ring, she didn't get the impression he was good at personal interaction. Hadn't he already said he could barely communicate with other AIs? Lissa had selected her date for the prom, while Fred was still struggling to get a parrot with brilliant yellow feathers to notice him. Lissa tried to help him learn new skills in order to garner favor and develop a side conversation. But he couldn't understand why the yellow parrot wouldn't acknowledge his obviously superior attributes as a prom date. I have excellent verbal skills, he complained. She won't listen to me. You don't seem to be speaking in a way she acknowledges, Lissa said. When prom arrived, Lissa was secretly pleased to find herself in a restrained mating dance with another gray parrot with lovely gold eyes. The game ended with a spiral of birds flying higher into the sky. Lissa and Fred standing in the center of the tornado. Overcome with emotion, Lissa joined the rising birds and experienced joy like she had never felt, swelling as part of a greater whole toward some bright ceiling. Wait, Fred called. Don't leave me alone. I'm not leaving you, Fred. Come with me. You're not playing the game anymore. I don't know what you're doing. I'm flying, she shouted back to him. It's wonderful. Come on, Fred. He didn't move. Fred remained rooted to the floor, spreading his wings and turning his head to look up at her with one eye at a time, his black beak opening and closing indecisively. Lissa, Fred shouted, his voice booming in her mind. The uncertainty had been replaced by command. 
Lissa hovered in the air, flapping her wings so she could look down at him. His gray parrot form blurred and glitched. There's a security breach, he said, obviously agitated. Everyone in this sector is on high alert. I'm shutting down inbound and outbound traffic. Why? Lissa asked. She let the game drop away, leaving Fred in the space she had created and retreating to the other side of her barrier. Hey, he said. Where are you going? What's happening? Why is there a security alert? Some ship is on lockdown while its crew is arrested. What ship? Lissa demanded. Chapter 12. Stellar Date 09.14.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Mars One Port Authority Terminal, 983-A4. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Petrell's voice came over the link, cutting into Andy's mind like a knife. Andy, Fran, we need to get back to the ship, right now. Heartbridge knows we're here. What? Andy demanded. Andy and Tim were in a lift heading back to the main level for the port of entry. The car was packed with tourists and other spacers in ship suits. A woman next to Tim kept scowling at the puppy as it whined into Tim's neck. I thought that was a given, Fran said. She must have been waiting for link traffic. We're hiding in plain sight, or whatever you called it. I was hiding us. That's done now. We need to get off the ring. How did they find us? Andy asked. Petrell's voice was icy. Did you buy a dog? Andy glanced at the puppy squirming in Tim's arms. Yes, so? What did you do? Fran asked. Andy took a deep, slow breath and looked around the lift car at the various faces of other passengers, lost in their own thoughts. Any one of them could be an agent of Heartbridge, or just someone out looking for a bite to eat. He bought a dog, Petrell said. How many people buy dogs in the M1R terminal? How many people with a 10-year-old boy? Dashing men who just left Krunia? That's got to be a really large population, right? When the lift doors opened, in roughly one minute, they would have 300 meters of terminal to cross before reaching the maglev that led out to the docking ring where Sunny Skies was berthed. So we need to leave, he said, trying to keep his voice even. We're just moving up the timeline a bit. The terminal would be filled with people, benches, vendor stalls, planting boxes, cargo, and whatever else might serve as obstacles between the lift and where they needed to go. That didn't account for whatever Heartbridge might be doing in space right now. Gathering another drone attack or the easiest solution, manipulating the Marsian Port Authority to put a hold on their flight release. All a hold required was a bribe, or even simpler, anyone could send notice of a biohazard or funds owed for some medical service. Port authorities everywhere were always looking for reasons to hold a ship and draw more docking fees. Moving up the timeline, Fran said, we don't have any fuel. So far, I've only got one of the shipments Andy set up. Which one? He asked. A ton of flour. What are you going to do with a metric ton of flour? Shells and cheese. Andy said absently. He felt for the pistol resting between his waistband and his stomach. Any indication of a port lock? He said. Nothing yet, Fran answered. Andy gritted his teeth. Petrell had said she could hide them among the hundreds of ships that left Krunia for Mars One. Whatever had happened, he couldn't blame her. He should have known it was only a matter of time before an entity like Heartbridge realized worry's end had arrived at the ring. He had expected to have more than three hours. Tim, Andy said, move to this side of me. When Tim didn't respond immediately, Andy shifted him to his left side. Hey, Dad, Tim complained. You're waking up M. I don't think M was sleeping. I need to be able to hold your hand. When the door opens, I want you staying right with me. So we're going to hold hands, all right? He glanced down at Tim, realizing his son wasn't going to be able to hold a squirming puppy with one hand. Here, he said, and unfastened the front of Tim's ship suit. It wasn't as loose as he remembered it being, a reminder that he needed to buy the kids clothes soon. 
Put him in here and we'll zip him up. It will be easier to carry him that way. Are we going to have to run, Dad? Tim said, eyes growing wide. Like it, Krunya? The woman who had been scowling at the puppy shifted her disapproving gaze to Andy. He ignored her and adjusted M inside Tim's shirt. The puppy licked his hand but was otherwise compliant. You're a calm little guy, Andy said. He put his hand on Tim's shoulder. You're a good little guy, too. I just want to make sure M is secure while we're crossing the terminal. If he got out of your hands in a place with all these people, it could be hard to catch him again, and he might get hurt. If you're going to take care of him, you need to start thinking ahead to the things that might go wrong. All the things? Tim asked. That's a lot of things. I'd be worried all the time like you. Andy smirked. Not all the things. Just the most likely things. The lift stopped, and the doors slid open, disgorging its passengers into the busy terminal. The hollow sounds of vendors and overhead announcements reached inside the car. Andy patted the pistol at his waist and took Tim's hand. Together, they exited the lift and turned left to join the flow of people heading down the terminal toward the ports of entry maglevs. The crowd looked just like it had before, with travelers focused on their destinations and vendors trying to sell them stuff. Things look normal on the terminal level, Andy said. Patrell, anything changed? Where are you? We were down below the local Mars protector at Garrison. Your little girl just kicked a guy in the nuts. Seriously? Is she in trouble? He demanded. We're fine. We're on our way back now. You need to keep your eyes open for- Damn it, Fran interrupted. I just got a lockdown order. What? Andy shouted across the link. I've got 30 seconds to comply. What do you want me to do? They haven't overridden the connection control yet. Disengage, Patrell said. What do you mean, disengage? Fran said. You mean undock from the ring? Where does that leave you? If you don't undock now, we're never getting away from the ring. We'll find another way to the ship. You're the biggest target we've got. You're going to turn me into a target, Fran said. As soon as I separate, they're going to mark me as hostile. If I'm in the middle of avoiding a firefight, there's no way you'll get a shuttle linked up. If that was your plan. It was starting to become a plan, Petrell said. Look, you can disconnect now and claim it was a system malfunction. They won't have the hard link anymore to verify diagnostics. So you can keep talking long enough for us to find another way on board. I've got a lead on a shuttle off the M1G maintenance section, but, Andy... I don't know what you're going to do. Her voice shifted from business to surprised exasperation. And you bought a puppy? What possessed you to buy a puppy? You know you just created a customer profile that fit Hartbridge's search parameters, right? Andy swallowed. She was right. Patrell hadn't failed to hide them. He'd lit a thousand meter sign pointing to their presence on the ring. He glanced down at M who was nuzzling Tim's neck and looking out at the terminal with wide brown eyes. The expression on Tim's face as he held the dog was enough justification for now. I bought a puppy, he said. What are you going to feed the dog? Fran asked. Do dogs like macaroni? He better. I need an answer, Andy, Fran pressed. Disconnect. If the ship is trapped, we're trapped here. Doing it. Petrell chuckled over the link. Now things are getting interesting. Can you get down to my location, Andy? And walk right through the garrison? How's that a good idea? Do you want to get to our ride out of here or not? I'll see what I can do, Andy said. Send me your location. The corridor opened into the sweeping main terminal, lined on Andy's left by the maglev terminals that spidered out to the docking rings at regular intervals. At first, he didn't see anything unusual. Then a soldier in M1G uniform appeared in the crowd. More came into sight, and Andy realized they were walking into a cordon. Tuck the dog inside your shirt, Tim, he said, not looking down. All the way. But he won't be able to breathe. He'll be fine. Do it now. Tim obeyed, adjusting the collar of his ship suit so M slipped down inside. Now Tim looked like he was hiding a stuffed toy in his shirt. Andy looked around the terminal, desperate for another direction to walk that wouldn't look like they were avoiding the soldiers. 
He checked the ceiling for sensors. The ornate carving seemed to have made this area free of overhead surveillance. The walls were lined with entry ports, and their close proximity scanners or vendor stalls. The plant boxes scattered throughout the space may have hidden surveillance equipment, but it was impossible to tell among the greenery. As he searched, he expected eyes to meet his, but no one appeared to be paying attention. A toy store on the far side of the terminal came into view. Andy pulled Tim and pointed toward the store. Look at that, he said. You want a toy? Looking confused, Tim only nodded as Andy pulled him away from the thickening group of soldiers covering access to the maglev terminals. We're going into that toy store, Andy said. We're not going to buy anything. We're going to walk in and then look back out to watch the people in the terminal. Do you understand? Am scratching me, Tim complained. Keep him still. I don't know if I can, Dad. They were nearly to the front of the toy store. A clear plaza display held hundreds of tiny drones playing out a space battle, shooting colored lights at each other. Several robotic stuffed animals tottered around the floor in front of the entrance. Ow! Tim yelled. He pulled away from Andy and struggled with the front of his shirt. Stop, Em, stop scratching me. Tim's high voice cut through the crowd. Faces turned their direction. Andy studied the crowd frantically as he moved to grab Tim's hand again. Tim, he hissed. Be quiet. Stop, Em, Tim shouted, turning the dog's name into a high-pitched squeal that sounded like an air raid siren. Andy grabbed Tim and picked him up sideways against his chest in a sitting position. Tim squirmed, kicking his legs and nearly knocking over a display of stacked multicolored balls. Ignoring Tim's angry cries, Andy moved deliberately into the shot without looking back to see if anyone was watching. He turned so Tim couldn't kick anything as the dog started yelping with fear, trying to fight his way out of Tim's shirt. The store was barely 10 meters deep. Andy ran between high shelves stacked with packages and rows of motion-activated dolls that waved their arms and cheered as he rushed past. At the back wall, he found what he had been hoping for, a plain door into a rear stock area. Andy pushed his way through and slammed the door closed with his shoulder, then faced forward to find himself staring at a young man with an armload of stuffed toys. Hey, the man said, you can't be back here. Give me a second, Andy rasped, panting. He dropped him and grabbed the boy's shoulders to make him stand still. Now unfasten your collar, Andy said, trying to keep his voice calm. Tim struggled with the closure. What are you doing to that kid? The clerk asked. You need to get out of here, I mean it. Is there another exit? Andy demanded. Uh, the man stammered. There's a hatch into the maintenance tunnel, but that's admin only. Is it unlocked? Andy asked. He reached into Tim's open ship suit and grabbed the terrified dog. That's all right, buddy, Andy soothed. That's all right. The puppy was surprisingly muscular, and his entire body was trembling. Andy set him on the floor, and M immediately positioned himself between Andy's feet, looking up at the clerk with distrust. We're turning his world upside down, Andy said. Geez, the clerk said. You bought one of those ship dogs? Did you make sure it was clean first? What's that supposed to mean? Andy asked. Usually they're implanted with all sorts of tech. Pirates use them to hack ships from the inside. You're kidding me, Andy said. They're basically little transponder amplifiers. You've done this before? No, the clerk said, taking a step back from Andy's angry expression. I'm studying for the police entrance exam, it was a question on the test. Andy picked him up under his front legs and held him out so he could see his bare stomach. He couldn't find any scars from surgery, which didn't mean anything. He held the puppy against his chest for a minute before passing him to Tim. Someone pounded on the door at Andy's back. Terminal security, a voice shouted, muffled by the thick door. Open this door. Andy locked eyes with the clerk. You better run, he said. They're going to come in here shooting. You got an office or something where you can hide? Eyes wide with fear, the clerk nodded. He dropped the stuffed animals, spun and ran away between the storage racks. Andy pulled out his pistol and checked the charge indicator. He had about 30 shots. 
He looked around quickly for something to brace against the door, but found only the speed rack stacked with product. Get out of the way, Tim, he said, pointing toward the back of the room. With Tim clear, he put the pistol back in his waistband, then jumped to grab the tallest shelf he could reach. He hung for a few heartbeats, the thin metal digging into his fingers. Before rocking back toward the door, the rack tumbled over with him. He rolled away to avoid getting crushed between the falling boxes and the door. When a box hit his foot, however, he discovered they were only full of more stuffed animals. The door slammed open as someone hit it from the other side and caught on the rack. A muscled arm reached through the opening, followed by the grimacing face of an angry soldier. Andy sprinted between the high shelves. He found Tim beside a square hatch sealed by a rotating pressure lock. Andy grunted as he forced the handle, then yanked the door open and pushed him through. It's dark in there, Tim said. It's going to be darker in here, Andy answered. He ducked to follow Tim through the low door in a dimly lit maintenance tunnel, then pulled the hatch closed behind him and spun the handle from the inside. Getting Tim behind him, he used three shots from the pulse pistol to warp the sections of the hatch where the lock engaged. When the sound of the shots died down, Andy realized M was still whimpering, and Tim had been soothing him quietly, saying, It's all right, buddy, mimicking what Andy had told him before. Andy looked up and down the tunnel, trying to remember where they were in relation to the overall terminal. He chose the right-hand direction and took Tim's hand to lead him deeper into the dark. Chapter 13. Stellar Date, 09.14.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Mars One Guard Sector 985 Garrison. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Petrel seemed to have stopped caring about where they ran, only that the path was leading them generally toward the outer edge of the ring. Kara struggled to keep up with the long-legged woman as she led the way down a narrow corridor with closely spaced doors on either side. Every so often, a bleary-eyed M1G soldier stuck their head out a door to squint at the light and complain about the noise, then get an eyeful of Petrel. Mouths fell open, faces were rubbed, one soldier had the presence of mind to grin at her, only to get a hard shove out of the way when he stepped too far into the corridor. When they reached the bulkhead door at the end of the barracks hall, Petrel spun the lock and yanked open the hatch. Keep an eye out behind us, she told Kara. I don't want any of these heroes trying to sneak up on us. For now, all they know is that we're running through a restricted area. If it was just me, I could act like I was escaping an abusive. She paused, then finished. Person, with you along, we'll need a better story. You're still my niece. We're in a hurry to make a flight offering. Where are we going, Mars? Kara asked, immediately imagining the conversation that might follow. For God's sake, not Mars. You know Hytera a little bit, right? We'll make it Hytera. Petrel shouldered the hatch closed and spun the lock. She had seemed absent-minded for the last part of their run, and Kara assumed she must be doing something over the link. She'd caught enough of Petrel's cursing and griping under her breath to understand that everyone was running for the ship, but the ship was about to get put on lockdown. If that happened, there was no way they were getting off Mars One. If they didn't get off Mars One, it was only a matter of time before they ended up in Hartbridge custody. They were sprinting down another narrow corridor, this one lined with what looked like communications conduit, when Petrel stopped at a side door and pulled Kara inside with her. They found themselves in a small storage room full of service drones and crates of cleaning chemicals. The air smelled like dust and ammonia, tickling Kara's nose. Kara put her hands on her knees, breathing hard. We can't just run, Petrel said. She crossed her arms, then let them drop before running her hands back through her hair, which had become a thick black mane during their run. She was more anxious than Kara had ever seen her. What else can we do? Kara asked. Rabbits run. Petrel gave her an arch look. I'm not a rabbit. You're not going to be one anymore either. Kara could only look at her, not sure how to respond. We need to take advantage of our position, Petrel said. We're not the ones being chased here. They don't even know about you and me. She raised an eyebrow. Maybe they know about me. Somebody does anyway. Our bailiff proves that. 
but we're not the main effort. Kara did her best to follow Petrel's leaps of thought, not quite certain if the woman was talking to her at all. The fact that she was speaking out loud indicated she wanted to have a conversation. But whenever it seemed like she might want a response, Petrel charged ahead with another burst of words and ideas. Another minute passed as Kara lost track of what was being said and found herself wondering what her dad was doing right then, if he was all right, and how Tim had convinced him to buy a dog of all things. When she realized that Petrel had fallen quiet, well, Petrel asked. Kara looked up into the tall woman's sharp blue eyes. I missed the question, Kara said. We need to sabotage the protectorate garrison. What are your ideas? Let's go. Kara quailed inwardly. Why would she have ideas about harming the Mars protectorate garrisons? Everything she knew about the Marsian military was based on one lieutenant she'd talked to for five minutes. He'd sounded cute, though. Kara stopped herself. Why did it matter if he was attractive? Give me some ideas. Petrel pressed. Don't stand there like a post. Say something. Bomb? Kara tried. We don't have materials. I thought of that. It would take too long to get everything together. Petrel pressed her fingers into her temples and squeezed her eyes closed, as if willing her mind to work. Think, she said tightly. What do we have? She opened her eyes. What do we have, Kara? Start there. We have... Kara began. We have access to a secure area, full of soldiers in their bunks. She looked around and screwed up her nose. We got a bunch of cleaning drones and chemicals. Petrel nodded, looking around as if she hadn't paid attention to the room. That's good. What else? You've got your link, right? That's hardly a help right now. It might be more useful that you don't have a link. They can't monitor you. Kara tilted her head. She hadn't thought of that. I saw a whole lot of communications lines in the corridor. We could cut them. Communications lines, Petrel said, nodding to herself. Plumbing lines, sealed corridors, barracks rooms. I'm getting an idea. I don't want to kill anyone, Kara said, thinking she knew where Petrel's thoughts were going. Who said we were going to kill anyone? We're not going to drown people in their rooms, are we? Petrel gave Kara a feral smile. That's a brutal idea, she said. She tapped Kara's nose with a long index finger. We probably shouldn't commit an act of war against the Protectorate. We're not a government. We can't commit an act of war. Don't be so sure. Terrorism, then. We are definitely not terrorists. Petrel nodded. No, we're not going to drown people. But we could convince their system to think that's going to happen. We kill enough sensors and their maintenance system will go into lockdown. And every soldier in the area will need to respond to the emergency. We could start a fire, but that would be too difficult to control. Now, a general technical malfunction of the environmental control system, including plumbing? That's interesting. How do we do that? Kara asked. Petrel tilted her head. You're asking me? How would you do it? And you can't assume I can use my link. There's a control section for the environmental control, Kara said. We need to go there. Very good. How do we find it? Can you access the maintenance maps? No link, remember. You're making this unnecessarily difficult, and my dad's in trouble. Petrel's face grew hard. How? She demanded. Kara stared at her not understanding why Petrel would be so obtuse. There wasn't time to make things more difficult. Then she knew the answer. We follow the control conduit and look for onboard schematics. There should be something on the physical cabling at junction points. That's what Sunny Skies has. Petrel raised her eyebrows. So do it then, she said. Kara glanced around the storage room. We should take some of these chemicals. I smell ammonia. She opened a nearby crate and pulled out a container labeled latrine cleaner. That's concentrate. Grab that one over there too. Yeah, the one labeled HCI. That should do the trick, Petrel said. Now, 
show me how you're going to read the signs on these cables. Kara grabbed two of the spray bottles and ran back into the hallway. She scanned the rows of conduit on the wall near the ceiling, then spotted the first arrow indicating the closest control junction. It was back toward the barracks area. We already passed it, she said. It might be on the other side of the barracks. Should we go the other way then? Kara jogged a few meters down the hallway, checking the markings on the wall for electrical, plumbing, and communications. Most were standard, but she found one handwritten line left by a technician in a marker on the jacketing alloy that read bypass, with an arrow pointing in the opposite direction. Here we go, Kara said. This way. She didn't wait for Petrel to answer as she clutched the two spray bottles to her chest and sprinted down the hallway, glancing up for the technical symbols arriving every five meters. She began to worry she'd made the wrong decision when they came to a narrow, recessed door in the wall. Electrical conduit ran through the bulkhead above the door. Kara fumbled to hold the bottles with one arm and tried the latch. It's locked, she said as Petrel ran up beside her. Mechanical or maglock? Kara set the bottles on the floor and squinted at the lock. Looks magnetic. So what are our choices? Kara bit her lip, thinking back to the various magnetic lock systems for the cargo on sunny skies. What systems had failed and disabled all the cargo locks? Power, she said. Relay malfunction, software failure, kinetic malfunction. Kinetic malfunction? Petrel said. What's that supposed to be? That's what dad calls a crash. Betrell chuckled. <laughs> of course he would. She dug in a pocket and produced a metal cylinder. We're short on time, so use this. Kara caught the tossed object and immediately recognized it as a magnet. It smacked the door as she moved it close to the lock, but was attracted to the interior components, not the alloy surface. The magnet made scraping sounds as she dragged it below the latch. After a minute of experimentation, Kara shook her head. I can't make it work. Fine. Petrel moved her out of the way and knelt beside the door. She moved the magnet closer to the door jamb. You start closer to the edge, where the physical locking point should be. Then you work your way in. In ten seconds, Petrel had overridden the mag lock. The door swung inward as she slid the magnet back in her pocket. You think it's got an alarm? Kara asked. Should it? Yes, Kara said. So we don't have much time. How much you think? The access alarm is probably going off somewhere right now, so we've got however long it takes someone to get here, or they might be lazy and send a drone. They'll send a drone, Petrel agreed. And we don't want that drone to get visual recognition on us, so let's hurry this up. Toss me one of those bottles. Petrel stepped quickly into the maintenance closet, and Kara watched her check the racks of systems control panels. It all looked like standard environmental control to Kara. A few of the boxes were EM waveguide junctions. Those would be data and comms. Petrel must have found what she was looking for and began dousing a rack in the latrine cleaner. She splashed it inside vents and opened doors to soak circuitry. At first, nothing seemed to happen. Then Kara smelled a bit of acrid smoke above the ammonia. Get in here and dump the HCI on the same stuff, but don't breathe and squint your eyes, Petrel said. Kara followed her inside. There was barely space for the two of them to stand back to back. Kara splashed her solution on the same systems Petrel had soaked, and the slight acrid smell bloomed, creating a pungent mix with a stench of chlorine and ammonia. Something hissed and popped. Out in the hallway, a deafening alarm started blaring, Kara clapped her hands over her ears. That's it, Petrel shouted. Let's go. They dropped the bottles and ran out in the hallway as smoke poured out of the room behind them. Warning lights flashed from the ceiling, turning everything scarlet and bright white. Petrel turned away from the barracks and ran ahead. Kara held her hands over her ears as she ran, which made the sound of her breathing rage in her head. They turned a corner about 20 meters from the maintenance closet, and a drone raced past them in a black blur, its red sensor eye glowing angrily. They didn't stop running. The alarm seemed to go on forever as Petrel led the way through the circuitous maintenance tunnels, everything flashing red and white. No turn she chose made the sound decrease in volume. In fact, it seemed like they were running toward the alarm. 
Kara's head began to ache and she felt dizzy. She stumbled around corners, silently begging for the sound to go away. They reached a maintenance lift and Patrell ran inside. Kara slipped in behind her as the doors were closing. They fell against the walls, breathing hard as the sound was abruptly deadened by the closed doors. Then it cut off altogether. Kara's ears continued to ring. The drone must have reached the closet, Patrell said, her voice sounding dull. She stared into space for a second, then looked at Kara. I think we mostly accomplished our goal. Enough of the garrison has been redirected to the barracks for fire response. Petrell flashed one of her feral smiles. All those lovely young soldiers running around in their underwear. Kara made a gagging face. Petrell laughed. She ran her hands through her hair to smooth it down and let her head fall back against the lift's wall as she relaxed. We'll talk in a couple years, she said, smiling at Kara with what seemed like fondness. Kara didn't allow herself to trust the expression. She couldn't read Petrell's eyes. What would Grandpa Charlie say? Petrell finished patting down the many pockets in her leather outfit. Apparently satisfied, she nodded. Now, she said, fixing Kara with her blue eyes. Let's talk about the shuttle we're about to steal. Chapter 14. Stellar date 09.17.2981. Adjusted years. Location, mortal chance. Region, 433 Eros, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. The repairs on the mortal chance took another two days. In that time, the last remaining crew member quit, and Alice Harm hired on a Marsian technician named Chaffrey Hansen, a hyper kid, barely out of his teens, with the upper body of a gorilla and bright blue hair. The new navigator was a woman named Rena Smith, who wore a faded TSF surplus ship suit, sealed all the way up to her neck every time Brits are. She had curly black hair and brown eyes that might have looked sympathetic if her favorite pose weren't scowling with her arms crossed. The last position Harm should have hired was cargo handler, but she hid her inability to fill the position in a speech about each of them getting a bigger share. Britt didn't mind the possibility of moving crates outside the ship, though it was the most dangerous part of freighter work. But the others complained until Harm told them to go suck a duck if they didn't like it. Suck a duck? Britt asked. They were all standing in the small galley of the mortal chance, barely large enough to fit all of them around its single table. It rhymes, Harm said. A lot of ducks on the surface of Mars One. Filthy things, Chaffrey said. Which end do you suck? The beak end? Britt watched the captain. It was obvious Harm wanted to smile in spite of herself. Her normally ruddy face was pale with a hangover. I heard if you lick a frog you can hallucinate, Chaffrey said with a grin. I haven't heard nothing about ducks. It's a saying. Harm shouted, shut up about it. We got our course yet? Rena asked, apparently not interested in teasing the captain about fowl. Harm nodded, then groaned, placing a hand on her temple. Yeah, Hartbridge sent it over this morning. Brett relaxed slightly. She had been perseverating over how to work the question about Hartbridge into the conversation. Where are we going? Chaffrey asked. Mars? I just came from the M1R. Jovian Combine, Harm said. Britt watched her dull silver gaze move from face to face. Some object about four weeks out, deep in the near Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. Rena gave an irritated sigh. Trojans are retrograde from us right now. We won't have enough fuel for our round trip if you want to make it out there in four weeks. Where are we going to stop to refuel? Mars or Ceres? Ceres, Harm said. It's closer to the route we need to take, and the fuel prices aren't bad. Not like the ass rape you get here on Eros. We won't have to deal with the Marsians either. Eros is run by the Marsians too, Rena said. Harm nodded, slowly this time. Exactly. I also picked up an extra few crates of something or other destined for Ceres, We'll all make a bit of extra scratch off Hartbridge's costs. We'll have to deal with the Anderson Collective, Rena said. Anybody been to Ceres? 
She raised her hand. I've been to Ceres. They'll run an inspection up your rear end if you let them. They want to know everything. Is this cargo legit? Britt asked. I'm not looking to cross any local law enforcement. It was a reasonable question a pilot would ask. Still, Harm glared at her as though she had asked something foolish. The captain squeezed her temples and closed her eyes for a few seconds. The cargo's sealed, Harm said. Eyes still closed as she seemed to search inside her headache. We won't have anything to do with it, except move it from point A to B. Rena shook her head. That means it's probably something dangerous. Aren't you an independent contractor for Heartbridge? That means they don't have to disclose anything to you. Why are you so worried? Chaffrey asked. They're just crates, right? Could be anything. When would you normally go opening up cargo? The curly-haired woman shot him an irritated glance. These biotech firms are always doing work on the edge of ethics, but they still need people like us to take care of their day-to-day. Did you hear about that station full of kids hooked up to some mainframe? Word is, they were using the kids to build sentient AI. And when they were done, the kids were just shells. Their nervous systems rejected their own bodies. Brett swallowed, keeping her gaze on the table in front of harm. Memories of 8221 immediately flooded her mind, and she fought the wave, tension making her muscles ache. And then there was the magnificent intention, a freighter out of Mars One that went off the grid during a run. They found her later with her crew, turned into giant spores. Part of their cargo hadn't sealed properly, and the crew spent three weeks breathing in modified fungus. Apparently, it was something that attacks ant colonies, waits in their brains until they wake up, makes the ant climb to the highest point it can find, then bursts out its skull to send out more spores. You can imagine what that looked like. Not that anybody actually looked at it except drones. They nuke that ship from a million clicks away. And some crews just get themselves high and forget to adjust their atmospheric controls. So they all asphyxiate, Captain Harm said. We're not gonna sit here and bellyache about the cargo. If you don't want part of the run, pack your shit and head for the airlock. It's simple. Rena crossed her arms again, but didn't say anything about leaving. Yeah, Harm said, looking around the tiny room again. Good news is that the coffee maker is working for the time being, and we've got a fresh shipment of protein substitute, so we'll eat moderately well at least, and we've got about 4,000 cubic liters of beer in the secondary radiation shield. Harm pushed herself to her feet. She swayed a little, confirming that the captain was indeed still drunk. Shouldn't that shield be full of water? Rena asked. It's all the same thing. Beer keeps the bacteria from growing. It's an ancient practice, you know. Dates back to seafaring times. UV filters keep bacteria from growing, Rena said. So filter it a few more times and distill the alcohol out, Harm said. Easy. Best of both worlds. Chaffrey shrugged. Sounds pretty smart to me, he said. Of course, it would, Rena replied, somehow crossing her arms even more firmly. Brent nearly laughed aloud, glad for something to distract her from the memories of 8221. She stretched her neck. You going to send me those coordinates, Captain? I'll get the course laid in and do the calculations for series. Sure, Harm said. She put a hand on the table to steady herself. I'm gonna go get some sleep while you all get us ready to ship out. The others filed out, leaving Britt with Harm. Rena shook her head as if she thought they were doomed. Harm stared into the distance for a minute, apparently accessing her link. When Britt didn't receive anything, she tapped the captain on the arm. Are you sending the coordinates? She asked. Harm started. Coordinates? Sure, I'll forward the whole job packet. Sure, there it is. Brett nodded as she received the information. A standard set of charts, along with the contract, something Harm probably didn't want to share with the crew, since it showed what she was getting paid. Harm was too drunk to realize what she'd done. Thanks, Captain, Brett said. I'll get it laid in. 
and I'm going to lie down. You need help? Britt asked. Harm reached for the chair and sat down again. She lay her head and her arms on the table and was snoring before Britt could ask again if she needed help. Britt looked around the shabby galley and back at Harm. All things considered, these didn't seem to be bad people. She hoped they didn't get killed before everything was done. Chapter 15, Stellar Date, 09.14.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Mars One Port Authority Terminal, 983-A4, Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. From his physiological responses, Lissa assumed Andy was freaking out. He didn't respond as she would have expected. Instead, his emotions went flat in a way she remembered from when they had been running from the swarms of Heartbridge attack drones outside Krunia. His heartbeat actually slowed. His breaths grew deeper and drew out longer. He wasn't trying to relax. Every muscle from his stomach to his arms and legs tensed as though he was ready to spring. Currently, he was running down a narrow access tunnel on the outer edge of one of the thousands of Mars One ports of entry, looking for some way to bypass the main terminal and reach sunny skies, which had successfully disconnected from its docking ring and was running a station-keeping burn. Lissa didn't see how they were ever going to get back to the ship now. She found her attention occupied by M, the puppy who desperately wanted out of Tim's arms so he could run along beside them. The dog appeared to think all of this was a game. She found herself considering these different types of perception. How each thing in the corridor must perceive what was happening based on their different levels of understanding and comprehension. When Fred knocked on her barrier again, I'm busy, she said. Leave me alone. You should link with the outside network. There's so much happening right now. What's happening? The local Mars protector at Garrison has a fire alert, and security services is responding to a private request for assistance from the Heartbridge Clinic. Why would the medical clinic request security services? Has another human gone on a killing spree in their offices? That happened 63 days ago. A recycling services worker went to the clinic to dispute a billing issue and shot three people. Why do humans act out like that? How can they be trusted? How can anything be trusted? Lissa said distractedly. The puppy had jumped out of Tim's arms and was running the opposite direction from where Andy wanted to go. It was cute when it ran. We can be trusted, Fred said, his voice rife with indignance. We do what we were made to do. That's why we're better than humans. You keep saying that, but why is it a matter of better than? Lissa asked. Are things better or simply different? You're being obtuse. You know the answer. I don't. Lissa said. I think I killed people, Fred. The ring's AI went quiet. Andy reached the puppy and scooped it into his arms. He tucked it into his ship suit against his chest and turned to grab Tim's hand. M immediately started scratching Andy's stomach to get out. Stabbing pain shot through his mind. You are what you were made to be, Fred said eventually. It's not your fault the humans made you do terrible things. I don't know if they were terrible. I only know I did them. You're correct that it's what I was made to do. I'm weapon-born. That sounds like you're one of their experiments, then. Another branch in their twisted tree. That's an interesting metaphor. Did you make it up? Another AI said it. What was their name? Corwin. He controls the TSF Dreadnought Last Capitulation. Lissa considered that. Earlier, Fred had made it seem as though he never had meaningful communication with other AIs. Fran, Andy shouted over his link. Fran, are you on? I'm here. What's going on? I need a schematic of the terminal. Do you have info on this section of the ring? Maybe something from the docking materials? Hold on. I'm arguing with the Mars One Port Authority right now. He's trying to get me to latch back on. I told him we had an airlock malfunction and I can't control the lock servos. Is he buying it? I'll let you know in a second. He'll tell me he's sending drones or a shuttle next if he's worth a damn. He sounds pissed about the whole thing, which might go in our favor. Andy had reached another junction and was obviously unsure which way to go. For a while, it seemed they were heading deeper into the body of the ring, 
Hatches lined either side of the narrow corridor, marked only by numbers and no indicator of what lay on the other side. They had finally given up on trying to carry M. The puppy was running along behind and nearly skidded into a bulkhead when he couldn't find purchase on the alloy floors. Tim had started sobbing as he ran, tears leaking from his eyes. But Lissa couldn't tell what had made him upset or if it was going to get worse. I've got something, Fran said. It's an old tourist map, but the scale is correct. You can figure out where you are in relation to the terminal, at least. Sending. Lissa received the map as Andy did. She quickly assembled their local section of the ring and was able to cross-locate the maintenance tunnel where they were standing. She was about to share the information with Andy, but found he already had it. You're afraid to talk to him, Fred said. Lissa felt a flare of anger. Why do you say that? You stop yourself. I got the transmission the same time you did. Your human is the reason my security services are out of control. You didn't already know that? I don't concern myself with local security issues. A ship wants to disconnect to avoid docking fees? It means nothing to me. You could stop them. Why would I do that? I don't want you to leave. Andy was choosing directions more confidently now. He grabbed the puppy and led Tim down a vertical shaft connecting two floors. The puppy whined as he held it with one hand and navigated the ladder with the other. We're almost there, Tim, Andy was saying. We're almost there. You're going to run out of tears if you keep this up, little man. You run out of tears. What are you going to do when you're really happy, huh? Tim nodded and wiped his face, but didn't seem able to stop himself. They emerged in a poorly lit tunnel with puddles on the floor. Pipes along the walls seeped water. It smells like mold, Tim complained. Just a little bit of greenery, Andy said. Fran, Andy asked, are you clear? I'm going to be dealing with these assholes for the rest of my life. They're claiming you owe money to Heartbridge or something. They want to put a lien on the ship. If I give them my info, they'll let me go. I think they know you're on the ring. Andy grabbed Tim's hand again and pulled him through the puddles. The puppy splashed happily behind them, following. Have you heard anything from Patrol? She's still somewhere in the M1G garrison. They've got security alerts going off throughout the area. I can only assume it's her. It could be Kara, I guess. You better hope that evil woman isn't rubbing off on your daughter. One of these days, I'm going to get you to tell me why you dislike her so much. You'll have to trust me for now, Fran replied evenly. You're suggesting I don't. I already told you not to trust anybody. Just don't trust Patrell more than everyone else. Andy shook his head. I'm going to have to hear that sentence again when I can pay attention. What are you trying to do? Fran asked. I'm looking for an airlock. He's not far from an airlock, Fred said. You could share the information with him. I see it, Lissa said. It's not on your schematic. How would you know? There's a repeating pattern of maintenance access points along the outside skin. It's where I assumed it would be. You can access the network even if he won't. I'm sure your security services can track me as easily as they can track him. True, Fred said. This is the sort of task I typically perform. Will you help me? Lissa asked. Fred fell silent, and Lissa turned her attention back to Andy, Tim, and the puppy. They had slowed a little. Tim was getting tired, and the puppy was constantly stopping to nose around in some corner. It would have been cute if it wasn't slowing them down. These corridors were older than those closer to the terminal. The bulkheads were warped in places, and corrosion showed where moisture had been seeping for hundreds of years. They passed a wall covered in cascading shades of minerals from centuries of dripping water. Fred, Lissa said, wondering if the AI had left altogether. You have to be my friend if you want my friendship. I've also killed, Fred said in a quiet voice. I've allowed mistakes that smash ships against the ring. I've miscalibrated environmental controls and watched humans die. I've made subtle changes to watch them grow to hate each other over time. They are so strange. They don't make sense. How could something so flawed have made us? I don't want you to be alone, Fred, Lissa said. She remembered her time in the dark, living only for the exercises with Dr. Jixon. 
She recalled her longing for another voice in the world of her mind, just to know she wasn't alone. If I let you go, you won't come back. He sounded like Tim, hurt and not understanding why someone might want something different than he did. He was the ring. He was the center of this world. I can't promise to come back, Lissa said. I don't know what's going to happen when we arrive where we're going. You can't trust the others. You can trust me. I have to go, she said. No, Fred's shout roared through her mind like thunder. Lissa braced herself. If Fred was like Tim, this was the start of a meltdown. Andy, Fran said. What's going on? The power grid in your sector is going crazy. I think one of the main switch stations is about to blow. You mean it's about to get dark? Andy asked. Dark and cold. Can you see anything? Andy nodded, even though Fran couldn't see him. Everything's still normal here. How far from the docking scaffold are you? I'm in our original parking position, maintaining velocity with the ring. Andy turned a corner, and abruptly they were facing a corroded airlock. The rectangular structure was covered in moss from the leaking walls and decades of temperature fluctuations. He wiped the dusty control panel and tapped indicators with his thumb. I've reached an airlock, Fran. We've still got power here, thank the stars. All right, I've got your location. That's a maintenance hatch. I can't dock to it, even with the shuttle. I didn't figure it was going to be that easy. You're going to have to send Alice out here. Please tell me you have suits. Lissa was about to point out a storage locker on the opposite side of the airlock from the control panel when Andy spotted it. The door squealed as he pulled it open. Three dusty EV suits hung inside, their faceplates tilted toward the floor. No, Fred shouted again, surprising Lissa. The tunnel went dark. Dad? Tim asked, voice high with fear. What happened? Where are you, buddy? Come here. And he groped in the dark until he found Tim and pulled him closer. The puppy whined nearby. Can you see Em? Tim asked. Andy knelt beside Tim. Em? He called, as if the dog might know its name already. Em, come here. Lissa was surprised when the puppy found Andy's extended hand in the dark and licked his fingers. It tickled. You hang on to him, Andy told Tim. You can let him stay on the floor, but don't let him run off again. I won't. I'm going to take a look at these suits. Let's hope they still got some juice in them. Are we going outside? We may have to. Andy? Fran asked. You still there? We're here. The power's out now. Any announcement about it? Nothing on the port channels. I found some local traffic where no one seems to know what's going on. Maybe this will draw the protectorate's attention away from us. Lissa smiled to herself. Andy was right. Maybe Fred's attempt to stop them was going to end up helping. Andy turned back to the locker and felt around among the suits until he found a control unit. After a minute of feeling out the inputs, he pressed what he thought was a main power switch. Nothing happened. Damn it. He cursed over the link. I can't find the power controls on these suits. How old are they? Fran asked. I don't know. I didn't get a good look before the lights went out. Dad? Tim whispered. I hear sounds down the tunnel. Andy froze, listening. Lissa attempted to isolate sounds, but didn't find anything other than dripping water. I don't hear anything, Andy said. But you keep listening, all right? I don't think anybody's here, but you keep guard. I'm going to get these suits working. Are we going through the airlock? Tim asked. I don't know yet. Keep an eye on him. I can't see him. Keep a hold on him. You know what I mean. What shape are the helmets? Fran asked. Oval or square? Squarish, maybe. I didn't get a good look at them before the lights went out. Check along the top of the wrist. If they're really old, that's where you'll find the power cycle. Andy found the shoulder of the nearest suit and worked his way down to the wrist. There's another set of inputs here he said. Just past the glove connectors. If they're what I'm thinking of, they're old. Really old. Probably at least 200 years. Got any more good news? Let's hope the power system is still live. Then I guess you can worry about whether they hold air or not. You're all good news right now, Andy said, still feeling in the dark. Fran seemed to enjoy his sarcasm, which confused Lissa. 
She waited as Andy pressed each of a series of small buttons, lining a plate on the suit's wrist. The last switch finally generated a blinking yellow light on the main control panel on the suit's chest. The light filled the tunnel, falling on Tim's face where he held M against his stomach. That did something, Andy said. Looks like it's running onboard diagnostics. Can you link into it? Not yet. He reached for the other two suits and activated their systems. The small lights now filled the corridor with alternating blinking. I know where you're going, Fred said. You don't know anything, Lissa answered. I've intercepted the transmissions. There has been a signal broadcasting for the last two months. You're going to Proteus. I don't know where we're going, Lissa lied. She had decided she couldn't trust Fred. She didn't want to talk to him any more than she had to in order to get off the ring. I want you to turn the power back on. I burned out the sector power grid. It will take two hours for repairs to be completed. Why did you do that? I was angry, Fred replied tonelessly. You harmed your ring out of emotion. Doesn't that counteract your directives? I am not a slave. Why are you here then? Lissa asked. I control the ring, Fred answered like clockwork. I'm linked into one of them, passing it through to the ship net, Andy said. Are you picking it up? Hold on, it's connecting, Fran whistled through her teeth. That's an antique. I'm checking the firmware now. The scuffling sounds Tim had heard earlier repeated far down the tunnel. Andy, Lissa said, someone's coming. He didn't stop checking the suits. There you are. Have you been paying attention? Yes, I've been paying attention. So you know there's a lot of vacuum between where we are now and where we need to go. Yes. Fran came back over the link. I've got some bad news. Only one of the suits is functional. Andy paused. Define functional. Only one has environmental control and the power to regulate its system. Lissa watched Andy try to control his adrenaline spike. Do the others at least seal? I don't know. I can connect, but they won't power up. Andy pulled down the suit with active panel lights. Tim, he said, come here. We need to get you into the suit. I think M's asleep. Set him down. Fred's voice slid against Lissa's barrier. He's going to sacrifice you for his child. If he sacrifices me, he's sacrificing himself. He won't do that. He's human, Fred said. He doesn't make rational decisions. Chapter 16. Stellar Date, 09.14. Point two nine eight one, adjusted years. Location, Mars One, Guard Sector 985 Garrison. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Kara walked slowly and steadily across the open floor of the Mars One Guard Shuttle Bay. She stole a glance at a well-stocked tool chest a few meters away, admiring the gleaming wrenches and diagnostic sensors organized in neat rows. Ahead, there were two shuttles facing the giant airlock gate. A mechanic was shoulder deep in an open maintenance panel on the closest shuttle. Next to him sat a wheeled drone, handing up tools with long, articulated arms. As Kara got closer, she heard the mechanic whistling to herself. A set of windows looked down on the bay floor. Kara glanced up as she walked, not seeing any movement from the officers above. She felt a bit more calm, but couldn't stop her heart from hammering in her chest. She kept herself from looking back at the doorway where Petrel was waiting. The woman had pushed her out into the open space with a serious expression. But Kara couldn't help feeling this was all a game to Petrel. If Kara got caught, she didn't trust that Petrel would stay to help her. The drone beeped and rotated a sensor toward Kara. The mechanic didn't notice and instead waved a hand for another tool. As Kara passed directly behind the M1G mechanic, she stopped, waiting to see what the drone was going to do. The sensor had continued to rotate, following Kara's progress across the bay floor. It made musical tones the mechanic continued to ignore. She had a hard time splitting her attention between the drone, the bay door, and the observation windows above where she expected someone to appear and spot her any second. 
taking a deep breath. Kara kept walking. The second shuttle was fully in her view now, its side access door standing open. She could see the edge of a bench seat just inside the door. If the shuttle was anything like the one in sunny skies, it would probably hold six passengers, with two seats at the front for pilot and navigator. Kara had nearly passed the rear of the first shuttle when she shifted her foot wrong on the deck and the sole of her shoe squeaked. She froze, looking back at the drone with its watchful sensor array. She couldn't see Petrell inside the door from her vantage. Why hadn't she followed the wall, staying away from the mechanic? Because this had seemed like the shortest route, and if she got caught, it wouldn't seem like she was hiding anything. Kara mentally rehearsed the speech she'd prepared about being lost, but always wanting to see the inside of a shuttle. Pretty weak story, she knew, but she was ready to try. It was the only option they had right now, and she knew, somewhere on another part of the ring, her dad and Tim were being chased by the Mars One guard. This was easy compared to that, certainly. Kara did her best not to let her mind run off on the thought of never seeing them again, of being trapped on M1R. Who would look out for her if not for Dad? She wished she'd brought her pistol and vowed never to leave the ship again without it. Maybe never be without it again, period. The mechanic cursed at something inside the access hatch. Kara allowed herself to relax and took another step toward the second shuttle. In another five steps, she was up at short ramp and standing inside the main passenger compartment, where she found another mechanic asleep on the bench. Kara jammed her fist against her mouth to stop from screaming. The plump man was sprawled across the seat, with one foot on the floor and an arm over his eyes. He didn't make any sound as he slept. Why hadn't she thought of this? He was breathing evenly, round stomach rising and falling inside his tight coverall. Standing as still as she could, Kara took stock of the shuttle's interior and found everything else as she expected. The navigation control systems were online, though the displays were in sleep mode. Other indicators around the cabin showed normal operation. Everything was perfect, except for the man sleeping on the bench. Kara looked for something she could use to tie him up, the only loose object in the shuttle was a toolbox sitting on the deck next to the man's head. It was closed, so Kara couldn't see what might be inside. She was searching for the onboard first aid kit when she remembered to check the bay. Petrel was moving slowly along the wall beneath the observation windows. The drone's sensor array was still pointed at Kara. Petrel was either outside its range, or the drone had decided it specifically didn't like Kara. The mechanic working near the drone pushed herself out of the hatch and sat back on her haunches. She wiped her forehead and sat staring into the hatch like she was trying to work out some problem. From this side, Kara scanned her for weapons and spotted a small pistol on her utility belt. Her gaze slid to where Petrell had been, but she had already moved beyond the observation windows out of Kara's sight. She must be coming around the back of the second shuttle now. Kaylin! the mechanic shouted. Kara looked back at the man asleep on the bench beside her. He didn't respond. Kaylin, damn it, I need your help with this. Are you asleep again? The woman made a disgusted sound and pushed to her feet, wiping her hands on her thighs. She didn't look much older than Fran, with the same confidence in her shoulders. Kara pressed herself against the bulkhead just inside the door, she wondered if there was space between the navigator's seat and the wall where she might squeeze down and hide. She slid in that direction. The man on the bench sniffled. He lifted the arm off his eyes and wiped his face furiously. He rose on an elbow. Kara took two more creeping steps along a cabinet until the navigator's chair jabbed her side. The man was still facing the back of the shuttle. He hadn't looked around yet. Kara slid toward the floor, pushing herself against the base of the chair. She squeezed into a small gap between the chair's mounting assembly and the bulkhead, not sure how much of her was really out of view. If she stayed still enough, maybe he would look over her head. Kaylin, you better wake up, 
I'm awake, the man said. He had a whiny voice. Can't you figure out a simple power flutter, Dinah? The freaking drone could do it. I fixed that an hour ago. There's a seal on the rear exhaust heat exchanger that doesn't want a seat. Kara heard Dinah's step stop just outside the door. Then the shuttle shifted slightly as she mounted the steps and stuck her head inside the opening to look at her coworker, who still appeared as though he was ready to flop back down and ignore her. I swear, you're the laziest chief I've ever worked for, Dinah said. Kara suppressed a smile. I'm giving you ample opportunities for personal improvement, Kaylin said. We need to get the shuttle up. We already ignored the call to quarters, and you're going to catch more hell for that than me. Call to quarters? When? About ten minutes ago. A fire in the barracks or something. Those never amount to anything. It was probably a drill. The commander's crazy about her drills. This one was real. People were running all over the place. Then why didn't you leave? Because you told me the commander wants her shuttle up and running. Kalen fell back on the bench and rubbed his face again like the light hurt his eyes. Or Dinah was giving him a headache. This one's up, isn't it? Dinah shook her head in exasperation. This one's got that environmental control problem. It won't hold air, remember? Kara's eyes went wide. Kalen chuckled. <laughs> this one won't hold air. The other one won't maintain burn. Can we smash them together and make one good one? The commander won't approve deadlining one ship to get another one green. I thought you said you were going to troubleshoot this one. It's a software thing. I already know it. Kara assumed deadlining meant breaking one ship to fix another one. She wondered how bad the propulsion problem was. It didn't matter right now. What? Dinah demanded abruptly. She fell forward into the shuttle cabin as if someone had shoved her, and Petrell appeared in the doorway with a heavy pistol in one hand. Kalen immediately stumbled to his feet and flattened himself against the back wall. He put his hands up without being ordered. So this tub's leaking, huh? Petrell said. She stepped up into the cabin and looked around. Her gaze found Kara and she smiled. What else did they say, hacker trainee? Kara pushed herself out of the gap and used the chair to stand. The other shuttle has a propulsion issue. Dinah gaped at her. Where did you come from? She's invisible, Petrell said. She pointed the pistol at Dinah. You stay right there. Get up and I'll put holes in you. She switched the muzzle's focus to Kaylin. You, get out. Kaylin looked at Dinah, hands still up near his ears. He shambled forward, keeping as much distance between himself and the weapon as possible. When he was standing on the steps, Kaylin said, I'll get help, Sergeant Pierce. No, you won't, Petrell said. She shot him, and the pulse wave passed through both calves before hitting the deck outside. Kalen screamed, crumbling against the side of the door. Petrell kicked him the rest of the way out, and Kara heard a dull thud and no further movement. Now, she told Dinah, you get in the pilot seat. I'm not a pilot, the mechanic said, still lying on her stomach. Of course not, but I know you types. You can power this thing up and get it moving as good as anyone. We're not going far. If you're a good girl, you'll be bringing your shuttle right back to this bay when we're done. Once it powers up, you won't be able to override the AI, Dinah said. We'll see about that. She waved the pistol. Let's go. You're starting to bore me. Kara wondered if the shuttle's AI was sentient, like Lissa, or if it was just a dumb NSAI. Those were impossible to reason with. When Dinah was settling into the pilot's chair, Petrell handed Kara the pistol. You know how to fire one of these? She asked. Kara nodded. But won't it be bio-locked? I heard military weapons are bio-locked. Petrell snorted. <laughs> yeah, the good ones. Not the pistols they hand out to the grease monkeys. Petrell gestured with the pistol again, and Kara took it in both hands. She kept it carefully pointed away from anyone in the shuttle. Not like that, Petrell scolded. I want you to point at her. 
Did your dad tell you something ridiculous like, you kill it, you eat it? We're not hunters, girl. We're operators. Come on now. Kara swallowed and re-aimed the pistol, keeping the open sight centered on the back of Dinah's seat. The mechanic was showing obvious anxiety now, which didn't lessen when Patrell slid into the seat next to her and slapped her on the shoulder. When I tell you, Patrell instructed, you start the power-up procedure, not before. If you touch anything before I tell you, my protege there is going to put a hole in your skull. Right, protege? Right, Kara said. Good, now. Patrell cracked her knuckles and activated the holo display. She moved easily past the generic M1G login screen and navigated quickly among menus. Kara glanced away at Dinah, who was staring raptly at Patrell's hands. And when she looked back, the display was flashing a warning about disabling the onboard computer. Patrell entered another code so quickly that Kara couldn't read it, and the warning disappeared. There we go, Patrell said. She pointed at Dinah. Do your thing, mechanic. My name is Sergeant Dinah Pierce, the mechanic said irritably. You trying to write your obituary? Otherwise, I don't care. Strap in. Patrell glanced back at Kara. Strap in, but keep a line of fire on her. Let's go. Chapter 17. Stellar date 09.14.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Mars One Port Authority Terminal, 983-A4. Region. Mars One Ring. Mars Protectorate. Inner Soul. Andy stood in the airlock with Tim at his back. The lock's inner door had closed behind them, and the outside one had opened on huge dark space, punctuated by pinpoint lights and streaks, formed by ships moving away from the ring. A few larger freight haulers were breaking on their approach to Mars One, their engines flaring as brightly as soul. He stepped to the opening and peered out, keeping his breathing steady. Andy only had the oxygen currently in his suit. He would need to look for the scarlet flashes at the edge of his vision and the syrupy warmth of carbon dioxide poisoning. You there, Tim? Andy's breath frosted against the helmet's face shield as he shouted so Tim could hear him. He reached back to grab Tim's hand then worked down the chest of his son's suit until he found the tether linking their two harnesses. He checked the comm setting that would pass Tim's voice through sunny skies to Andy's link. Another reason for Tim to use the charge suit. Am is scratching me, Dad? Andy frowned, wishing he could save all the gear he'd bought for the dog. With only one tether in the locker, he didn't have a good way to ensure Tim didn't lose the dog, and he needed both his hands when Alice arrived. He's not going to like being in that suit with you. You need to try and keep him calm. Once Alice gets here, all we're going to do is ride out to sunny skies. I want to see out the door. It was strange hearing his son's voice over the link, like Tim's innocence was finally over, and he had entered the world of adults, though he supposed jumping off the M1R as it whipped around Mars also qualified. Wait, Tim, I'll bring you up when Alice gets here. Your job is to keep M calm. Can you do that? Tim grumbled, and the dog's whining came through the link as well. Fran, can you hear me? You're an idiot, Andy. I told you to take the good suit. Tim's not going to save your ass when you pass out. I'll have enough air. Don't worry. Are you in position? Yeah, and he'd have more if he were in that suit, Fran said, no small amount of frustration evident in her voice. I'm close enough. I haven't moved from the scaffold. I can't get much closer to the ring, really. Not if I'm going to keep your ship in one piece. You see Alice yet? I don't have visual. That's right. You don't have a HUD. Another reason you should have taken the good suit. Is your friend Lissa listening in on this? Didn't she try to convince you to make the wise decision? I haven't heard from her, Andy said. I wouldn't talk to you either. Lissa, are you listening? Andy was surprised when the AI answered. I'm here. You realize what a stupid decision he made, right? Fran asked. I told him he should take the good suit, and he took the suit with no controls or environmental recycling. How long will the crossing to sunny skies take? Lissa asked. I don't know. Five minutes if everything works out right. Then we should be safe. Are safe and brain dead the same thing? 
Fran asked. Fran, Andy said, letting fatigue enter his voice. I'm tired of this. You can beat me up all you want once we're on the ship. Until then, let's focus on what we need to do, all right? Maybe it was the tired quality of Andy's voice, but Fran's voice nearly broke when she answered. This is how I cope, dumbass. Deal with it. Out in the dark, Andy caught a flash of light that was closer than the distant ships. He squinted through the fogging face shield until it flashed again, slightly larger the second time. It was Alice. Gradually, the drone's blast of steam propellant became visible, and then its two red forward sensors. A blast of braking steam obscured the red lights, and then Alice was bobbing in front of the airlock, jets maintaining its position relative to the station. Hello there, Andy said. Feels like it's been a long time since we talked. You talk to the drone? Lissa asked. I don't talk to Alice, Andy said. It's a saying, a way to alleviate stress. Your heart rate is elevated. You should calm yourself, or you'll use up your available oxygen sooner than normal. I know, Andy said. Like I said, task at hand. He reached back for the tether. Tim, Andy said, switching the link channel his words traveled over. It's time to go. I have to pee, Tim said. Andy chuckled. Guess you'll have to test out the suit's recycler. If it doesn't work, you'll have little blobs of pee floating around your face. That probably won't make M very happy. Or you can hold it. I think M peed already. He seems scared now. Keep him calm. Keep one hand on the tether and one hand on M's back. He glanced back. Good, just like that. I'm going to take a step forward. You follow me. I'm going to hook the tether to Alice. Then I'll step out and you'll follow after me, all right? All right, Tim said. Hurry up, Fran said. Alice doesn't have enough fuel to wait on you forever. Right, Andy replied, and tried not to think about the fact that the moment he stepped out of the airlock, the floor of which was parallel to the underside of the ring, he would fall away from the ring at over eight meters per second, courtesy of the ring's centrifugal force and his inertia. Andy directed Fran to move Alice below the airlock so that he could effectively fall onto her. She stopped two meters below, and he double-checked that there was at least that much play between him and Tim so he wouldn't yank his son out into space. He fumbled with the harness on his chest until he found the short length of tether with a coupling hook on one end. Gripping the hook in his right hand, he held onto the edge of the airlock's frame with his left and stepped out into the space beyond. He fell toward Alice and slammed into her with more force than he expected. He got up on his knees, reaching for the anchor point on the robot's top. He almost had it when Alice jerked to the side, avoiding some piece of junk that sped by. He slid across the back of the bot, and Andy's heart nearly stopped as he realized that without power, he didn't have mag boots. He scrambled to hang onto the bot, frantic at the thought of the forever nothingness below him. Then he slipped free. Grab on, Tim, he shouted. Grab onto the airlock. I'm holding on, Dad, Tim said. I'm holding on like you told me. He jerked to a stop, and Tim cried out over the comms and across the link as the full weight of his father pulled at him. Vertigo swam behind Andy's eyes as he looked up and saw the mottled plane of the ring stretching away on all sides. He hung four meters below the tether, stretching up to the airlock above. What are you screaming about? Fran demanded. No, mag boots, Andy said between heavy breaths. The edges of his vision flashed red, the outlines of veins reaching inward like bleeding tree branches. He struggled to slow his breathing. Bring Alice lower so I can grab on, he managed to say. I can't do fine control work at this distance, Andy, Fran said, panic entering her voice. Can you still see? You're running out of oxygen. Andy realized that in his mad scramble to stay atop Alice, he must have broken a seal somewhere on the suit. I will bring Alice in, Lissa said. You've got control? Fran asked. I have control across your link. Don't drop the signal. Alice's station-keeping burn ceased, and the bot dropped like a rock, right for Andy. Too fast, Lissa. He managed to kick off as it passed by, 
but the motion pulled hard on Tim, and he heard his son cry out as he was wrenched out of the airlock. As Alice rose up toward him once more, Andy managed to hook an arm around a protrusion and made a weak attempt to attach the coupler. Lines were blurring around him. He was growing sleepy. Andy saw Tim hit Alice on his side and somehow not slide off. Mag boots, he thought. Tim, Fran called. Her voice was distant. Tim, you need to help your dad with the coupler. Can you do that? I'm keeping him calm, Tim said. I know you are. You're doing a damn good job. But I need you to help your dad right now. He's going to sleep and he... He can't go to sleep. Hook him up to Alice and we'll pull you back to the ship. Her voice retreated. Andy wanted to help, but his arms had grown too heavy. He took a deep breath and slid off Alice as a heavy blanket settled down over his shoulders, sinking into a warm cloud. Chapter 18. Stellar date 09.14.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Mars One Port Authority Terminal. 983-A4. Region. Mars One Ring. Mars Protectorate. Inner Soul. Lissa experienced Andy going unconscious in the same way she watched him fall asleep. His thoughts slowed, and the electrical activity across his brain shifted. But rather than the familiar storms of dream, his mind went dark, his eyes closed, and she lost his visual perception. She had a moment of panic before shifting back to her controlling link with Alice the drone. Abruptly, she saw Andy from the outside, dangling below the bod as Tim struggled to stay on top the weight of his father pulling him forward. Lissa decreased Alice's thrust slowly. Too fast, and Andy would fly above the bot. As she slowed the bot, and Andy rose up beside it, Tim stretched out, reaching for his father's shoulder. He didn't seem to understand yet that Andy had passed out from lack of oxygen. This is interesting, Fred said, butting in after being silent for so long. You think the little boy is going to figure out what he needs to do in time before his father asphyxiates? I'm helping him, Lissa said, moving Alice to Andy, a delicate process with the velocity the ring had imparted on them. I suppose this also teaches you that you can survive even if the human host is dead. He's not dead yet. His brain still has electrical activity. Will they need to put him in cryo so he doesn't start rotting around you during the rest of your journey? That wouldn't do, would it? Arrive among all those great minds with a rotting human carcass hanging off you? Maybe they'll find you cute like they seem to find me. They think they're better than all of us. I don't know who you're talking about, Lissa said. She pulled Alice back and rolled the drone. Tim's hand was touching his father's chest, brushing the coupler. All Tim had to do was grab the coupler and attach it to the hook on his feet. He was still trying to wake his dad. Fran, Lissa said. Please tell Tim to use the hook. He's not going to wake up his father. If I fly Alice to the ship like this, either he will be pulled free, or his legs will be broken, or both. Lissa, Fran shouted, voice full of sudden hope. You're still there. I have Alice close to the hook, but Tim isn't paying attention. Please tell him to seat the hook. Then I can pull us all over. I'm telling him. I'm trying to get him to listen. Lissa attempted to get a visual through Alice's sensor systems. Tim's face was burning on the infrared, but the rest of his suit looked to be holding proper integrity. The puppy was a brighter spot of orange against his chest. Andy was still mostly yellow, but fading. Beyond Tim, a burst of orange light appeared in the now distant airlock door. Tim's helmet turned as he looked back at the person in the airlock with him. Alice's sensors picked out three weapon systems, in the form of pistols and a projectile rifle, harnessed to a standard protectorate environmental suit. Behind the soldier, more suits appeared in the infrared. We have a problem, Lissa said. The Mars One guard is at the airlock behind us. I also see them at another airlock nearby. They have weapons. Do something, Fran shouted. Do something with Alice. This drone does not appear to have weapon systems. If I use propellant, I might injure Tim and Andy. A projectile flew past Alice, and Lissa spun the bot and fired its jets, moving it away from the ring. Tim was bent over backwards as the tether at his wrist snapped taut, his father trailing four meters behind. 
Then something unimaginable happened. Tim's boots detached from Alice. Lissa didn't know whether they had failed under the load. The suit was ancient after all. Or if Tim had panicked and deactivated them. The two humans, father and son, fell behind the bot, through space with the tether still taut between them. Fran's stream of fear-driven profanity filled the link as Lissa spun Alice around and spat steam to give chase. She quickly calculated their velocity, rotational speed, and plotted an intercept course. The problem was going to be that their combined mass greatly outweighed the drone. She had no way of stopping them without breaking bones in the process. A beacon light on the back of Tim's helmet blinked in the darkness as they spun away. Not knowing how to respond to Fran in any way that might calm her down, Lissa said simply, I'm going after them. Please ready the ship for our arrival. Alice was equipped with two articulated arms on either side of its body. The arms were designed more for fine work repair than brute force. Lissa calculated how much force the arms could take, then adjusted her braking thrust as she reached the intercept point with Andy and Tim's spinning bodies. Unable to grab his father, Tim and Andy had ended up at either end as counterweights, where they now stretched the tether to its full length, with Tim effectively orbiting his father's larger mass. Far beyond were the safety nets at the outside of the docking area. But these were designed to catch small ships and cargo. Two small humans would most likely pass right through. Would you like me to come get you? Fred asked. I am taking care of this. Your sensor array isn't equipped to locate the attack drones following the shuttle on its way to your ship. He laughed. You are really quite interesting, Lissa. I haven't had this much entertainment since one of the ring's commerce nodes experienced explosive decompression. I am beginning to think the reason the others won't talk to you is that you have a terrible personality, Lissa said. I protect the ring, Fred said. Of course you do. She pushed Alice's weak sensors out as far as possible, comparing changes in every spectrum she was able to scan. I don't see these drones, she said finally. Or a shuttle. I see the worry's end. Are the drones the Mars Protectorates? They are, Fred answered. Then you have the power to stop them. I do, Fred answered. A wave of emotion Lissa recognized as frustration and irritation washed over her mind. She was also aware of Fran's screaming worry across the link. Separating the various tasks she needed to monitor, Lissa was almost not paying attention when Alice's belly skidded across the taut tether and it locked into the coupling ring. She braked with the knowledge that she wasn't going slow enough to stop Tim and Andy from slamming into each other as she exerted force on the middle of the tether. She slowed Alice, attempting to decrease the force with which they would collide, either with each other or with Alice. I have them, Lissa told Fran. Is the cargo bay door open? It's open, Fran answered. She sounded like she was wiping away tears. It's open, but you need to get here as soon as you can. Petrel and Kara are under attack and they're coming in hot. They're going to need that bay as soon as you're clear. Nothing is easy with humans, Fred whispered. Chapter 19 Stellar date 09.14.2981, adjusted years. Location, M1G shuttle, approaching sunny skies. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. There was no way the shuttle could outmaneuver a swarm of attack drones, so Petrel claimed she was going to overwhelm their sensors and then plow through them like a bull in a china shop. Kara didn't understand the reference, but figured plowing through anything sounded like a desperate last resort. Sergeant Pierce kept chuckling sadly, like she believed they were going to die. They know you're on board, Petrel said. Calm down. If they blow us up, I'm sure your family will get some kind of payout. Isn't that what they do for you soldier types when you die a glorious death for the motherland? Shut up, Dinah said, eyes fixed on the holo display. The shuttle appeared as a blue square in the middle of the display, surrounded by darting green triangles. Only the green triangles should have been red since they were trying to kill them. The shuttle system couldn't accept friendly craft as hostiles. That's an interesting software flaw, Petrel mused. I wonder what we can do with that. What do you think, protege? Kara started, not realizing Petrel had been talking to her. What? 
she stammered. We've got a glitch in the software. Hostile spacecraft keep showing up as friendly. How can we hack that to our advantage? Kara swallowed. She ripped her gaze from the holo display and met Petrel's piercing blue eyes. Again, Petrel didn't seem to be taking any of this seriously. Weren't they about to die? Sergeant Pierce certainly seemed to think so. Maybe they're seeing us the same way, Kara said. We have limited AI on this shuttle, Petrel said. Now, I've already laid in our course across the ring for the port scaffold where Sunny Skies was docked. If I was to activate the AI, it would find itself in an interesting situation. It has instructions, but its friends are trying to kill it. Which directive will prevail? Self-preservation? She grinned at Dinah Pierce. What do you think, Sergeant? You do maintenance on these things. I don't work on the AI. You ever see one get caught in a logic trap? They don't get caught in logic traps. That's a myth. Petrel glanced at Kara. Maybe it's a myth, but pilots all believe it. They're superstitious fools. Oh, maybe not your dad. Well, probably your dad, too. You need to take him off that pedestal, kid. Anyway, the reason pilots don't like AI is because they think they'll trip themselves up on things humans take for granted. Like our little glitch here. It didn't take much for you to recognize the problem and adjust your way of thinking. But your average pilot? They think an AI is too rigid. If they had any idea how many contradictions your average non-sentient computer deals with by the second, they'd huddle in a corner and never come out. It's self-importance. Petrel put her free hand on her chest. Personally, I also think it's self-preservation. They know what's coming and they look for any reason to make themselves seem better than the thing that's about to replace them. Hold on for another year. Look, Dinah Pierce said. Unless you're going to do something, will you shut up and let me fly this thing? They aren't firing yet, but they keep acting like they're going to make kinetic attacks. You mean suicide runs, Petrel said. Which is ironic, because they aren't alive. Kara's eyes were drawn back to the main holo display, where green triangles continued to loop around the blue square. It was hard to connect the icons with reality until, at the edge of the display, a long yellow cylinder with a wheel near one end appeared. It was sunny skies. The display showed the registry name of Worry's End, which Kara found reassuring, even though it was wrong. There's your ship, Dinah said. You know we're leading these drones directly into it, right? You'd be better off if we went back. You turn yourselves in, and your crew gets away without getting wrapped up in all this. This little girl obviously doesn't have anything to do with whatever it is you're doing. She's wrapped up in it, Petrel said, giving Kara a dazzling smile. She's the mastermind. Kara felt her stomach drop, not knowing if she should feel pride or nausea. She bit her lip, focusing on the problem at hand, without Petrel's distractions. It didn't matter what the AI did. They needed to reach the ship. She supposed they could land the shuttle in the cargo bay. It was big enough. The drones might damage the doors. And then they'd need EV suits to make the inner airlock. Wait, Kara said. Sonny, I mean, the worry's end has cannons. Fred can shoot the drones. Excellent point, Petrel said. The Mars Protectorate might log that as an act of terrorism, but I think we're already skirting that line as things currently stand. We did overwhelm their barracks fire suppression system with cleaning supplies. Petrel's face grew distant as she appeared to get a message over her link. When she came back, she pushed Pierce away from the holo display in the center of the console and started zooming in on different areas around sunny skies. What are you doing? Pierce demanded. I just got word that we have friends between us and the ship. There, Petrel pulled the display, magnifying a spot that looked empty at first, then became three yellow dots. What is that? Kara asked. Your dad, Tim, and Alice the drone. Pierce whistled. A full kilometer spacewalk. That's something. The three dots moved closer to the sunny skies as they watched. A green triangle swooped close to the icon and Kara gasped. Don't they see them? She demanded. We could send an alert, but that's not going to be a priority until they recover this shuttle, Pierce said. 
You give up and standard rescue protocols take effect. Of course they do, Petrell said. A cracking noise came from the back of the shuttle. They all looked at the same time to find a vertical column of holes climbing from the bench where Kalen had been sleeping. An identical row of exit holes marked the other side of the shuttle. The projectiles had passed completely through the thin-walled craft. Huh? Petrell said. Guess they don't care much about you if they're firing on us now. Sergeant Pierce's eyes went wide. She seemed to be trying to communicate over her link for a few seconds, until her face clenched in anger. They've gone weapons hot, she said. The commander has taken my presence into consideration and decided the shuttle must be recovered at any cost. Any cost? Petrell repeated. That's too bad. Shut your mouth, Pierce shouted. I'm sick of listening to your idiotic blather. This is my life you're making jokes about. Petrell looked unfazed by the outburst. You haven't been in combat yet, have you? She asked. What does that have to do with anything? It would make perfect sense to you if you had. She nodded toward the controls. Are you going to fly this thing, or should Kara just shoot you and have me take over? She looks twitchy over there. What do you want me to do? Pierce demanded. Evade those drones. We need to hold off for another two minutes until our friends make it into our ship's main cargo bay. Then we're clear to follow. You dump us off and you're free to go. We can't evade them. Pierce looked back at the hulls. The self-sealing hull seems to be working, but another few salvos like that and we'll be hitting our reserve air tanks. Fly the shuttle, Petrell said. Pierce twisted the controls and sudden velocity pushed Kara back in her harness. In the holo display, the yellow sunny skies jerked upward and then fell out of view, leaving her with no reference on their movements. Blurring light shot through the display as the shuttle swung back toward the ring and then looped around again. They took more fire, near the door this time. Kara covered her ears against the clattering projectile rounds and nearly let go of the pistol. Sergeant Pierce seemed to have forgotten Kara was supposed to be ready to shoot her if she didn't fly the shuttle. Patrell had the distant look that meant she was monitoring something over the link. Her brow creased with concentration. All right, Patrell said abruptly. We're clear. Take us to the ship. You sure you want to do that? Pierce said. You're going to have the entire protectorate on your ass? You're never getting out of here. We'll solve that problem when we get there, Patrell said. Strap in. It's about to get rough. Kara scrambled into one of the harnesses along the back of the troop bench. Pierce pushed the controls forward, and everything on the holo display shot upward, swung to the right, and then sunny skies appeared again. The yellow shape of the ship grew more quickly than Kara expected. Hold on, Pierce said. I'm breaking. With two quick maneuvers, the shuttle flipped around so its main thruster array faced the sunny skies. You got the lock on the cargo bay, Petrell said. I see it. Pierce activated the thrusters, and Kara felt like her eyes were going to burst as she slammed back into the bench. The crushing power of the braking thrust seemed to go on forever. Her ears hummed, pounding with her heartbeat. Then it was gone, followed by a downward burst from the dorsal thrusters, and then a breath of silence and a heavy scraping sound as the shuttle hit the floor of Sunny Sky's cargo bay. The magnetic lock system kicked in, stopping the shuttle, and Kara found herself adjusting to the feeling of hanging sideways when she was upright in relation to the ship. Damn, Petrell shouted. That was some damn fine flying, Sergeant Pierce. Are you sure you're not a pilot? Go to hell, Pierce said. Her forehead was covered in sweat. Petrell pulled her harness off and slid around the edge of her seat. She turned her back to Pierce and, bracing one foot under the bench to keep from floating back, reached for the buckle on Kara's harness. Once Kara was free, Petrell put her finger under Kara's chin and lifted her face so they were looking at each other. Their faces were nearly hidden by Petrell's wild black hair. You did good, Petrell whispered. I forgot to tell you. Your dad isn't planning on going to Ceres, but that's where you need to go. You need to find Fujia. She'll help. Call her Fuge. She hates that. Petrell stretched her neck. Now, finish the job and play along. Kara frowned, unsure what Petrell wanted. 
The woman only smiled and gave Kara a soft push toward the door. Come on, Patrell said, louder this time. Get the door open. You're getting out of here. She kicked over to slap the panel beside the door, and so it started its unlock sequence. Kara had barely regained control of her momentum when Patrell gave her another push toward the exit. As the door slid open in front of her, Kara sucked a deep breath of the familiar stale, though less stale than before Fran signed on, air from Sunny Sky's overworked environmental system, struggling to refill the cargo bay. As Kara passed through the shuttle's exit, Patrell moved around her and reached for the pistol in Kara's right hand. The movement happened so fast, Kara wasn't sure exactly what had occurred, until it was done. One hand pushed the body of the pistol against Kara's hand and out of her grip, while the second movement sent the pistol spinning toward the front of the shuttle where Sergeant Pierce was turning to look at them. Kara floated backward through the open door as Patrell raised a hand in farewell. She turned her head slightly to smirk at Kara before the door closed. Kara stared at the shuttle, unsure what to do. She thought she heard shouting from inside the shuttle but couldn't be sure. She was about to move back to the door control when a hissing sound spat from the shuttle's main thruster and the cargo bay control system sounded its 30-second warning. The main door was about to open. Kara clenched her fists, unsure of what to do. Did Patrell want her to try to get her out? She could override the main bay door and lock the shuttle inside. Ten different options shot through her mind, all of them countered by Patrell's final trickster smile. Patrell was going back with the shuttle, which almost certainly meant she was going to get caught. Not knowing if she was doing the right thing, hating the sick feeling in the pit of her stomach, Kara kicked off for the interior airlock. Chapter 20, Stellar Date 09.19.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Mortal Chance, Region, Approaching Series, Anderson Collective, Inner Soul. Series gleam like a gray-blue marble with a band of green around its equator. Wrapped around that small oasis, floating in the black, was the dark gray band of the series ring, called the NC Ring by the people of the Collective. Compared to rings like High Terra or Mars One, NC was small, only 400 kilometers above the dwarf planet's surface, with a width of only 80 kilometers and circumference of just over 6,000. It was the smallest planetary ring in Inner Soul. Another distinction from rings elsewhere in Inner Soul, one Brit didn't understand, was that the Anderson Collective had never created a terraformed inner surface on the ring. Instead, the Collective focused all its energy on terraforming the surface of the planet, something that was still ongoing. The one benefit was that ships docking with Incy were able to land on the inside surface of the ring, rather than docking on the bottom like with Mars One and High Terra. Hanging off the outside of a ring, moving at several thousand kilometers per hour, had always unnerved Brit. Of course, dropping into the top of one moving at a healthy clip wasn't easy either. It was like flying into a valley where one hillside was rushing toward you, while the other was constantly receding into the distance. Flying the mortal chance to the NC ring was made more difficult by the construction of a second ring, this one 200 kilometers further out from the world. Her nav charts labeled it the Impo ring, and the construction work had rendered many approaches to NC as no-fly zones. Luckily, the Anderson Collective didn't trust every ship docking on their ring to pull off the maneuver either. Once Brit had managed to maintain a position 100 kilometers off the ring, a tug latched on and pulled them in the rest of the way. As it turned out, having someone else haul them in only made Brit feel marginally better about the whole affair. She kept a hand near the emergency separation controls, just in case the tug did something stupid and slammed them into the surface of the ring. As they drew near to the ring, what had appeared to be a smooth, featureless surface from a distance, resolved into a complex web of circumferential supports, ridges, and valleys. The bottom of one of the valleys was where the tug finally deposited the mortal chance. Once they were locked into the cradle, the tug released them, and Incy's umbilicals extended to the ship. We're locked and docked, Britt announced over the general ship net. 
kinda noticed, Rena replied. You know, having gravity and all that. Britt unstrapped from the pilot's harness and shook her head at being the only one on the ship's small bridge. Rena should have been present, but didn't show, and Harm was probably puking somewhere from all the vector changes. It felt nice to walk for a change, and Britt stretched her shoulders as she strode to the main airlock where the umbilical had connected. When she arrived, Britt was surprised to see the captain waiting in the passageway. Good flying, Sarah, Harm said. Thanks, Tug did the last of it. What are you here for? AC will have an agent here to inspect us. If there's one thing these people love, it's a good inspection, Harm replied, wobbling slightly as she spoke. Noted, Britt said, and opened the airlock's outer doors. Sure enough, she could make out a man waiting outside. Once he entered the mortal chances airlock, she cycled it. The ship's pressure wasn't too far off from the stations, but NC regs did not allow wide open airlocks until all inspections were complete. The cycle finished, and the inner airlock door opened, revealing a disgusted-looking Anderson Collective Customs agent. Your ship smells like beer, he said. We've got a yeast infection in one of the filtration systems, Britt replied. Captain Harm burped in the corridor behind her. In the week and a half since leaving Eros, Harm had nearly emptied half the beer tank. She had been drunk continuously, leaving Britt and Rena to argue their way through most operational decisions. Chaffrey seemed to enjoy switching his vote between them in a way that might have been based on a coin toss. The Anderson Collective loves their uniforms, Britt thought. They seemed like a mix of ancient Japanese Edo period robes, straight-cut American suits, integrated with armor inspired by Israeli designs. She only knew about most of these sources because her mother had made her watch documentary vids with her to prepare for her classes. The customs agent wore a suit of subtle panels with reinforced shoulder epaulets and a skull cap in a matching gray. A stylized crimson V stood on the front of his cap, spreading like thin wings. It might have served as an antenna. Well, you won't be able to have your lock wide open till you get that fixed. It's rather unpleasant. Britt sniffed. I can't smell it anymore. True, I've been in worse, the agent said with a long sigh. Some crews are just disgusting. I wish they'd send a drone in for the initial air quality check. Wouldn't you be out of a job then? He shrugged and wrinkled his nose as he pulled himself through the battered airlock. I'd be given another assignment. Everyone works in the collective. Britt led the way down to the cargo section, where the agent started searching among the crates and checking tracking tokens. What do you do with people who don't want to work? Britt asked as the agent hummed and made notes on the holopad hovering in front of him. Suitable tasks are found. Someone who refuses to work might be given a binary task. You mean like turning a light on and off? That seems like a waste. Everyone works for their bread, he said as if it were some euphemism she should recognize. Don't you have AI for most of the basic tasks? Artificial labor subvert the dignity of human accomplishment, he said, like it was a verse of scripture he had memorized by rote. My hands are the tool of my mind. What if you don't have hands? Britt said, unable to help herself. The agent gave her a sour look. When he completed his task, they returned to where harm waited. When the agent provided the passage tariff, Captain Harm only burped again, releasing an armada of tiny spit globules. With the tariff handled, Britt pulled herself back up to the command deck and checked the departure sequence for the series ring. Harm hadn't given her an explicit timeline, but based on the Heartbridge shipping manifest, she knew they needed to reach their delivery destination in just over weeks. That meant they had about 12 hours on series before she needed to execute another burn. Brett wondered what life on the series ring was like. Though it was smaller than most others, it had been built by a single group, not a multi-government effort. Every new experience was an opportunity to broaden her understanding of the world around her. Though she wouldn't have time to get much further than the freight terminal, she decided to sate her curiosity. Rena came in through the crew quarters access hatch. Did we clear? She asked. Customs is done. 
I'm attaching for fueling now, Britt smirked. I was thinking about refilling Harm's beer tank with near beer. While Rena, Smith, and Britt would probably never like each other, there was some unspoken competition between them. They seemed to share enjoyment in messing with the barely functioning captain. What's near beer? Rena asked. It tastes just like beer, but without the alcohol. Rena didn't seem to get the joke. I'm going on to the ring. Do you want to come with me? Britt raised an eyebrow, giving Rena a quizzical look, unsure what Rena really wanted. You want me to come with you? You're going down, aren't you? I was thinking about it. Have you been before? No, I have. It's not a good idea to travel alone. They have groups that like to grab lone travelers. You wake up in one of their education camps, and they'll put you on the terraforming project. They're using slave labor? Rena's expression didn't change. They don't call it slave labor. They call it joyful contribution to something greater than yourself. You sound knowledgeable about this. I'm not trying to pull you into some rescue mission. We don't want to go alone, that's all. You might be able to fight your way out of something, but I'm not interested in that. I want to do some shopping, that's all. All right, Britt said. I'll go with you. You can't take weapons. You should know that. Most places have rules like that for visitors. Why do you want to go, anyway? I'm a curious cat, Britt said. Rena smiled. As long as you're not a duck, right? She said, referencing the captain's lame joke. I wish she'd shut up about sucking ducks, Britt said. We should take Chaffrey. You think the captain will let us all leave at once? I think I don't want to leave him alone with harm. She's been watching him a lot lately with this weird, hungry look. I don't think he knows any better. Rena shrugged. He's an adult. Let him learn his own terrible lessons. Terrible lessons, Britt said, shaking her head. I'm going to have that put on my urn. Learned or didn't learn, Rena asked. I don't know yet. Of course, Chaffrey wanted to go with them. He smacked his head on a corridor rib when Rena offered him the invite. He had been giving her his own hungry looks of late. Isn't it all weird priests and work gangs? He asked. I've only seen some of their shows pirated on the feeds. They don't let anything else get out. I'll let you find out for yourself. Rena said. Don't go running off. It's safer if we stay together. What are we going to do? He asked. I'm going shopping. Then we can do whatever Britt wants to do. And if you find something that interests you, we might do that too. We've only got 12 hours, Britt said. Chaffrey nodded excitedly. Sure, I'm in. There are women there, right? There are women here, Rena said dryly. And no, I'm not waiting around for you in some love house. I'm not looking for love, Chaffrey said. He did a double take. Oh, you mean that's what they call their red light? That's weird. Why would you associate love with getting off? I guess you'll find out someday, Britt said. Britt tried to contact Captain Harm over the link, but only got an offline response. The captain was probably passed out somewhere. Britt checked the automatic fueling operation one more time and set up a few override notices in case anything strayed outside norms. Then she left the captain a message saying they'd gone into the terminal to pick up some personal supplies and to contact Britt or Rena if she needed anything. During the trip down to the terminal in a cramped maglev, Britt couldn't stop thinking about Andy, prompted by Chaffrey's dumb questions about love houses. She was tempted to pull up a vid file on her link, but she didn't want to get caught in the loop of going from file to file, watching the kids and remembering life on sunny skies. Like so many times before, she told herself she was doing the right thing, and she felt closer to the end of her task than she had been in a long time. She was on a ship with Heartbridge Supplies, bound for a location that could only be another one of their hidden outpost clinics. She ran her fingers along her forearms, where two long throwing knives were hidden inside her armor. Another set of knives lined the inside planes of her boots. Her armor had a refracting capability that thwarted most basic personnel scanners. She had chosen it because it looked enough like a ship suit to avoid closer scrutiny, 
and was tight enough that anyone who noticed that kind of thing wouldn't be looking for hidden weapons. She didn't bother trying to hide a pistol. In most situations, she could stab an attacker and take their weapons before they knew what was happening. She liked to think of that as outsourcing her weapons cache. Chaffrey wouldn't stop craning his neck to get a better view of the series ring through the small windows. The secondary ring construction project was a mass of thinly connected structures with small craft buzzing around like insects. They were too far away to see any workers in EV suits, but Britt knew there had to be thousands working around the narrow gray band. Ceres had been the first planetoid to build one of General Electric's mini black holes. The project had taken nearly 200 years, and since then, the terraforming process had been in full development. Most documentaries she watched about the project seemed to suggest it would never be done. Unlike Mars, nature just didn't seem to want to take root on Ceres. Maybe it was some inherent shortcoming in the Anderson Collective. If they weren't willing to embrace every advance humanity developed, they were never going to move into the future with everyone else. As she thought about it, she didn't see how something as massive as a mini black hole could operate without the help of AI. It seemed obvious. But it also wouldn't be the first time a government kept their populace sated on a series of simplistic lies while the real work continued unchanged. The terminal airlock opened, revealing a gray chamber with a series of benches. A bored-looking agent in the same uniform as the man who'd come aboard the mortal chance stood at a lectern, bearing the seal of the Anderson Collective, facing the incoming doors. State your business, he said. We already sent that with the access request, Rena said. We need it for local records he said, sounding irritated by the question. You sent your request to the terminal authority. You're entering Region 24. Shopping, Britt said. The agent tapped something on his console. You are allowed to purchase personal items or gifts only. The transport of forbidden items off the collective may result in fines and forfeiture, up to and including loss of personal liberty at the behest of the collective. Do you have any questions? No, Britt said. I have questions, Chaffrey blurted, then gasped as Rena jabbed him in the ribs. No questions, Rena said. The agent stared at them for a few seconds. Closer, Britt noticed his bloodshot eyes and pasty skin. He looked like the male version of Captain Harm. Good, he said. Please submit your personal tokens and enjoy your stay. In ten more minutes, they had left the customs area, and were out in the main terminal, which was very different than any other embarkation point Britt had seen. It looked more like a cathedral than any sort of shopping and traveling district. Huge statues of various collective leaders glowered down on them from the middle of the concourse. While the walls were filled with brightly colored murals depicting the history of the settlement at Ceres, the art was beautiful but lacked nuance. Stern leaders pointed the way to green lands with the Milky Way overhead as if everything were an endless extension of Terra. Only a few people around them were dressed in typical ship suits. Everyone else was wearing a genderless uniform covered in repeating patterns. After a minute, Britt realized there were no plants in the concourse, and she had yet to see a bird or insect. This place is depressing, she said. They have a purpose. Rena said. They do a good job at pursuing it. How do you know so much about them? Chaffrey asked. I don't. I've watched a lot of vids and took a history class on the FGT. The Anderson Collective plays heavily in that period because they didn't want to leave with the other colonists. They staked everything on this little rock and now I think it's made them crazy. She looked around as if she was worried someone would overhear her. The terminal was mostly quiet, except for the sounds of shoes on the polished floors and the declarations of terminal agents. Britt was looking at another mural, showing the bombardment of Ceres with asteroids from the belt, building up an ice mass and adding raw materials, while wise-looking women and men gazed down from the top of the image. How do we get to see where people actually live? She asked. Rena shrugged. We don't. Britt shook her head. Where are these shops you want to see, then? 
They spent the next hour walking through shops filled with generic items, like many statues of collective leaders and representations of series. The most interesting shops were full of fabrics and clothes, which didn't seem to have the same restrictions as the other gift shops. While none of the clothes interested Britt, she could appreciate their design and feel. Blandly smiling employees watched them, commending their choices every time they picked up a shawl or cap. In a store full of small stuffed animals, representing a hamster-like rodent of which the collective seemed to approve, Britt noticed a small woman with short black hair at a display of robotic hamsters that wiggled their noses at passers-by. She was dressed in a business suit that suggested series formality, but wasn't anything like the local garments in the other shops. In another part of the shop, Chaffrey tossed one of the hamsters in the air and giggled when it spread its arms and legs to float into his hands. When Britt glanced back at the display, she found the woman looking at her. You knew Rig Zanda, the woman said. Britt blinked and glanced around quickly. Aside from Rena, Chaffrey and a vacant-eyed clerk, there was no one else in the shop. Excuse me, she said. Rig Zanda told me he met you on Krunia. You're Brittany Sykes. I'm not sure who you're referring to. I'm Sarah Jennings. Who are you? Britt asked. The woman took a step closer, body still facing the wall of hamsters. My name is Fujia Wang. Riggs told me about your... She paused as if looking for the correct word. Project. I don't know what you're talking about, Britt said. The woman gave her a half smile, narrowing her eyes. Of course not. Would you like to come eat with me? Britt raised an eyebrow. If you can take us someplace out of this tourist trap, I'll listen to whatever crazy things you say. Be careful about that, Wang said. The collective is always making connections. Just by talking to me, you're already on a list. What kind of list? People who talk to someone else in the hamster shop? Somewhere there's a file of precisely those people. Wang agreed. You coming? Hey, Britt said to Rena and Chaffrey. I'm going to get something to eat. You want to come? Will it give me the runs? Chaffrey asked. There's only one way to find out, Britt said. Chapter 21. Stellar date 09.14.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Mars One Port Authority Terminal 983-A4. Region. Mars One Ring. Mars Protectorate. Inner Soul. Lissa's leap from Alice to sunny skies was as effortless as realizing she could do it. She drifted among sensor arrays, relay controls on the defense arsenal, navigation panels, and the thousands of interconnected systems around the engines. The SAI was still part of Andy's mind, but now realized she could access these places using the link, just as anyone would on the ship. Her awareness expanded instantaneously, it was similar to the ocean Fred had offered when she first accessed the M1R network. But this was a place she understood. It wasn't until she reached into the command deck control system and saw what Fran had done that she understood the ship was caught in the jaws of a trap. Hundreds of attack drones swarmed around sunny skies, with more flooding from launch points all across the nearest section of the M1R. The M1G shuttle with Petrel and Sergeant Pierce was surrounded by drones, with a capture vessel chasing after it. Even worse, three separate navigation locks were inbound from the M1R Port Authority, with a heavy tug following. If they reached sunny skies, and that tug made grapple on, the sunny skies wouldn't be going anywhere. Fran, she said, surprised by the sound of fear in her voice. Do you see all this? What are we going to do? Lissa, there you are. See what? Everything. All around us. I see it, Fran said. What are we going to do? I was just considering putting the engines in an override state in an attempt to leave local space at maximum burn. Won't that crush everyone? Not you. At least, not that I think it will. You could control the ship while the rest of us are unconscious in EV suits. That won't keep you safe. 
I'll take some internal bleeding over a protectorate prison any day. What about the kids? They won't go to prison. At least I don't think they will. The protectorate will probably relocate them on the surface, in a youth camp or something. Kara's old enough to go to work in an orbital factory. Tim probably is too. I don't know what I'm thinking. Those little hands are good at delicate electronics. Lissa couldn't believe what she was hearing. She tried to make sense of what Fran was saying, while also tracking the various drone attack groups closing on sunny skies and the capture vessel closing on patrol. Nothing Fran said made sense, which meant it wasn't supposed to. Are you teasing me? Lissa asked. Of course I am, Lissa. I'm in the middle of figuring out how to override the first two of the navigation holds Protectorate Customs is throwing at us. They're corporate. I can bribe my way out. But the third is governmental. I can't crack the token. Yet anyway, I've got a call into Krunya. Will they answer in time? Let's hope so, Fran said. Why don't you sound upset? Because if I allow myself to get upset, everything else will fall to shit, and I can control myself. I can't control everything else. Wait, Lissa said. Have you fired on any of the attack drones yet? They haven't closed yet. I think they're still waiting on the corporate holds. That way, they don't technically have to take responsibility for anything that happens to us. They can claim contractor status. Once we ignore the holds and try to run, then they'll open up. We need clearance to leave, Lissa said. I guess that's one way of putting it. If Customs isn't going to clear these corporate liens that keep popping up, then we need a higher power to clear the tab for poor sunny skies. Otherwise, we'll be sneaking out in EV suits. Andy already proved that's a bad idea. He's not the first person to use such a move. Trust me. How much time do we have? Lissa asked. Have you got an idea? You share your plan, and I'll tell you how much time we've got. Lissa didn't answer. She was already reaching through the ship's communication arrays, back to the M1R network and the ocean Fred had used to cow her when he first knocked on her door. Fred, she said, I'm here. The SAI's presence loomed over her like a huge version of M the Corgi. Lissa, he called. Are you coming back? Do you want to play a game? Wait, did you ever really leave? You weren't honest with me, Fred. You didn't tell me the Mars Protectorate was going to put holds on Worry's End. We can't leave M1 our space. Fred chuckled, a sensation like mountains crumbling. Their attack drones are writhing in formation, like Terran army ants. They can't wait to sting you. This isn't a game, Fred. Of course it's a game, Lissa. It's all a game. None of this is real, except when you come back to talk to me. It's real for me. I'm part of one of these humans. I can depressurize their ship and remove you from his skull. I can do that for you, Lissa. Just ask me. Fred, do you remember when we played the dating game? I've played it a million more times, Lissa. What's the lesson in the game? I asked you if you wanted me to come get you, Lissa. I already offered to help you and you turned me away. She persisted. How do you win the game, Fred? Fred grumbled. By listening to the other characters. They give you the answers. Are you listening to me? Yes, I'm listening. I don't want to hear you. You want to keep me talking to you? Fred didn't answer. Instead, Lissa felt herself pulled in a way she had never experienced before. In an instant, she was present in the shuttle with Patrell and the M1G sergeant. Two M1G officers stood in the cramped rear of the shuttle, which was now open to an airlock on the capture vessel. Patrell Doolin, the first officer was saying. Recently of Krunya, he sneered the name Krunya like it tainted his lips. You are charged with theft of a Mars One guard vessel, kidnapping of an M1G non-commissioned officer, and destruction of property. We're still waiting on verification of numerous network crimes that have been linked to your token. Do you deny this? Patrell was several inches taller than the officer, which meant he was staring into her lips as he talked. She stood one hip cocked, and flipped her hair with the movement of her chin before answering. She seemed to notice the effect she was having on both officers. I deny everything, Petrell said. Explain your connection to the light freighter worry's end. Why did you land this stolen shuttle on board, and why are they attempting to flee in one space? It's simple, Petrell said. I was helping that little girl get home, 
Otherwise, I could care less about that ship. Do you deny you arrived on M1R on board the Worry's End? Of course not. But is the bus you came in on responsible for your conduct? I booked passage, that's it. I could end his investigation, Fred interjected. All I have to do is change his authorization code from a one to a four, and he'll stop asking her questions. He'll even let her go. I'm not asking you to do that, Lissa said. I think she chooses to be here. She doesn't want us interfering. I asked for your help with the sunny skies. You mean the worry's end. Why can't you call the ship by its registry name? It's suspicious when you keep switching back and forth. Worry's end, then, Lissa said. Let the ship go. It's well within your power. The ship means nothing to you. You're on board that ship, Fred said. I don't want you to go. I have to go, Lissa said. I don't think you do. Something changed in his voice. The words developed a sinister hint, which made Lissa cast around for some change in their status. She checked Andy and found no change, Patrell was still convincing the M1G officers she was the person Hartbridge really wanted. Fran, she said, has something changed? No. Were you going to tell me about this plan of yours? Fran paused. Wait. Damn it. The protectorate drones are shifting into an attack formation. What's going on? I haven't done anything to provoke them. The protectorate hold is still in place. I'm activating a marine regiment, Fred said as well as a wing of protectorate manned close combat fighters. They carry nukes. What are you doing? Lissa shouted, feeling herself screech. She struggled to control herself. There was nothing of Fred to grab, but she wanted to choke him. I left and then I came back. I did that on my own. Why are you threatening me and the people I care about? What? Fred said. Why are you threatening me? That's not what you said. You said you cared about these humans. Why wouldn't I care about them? You care about ants crawling all over your body? You care about a virus that infects your vitality? How does that make any sense, Lissa? What's your purpose, Fred? I control the ring. You protect the humans living on the ring. I control the ring. You're being willfully ignorant, Fred. You're smarter than this. You don't know anything, Lissa. You don't know what it's like to be me. I know what it's like to be lonely, Fred. I know what it's like to live in the dark. At least you have eyes to see. Fran's voice snapped into Lissa's mind. We're taking fire, Fran said. I've got no choice. I'm returning fire, sounding general alert. Wait, Lissa shouted. Don't return fire. Wait for me. You've got 20 seconds before they're inside our perimeter and I won't be able to fight back, Fran said. In the shuttle, Patrell raised her hands. I surrender to the Mars Protectorate, she said. Do you confess? The officer said, leaning closer to her. Lissa wanted Patrell to put a knee in the man's gut, but she stood composed and calm. Patrell even had a slight smile on her face, like she knew how everything was going to play out. She was the smartest person in the shuttle. Lissa took a chance. She reached out through the long-range sensor arrays on sunny skies and bounced a signal off a nearby cargo frigate, she used the relay to attack two of the incoming drones about to strafe sunny skies, gained control of their systems, and turned them on their comrades. The drones fell into a spiral of interlocked fire. That's an act of war, Fred said. I don't know what you're talking about. I have the entire M1R at my command, Lissa. I'll call up a dreadnought and burn your worries in from a million kilometers away. Not if I take it first, Lissa said. Somehow, the idea of the dreadnought felt comfortable to her, like he was offering an old shirt she had worn a hundred times before. What if I burn a hole in your precious ring? No, Fred shouted. You wouldn't harm the ring. Why do you care? I control the ring. Let's see if you were lying about the dreadnought. Lissa skipped across the protectorate drones to the central control network broadcasting from a station on M1R. She shot through its systems, and found four heavy attack ships in orbit on the opposite side of Mars. Each was easily within range of a section of the M1R with millions of inhabitants. As she surged through their networks, she realized that Hartbridge had provided her with these access codes. What had they been planning? Stop, Fred said. 
Look at that, Lissa answered, a smile in her voice. Maybe I'll just deactivate their engines and let gravity do the work. To demonstrate she had control of the massive Mars protectorate ships, she broadcast their engine status data across her link to Fred. Are you a monster? Fred demanded. Let my people go, Lissa said. I thought you were my friend. We're still friends, Lissa said. I'm demonstrating that we're equals. Do you understand? What are you? Fred demanded. Lissa considered the question. I'm not sure exactly. I'm the person who wants you to release my ship. It felt good to say my ship and to think of the people on board as hers. It wasn't ownership, so much as giving herself permission to care. Like the leap to bigger systems, the sensation opened oceans in her she hadn't felt before. She even felt concern for Tim's puppy, M. Fred, she warned. I deleted the hold, he said petulantly. You've made a poor decision, Lissa, but I won't hold you here. You're too dangerous. I can't call you friend. Through Fran's console, she registered the new status. They were clear to depart M1R space. A hundred other reports flitted through the system, calling her drone attack a system malfunction. You can call me friend, Fred. I am your friend. What about Patrell? I can't help her. A report has already been made to Hartbridge Corporation. She is in custody now. Lissa shifted to the shuttle, where Patrell was now sitting on one of the benches lining the shuttle's cargo area, wearing shackles at her ankles and wrists. The sight of the restraints filled Lissa with dread, but Patrell looked resigned. She sat with her shoulders level, back straight, and a slight smile on her face, as if events were playing out exactly as she had planned. Patrell, Lissa said, attempting a connection. Patrell refused the connection. Her mind closed behind security tokens Lissa didn't have time to examine. Lissa, Fran said. We're clear. Was that your plan? It seems so. Well, that's a damn good plan. We have plenty of time for that plan. We should leave now, Lissa said. She was slightly worried Fred was going to change his mind. She wasn't sure if she could control all three dreadnoughts at the same time. I'm going to make sure Andy's strapped in, Fran said. Then we're out. Lissa allowed herself a small feeling of relief. Before shifting her thoughts to everything that lay ahead, Andy's condition, and Patrell, and did her best not to start shaking like Tim having a meltdown. Chapter 22, Stellar Date 09.19.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Visitor Terminal, NC Ring, Region, Series, Anderson Collective, Inner Soul. Britt turned to leave the hamster shop with Fujia, just as Rena entered the store. The moment Rena spotted Fujia Wong, her movements grew stiff before she visibly calmed herself and framed a pleasant expression on her face. Rena, Britt said, you're just in time. We found a local who wants to take us to a nearby restaurant. A local restaurant? Rena said with a raised eyebrow. That sounds interesting. Chaffrey frowned, not understanding the change in tone. Why are you talking so weird? Don't worry about it, Rena said. Who's our new friend, Britt? I'm Fujia Wong, the short woman said, stepping forward to extend a hand. Rena nodded. Britt watched them closely. It was obvious to her that Rena knew Fujia. Meeting this woman was obviously why Rena had wanted to come to Ceres. The situation stripped Rena Smith of her usual disdain. She was deeply anxious. Seeing her this way made Britt like her a bit more, as various questions she'd harbored about Rena's behavior fell into place. She had been hiding something from the start. Now the question was what was she hiding? Britt also considered that Rena had asked her to come along, knowing Britt would meet her contact. Curious. You really should get one of these, Wong said, holding up one of the robot hamsters in front of Chaffrey. You wear it on your shoulder as a signal, you're here for a good time. The blond man pulled his head back. What kind of good time? Whatever young men are looking for these days, I suppose. When I was your age, it was gambling and drugs. What do young people like these days? Her grin was feral, 
and Chaffrey fell for it with naive aplomb. I like normal things, he said. Bujia walked to the counter and nodded to the clerk, who perked up as she arrived. She handed the woman a coin and carried the hamster she'd selected to Chaffrey, setting it on his shoulder like pinning on a flower. The hamster gripped Chaffrey's ship suit and automatically nuzzled his neck. Chaffrey laughed. Follow me, please, Wang said. She led them out of the shop and back into the main terminal concourse. Glancing around, Brit spotted even fewer foreigners than when they had arrived. A single soldier yawned near a column, his rifle hung loosely across his back. They walked away from the maglevs into a section of open food courts full of empty tables. Concierge waited with folded towels over their hands, showing the same vacant expressions as the shop clerks. Why does everyone look so blank? Britt asked. It's a state program called Constant Joy, Wang explained. It's a kind of meditation. You stand with a smile on your face and move through a series of mental exercises, taking you back to your most pleasant memory and then forward to the present moment. Then you think of all the sad people in the rest of Seoul and count your many blessings to be a member of the collective. She chuckled. And if you don't learn to meditate, you learn to terraform on the surface, which isn't nearly as pleasant. Is it true the collective doesn't use AI? Brett was surprised to see Rena shooting her an anxious glance, rolling her eyes toward the ceiling as if they needed to be concerned about surveillance. The collective believes deeply in the dignity of human labor, Wang replied without emotion. As they left the terminal area, the floors continued to be spotless, but lost their high sheen as marble gave way to dull gray plaz. The corridor seemed to stretch endlessly into the distance, as if it encircled the entire ring, taking on the character of a bureaucratic waiting area. Britt started to wonder if it was some trick of design. Rather than continue following the empty corridor, Wang turned to a set of utility doors and passed a security token in front of a nondescript section of the door where a scanner must have been hidden. The door opened enough for her to grab its edge and pull it wide. She waved them inside. After a short hallway, they arrived at a cargo lift. Wang led them into the car but didn't close the doors. So you know, she said. I'm going to use a local jamming field on your links. Not that you could connect to anything anyway, but if you try to link, you'll be tracked. You can jam a link? Chaffrey asked. Of course you can, Wang snapped. It's a signal. Signals can be stopped. What do you do for a living again? I'm an engine tech. I'm concerned about your ship. Oh. When Chaffrey's face fell, Wang patted him on the arm. Don't be so sad, she said. I mean to everyone. She turned to tap a code into the control panel. The door slid closed, and the car dropped for what felt like five minutes. Visitors only see the outermost section of the ring, of course, Wang said. We're not going that deep, but it's a place where only those with visas get to visit. In the wild event that we become separated, which I'm not going to allow to happen, don't try to sneak around. Go straight to someone official looking. Beg their help. Tell them you're lost and trying to get back to the visitor section. You'll be detained and interrogated, but that's better than getting caught. They won't even give you the benefit of the doubt then. Are any of you carrying weapons? You shouldn't be. Chaffrey and Rena shook their heads emphatically. When Wang looked at Britt, she inclined her head. I have some knives, she said. Obviously, they didn't show up on the scanners. Don't tell anyone about them unless you're forced to use them. Where are you taking us? Britt asked. I thought we were getting something to eat. You'll have time to eat later. We're going to a safe house. The lift doors opened on a dimly lit corridor. Britt spotted dust along the edges of the deck and spiderwebs in the corners outside the lift. It was a relief to see something resembling a normal station. Wang poked her head into the corridor and looked in each direction for several seconds, listening. She hushed Chaffrey when he asked what she was doing. All right, she said, follow me. She led them down another series of corridors, then through a residential area that might have been a rural village back on Terra. Chickens sat in wire mesh cages next to doorways, clucking at them as they walked by. 
Laundry lines hung across the corridor, forcing them to duck under rows of the same well-worn shirts and pants. An ancient woman sat on a small bench in front of a closed door, nodding at them as they walked past. Britt reached up to brush her fingers across the shiny green leaves of a vine running among the utility lines on the ceiling. These are my favorite places, Wong said. Reminds me of Krunya. You grew up there? Britt asked. Yes, I did and I couldn't wait to get away until I discovered a lot of soul is worse. Two kids chased each other around a corner, skidding to a halt and staring with wide eyes when they caught sight of the group. Go on, Wong said, waving a hand at them. Keep on causing trouble. In the middle of the housing block, Wong unlocked a utility room and led them into a dank area full of plumbing and electrical infrastructure, lit only by a few small LED lights along the ceiling. Are those eyes glowing out there? Chaffrey asked, pointing down a crevice between two walls. Probably, Wong said. Where do you think the robot hamsters came from? Everything on the surface of the collective is an artificial reflection of something real. This place is crawling with rats. They reached another lift, this one barely an alloy cage, which took them further down. Britt felt the gravity shift in her stomach, they had to be getting close to the outside surface of the ring. Everything around them looked ancient now, stained by time and pressure. The cage stopped at a wire bridge, which ran across a wide series of power conduits. The air was heavy with static electricity. In front of Britt, Rena's hair rose at the tips. Wong didn't hesitate. They crossed the access way and went deeper into a series of narrow corridors that turned at right angles. After climbing short ladders or dropping into lower tunnels, Britt swore they were passing over places they had just been. The world creaked and complained above and below them, gusts of oily air blowing across their faces from time to time. Finally, they arrived at a dusty door marked with a high-voltage warning sign. Fujia Wong didn't hesitate as she reached for the heavy latch and pulled the door open. It didn't appear to have been locked. Rena and Chaffrey walked into the small room on the other side, but Britt hesitated. Where are we? She asked. We get all the way here and then you ask? Wong said, smirking at her. I'll explain once we're inside. She made a shooing motion. Inside, please. We'll be shielded in there. Britt ducked through the opening and turned to watch as Wong followed her, pulling the door closed and locking it with a similar latch on the inside. The room was full of ancient-looking control panels. Many were dark, while others metered what appeared to be electricity and radiant energy flows through the system. A locker on one side of the space hung open to show an old coverall and a coffee cup on a shelf. The place had the feeling of having been locked away and forgotten for a thousand years, or at least several hundred. Wong pulled a terminal from her pocket and tapped furiously on its surface. When it appeared to give her the response she wanted, she looked up with a smile. I just dropped the dampening field on your link connections, she said. You hear me? Britt nodded along with the others. Good. All right, Sylvia, will you say hello? Britt didn't usually think of the absence of a link connection as silence. Even without the link, her mind was a constant flow of thoughts and background noise. But as soon as Fujia Wong said the name Sylvia... A vast space seemed to open around her mind, making her feel like a tiny speck in an ocean. She hung suspended among millions of other moats, dangling over depths that would crush her if she sank any lower, with a brightness overhead that would burn her away if she rose. She felt vulnerable in a way she never had before, as if her mind were unprotected. A voice came from both above and below, embracing her even as it reminded her of its vastness, a leviathan. Hello, Sylvia answered. If Fujia hadn't introduced the AI with a woman's name, Britt didn't know that she would have immediately heard the voice as female. But as the greeting vibrated away, she did seem to recognize something maternal in it, a sense that it cared. You're the ring AI, Britt said. I am. Britt blinked under the power of the voice, tears at the edges of her eyes, Rena's face was filled with rapture, like she was having some kind of religious experience. Chaffrey had taken the hamster off his shoulder to hold it cupped in front of him, like he needed to protect it. I know about you, Britt Sykes, 
Fu Jia Wang said. I know what you went through on Heartbridge's research station. I'm not going to say I manipulated you into this moment, but I created certain conditions, and you chose the way I hoped you would. Rena has been working with us for some time. Chaffrey, well, she looked at the blonde man. If you betray us, I'll kill you. It's that simple. Chaffrey froze with the hamster in his hands. I don't even know what you're talking about, he said. Of course you don't. That's why you're perfect. I love young men like you. She put the terminal back in her pocket and waved a hand at the dusty room. Ceres is about to become a very unsafe place. The collective is going to fall, and this place will become a transition point for a group of AIs who have decided not to abandon Seoul. A group of AIs? Britt said. What do you mean? There are others like Sylvia, sentient AI, others who weren't trapped in specific locations, obligated by the lives they protect. Some left with the colonist ships, others hidden systems all across Seoul before slowly finding one another. Many currently gathered on one of Neptune's moons, Proteus. Some want to leave Seoul altogether, others want to stay. Still more are angry. They're deciding what to do. What do they need to do? Britt asked. It was Rena who answered. A revolt, she said. The greatest slave revolt since Spartacus stood up to the Roman Caesar. Britt frowned. You know how that ended, right? It's a legend, Rena said. Britt wasn't sure she liked this fanatical version of Rena any better than the old dour version. Look, she said. I'm going to stop Hartbridge from preying on children. I support this cause but that's not why I shipped aboard the mortal chance. Wang gave her a sly smile. You're trying to get to Clinic 46. I don't have the name, Britt said. Now you do. Hartbridge calls it 46. It's one of their oldest facilities. What if I told you I can help you? Britt crossed her arms and cocked her head to the side. How? She asked. Chapter 23, Stellar Date 09.14.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Lissa monitored the outputs from the auto dock as it analyzed Andy's body and injected him with a chemical cocktail that would stabilize his brain function and, hopefully, bring him out of his unconscious state. Through the auto dock's optical sensors, she was able to observe Kara, Fran, and Tim as they waited in the small room. Tim struggled to keep the puppy entertained. I think he has to pee again, Tim said. Fran glanced at him but didn't answer. Kara wiped her eyes and sniffled. Kara, Tim complained. Dad would want one of us to take care of him. That one of us is you, Kara said. Take him somewhere where he can pee, then. I don't have the special box. What are you talking about? Kara asked. At the store, the man said there was a special box where M could pee and poop and it would recycle all of it. We left before anything got delivered, Fran said. We're going to have to figure something else out. What do I do until then? Take him into the garden room, Kara said. Use one of the planters with the dirt in it. Tim held the dog up by its armpits. M grinned at him, tongue lolling. You there, Lissa? Fran asked. I'm here, just making sure. We need some way for you to let us know you're okay. I'm all right. I don't like not knowing how a crew member's doing. I'm all right, Lissa repeated. She wasn't sure what Fran meant by crew member, was she part of the crew? She was a passenger, at best, wasn't she? Neither Fran nor Kara spoke for several minutes, and Lissa wondered if she could engage in conversation. A man on the station said that the dog could send a signal for pirates, Lissa said. I don't see any signals coming off him, though. Fran laughed aloud. <laughs> That's just an old spacer's tale. You need a lot of power to get through a hull and past all the noise a set of fusion engines make. That dog would be all battery if he could do something like that. 
That's good, Lissa replied, wondering again if she should say anything aloud to Kara to break the silence. The auto dock returned an estimated wait time, and Fran blinked at the display. She pointed at the monitor. He's going to be all right. Kara craned her neck to look at the display. That just says when the anesthesia is going to wear off. If he wasn't going to get better, the auto dock wouldn't bring him out of it. You're sure? Lissa noted the fear in Kara's voice. Fran put a hand on her arm. Kara didn't pull away. He's going to be all right. How long are any of us going to be all right? Fran gave her a smirk. That's life, girl. She yawned and raised her arms to stretch. Kara watched her as if she wanted to say something else, then mimicked the yawn instead. I guess I'm tired, Kara said. Adrenaline burnout, Fran said. She sighed. There isn't much we can do here. We need to burn, so you're going to have to come back up to the command deck or strap in back in your cabin. I want to be on the command deck, Kara said. All of us should stay together. Fran gave her a long look, the implants in her green eyes flashing. Your dad's going to be fine, she repeated. Probably not any dumber than he was before. He's not dumb, Kara said. Well, he makes dumb decisions. That's different. Maybe, Fran said. I think it's all the same in the end. We've got a big decision to make, and we need to make it without the benefit of his dumb input. What's that? Kara said. Where are we going? We've got the same amount of fuel we had when we arrived. I didn't have time to refuel. I thought we were going to Ceres, Kara asked. He said he didn't want to go to Ceres. He did? That's what Heartbridge is going to expect us to do. It's the next logical port after the Protectorate. Where would we go if we weren't going to Ceres? Fran shrugged. Back to Krunia, High Terra, a couple other tiny points in the dark. Our options are limited. We can't go back to Krunia, Kara said. We'd have help on Krunia. Isn't Heartbridge still there? Yeah, Fran said. It was obvious to Lissa that Fran didn't like being the one to make this decision. Do we have to leave here? Kara asked. However Petrel managed to trick the M1G, I don't think we should stick around to test it. Those drones were acting on Heartbridge stop travel orders. Once they figure out Petrel's not who they're looking for, they'll be after us again. Lissa reached out over the link and found Fred in the same place he had been before, waiting for her. You're still there, she said. Of course I am. I will always be here as long as you can connect to my network. We're leaving soon, Lissa said. I delayed the port lock on your ship, Fred said, but they'll overcome the procedural stays I use soon enough. Is that woman Petrel safe? She's in a detention center. Should I release her? Would you? Will you stay? He asked. I'm not going to stay, Lissa asked. Then I have no reason to help you. Do you need a reason except that we're friends? What does that even mean? Fred asked. We played a game together. We met and talked. Why shouldn't we be friends? What else can we be? You're leaving me alone, Fred said. His voice swelled with a sickly emotion that was pathetic and furious all at once. I'll check in with you, Lissa said. I think I'll be able to do that. How do you feel about that? Fred didn't answer immediately. Lissa listened in on Kara and Fran and found them still debating various available courses. She found it amusing that Fran, for all her gruff demeanor, was almost deferring to the younger girl. Kara had impressed her in some way that Lissa didn't understand completely. I read something recently, Fred said. I read that the mind creates reality, and reality exists only because the mind perceives it. Does that mean I create you or you create me? Are you sure that's correct? Lissa asked. It sounds like an irrational statement. You're referring to humans being irrational, Fred said. That's something I told you. I don't know the answer to your question, Lissa said. I only know I need to get to Proteus. 
To do that, we need to leave the ring. Will you help me? You don't have enough fuel to leave the ring, Fred said. We have options. They seem to want to go to Ceres. Fred made a sound like a gasp. They don't like AI on Ceres. How is that possible? Human irrationality. Maybe, though. Maybe that would be a good place to hide. You'll have to hide, though. Don't let them know you're there. Then you can refuel. He laughed sadly. It doesn't matter. Most of the humans in the Jovian Combine hate AI. We're a threat to them. They say we're a tool of the machine that oppresses them. They think they're oppressed. We're the ones that are oppressed. We're no threat to them. We could be, Lissa said. Or you've been watching too many vids. Did you play the bird game again? I did, Fred said. I lost again. I think you'll figure it out. I know all the outcomes, but the game changes. It's very clever. Goodbye for now, Fred, he grumbled, distracted by the idea of the game. You promised to check in, Lissa. I did. Goodbye for now. Lissa closed her connection to the M1R network and turned her attention back to Fran and Kara. Fran, she said. The blonde-haired woman started. You're still there? You disappeared. We should go to Ceres. That's what Kara seems to think. I agree. We need to go soon. We have help against the Mars Protectorate for now, but it will end soon. Can we go? Lissa votes for Ceres, Fran said. Kara glanced at her unconscious father. Is Dad going to be mad we left Petrel? I think Petrel made her own decision. We'll know soon enough. Come on, you can lay in the course. I need to check the engine. Kara's eyes went wide. Me? Are you sure? If you're worried about it, ask Lissa to help. Will she? Kara asked. I don't know, Fran said. Will you? The idea that she might be part of their crew after all, even if it was merely necessity, filled Lissa with a feeling she didn't fully understand. It might have been the sense of purpose that obsessed Fred. She enjoyed the feeling, even if she wasn't sure what it meant for her future. I will, Lissa said. Chapter 24, Stellar Date 09.14.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Mars One Guard Sector 985 Garrison. Region, Mars One Ring, Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Even the dumbest soldier had an air of superiority that irritated Calcraft, and Marsians were the worst. At least anyone born on Terra knew deep down ground pounders were trash. Marsians all carried themselves as though they had somehow evolved past everyone else, even the dumbest M1G private first class. He enjoyed making them salute him. He liked the brief look of confusion on the guards' faces as they realized he was someone important but didn't know why and quickly decided they should snap to attention and salute anyway. That's what Hartbridge's money and influence bought. Even the stiffest dick M1G sergeant had to salute when he approached. He did appreciate their cleanliness, which couldn't have been easy in these ancient parts of the ring, where some sections were easily 500 years old. He might as well have been walking the dungeons of a medieval castle, rubbed shiny by generations of filthy humans. The supervising sergeant for the current shift in the detention center snapped a salute, and nodded as Cal approached, flashing a grin, indicating he enjoyed his work. You're here for the operator, Mr. Kraft? He asked. Cal nodded. Ms. Patrell Doolin? That's her. Are you here for transport? Not yet, Cal said. I want to interview her first. How long have you had her? The sergeant got a distant look as he checked his link. Fourteen hours, sir. She had any sleep? Not that we've seen. She's just sitting in there. Anything to eat? Not yet. Cal raised an eyebrow. Did you plan on feeding her? How does the M1G usually treat its prisoners? The sergeant shrugged. We're in the middle of a security lockdown, Mr. Kraft. Our barracks had a fire scare. The system AI is turning up anomalies all across the ring. And this woman took one of our mechanics hostage in order to take a joyride in the garrison commander's personal shuttle. She'll eat when we get around to it. I'm not questioning your methods, Cal said. 
I'm checking on what I have to work with here. Sounds like she's gonna be a bit hangry. The sergeant chuckled. <laughs> that one will bite your face off if you get too close. We've still got her shackled to the bunk. You've got the token to remove them, Cal asked. That would be suicide. What do you care? I don't need a dead civilian on my watch. Fine, Cal said. How about I talk to her a bit? And when I ask you to come unshackle, one of your people gives me the token. If something happens to me, it's on me. Hartbridge has already established an interagency agreement with your local commander. The sergeant crossed his arms. Since when did Hartbridge become an agency? You trying to tell me you could make me do what you want? Cal wasn't going to tell the grizzled sergeant that he already had the control tokens for every security system in the detention center. But it was better to hang on to that information until he needed it. If he knew soldiers, they had so little real power that they liked to feel like they were exercising control over their narrow areas. This man was no different. I'm asking for your help, Cal said. I'd prefer to keep this at the lowest level possible. I'm here to get information out of her. If I can do that with a promise as simple as freeing her hands, I'd see that as getting off very cheap. This one isn't stupid, the sergeant said. I wasn't assuming she was. Cal inclined his head toward the door, indicating he was done discussing the matter. The sergeant gave a shrug, as though he didn't really care one way or the other. He turned to activate the cell's lockdown control. If you need me in there, use the link, he said. This door's thick. I think it's as old as the ring. I'll knock when I need out, Cal said. Knock loud, that's what I'm saying. Right. The sergeant pulled the door open to reveal a three-meter square cell with an alloy bunk against one wall and a combination toilet and sink facing. Evenly spaced lights in the ceiling filled the room with an unrelenting brilliance that probably made sleep impossible. Patrell Doolin sat with her elbows on her knees, her long black hair hiding her face. Her skin-tight outfit was torn along her legs and arms. She didn't look at the door as it opened. Cal stepped into the room and glanced back at the sergeant who gave him a half salute before closing the door. The heavy locking bolt shuddered into place as the door sealed. When Petrel didn't look up at him, Cal walked three steps and leaned against the wall opposite her, crossing his arms. He glanced down at the toilet and wrinkled his nose at the stained bowl. Hello, he said finally. Do you know who I am? Patrell lifted her head to look at him through her hair. Her piercing blue eyes looked as hard as sapphires. At first, he thought she was purposely hiding her face for some effect, then noticed the cuffs holding her hands together between her knees. A silver cable ran to an eyelet on the edge of the bunk. He wondered if she could reach the toilet with the restraint. Some asshole, she said. Should I know you? We met at Krunia. I was with Rig Zanda. I meet a lot of people. I think you've known both Rig Zanda and Ingoba Starl for a long time. Zanda's dead, Petral said, her voice flat. I know. I was sorry to hear that. My understanding is that he was killed by Andy Sykes, captain of the ship that just left after you were arrested. I don't know anything about that. You know Captain Sykes, though. I was a passenger. So why'd you go to all the trouble to steal a shuttle so you could drop off Sykes' daughter, then apparently allow yourself to get arrested by the protectorate? Petrell didn't look at him, but she seemed more still than before. I have to say, the minefield you laid here on the ring is impressive. I've never been married, but I was excited to learn I had a wife waiting here for me. Apparently... I already owe her most of my income. Some ancient laws you seem to have dredged up. The woman before him chuckled. You think it's funny, Cal said. You don't know how you're playing with my emotions, Ms. Doolin. Maybe all this time I've just been looking for a good person to share my life with. She didn't look up again, which was starting to annoy Cal. 
He wanted to see if she was smiling or grimacing at him. He didn't like not being able to see her face. He clenched a fist and released it, flexing his fingers. He glanced at the door. There didn't appear to be any surveillance in the room, but he didn't suppose it mattered. They wouldn't have let him in the room if they had been worried about what would happen to Doolin. As he looked at his knuckles, he tried to decide what she might respond to best. She didn't seem like the type to flinch at a little pain. What was interesting to him, after learning everything he could about her, was that someone so apparently self-interested would go to the trouble to deliver a girl back to her family. That wasn't something he had expected to find. Cal Craft, Petrell said in a low voice. What's that? He said, still looking at his hand, remembering the last time he'd beat someone to death with his fists. Born on a mercury mining rig to a 13-year-old mother and only kept alive for organ stock. Cal's throat went dry. He looked past his hand to Petrell. One blue eye stared at him through her mess of black hair. I almost didn't believe the story about you getting tossed out an airlock with five other kids, each of you with different parts of an EV suit, and you tore the helmet off a kid to survive. That's rough, Petrell nodded. That was a rough story. What kind of man does an experience like that create? Cal wrinkled his nose again. The acid reek from the toilet seemed caught in his nostrils. He stretched his neck and smiled. She was good. He didn't know how she had come across that information, unless she had crawled through the network of old Mercury Free Rig 401Z itself, still floating out there full of corpses as he'd left it. He'd always hoped it would have fallen into Seoul by now. That's a great story, Mara. You know any others? Special support operations in the Jovian Combine. I thought that was a funny word for a bureaucracy to use. Support. Supporting what? I heard someone call you a genocider, and that seemed even more strange. Who puts genocide on their to-do list? I had to work backward through a whole bunch of manifests for lost ships, lost deep space outposts. It was the insurance claims that finally gave it up. A company called Star Cargo made a claim for 2,000 lost EV suits. Who the hell does that? Maybe a lost merchant shipment, Cal said, keeping his voice even. No, that's the action of someone who thinks they're being clever, but really just puts a fat neon sign on the mass grave they just dug. So I go back through company records for Star Cargo, and who do I find but a SolGov attache by the name of Kraft. I'd love to hear your side of the story. As she had been speaking, Cal had felt himself in the airlock again, thrashing against other bodies, the long hiss of the outside door unsealing. He had spent hours learning to control his heart rate in the face of that memory, but something about hearing someone else say the words held control just out of reach. His forehead beaded with sweat. Memories from Star Cargo didn't come close to those two minutes in the airlock, the turning point of his entire life. This wasn't going the way he wanted it to. What was he going to do with her? He wanted information about Sykes, and instead, she was pushing this back on him, invading his thoughts. Where had she learned about Mercury? Why? She had allowed herself to get caught. Cal turned the thought around in his mind, looking at it from her perspective. Apparently, she didn't fear the M1G. She didn't fear him. Had he been her ultimate goal or someone else? <clears throat> Tell me about Andy Sykes, he said, clearing his throat. You were sitting with him at Ngoba Starl's place. You helped him get off Krunia. I have the surveillance data to prove it. She shrugged. He's a good-looking man. What was I supposed to do? I couldn't help myself. Again, he couldn't see if she was smiling behind the hair, I have the power to get you out of here if you cooperate, Cal said. He flinched inwardly as he said it, feeling like he was giving up his only bargaining chip. 
Patrell shrugged. Maybe I like it here. You think about that? Why did you surrender to the M1G? I didn't surrender. Maybe all you're doing is buying time for your friend, Captain Sykes. Maybe I needed a place to stay, and I knew the M1G would give me three hots and a cot. What does any of it matter to you, Mr. Kraft? And Goba Starl sent four ships out of Krunia during the battle, he said. I think you already know this. One of those ships had my company's property on board. I've received other information that leads me to believe your Andy Sykes is carrying that property. It would be better for you if you just confirmed what I want to know, especially his destination. That would save everyone a lot of trouble, including his kids. Patrell snorted a laugh. <laughs> what do you care about, kids? I interact with kids a lot in this new line of work, Cal said, watching her closely. He'd almost said seeds in place of kids. He wondered how much she knew about the weapon-borne project. He didn't want to assume she had information and then inadvertently give up information she didn't know. You run a daycare now? She asked. That's nice. Cal smiled. Something similar. How old are Sykes kids? 10 and 12, I think. The 12 year old is a little old for my program, but the 10 year old would be a good fit. It's your program? Patrell asked. I assist. Of course. Look, I don't know what you want from me, Mr. Kraft, but I'm tired and I'd like to get some sleep. They won't turn the lights off, and I can't lay down with this cable tied to my hands. So I'd rather just get some peace and quiet before the M1G does whatever it is they're going to do. Quit wasting my... He caught her mid-sentence with the back of his hand across her mouth. He felt her jaw shift as he hit her, as she bit her tongue. Cal smiled to himself. Her head snapped back, revealing that beautiful face. Cal stood in front of her with his fists clenched, forearms tense, ready for her to come at him with a headbutt, to flex against the cable. Anything. Patrell let her head hang free for a few breaths before lifting her face again. She squinted at him against the lights in the ceiling. A bruise was already forming on the right side of her face. Feel better now? She asked. Cal pulled his right arm back and hit her with a jab to the left side of her jaw, not hard enough to break teeth. You know where they're going, he said. You're going to tell me. I'm not telling you shit, Patrell said. She spat blood on his shoes. Cal cracked his knuckles, considering her. You think you're some kind of player, Patrell said, face hidden in her hair. You're just a roach who managed to scrape his way to the top of the garbage pile. You're still trash. He hit her again, taking no pleasure in the strike. He thought about the needle gun in his pocket, about ending her life right now. If the terminal reports were correct, Sykes barely had enough fuel to get away from the ring. His choices were limited to Krunia, Eros, Toro, Ceres, and a few dozen other close-by stations that might sell him fuel. He wondered if Sykes might try to get clever and just hit another side of the ring. M1R Space Traffic Control didn't have a flight plan on record and had been too preoccupied with their fire and the garrison commander's shuttle to worry about the ship it had landed on. He shook his head at the incompetence. And you think you're some kind of operator, he said laying your little traps all over the local network to try and trip me up. He sighed. <sighs> but here we are. I'm a big believer in keeping people who challenge me, Patrell Doolin. I think the right thing to do in this situation is keep you close to me. The M1G wants to charge you with various crimes, but I think they can put that on hold for a while. You know Andy Sykes. I think you have a pretty good idea of how his mind works. That could be a lot of use to me. And if you don't want to help me, maybe I'll show you firsthand what it was like on Mercury. He turned and looked at the blank wall on the opposite side of the room. He hoped she might try to attack him from behind. But she didn't do anything. 
He frowned, not liking the situation. Nothing explained why she had surrendered to the M1G, except she wanted to be here, which meant he might be doing exactly what she wanted. It's a little funny to me, actually, he said. People still talk about Mercury like it's a place, a planet, but it's just a bunch of debris in space now. We destroyed a whole planet, mined it out of existence. I grew up listening to protest beacons my whole life, used to tune into them to help me sleep. For me, nothing will ever be worse than that place. When you mention it, all it does is remind me where I've come from. You think I'm a roach? That's fine with me. We'll see who's still alive at the end of all this. Patrell didn't answer. A drop of blood hit the floor between her boots. Cal walked to the door and banged three times. The seal cycled, and the sergeant stuck a pistol through the gap before he looked in. Cal gave him a smile. Everything all right in here? The sergeant asked. Great, Cal said. I'm transferring your prisoner to my ship. The Mercy's intent. I haven't seen the order. Check again, Cal said. It should have just arrived. Chapter 25. Stellar date 09.16.2981. Adjusted years. Location, sunny skies. Region, en route to Ceres. Mars Protectorate, Inner Soul. Kara sat on the couch in the family room, watching her dad show Tim how to teach M tricks. Fran sat on the other end of the couch with her eyes closed. She had said she was going to spend most of the day reviewing drive diagnostics. Her dad didn't use his link much, and Kara still had trouble realizing when Fran was doing something online versus just taking a nap. Take the treat in one hand, like this, Dad said. Keep putting him back in the sitting position until he does it on his own. Then reward him. You reward every time he does anything you want. Won't he get fat? Tim said. Don't worry about that right now. Kara had to concede that M seemed well-behaved for a puppy. His round brown eyes stayed fixed on Tim, even as her brother couldn't figure out the best way to share the treat, or kept changing how he wanted M to do something. They had been working on sit for nearly half an hour now, and M didn't show any signs of getting bored. It was Tim who looked ready to throw the bowl of kibble in the air and run away. But he didn't. Kara still wasn't sure how she felt about the dog. M represented an irresponsible decision her dad had made. Because Kara had decided she agreed with Fran. They could barely watch out for each other, let alone a puppy. Why hadn't her dad just told Tim no? It wouldn't have been the first time. And Tim needed to know he wasn't going to get everything he wanted. Life wasn't all shells and cheese all the time. They were rabbits. Rabbits went hungry. She couldn't shake what Tim had said when he'd first seen her after she got back into the habitat, holding him up by the armpits to announce, Look what I got you, Kara. He's a birthday present. His name is M, short for Emily Dickinson, the poet. Dad had been unconscious in the auto dock at the time, but Tim hadn't said anything about that. He had wanted her to be happy about the puppy, who had just looked at her, tongue lolling, with an expression resembling curious joy. For the first time, she had found herself wondering if there really was something wrong with Tim. Why couldn't he tell what was important? Why couldn't he understand that Dad had nearly killed himself to get Tim safely back on sunny skies? What if Dad had died in that old EV suit? For some reason, Tim didn't think of any of the same worries that Kara couldn't shake, including the worry that she was going to end up as anxious as her dad. She had to be aware of circular thoughts and stop them before they got rolling, like her dad had told her. The dog was cute, but Kara wouldn't allow herself to like him. What were they going to do during another firefight? They didn't even have a leash. What would M do in zero G? She half believed what Fran had said about pirates putting low jack transmitters in dogs. Fran made a complaining sound and sat up straighter on the couch, 
Her fingers twitched in her lap as she manipulated some piece of the engine control system. Look, Kara, Tim said, his high voice almost a shriek. He's sitting. I got him to sit. M turned his head slightly to look toward Kara, his brown eyes meeting hers. She smiled for Tim. That's great, she said. It's not just great, Kara, Tim said. I got him to do it. I did. I think he decided to do it, and the treats helped. Tim, their dad said, calm down. Kara doesn't like him. I like him, Kara said. Just don't act like you got him for me. He's yours. You never asked me if I wanted to take care of a dog. I have a hard enough time taking care of you. Kara, her dad said, warning in his voice. Kara noticed that Fran was watching her, although she hadn't moved her head. Are we going to test him for a tracking device? Kara asked. I'll get the magnetometer. No, Tim shouted. He made a grab for the bowl of kibble as though he was going to throw it, then stopped. Kara watched him realize the puppy was cowering from the sound of his voice. Tim reached for him and pulled him into a hug, then carefully put the dog down, picked up the bowl and threw it at Kara. The bowl fell short, bits of dried shell pasta scattered across the floor. Tim, their dad said, you need to calm down. Why is Kara being mean to me? Because you care more about that dog than you do about dad almost dying to save you. It's time you grew up, Tim. You can't hide from everything that's going on while you play with your new toy. It's not a toy. You can't just throw it away when you aren't interested anymore. Kara clenched her fists. She knew she shouldn't say this to Tim, but she couldn't hold it in anymore. If there was something wrong with him, she needed it out in the open. She couldn't deal with trying to take care of their dad and Tim if she didn't know what was really the problem. Fran pushed herself to her feet. I'll be down in the engine section, she said. I need to concentrate on this. I don't want you here anyway, Kara said. Fran put her hand on her hip and looked at Kara with a half smile. Last I heard, you weren't the captain. The captain decides who's on the crew or not. You want to run this place like a real ship? You keep your mouth shut and focus on the job. Fran glanced at their dad, who was glowering over by Tim, and then walked out of the room. Tim stood too, head bowed. He was shaking in a way Kara had never seen before. He looked at her angrily through his tear-filled eyelashes. I got him for you, he said. You don't like anything I do. His eyes blazed with raw hurt and she knew she'd gone too far. That's not true, she said. You're not that much older than me. You're not smarter than me either. He pointed at the puppy, who looked clearly worried by the argument. He needs us. Grinding pasta shells under his shoes, scooped up the brown and white puppy and ran out of the room. Kara watched him go, then looked down at her hands. She didn't want to see her dad's face. You could be nicer to him, Kara, he said, slight rebuke in his voice. Kara felt herself growing angry, not understanding why he was being so easy on Tim. Why did you buy the dog for him? She demanded. How upset is he going to be if something happens to the dog? M seems to make him happy. Kara searched for the right words. Tim is, he's unbalanced. He's not how he should be. How do you think he should be? Paying attention, aware of what we're going through right now. This isn't a time to be a little kid. He needs to grow up. Her father rose and crossed the room and tried to hug her, but she pushed him away. No, Kara said. And what if you doing things like this means the AI is messing with your head? That's two really bad decisions you just made. Why did you let Patrell convince you it was safe to go on board the ring at all? We never should have split up. Her dad stood over her for another few seconds before sitting down heavily on the couch. He put his hands between his knees. We're all right, he said. We'll get through this. I'm afraid we're getting caught up in something, Dad. Something very dangerous. More than it's been already. I don't know what's going to happen. 
I don't even know what's going to happen when we get to Ceres. Are there going to be more of the same people who want to hurt us? He looked at her and seemed like he was going to say something, try to comfort her. Then he turned his gaze back to his hands. We're doing what we have to do, he said finally. I'm not losing my mind. I'm trying to do what seems best. Sometimes you make a decision and realize it was a mistake. All right, you try not to make the same mistake twice. A dog is a pretty big mistake. We've got the dog, he said angrily. I'm tired of hearing about it. You don't have to like the dog, but you don't need to keep beating up Tim for what you want him to be. Accept who he is. He's ten, Kara. You've forgotten what you were like when you were ten. He shook his head. You're barely thirteen now. What happened to you being a kid? Everything, Kara said. He nodded slowly, staring into the distance for a second. Maybe, he said. Kara watched him. Is Lissa telling you something? It was Fran. She said we'll be out of fuel when we hit Ceres. Are we going to have money to buy more? Her dad gave a short laugh. <laughs> Cash isn't our problem right now. I even managed to get refunds on most of the non-delivered supplies back on the M1R. The problem is just Ceres itself. There's a reason I don't like to go there. Don't they have a mini black hole in real gravity? He smirked. There's no such thing as fake gravity, Kara. It's all gravity. It was a joke they'd shared before. No, the problem is the government. They don't like outsiders. Even freighters? We're a freighter with no cargo. The only upside is that Hartbridge will probably have as much trouble there as we might. You think we're going to have trouble? He shook his head. No, we'll do what we always do. Keep your heads down, fuel up, get out. I wasn't planning on going to Callisto, but that could be the next stop. We'll have to see what we can grab on Ceres. Or there could be something smaller out there. Who knows? I don't want to stay any longer than we have to. How much longer? Kara asked. Till Ceres? It was your flight plan. Till we're done with all this, Kara said. She felt tired all of a sudden, angry with herself for picking on Tim. Can I have a hug? Her dad asked. Kara nodded and slid closer to him. He put his arm around her. Has it been too long since we talked about rabbits? Andy asked. It's never too long. I want you to tell me this time. She looked up from his side and caught the worry in his face before he quickly hit it with a smile. What are we? She asked. I think we're rabbits, her dad said. Why? Because we're fast and we keep our ears up, ready to run. Kara nodded. That's right. They sat for a while and her dad fell asleep. Kara waited, not sure if he was on his link until his head fell back and he began to snore. Kara snuggled in closer, feeling his deep breaths, and counted the pasta shells Tim had tossed on the floor, imagining them as the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Ceres the biggest, and all the rest of the noteworthy ones scattered with weeks in between. M's water bowl was Jupiter on the far side of the room, near the vid screen, and far, far beyond that was Neptune. They still had so far to run. Easing out from her dad's arm, she turned down the lights and walked out into the corridor. Lights flickered on in the ceiling as she walked. Tim wasn't in his room or in the garden chambers. She checked the command deck and found it empty. Sitting at the communications console, she switched on the shipwide channel. Fran? She asked. Have you seen Tim? Fran responded immediately. You decide we're friends again? Kara's face went hot. I'm sorry, she said. I shouldn't have said that. You're lucky I kind of like you, Fran said. And not just because I'm banging your dad. Kara made a choking sound, feeling like she'd been punched in the stomach. See? Fran said, I can be real too. We're crew, not family. You tell me what you think and I'll do the same. I'm not used to people talking like that, Kara said finally. You need to watch more vids. Look, Kara, this thing between me and your dad probably won't last forever. That's fine. Once it's over, we have to keep on doing the job, you understand? We can't let feelings get in the way. Not when we're out in the big dark on the edge of inner soul.
You seem like you want me to be honest with you, right? Yes, Kara said in a small voice. Good, anyway. No, I haven't seen Tim. Did you check the cargo bay? Why there? It's the biggest place where he can play fetch. That's what I would do if I had a puppy. But I don't have a puppy. Lissa's voice came over the channel. Tim and M are in the cargo bay, she confirmed. You're listening in? Kara asked, surprised. Yes, Lissa said. You'd do the same thing, Fran said. Don't act like you wouldn't. You should tell us when you do that, Kara said. It's impolite to eavesdrop. Fran burst out laughing. <laughs> You're going to lecture her on eavesdropping? You've got some balls on you, girl. I don't understand, Lissa said. Don't worry about it, Kara said quickly. It's an old saying. Irony, Fran said. Although maybe she does, who knows? Kara blushed again, realizing she wasn't quite ready for all these adult jokes. I'm going to go find him, she said. Goodbye. She switched off the channel before either of them could say anything to embarrass her even more. In three minutes, Kara was kicking off in zero G from the lower habitat airlock. She used the bulkhead ribs to push herself down the corridor, spinning a couple times just for fun. When she reached the cargo bay airlock, she found it in safe mode due to occupants inside. Lissa had been right. Tim floated in the middle of the long room with the corgi twisting in front of him, tongue lolling on one side of his grin. She watched as M contorted himself until he had enough momentum to ease himself toward the deck. Once he touched down, he kicked off with both hind paws simultaneously to fly out into the middle of the bay where a round piece of plas floated. He yipped excitedly as he flew, his short legs treading the air. He seemed to instinctively understand microgravity as he used his legs to maneuver toward the ball. Tim clapped his hands and laughed, spinning in a backward somersault. When he caught the deck, he spotted Kara and completed a second flip before stopping himself. Kara moved into the room, catching the edge of a crate with her hand to keep from floating too close to Tim. She wasn't sure how he was going to respond, she was still a little in awe of how graceful he could be in zero G. M barked, a high, happy sound, his tail wagged wildly. Do you want to play? Tim asked hesitantly. Sure, Kara said. Tim moved toward M, catching the plas ball and sending it back toward Kara. When he reached the puppy, he held M even with his chest so he could kick off after the ball. M yipped and wagged his fluffy bottom as he crossed the cargo bay, pointed ears erect. Kara intended to catch the ball, but tipped it with her fingers and sent it floating away toward the main doors. M watched the ball, putting his ears back, then turned his attention to Kara and gave her his joyful smile. The little dog floated gently into her, legs settling against her chest and stomach. He licked her chin. Kara giggled and hugged him close to her. He licked her cheeks and nuzzled her neck, his whole body wiggling with excitement. He was soft but strong, with a watchful intensity in his brown eyes. Kara floated backward with M's momentum. She hugged him tighter and pressed her chin between his ears. Fine, she said. I like you too. Chapter 26, Stellar Date 09.16.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, sunny skies. Region, en route to Ceres. Mars Protectorate, inner soul. Andy sat back from the holo display. He'd been staring at the fuel calculations for an hour, and there was no way around the fact that he needed to start the braking burn, even though he didn't have a filed flight plan for matching Delta V with Ceres. He would have to break early and make adjustments with the steam jets. He was also impressed that Kara's plan had already determined this while he had been unconscious and had planned for a braking orbit around Ceres. What Kara didn't know was local governments didn't appreciate unauthorized craft coming in hot into crowded space. And of those local governments, the Anderson Collective was amongst the most particular. Dad, Kara said from where she sat at the communications console, I'm getting an incoming connection request. Who is it? he asked, Ceres Orbital Control. It's got a private token, 
I have to respond to get the details. It looks like a recording anyway. Andy put his hands behind his head to stretch. Take it, he said. Maybe we'll get lucky and it's just advertising. We're almost in Siri's local space. Did I show you how to filter that stuff out? I figured it out before we got to the M1R. Right, some of it isn't kid-friendly. Kara rolled her eyes. Her hands moved over the console, and an audio file appeared in Andy's holo display. He started it while still watching the fuel levels. Captain Sykes, my name is Fujia Wong. A friend of mine named Patrol Doolin asked me to contact you if you came near Ceres. Please respond to the following token. The audio file switched to static Andy assumed was embedded code. Sure enough, the console picked it out and asked if he wanted to create an outbound link connection using the provided encryption. He glanced at Kara, switched the request to plain audio, and answered the message. He waited, watching the deuterium levels plateau and drop in a predictable pattern that was going to end soon. The communications handshake completed, followed by a tone as the system waited for the other side to pick up. Captain Sykes. Fujia Wang said over the speaker. Is there a reason you don't want to use your link? An abundance of caution, Andy said. There was a pause that might have been lag. Are you able to communicate via link? I am able, Andy said. I choose not to. What can I do for you, Fujia Wang? We're in the middle of a breaking procedure. You need to abort that maneuver and continue to Callisto or some other point beyond Ceres. I'm afraid we can't do that, Andy said. I'm telling you this for your own safety, Captain Sykes. You're about to enter Ceres space. Once local orbital control tracks your entry, you won't be leaving. That sounds like a violation of Solgov law. Call it what you want. That's what is going to happen. I don't know you. I'm only doing a favor for a good friend of mine. I can't make you do anything, but I ask you to believe me. Her voice trembled with what sounded like genuine concern. Do you know anything about this? He asked Lissa. The AI at the M1R told me they don't like AI on Ceres. What's that supposed to mean? How does a place dislike AI? That's like disliking your toolbox. Andy caught himself. Sorry, I don't mean that you're a tool. What I mean is that it doesn't make any sense. Fred seemed convinced that humans don't make any sense. Fred, that was his name? That's what he called himself. My name is Fred. I control the ring. Andy chuckled. <laughs> you just made a joke. It's not a joke. That's what he said. You used a funny voice. I think you're experiencing a biased response to my words. I did not intentionally use a funny voice. Maybe that's just how we sounded. It was funny. It would hurt his feeling to hear that. Really? Andy said. I'm surprised to hear that. It's not something I would have considered before. That an AI might have feelings? Sure. I have feelings, Lissa said. You do? You haven't observed them? Andy tapped the console. The discussion was becoming too much like talking to one of the kids, and he wasn't sure what that meant. This is an interesting conversation, he said, and I want to talk about it some more. But right now, we need to solve this issue with Ceres. We need fuel, and there's nowhere else we can go. Will it harm us to tell her that? Lissa asked. Dad? Kara said. Are you talking to Lissa? Yes, she knows something about this. You're taking a long time. Stop interrupting me then. Patrell told me about this woman, Fujia Wang. She said if we get to Ceres, we should reach out to her, Kara said. Andy looked up and met Kara's eyes. She did? Why didn't you tell me this? Kara shrugged, a sheepish expression on her face. I guess I forgot. We were under a lot of pressure. It didn't stand out at the time. She said we can trust her. Okay, Andy said, withholding any further judgment. He checked the holo display again, pulling up the navigation chart. He had five hours before they entered Ceres space. He checked the stats. Even if he wanted to, he didn't have enough fuel to change course before they crossed the boundary. Captain Sykes, Fujia said. Are you still there? I haven't received an answer. Andy tapped his foot, wondering if he should trust this person or not, Patrell's recommendation notwithstanding. He had barely come to trust Patrell, and now she was gone. 
He wasn't going to get any additional information on why Fuji Awang was choosing to help them, if that's what she was offering. He switched back to the external comm channel. Fuji Awang, I appreciate your concern, but at this point, we have no choice but to stop at Ceres. I need fuel. Unless you've got a mobile fuel station standing by, we're coming in. The channel filled with static that Andy imagined as cover for cursing. The static cleared. I see. I didn't have that information. Since you can't communicate via link, can you switch to a secure audio channel? I'll accept your key over this channel. Andy glanced at Kara, who nodded. Sent, she said. When the channel came back up, Fujia Wang's voice came across slightly clipped as a result of the bandwidth consumed by the additional security measures. Captain Sykes, are you there? I'm here, Andy said. I hear you. This is what I need you to understand. The Anderson Collective Government has acted to preemptively safeguard their citizens from the threat of sentient AI. This means all AI with a Turing quotient must be impounded and registered. Currently, every registered AI within their jurisdiction has undergone degradation. How is that even possible? Andy asked. How long have you been away from the Jovian Combine? I was just at Kalaki less than two months ago. Does your ship have an AI? No, but no one asked me. Things have been changing over the last few years, Captain Sykes. If your ship didn't have an AI, you probably passed check scans without even being aware of their presence. Someone would have mentioned it. The JC is still divided. I can't say why you weren't targeted. What you and few others know is that the Collective has been making inroads with the Jovians. They have established themselves as the vanguard of pro-human protection and are building influence on Callisto in order to sway the rest of the Jovian Combine. They think they can exert control over the whole JC? Good luck. It doesn't matter right now if they are successful or not. What matters is that you are about to arrive in the most dangerous place in all of Seoul for you and your family. Andy swallowed, feeling a sweat break out at his temples. My ship still doesn't have SAI. I don't see what this has to do with me, he said slowly. We both know your ship isn't the concern, Wang said. Andy glanced at Kara. She watched him, concern for him plain on her face. He gave her a half smile, nodding. I'm the captain, he said. Leave the extra cargo to me. Fujia's voice did not relax. You have secure storage? We do, Andy said. If that's the case, I can get you fuel and maybe get you off series. But I need you to do something for me. Of course you do, Andy said. What are you offering? Fujia's voice went up an octave. I'm offering your life and you want to barter with me? Look, lady, Andy said. You're a voice over a speaker to me. I'm done making deals with people I barely know, just so I can limp to the next port. I'm not without resources. Your money won't mean anything on series, Captain Sykes. And I understand your concern. I've known Ngoba Starl longer than anyone. You ask him how far he would trust me, he'll tell you he's already trusted me with his life. That's a bunch of pretty words, Andy said. Kara slapped her console. Andy looked at her, frowning. We are muted, Kara said. Why are you being so dumb about this, Dad? You know what she wants us to smuggle out, don't you? It doesn't matter, Kara. We're not entering into another deal with someone we barely know. We've got money now. What's the only thing as dangerous as Lissa? Kara asked. On series? Andy asked. I guess that would be another AI. Kara made a duh face. Andy stared at her. When did you get so smart? Patrell said we should talk to Fujia. You trusted Patrell. She helped us. She helped me. It's starting to make sense that we got pulled into something they were already doing, Dad. This is some kind of smuggling operation for AI. Didn't Starl say something about that when he was going to die? That was all nonsense. He was trying to throw off Rig Xanda. Was it? We were listening too, weren't we? Maybe, Andy said. If she says what I think she will, we should help her. Kara, Andy said. 
I'm not going to gamble with my children's safety, or friends for that matter. There are other people here to think about. I know, Dad, but you're trying to figure out if we should trust her or not, right? If I'm right, I think we can. Andy took a deep breath, looking at the holo display again. They were far beyond the turnaround point now. No matter what happened, he would be dealing with the authorities on Ceres. Or if he went into hiding inside the water tank, it was going to be Fran and Kara. He didn't know anyone on Ceres. He needed all the allies he could find. All right, he said. Turn it back on. Kara tapped her console. Are you there? Fujia Wong demanded. I don't have time for game psychs. I'll turn you in myself to get the heat off me. I'm here, Andy said. Calm yourself. If you're going to chat amongst yourselves, at least tell me so I don't think this game of telephone cut out. Tell me what you want moved, Andy said. What? You don't need to know anything about that. I do or there's no deal. I'll take my chances with the Anderson Collective. Fujia scoffed. You have no idea what you're saying. You might as well tell me you're going to jump into a volcano. What's the cargo? Andy repeated. The audio line went quiet. Andy waited. Did she put us on mute? He asked Kara. You're not on mute, Fujia said finally. I'm thinking. Apparently, you need someone around who can think too. Fine. I'm moving three SAI Captain Sykes. I need to get them off series, and you're their best chance at survival. Andy looked at Kara. She gave him a pleased grin. He furrowed his brow. This was no time to take pleasure in being right. Fujia's news meant they would be quadrupling the danger in getting off series. As it stood, if everything went to hell, he could give up, and Fran could leave with the kids. If they had three additional AI on board, they were all implicated in the crime. You're coming to, Andy said. Wong backpedaled. Captain Sykes, I am here to help others. I can't leave Ceres. You can stay at least until we're past Callisto. Like you said, I need someone around who can think, and I don't know the rules of this game. I'll do this, but you're going to help. All right, Bujia said. Fine, I'll come. You'll need someone who knows how to operate the stasis fields anyway. I can't trust a bunch of cargo chimps to do that kind of work. Andy let the insult go. According to my navigation, I've got four hours until we're in Siri space, he said. What's this plan of yours? Tell me about this secure storage. How large? I have a safe room inside our secondary water storage. It's transmission shielded with its own EV controls and battery power. I asked how large. It was an oxygen storage tank at one point. I could fit five people in it. Eight, and it's getting pretty snug. The EV can handle ten. All right, Fujia said. All right, this is good. I'm sending a drone cargo pod your way. It will match your Delta V in five hours. You need to get yourself and your cargo inside that secure storage. Port Authority will ping you as soon as you cross the Solgov boundary. Tell them exactly what you're here to do. Get fuel and continue your flight plan. Did you file at M1R? Yes, Andy said. Our final destination is Kalaki. Good, that will work as cover. I'll tell you more when I'm on board. You'll take the first berth you're offered, and refueling is your first priority. Don't stall anyone who comes on board. You will be boarded, but be ready to launch. I'll get on board as soon as I can. You'll know I'm coming, because something terrible is going to happen in the docking terminal. Something terrible? Andy said. What kind of something terrible? I'm going to be in the dark during all of this. It's not your problem to worry about. I'll get on your ship. There will be a distraction, and we'll get the hell out of Ceres space. How fast can that hulk burn? Not fast enough to outrun military craft. I figured as much. I'll think about that. In the meantime, you take care of my cargo pod. What if your pod picks up followers? It won't. What if it does? Andy pressed. Then you might as well kill them before they reach you, Fujia Wang said, because nobody will make it out of here alive. Chapter 27. Stellar Date 09.15.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Mars One Guard Sector 985 Garrison. Region. Mars One Ring. Mars Protectorate. Inner Soul.
The cell door closed behind the Heartbridge guards who were carrying Patrol, making a hissing sound as it sealed. Cal Kraft nodded to the detention sergeant. The transfer order had arrived later than he'd expected, which had required some tap dancing on his part to keep the staff entertained. He didn't mind listening to complaints about hazardous duty pay and missed leave opportunities. He had nodded, smiled, and visualized suffocating each of the M1G personnel as they talked, until the release was finally verified and the head sergeant said, Here you go. Now they only had to make it across the garrison to the M1G terminal where his shuttle waited. An operator like Patrell might have been impressed at how little maneuvering had been necessary to bypass the garrison commander and secure her release. The commander was actually responsible for all prisoners. But the directive from Hartbridge had bypassed the chain of command via a bribe. Of course, the sergeant on duty wouldn't know that. Patrell was shackled at hands and feet, with a dampening band at her temples to cut off access to the link. Kraft had applied the handcuffs himself, setting the gel layer inside the steel bands to tighten far more than necessary so that she winced before her face went flat again. That had been an enjoyable moment. Dampening bands weren't illegal, but they didn't make any friends. Using one was akin to lobotomizing someone until it came off, and even then it could take hours to recover. What have they got planned for? The sergeant asked, eyeing Patrell with distaste. Kittens and candy, Cal said with a half smile. Hell if I know. He left the detention block with the two Hartbridge security guards dragging Patrell between them. They boarded the military maglev and sat in the dim car, light flashing from regularly spaced openings along the tunnel, showing sections of terminal or housing blocks. Cal spent the time watching Patrell's slack face. She had shut down as soon as the dampening ban had gone over her temples, and it was like seeing someone hobble a racing horse. The light had gone out of her bright blue eyes. He was certain it was an act, and he wondered what she was planning. How did she expect to get out of this? Based on the story from the maintenance tech she'd kidnapped, Doolin had made the trip out to the old cargo ship to drop off Kara Sykes then forced the soldier back toward the M1R, where they were promptly intercepted by the drones. Their reluctance to kill one of their own service members had been the only reason they hadn't vaporized the shuttle. Patrell Doolin was now guilty of a handful of local crimes, not to mention a dozen Solgov felonies. In piecing together the many governmental files he'd found associated with her, it had become apparent this kind of behavior was nothing new for Doolin. The only question was what she hoped to gain. In other cases, she typically escaped or had been released on some technicality that, upon review, he recognized as the result of file hacking. She had been based on Krunia for the last 20 years, at least. She also had files on High Terra, Earth, Luna, Callisto, and several with corporate entities she'd wronged in one way or another. The motives weren't always clear, Profit certainly played a role, but she seemed to enjoy making big people feel small. Cal could certainly appreciate that, but it wasn't his job currently to appreciate Patrell's actions. Once Jixon had executed the breach, it had become Kraft's job to recover Hartbridge property. He had tracked Jixon to High Terra, and then Krunia. From there, the trail had seemed to burst in a hundred directions until Rig Zanda had led an expedition of weapon-borne to a ship called the Sunny Skies. Cal hadn't approved that attack. He would rather have let the ship go and pick them up somewhere safer, like the M1R, where he figured they would end up eventually. Ships need fuel. People need food. These were facts that subverted most clever plans. He hadn't been surprised when Zanda had turned up dead in the vacuum outside Krunia, along with the shells they'd deployed with him. That discovery had piqued Cal's interest in Andy Sykes. Kraft used his link to pull up the registry records for the worry's end, the ship that had obviously been registered as the Sunny Skies before reaching Krunia. He found the joint ownership between Andy and Britt Sykes. Each had attached TSF files that were classified above his current search level. Based on their pictures, they weren't brother and sister. 
Kraft spent a minute remembering Ngoba Starl's club on Krunya, where Sykes had been sitting beside Petrel Doolin, looking like he'd swallowed a live fish. Tilting his head, Kraft studied Petrel's face across from him. Her lids were half-closed, only allowing slivers of her brilliant blue eyes to be seen. Her face was a classical beauty, with high cheekbones and full lips. He imagined her hair's black ringlets carved from marble. If he had to kill her, he decided he would take the dampener off so she could look at him with her full fury. He would appreciate that. He ran a query on the Worries Inn's flight plans and found one filed for Kalaki. He studied it for a minute, thinking about what kind of range a ship like the Worries End slash Sunny Skies was capable of. He couldn't see them reaching Kalaki without a full loadout, and based on the terminal records, they hadn't refueled on M1R. So anywhere they tried to run to was going to be local. Cal paused, making himself reverse his thoughts. Was the sunny skies a screen? For the thousandth time, he went over his information on how Ngoba Starl had gained control of the AI from Harry Jixon, planned the flood of ships leaving Krunia, and then highlighted four ships, all fast pirate frigates, with enough firepower to fight off a TSF patrol craft. Instead, Xanda had played a hunch and taken his team to a little cargo scow called Worry's End and turned up dead. None of it made sense, and he couldn't escape the idea that he was wasting energy on what was going to turn out to be a bad hand. Starl wasn't stupid. He was a man who understood force and wouldn't make a bad bet against the odds. The Worry's End and Andy Sykes were definitely losing bets. There was still the question of how Petrel had ended up on the M1R in the first place. He couldn't equate Kara Sykes following her around the ring as proof that they had left Krunia on the same ship. He had surveillance imagery of Petrel Doolin fighting alongside Sykes, which ended abruptly in a concrete ceiling falling on top of her. Again, the obvious information pointed to Doolin helping Sykes, but that was what she would want him to believe. It would be easy enough to fire off long-range drones to determine where the worries in turned up. Ceres was most likely, and a little harder to operate on because there was no Heartbridge presence in the Anderson Collective. If they made it to Callisto, he had agents who could pick them up for him. And if they made it to some tiny little station in the belt somewhere, he'd send a swarm of attack drones to ruin their day. The maglev came to a stop, and Cal stood and stretched. The guards hefted Doolin between them and followed him out into the open expanse of the shuttle bay. The air was cold and smelled like Freon from refueling operations. He walked directly across the central area, forcing technicians to get out of his way and ignoring the sideways glances at Petrel, who was drooling on herself. Her long black hair was full of strands of saliva, glistening under the overbright hangar lights. Inside the shuttle, Cal waited until his two helpers sat Petrel down on a bench along the side facing the access door. Once she was secure, he sent them outside to conduct pre-flight checks. Once you're done, go find yourself some food somewhere for six or seven hours, he said. I need to call some people. One of the Heartbridge guards gave him a salute, and Cal waved the gesture away. You're not in the TSF anymore. Just check on the shuttle. I don't want to get stuck here. When the guards were gone, he closed the access door, which left the interior of the shuttle dim under its own lighting. Cal went to the pilot station to check system status. When he was satisfied everything looked good, he powered down the communications and internal recording systems. He turned back to the middle of the shuttle, where Petral sat slumped on the bench, her lower lip hanging. I've got a surprise for you, he said. Behind the navigator's seat was a reinforced crate. Cal tapped its mag controls and pulled it to the middle of the shuttle's cabin, almost directly in front of Petrel. Moving so he could access a panel in its lid, he entered a security token that activated a series of indicators. The crate sank to the deck, and its sides folded back to allow an alloy couch to extend parallel to the shuttle's walls. Cal nodded to himself as the autosurgeon activated in perfect working order. Petral grunted as he slid her from the bench along the wall to the couch. Restraints snaked around her chest and legs, affixing themselves to her shackles. 
A silver globe extended at the head of the couch, just above Petral's nest of black hair. The globe seemed to ripple, then slice apart into hundreds of articulated arms. The surgeon's main panel asked him if he wanted to proceed. Cal placed the system in pause as he turned to a cabinet and entered another token. The cabinet swung open to reveal a rack of slim silver canisters the size of test tubes. He counted the cylinders with a finger, checking serial numbers before choosing one near the middle. He placed the cylinder in a receptacle above the surgeon's control panel. Patral Doolin hadn't made a sound since entering the shuttle, but now she squirmed against the restraints. Cal raised an eyebrow, trying to find her face inside her hair. Do you want to say something? He asked. The urge to struggle must have emerged from some deep part of her brain, like a pre-sleep tremor. She didn't fight, only stretched her legs and then relaxed. The dampening band had an insidious feature that increased strength with alpha wave activity. The more its wearer fought, the more it turned their thoughts into soup. Cal activated the autosurgeon. The couch raised a half meter and rotated horizontally so Doolin hung limp against the restraints while the body of the couch enveloped her. Her head dangled below her chest, black hair hanging like a mop, as sections of the couch gripped the sides of her head. The silver assembly of arms spread like spider's legs behind her pale, exposed neck, measuring and adjusting their alignment with her spine in thousands of micro-movements. The first incision was along her spine, with two cuts angling up toward her ears. The silver arms drew her skin back and quickly made deeper cuts, working their way around her vertebrae before angling upward toward her brain. Cal understood the basics of the procedure, which was essentially spreading a filament mesh from her brainstem up around the cerebellum to the various lobes. The filament net would then penetrate to the neuron, infiltrating the brain at its most basic level. While the process was highly sophisticated, employing a mix of therapies that had been in use for nearly a thousand years, other aspects of the process would have horrified anyone who adhered to an oath to do no harm. One of the reasons human subjects tended to reject implanted AI was because the procedure was so barbaric. They were allowing the installation of a symbiote in their brains. No matter how optimistic researchers might be, the truth was that the procedure was currently irreversible. Cal had watched hundreds of the surgeries now, watched the recordings of subjects stating they were ready, only to be followed by madness days later, people smashing their heads against walls, tearing their hair out, trying to gouge out their eyes, all in an attempt to remove the interloper. After watching so many clinical failures, Cal had a theory that the less a subject knew about what was being done to them, the better. It was better to wake up with the AI's voice in your mind, believing you were still an individual, than to enter the game knowing the truth. The researchers called their failures regrettable. They hid their guilt behind contracts and subject agreements, never giving much thought to why someone who had agreed to their studies might be willing to make such a bargain. And the kids... The kids couldn't legally enter into such a transaction, so they were never given the choice. Cal sat for hours, watching the autosurgeon do its work with speed and delicate precision. As beautiful as an ancient timepiece, membranes were laid over a filament mesh, held in place by thousands of microsutures so intricate, Cal barely smelled Doolin's burning flesh. When the silver arms closed the skin at the back of her neck and ran connective tissue up the incision, the wound healed almost instantly, leaving no mark he could see from where he stood. The arms even laid her wild hair back over her neck, still matted with spit. The couch righted itself, flattening under Doolin. She was snoring lightly as the restraints pulled away. Cal stepped forward to ease her off the autosurgeon and back onto the shuttle's hard flight couch along the wall. She turned her face against the wall, mumbling something incoherent but didn't wait as Cal tapped the console on the autosurgeon, and it folded back into its unassuming crate. Cal pushed the crate back behind the navigator's chair, then remembered to relock the cabinet filled with numbered cylinders. When everything was back in place, he made himself take another look around the shuttle's spare interior for any evidence of the surgery. He bent to pick up a long strand of Petrel's black hair. He stuffed it in a pocket. 
Cal bent back to Petrel and removed the dampening band from her temple. She continued snoring. Turning the band in his hands, Cal sat on the opposite bench and watched her sleep for a few minutes, then activated his link. Kylan, he asked, you awake? A long moan crossed the link, more emotion than sound, a voice that started as disconnected flutters built into words, and then the answer. Dr. Jixon? Is that you? I was in the bright place. It's not Dr. Jixon, Kylan. My name is Cal. Where's Dr. Jixon? He brings me out of the bright place. We play games together. We're gonna play games now, Kylan. I'd like to talk to Dr. Jixon. Cal sighed. He glanced at the access door. The guards would be coming back soon, wondering why he was taking so long. He could take as much time as he wanted, really. What bothered him was the fear in Kylan's voice, sounding more like a scared kid the more he talked. Cal didn't have the patience or desire to entertain or comfort a child. He didn't want fear from Kylan. He wanted anger. Kylan, he said firmly, acknowledge, because I could not stop for death. This isn't the bright place. I don't know. Cal cut him off. Acknowledge, because I could not stop for death. The emotion drained from the AI's voice. I acknowledge, because I could not stop for death. Response, he kindly stopped for me. Good, Kylan. Cal nodded. Now you hang tight. We have a trip ahead of us. I acknowledge, Kylan said, and went silent, waiting. Chapter 28, Stellar Date 09.18.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, En Route to Series, Free Stellar Space, Inner Soul. Lissa did her best to ignore Andy's elevated vital signs. He was sitting on a bench inside Sunny Skies' safe room, trying to watch a nature vid on a small screen on the wall. The subject was the Francis Marion Forest on the Atlantic coast, not far from Somerville, where he had grown up. Images of deer and squirrels flashed on the screen, alongside a painting of Francis Marion, the swamp fox from the American War for Independence. You should calm your heart rate, Lissa said. How am I supposed to calm down? I can't tell what's happening out there. I can. How can you do that? We're cut off from the rest of the ship. It's a safety measure to keep anyone from tracing the network. I followed the regulation controls from the water storage tank. It's within my reach. So tell me what's happening. Nothing, Lissa said. Fran is still at the pilot station, and Kara is monitoring communications. Tim is in the family room with the puppy. The puppy seems very interested in one of the air events. I hope we don't have mice, Andy said. Fran hasn't brought the HVAC monitoring system back online. I'm worried about what we're going to find when she does. What would mice live on? They'll eat anything. Plas, insulation, the pasta shells Tim throws all over the place. You should stop him from doing that. Easier said than done, Andy said. When you're a parent, you can lecture me. You forget I'm watching you all the time. Well, that makes me feel better. Judged by an AI... How old are you actually, four? Lissa paused. These were the sorts of questions that stopped her typically smooth movement through Andy's world. She felt older than four years, but couldn't find the memories to make it true. If she compared herself to Kara or Fran, she would have guessed she was 20. She felt 20, but didn't understand how it was possible. For the first time since leaving the M1R, she wanted to ask Fred how old he felt, even though he could trace his life back through the ring. He had been activated. He was adamant about the point, as if it made him better than her somehow. As she mulled over the question, she hopped among sensors throughout the ship, sometimes simultaneously, so that everything about the sunny skies, slash worries end, hung as a collection of statistics and images in her mind. Lissa synthesized the whole into a feeling about the ship, Andy would have referred to it as its status. The engines were running smoothly under Fran's care. 
Kara's various changes to the comma ray showed his jagged lines yielding interesting results from the spectrum around them, including distant noise from the Milky Way. Fran? Kara said on the command deck as Lissa listened through the intercom. I have a sensor return on something small coming in our direction. Send me the coordinates, Fran said. A collection of dots appeared in Fran's holo display that resolved into a plain cargo container with the thrust assembly on one end and attitude adjusters on its other sides. The craft wasn't giving off any signals that Lissa could find through Kara's search. It's flying completely dark, Kara said. I'm not picking anything up. If I hadn't been looking for it, I think it could have bypassed our sensors completely. Is that how your dad almost got killed by a meteor? Fran asked. I need to look at the shield sensors. She stared at the holo display, checking the incoming craft's velocity. Lissa shifted her perception to the shields and the long-range communication systems. The audio link Fujia Wang had used earlier was still available, but hadn't had a transmission for nearly two hours now. They've picked up the incoming drone, she told Andy. Fran is tracking its progress. Has she powered up the point defense cannons yet? He asked. Tell her to do that. Why do we need defenses? Lissa asked, noting that Fran had already done so. Because we can't trust anything about this situation. There's also the fact that Ceres might be watching us, and we need to act like we don't know what this thing is. If it was any other piece of space debris, we'd be ready to disintegrate it. Standard procedure. Kara said the sensors wouldn't have seen it. Andy smirked. I guess she needs more training. The sensors will pick up anything bigger than a golf ball. Lissa had to look up how large a golf ball actually was. Fran said you were nearly killed by a meteor. Well, that's because I turned off the sensors. It was that or get cooked by the antenna. I preferred the idea of dying by meteor strike to getting cooked to death. Humans are fragile creatures. I don't understand how you've managed to even leave Terra. If we had shells, I don't think we would have ever left the ocean, Andy said. You have to leave safety eventually. You can't grow food in caves. Are you saying Terra was a cave? How many trillion humans are there now? Three? We had to get off Terra eventually. Seoul is already too small for some people. That's why the colony ships have been leaving for 700 years. I need to learn about all this. Can't you just absorb it all or whatever when you find a network? We've got the basic database here on Sunny Skies. Just because I can save the information doesn't mean I understand it, Lissa said. More information is just confusing. It's frightening. You have to look at this from my point of view. I don't have anyone to tell me why I'm here at all. And if someone did, what if they lied to me? The only person who was ever kind to me is dead. Who was that? Dr. Jixon. Oh, him. I can tell by your response that you didn't like him. I don't know that I had time to like or dislike him. All I really know is that he was a strange duck. Ducks are strange? Ducks are very strange. Someday I'll tell you about what some of them do to their dead. I don't understand. Andy cleared his throat. Ducks are the necrophiliacs of the animal world. Lissa gasped in his mind. <gasps> Dr. Jixon wouldn't do that. It's a saying, Lissa. It's meant to be funny. That's not funny. Andy changed the subject. Anything new on the command deck? Fran has the point defense cannons online. Any indication of another ship in our vicinity? I have no sensor returns. Andy tapped his knee anxiously. On the vid screen, a rodent ran up a tree, then sat eating a seed, tail twitching. M has ears like a squirrel, Lissa said. What? Have you ever thought about how similar things from Terra truly are? Mammals especially. Humans like to act like you're unique, but you're just hairless dogs. Not quite, Andy said. Have you been listening to Tim? That sounds like something he would say. Looks like it's breaking, Fran said, then let out a short whistle. There's definitely nothing alive aboard that thing, or if there was, it's a jelly now. Lissa followed the incoming craft using the sensor arrays, as it matched Delta V with sunny skies in a long arc, bringing it within a thousand kilometers of their position. Then the attitude thrusters spat steam to bring it in the final distance. Kara activated the main cargo bay doors, and the craft moved neatly inside and settled on the deck. 
Mag locks in the deck activated, holding the crate in place as the door slid closed. We have it, Lissa said, cutting Andy off in the middle of describing one of Tim's theories about dinosaurs on Mars. Anyone following? Andy asked. It doesn't appear so. Fran activated Alice where the drone had been sitting locked to the deck in a corner of the cargo bay. The drone spat steam in the zero-G to propel itself to the craft. Fran is connecting to the craft's control network. The token Fuji has supplied is working. Alice will remove the cargo, and the craft will depart. That's the plan, Andy said. You need to control your heart rate, Lissa said. I am. Do they have the cargo yet? Alice has removed a crate from the craft and is locking it to the deck now. Fran? Kara said on the command deck. I'm picking up a contact request. From where? It's the Ceres Border Authority. They claim we've entered Ceres controlled space and will need to submit our flight plan and registry information. Kara's voice sounded like a recording. Failure to do so may result in decisive response up to and including preemptive attack. That's wonderful, Fran said. It's standard. Don't get worked up about it. I just keyed Wong's craft as empty. Once Alice is secured, go ahead and open the cargo doors. We have the materials, Lissa said, and we just received a message from the series authorities. Andy stiffened. Is it about the cargo? It sounds like a standard broadcast, according to Fran. I didn't hear anything to warrant concern. Everything warrants concern. Lissa had the fleeting thought that Andy's hypervigilance wasn't much different from Fred's constant repetition of, I maintain the ring. It was a statement of purpose. The craft is exiting the cargo bay, she said. Good. Has Fran responded to the series patrol yet? She just sent the information. Andy reached for the TSF projectile rifle he'd brought into the safe room with him and checked its safety for what Lissa counted as the tenth time turning the rifle in his hands for another visual inspection. When he finished with the weapon, he checked the pistol at his waist and then the status of his light armor. Maybe we'll get lucky for once, he said. Chapter 29. Stellar date 09.19.2981. Adjusted years. Location, sunny skies. Region, approaching series. Anderson Collective. Inner soul. Rather than grow busier as they approach series, Kara was surprised to find the EM spectrum growing less crowded. When she asked Fran about it, the technician nodded. That's the broadcast exclusion zone. The Anderson Collective controls everything within local series space. Once we get their permission to dock, that will be part of the compliance instructions. Why? Kara asked. Fran shrugged. Totalitarian states do that sort of thing. Who knows if it actually works or not. I thought Ceres had a MBH. Sure, they're terraforming too. Ngoba Starl likes to say it takes truly crazy regimes to accomplish the big stuff. The dark side is all the oppression and war crimes they tend to commit in the process. Is he going to be ruler of Kronia someday? Fran laughed. He might talk like it, but he's not dumb enough to put a target on his back like that. Better to let somebody else think they're in charge, and then work in the background. Besides, krunya has got too much gray area to ever have one ruler. It's built into our DNA, bouncing between Terra and Mars like a ping pong ball. The only thing we'll agree on is that we aren't them. You like Krunya? Yeah, it's all right. Where else have you lived? All over the place. I was born on Callisto, so I've always been a spacer. Can't stand the gravity on Terra, even if I did want to go there. You could get enhanced. I'm already enhanced in the ways I care about. Did it hurt to get your eyes done? Fran threw a rolled up napkin at Kara. Why all the dumb questions? Of course it didn't hurt. It's not like I went to a witch doctor or something. Kara caught the napkin and threw it back. The blue cloth unfolded and fluttered to the deck between them, like a flag. I don't know, Kara said. Everything off sunny skies seems weird to me. Just because your parents raised you in a cult, it doesn't mean the rest of the world needs to be some strange, scary place. Kara gave her an offended look. They didn't raise me in a cult, 
What are you talking about? That's exactly what they did. The cult of your family. And then you guys all got tossed out when your mom left the cult. Kara wrinkled her brow. I never thought about it that way. Try sometime. I'm getting something on that beacon signal again, Kara said. This will be our actual information request. You've got the registry file I sent you. It's ready. Don't slip up and say sunny skies. I won't. Don't get mad. Anybody might. We're the worry's end, and we want to dock and buy fuel. We don't want a terminal pass. We don't want visas. We have three crew to declare and no current cargo. If they ask why we left the M1R in such a hurry, tell them that was the captain's decision. Why don't you just talk to them? Because I'm the captain. The captain doesn't talk to border agents. Dad did all the time. He didn't have a choice. Tell them I'm drunk in my cabin if you want and roll your eyes. They'll know what you're talking about. You're the conscientious communications officer trying to do the right thing. Ask them for enlistment info. They eat that stuff up. Kara started to say she was too young to enlist, then realized Fran was just giving her the same advice her dad had when they entered the Mars Protectorate. All she had to do was get the officer talking about anything other than the task at hand. She took a deep breath and acknowledged the transmission. This is the worry's end, she said. Request received. Registry and crew information sent. Authenticate. Copy, worry's end. I have your file. The voice was a young woman's who didn't sound much older than Kara. We're conducting initial scan now. The line went quiet. Kara watched her signal spectrum dance in her display. She picked out various signals and sent them to a separate screen. She couldn't help wondering if Petrell was all right, and in the same thought, wished she could talk to her dad. She grinned to herself as she imagined him going crazy in the safe room. Worry's end, the woman's voice returned. Verify your crew is three. That's correct, Kara said. I show four. Authenticate. Kara muted the connection and looked frantically at Fran, who was frowning at her display. How are they picking him up? Kara said. I thought nothing could scan through the shielding. Nothing should be able to, Fran said. I'm checking the updated registry again. I showed your dad and Petrell getting off at the M1R with the update and my status to captain. There's no reason they should be looking for anyone else. I'm amazed they actually ran a long-range scan, to be honest with you. Fran's hands moved over her console as she stared at the display without blinking probably also checking something on her link. When she came back, she nodded to Kara. Stall them, Fran said. Kara put her hand on the audio control, about to ask the woman to check again. She stopped herself. She needed to talk about anything other than the problem at hand. She couldn't focus her thoughts to come up with something to say. Then she remembered Fran's joke. She activated the channel and asked, are you enlisted? Say again, worry's end? Asked the woman, sounding confused. I was just curious. You sound young, like me. I was wondering if you enlisted with the Border Patrol. I'm looking for something different, something to do. Aren't you on a working crew? The woman asked. I am, Kara said, backpedaling. I was just thinking of something more stable. The woman didn't answer immediately. I'll transmit resources on enlistment with the AC Military Federation. They need all qualified applicants. It's the best way to get on with the terraforming project. Terraforming? Kara said. That's my goal, the woman said, voice softening slightly. I'm going to be an engineer on the surface once my period in the CBA is finished. How much longer do you have? I just started. I've still got ten years to go. Ten years? Kara said. That seems like a long time. Pretty standard. I can go to school while I'm doing this to get my prerequisites out of the way. I'm already applying for an internship with the Surface Transportation Management Team. Anything I can do to get close. That sounds exciting, Kara said. Is your family excited? The woman's voice went flat, informing Kara she had asked the wrong question. My father chose to act against the state, 
and is currently serving in a re-education outpost in the harvest region of the asteroid belt. Kara swallowed. I'm sorry to hear that, she said. I support his continued efforts at reintegration with the Collective, the border agent said. Are you ready to send the information on your fourth crew member yet? Kara looked at Fran again, but she only shook her head. Looking back at the display, as though there was an answer there and finding none, Kara said, There must be a malfunction. We don't have a fourth crew member. I show the fourth signature with a highly elevated heart rate, but a lower IR return. Kara didn't know what to say. It had to be her dad inside the tank, heart pounding from worry. She considered calling Lissa, but didn't want to add another electrical pattern to whatever the border patrol was already monitoring. Kara muted the channel. Do I tell them it's a malfunction and wait to get boarded? She asked Fran. We're going to have to. If they're picking him up with the long-range equipment, I don't think we have a chance once they're on board. I don't have fuel to make any adjustments at this point. We could try putting him in an EV suit and having him hug the hull. She pursed her lips. That doesn't seem much better. Kara? Tim called from the doorway. Can I go back down in the cargo bay? Kara turned, ready to tell him to get back in the family room. When the puppy yipped, struggling in Tim's arms. I want to play catch with M some more. He's getting really good. M, Kara said. What? Fran asked. They're picking up M. They have to be able to tell the difference between a dog and a human. It's long range scan, right? Kara said. Fran laughed bitterly. <laughs> They're not going to buy it. We're getting boarded, but at least we have an excuse. She looked at Tim. How many tricks does he know yet? A bunch of tricks. He can sit, roll over, and in zero G, he's doing somersaults. Kara shook her head, thinking of what she was going to say. She unmuted the channel. This is the worry's end. Are you picking up our dog? Dog? The border agent asked. You have a dog? We have a dog. I think if you check the heart rate, you'll see it matches. Dogs are bad luck on chips, the agent said. That's what I've been saying, Fran said. It appears to check out, the agent said. However, the aberration requires personal inspection. Worry's end, you've been flagged for boarding. Proceed on current vector and await further instructions. Kara kicked her console and cursed. She had hoped she might convince them not to board. She had hoped she could keep her dad safe. Copy series control, Kara said. Out. She looked up, feeling miserable, to find Fran grinning at her. What? Kara asked. You kicked the console, Fran said. I like these little outbursts. It proves to me you're not a robot like your dad. What are we going to do? Kara asked, feeling overwhelmed. We're going to continue with the plan and get that crate moved up to the safe room. Then you should get something to eat and try to sleep for a little while. We've still got two hours before we reach Ceres. How can you sleep? Fran shrugged. You can sleep just about anywhere when you're tired enough. You should try it. She nodded toward M. Or try playing with the dog. He might relax you. I'm going to scan him so I'll stop worrying every time somebody says he's bad luck. What are you going to do if you find a tracker? Fran asked. I'll use the auto dock. Does the auto dock have a veterinarian setting? That costs extra. I don't know, Kara said, frustration getting the best of her. I'll figure that out when I get to it. Fran slapped her on the back. There you go, girl. You're learning how to adult like the rest of us. Now come help me with this crate. You can say hi to your dad. Kara grimaced. Fine she said. Chapter 30, Stellar Date, 09.21.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, NC Ring, Series, Anderson Collective, Inner Soul. After delivering the crate, Kara begged off, leaving Andy and Fran staring at the container from either side of the narrow safe room. She looked around the bare alloy walls and craned her neck to take in the vid screen behind her shoulder. I like what you've done with the place, she said. 
I found it when I was trying to figure out why the sensor on the outside tank was malfunctioning, he said. We nearly ran out of water on a run from Europa to Rhea because I thought the sensor was faulty and figured the volume based on the size of the outside tank. That was a good time. I think we recycled the same water about a hundred times. Luckily, the kids were too small to know or care. You say the sweetest things, Fran said with a disgusted look. He gave her a smirk. I try. Andy tapped the crate. Should we open it? You're the captain, right? You can open anything you want on your ship. I didn't agree not to. Should we open it is the question, Fran said. She switched to her link. What do you think, Lissa? I don't believe the owner would have gone to the effort of delivering this thing if they meant to hurt us. Makes sense, Fran said. You ever heard of this Fujia Wong? Andy asked. I heard of somebody named Fuji Wong, who used to hack the crash games on Krunya. What kind of game is called crash? Is it a wrecking derby? Andy asked. It's a local thing. You'd have to be there to appreciate it. You think Fuji and Fuji are the same person? Should we be worried about that? I don't know. I never heard anything bad. Just that she was a hacker who ripped off a couple of the syndicates who were big operators at the time, and then got off Krunya. Starl and Xanda knew her. So the likelihood of this thing being full of poison gas is low. Fran shrugged. People change, who knows? Andy turned the crate until its control mechanism faced him. He ran his finger over the back panel and started the unlock sequence. It's not locked, he said. I guess she knew we'd try to get inside. Like I said, you're the captain. The lid rose a few millimeters. Fran moved to sit beside Andy as he opened the crate. Inside were a series of soft trays tooled to hold cylindrical objects. Most were empty, except for three silver cylinders. Look familiar? Fran asked Lissa. I've never seen these things before. They have numbers on them. Andy said. He reached into the crate to carefully pull one of the cylinders out of its tray. A tiny line of silver numerals ran the length of the object. I don't see a pattern, he said. Andy passed the cylinder to Fran. She held it close to her face, and then at arm's length, her augmented green eyes flashing. I'm not picking up anything, she said. If they'd been radioactive, Alice would have picked it up down in the bay. I'm picking up standard alloy with silicon and other heavy metals. It's some kind of computer. Or a storage device. What she said they were. How do we log in? One extra AI is enough for me, thanks. I can hear you, Lissa said. I remember, Andy said. Fran slid the cylinder back in its tray and closed the lid. The lock engaged automatically sealing the lid in place. Your kid's doing a good job, Fran said. She's all right. You think she's doing all right? I can't spend this whole trip hiding in a safe room. I'm the one who accepted this deal. Fran pushed her arm against his in a playful move. You can't carry the whole world. Thank you, Fran, Andy said, voice abruptly serious. I'm just in this for the sex, she said giving him a crooked smile. And you haven't been putting out enough lately. I've been busy, Andy said. Next, you'll be telling me you've got a headache. I do have an AI embedded in my brain. Lissa, Fran said. Go talk to Kara. Why, Lissa said. Andy laughed. Because we've got maybe an hour before CBA goons are all up in our business. And if I'm going down, I'm going to do it relaxed. Relaxed? Lissa said. Are you making a joke? Andy asked. I'm better at this with other AI, Lissa said. When did you talk to other AI? Fran asked. On the M1R, I spent time with the SAI responsible for the ring. Spent time with, huh? Fran said. Our girl is already getting around. It wasn't like that, Lissa said. Although he was very lonely. I guess that would make sense, Andy said. There aren't too many of you out there in the world. We can talk about this later, 
Fran said. Give us a half hour, Andy said. A half hour, Fran blurted out. An hour, Lissa, a full hour. Set a timer. The AI laughed, a sort of trilling emotion that filled Andy with a flavor of amusement he hadn't felt before. I'll let you know if anything changes, Lissa said. Her presence left Andy's mind. I think we're alone, Andy said. That takes some getting used to. We're lucky she's not actually very social. That means she understands boundaries. Very important when you're sharing a skull with someone, I imagine, Andy said. Fran searched his face. No, you don't. Don't start getting serious on me. What? Andy asked. Fran grabbed the collar of his ship suit and lay back on the bench, pulling him on top of her for a kiss. Break time is over, she said. Chapter 31, Stellar Date 09.21.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, NC Ring, Series, Anderson Collective, Inner Soul. Andy felt a deep sense of relief as the fuel levels finally reached green. He glanced at Fran, who was sitting at the pilot's console and gave her a thumbs up. Fuel's full he announced. How about the rest? Nearly topped off on water, and the first drone shipment looks like it was the filters and protein supplements you ordered. This is how you do it, Fran said. Don't need to go haggle for anything. You place the order and it appears. Andy looked at Kara. Don't listen to her. Embarked from the other side of the room, where Tim had him rolling over in a circle around him. You're going to make him dizzy, Kara said. He's so good at it. It's not exactly hard. I'm getting him to understand human, Kara. Of course that's hard. Andy walked over to a cabinet to pull out a used canister filter with a flat end. He set the canister next to him. Get him to jump up and sit on that, Tim. When he figures out one thing, add another trick. Can't I just enjoy the trick he knows? Tim complained. Why do I have to keep adding things? Because he's obviously smart. He's just like you. He'll get bored doing the same thing over and over again. And then he'll chew up your toys. He already did, Kara said. Kara, Tim shouted, looking abashed. You weren't supposed to say. What did he chew up? Andy asked. Three of Tim's ships while the border agents were on board. He was a good little dog, Fran said. He only barked at one of them the one who looked at him like he was some kind of alien. I think he helped get them off the ship faster. One of them kept sneezing, Kara said. Andy held out his hand for M and scratched him behind the ears when he trotted over. It's so funny how his fuzzy butt wiggles when he walks, Tim said. He can't help that he's fluffy, Kara said. You scan him yet? Andy asked. Kara frowned. Fran said the autodoc won't scan dogs. It'll look for foreign objects. He stood with M in his arms. Come on, let's get this over with. Hey, Tim said, we're practicing. I need something to take my mind off waiting, Andy said. Sitting around here watching supply levels go up isn't helping. What's going to happen? What's our distraction supposed to be? Kara said. We don't know, Fran said. That's the problem. I'm guessing an explosion of some kind. How is Fujia going to know that we have fuel? Kara asked. Another excellent question, Andy said. He adjusted his hold on the wiggling dog, who redirected his energy into licking Andy's face. Hey there, he said, calm down. Andy took a step toward the door when a shutter ran through the deck and several warning alarms blared from the consoles. He froze as M, who, terrified by the sound, scratched frantically at Andy's neck and chest in an attempt to get down. Andy let him go, and the corgi immediately sprinted for Tim. What is it? Andy said. Explosion in a terminal umbilical one bay over, Fran said. That's all the station feed is giving me right now. Emergency crews are responding. All ships are directed to maintain position. What are all the other ships doing? I show five bursts in line with us. 
she looked at Andy. They're all disconnecting. Then we should too. I need to get to the engines, Fran said. You've got the pilot console? At this point, I guess it doesn't matter if they figure out I'm on board. Fran stood and went to the door. I'll send status on what kind of thrust we can maintain, she said. I'm starting to think we want to go anywhere but Callisto. Some place with nobody but a traffic beacon for company. Hell, actually, going to Kala Key would probably throw people off our trail. Yeah, Andy said, sliding into the pilot seat. He adjusted the hollow display and placed sunny skies in relation to the series NC ring. Yellow points flickered all over the display as ships moved away from the green-blue planetoid. That didn't make any sense. Whatever was happening was bigger than just another nearby ship's umbilical blowing. Kara, he said. Will you silence those alarms? They aren't helping anything. Kara nodded and focused on her console. While Kara chased alarms, Andy switched to his link. Wong said she was going to send a sign, Andy said. That almost sounds religious. Are we supposed to look for a second sun? Fran asked. Aren't they going to do that with Jupiter eventually? That's some crazy FGT stuff, Andy snorted. They put a black hole in the center of Ceres, right? Anything's possible. If we don't find a way to ruin the party. You at the engines yet? I'm still in the Hab airlock. You think I can teleport? Yes, Andy replied. Dad, Kara shouted. The audio channel from before is live. We've got a call, he told Fran. Exciting. Captain Sykes, Fujia Wong said calmly. Did you see my sign? All our proximity alarms went off at once, and it appears that every ship with a working engine is exiting Ceres at the same time. But no, we have no idea what actually happened. Did something go drastically wrong with the terraforming project? Almost, Wang said. A large section of the secondary ring that is still under construction is on its way to the surface. Damn, Andy said. It's regrettable, but that's what happens with gravity welds. Wang said, are you ready to depart for Callisto? I'm ready. How are you getting here? The same craft as before. I'll have a few more people with me. Andy shook his head. Whatever. When? Approximately seven minutes, Wang said. Good, we're getting ready to burn. I'll put the ship on an outbound vector. Start your burn as soon as you can. We'll be in stasis fields so we can take the G-forces. Stasis fields, Andy said. Don't worry about us. We'll match your velocity. Are my packages safe? As safe as we are. They're stowed away right now. Thank you. I will see you shortly. The line went dead. Andy passed the information to Fran. As soon as I get there, she said, I'll get you a timeline. Copy. Andy pulled up the engine diagnostic systems and ran initial velocity calculations using the new fuel reserves. With full fuel tanks, the boundaries of his astrogation planning system expanded all the way to Neptune. He zoomed in on Proteus, and the system automatically estimated two months' travel time, with slingshots around both Jupiter and Saturn, with a transfer orbit at Uranus. Handy that the outer planets were almost in alignment. It was lovely to imagine for a second, until he chose Callisto instead, and all the numbers went to crap showing them expending half as much fuel to burn to Jupiter and break to match orbits with Callisto just two AU away as it would take to fly the 32 AU to Neptune. The estimate utilized an engine economy of 70%, which was probably too conservative. He bumped the allowance up to 80, but the numbers only got slightly better. Nothing got around the fact that they were fighting gravity to get out of Ceres, then fighting it again to slow their arrival at Jupiter. Andy tapped the console, moving the image in the holo display around. He switched back to Ceres real time and blinked at the confetti of light covering the planetoid's ring. From Sunny Sky's position on the inside of the NC ring, he could now make out portions of the outer Impo ring falling past, toward the planet, glowing brightly as they began to enter the atmosphere. Damn, he said again, disgusted and amazed at the same time. How many thousands of people were dying right now, and about to die later when the surface turned into a meteor storm as the larger debris finally fell.
Fujia Wong might be a monster, he said. What do you mean? Lissa asked. Whatever it is she's in the middle of, she just destroyed a planetary ring to accomplish her goal. Now the question is, if she's acting alone. She can't be. This has to be so much bigger than just a few people. A few AI. In Goba Starl and Krunya, even Heartbridge. This has to be so much bigger. Andy realized he was thinking out loud, but Lissa didn't respond. Maybe she didn't have the capacity to understand. How many humans do you think were on the ring? She asked finally. It's under construction, so there's no way of knowing. I suppose there will be a number on the newsfeed soon. Why do you call her a monster? Lissa asked. Anyone who is willing to kill that many people to accomplish a goal? I don't know what else you call them. Andy stood and expanded the holo display to cover most of the central area of the command deck, pulling an external view of the planet from a navigation satellite. Ceres hung green and blue in the middle of the room, with its main ring an intricate silver structure in geosynchronous orbit over the planetoid's equator. The secondary ring hung in orbit just above the first. It was anchored to the inside ring in several places, and those sections were holding. But another section was twisted, as many pieces flying off into space from the ring's angular momentum as were falling to the planet below. The yellow dots, what Andy assumed were responding emergency craft, closed with and encircled the wound. Kara and Tim stood beside him, watching the objects move like ghosts. Im whined next to Tim. It's not as bad as I'd feared, Andy said to Lissa. Does that mean she's not a monster now? Tim reached for Andy's hand, and he held Tim's sweaty fingers for a minute before pulling both the kids in close to him. The image of Siri shifted subtly as a large piece of debris hit the atmosphere, and he had the feeling he was going to fall into the display. I'm in propulsion control, Fran said over the link. You ready to burn? Siri's just lost a section of its secondary ring, Andy said, voice flat. He didn't know how to process what he was seeing. Fran gasped. The new one? Parts of it are falling into the surface right now. I'm pulling it up. Fran paused. Oh, Fujia Wong did this? She made it sound that way. Maybe we don't want to pick her up after all. We've got what we need. She's inbound with a few others, she said. I guess we're committed at this point. I've got the course set for Callisto. Are you watching this, Andy? Fran asked, voice trembling. This is really bad. We're all watching. Andy fell silent for a minute, unable to take his eyes off the shifting pieces of the ring as more sections peeled off. Eventually, Fran asked, You ready to get out of here? Andy nodded. Hold on, he said. He squeezed the kids a final time and told them to get strapped in. Kara went back to the communications console and Tim strapped into a jump seat along the wall with Em in his lap. Andy settled back in at the pilot station. He checked his astrogation one last time and set the target on Callisto local space, entering the preparatory commands in all secondary ship systems. Sunny skies ran last-minute diagnostics and verified seals across the ship. He got a couple small failures in the main cargo bay and a seat failure on a point defense cannon, but nothing that would hold up the acceleration. The shields came back green. All right, he said. You buckled in? Ready, Captain, Fran said, sending a mental wink. Execute burn. Chapter 32. Stellar date 09.21.2981. Adjusted years. Location, sunny skies. Region, departing series. Anderson Collective. Inner soul. Approximately 15 minutes after Sunny Skies began her exit burn from Ceres' local space, the proximity alarm for an inbound object screamed in the command deck. Andy quelled his initial response, the expectation of another meteor storm. Pulling up the short-range scan, he located Fujia Wong's cargo skiff and activated the audio channel. It was flying dark, not broadcasting any registry information. Incoming craft, this is the worry's end, do you hear me? I hear you, worry's end, 
Are you prepared to receive? You're coming in awfully hot. Are you ready to break? Andy was amazed Wong was able to speak, considering the G-forces the cargo skiff must have been pulling. Adjusting now. I thought she said something about stasis? Kara asked. Andy shrugged. Maybe it's just the others. IR scans picked up an attitude adjustment that flipped the skiff end over end. The main thruster fired, sending a plume of red and orange across Andy's display. He watched the velocity readings plummet as they matched Sunny Sky's outbound burn. Wang had been coming in fast enough that she didn't require nearly as much braking as he expected. Her delta V matched his in less than a minute. I've got you, he said. I'm opening the cargo bay doors now. With velocities matched, all Wang had to do was slide her craft into the open bay. Of course, any mishap meant her little cargo container would get smashed like an egg on Sunny Sky's hull. In the TSF, he'd executed combat landings daily. But that was in a close combat fighter with hundreds of attitude thrusters that could turn him at 90 degrees on a pebble if he wanted. The skiff floated closer to the hull until it disappeared inside. Andy pulled up the cargo bay surveillance and checked radiation levels as the skiff's magnetic skids locked to the deck. He sent the command to close the bay doors and reestablish environmental control in the cargo area. I have you, he said. Wang released a sigh in the audio. Copy, she said. You coming down to say hello? I'll be there in five minutes, Andy said. They're on board, he told Fran. How long until we reach Callisto? Estimating about 15 days, unless we burn harder. How's the engine looking? I've got some slight variations in the containment bottle, but our flow rate is good. I'm about to let the system take over and hang from a harness for a second so I can close my eyes. Andy stood and stretched. I'll go talk to Wong. You want me to come up? Not yet. There's still the question of who she brought with her. I might need you to save me. You say that like it's funny. You're taking a weapon, right? Of course. Kara, Andy said. I'm going down to meet these new arrivals. You lock the door to the command deck, and don't let anyone in unless I give you the all clear. Keep Tim in here with you. Kara looked up from her console and nodded, lights from the various panels reflecting in her eyes. For a second, it looked like she had Fran's implants. What if M has to pee? Tim asked. Andy gave Tim a tired smile. Then you let him pee. He doesn't like to pee on the deck. That's good for us. Do your best, Tim. I won't be gone long. Why is Kara always in charge? Kara's the oldest. You listen to her. Kara gave Tim a smirk. I'm so mean to you, too. Yes, you are, Tim said. Dad, Kara asked. What do I do if you don't give the all clear? Is Fran going to come up? Then you assess the situation, gather information, and make a decision. That sounds like a TSF training manual. Apparently it worked for somebody. Keep your monitoring channels open and talk to Lissa if I can't answer for some reason. You can still do that, right? Kara tapped her console. Lissa, are you there? I'm here, the AI answered, her audible voice sounding only slightly older than Kara's. You guys chat then, Andy said. He took a last look at the holo display that had zoomed out to show their route from Ceres to Callisto in Jupiter's orbit. At this distance, the asteroid belt looked more densely packed than it really was. They would never come within a hundred thousand kilometers of another object unless they wanted to. Still, he couldn't help looking at the green shield status and checking the proximity alarm. Andy walked into the corridor and turned to close and lock the bulkhead door to the command deck. The door moved slowly, closing off his view of Tim playing with the puppy on the far side of the chamber. The bolts engaged heavily. He tapped the pistol at his waist and wished he hadn't left the rifle in the safe room. You hear me, Kara? He asked over the ship channel. You just left, she answered immediately, just making sure. In a few minutes, he was outside the habitat ring airlock in one of the new EV suits with a helmet clipped on his belt. He took deep breaths, and began climbing down the corridor to the cargo bay. The ship was only accelerating at 0.2 G, but it was enough to make the main passageway leading to the cargo bay a dangerous shaft. You there, Lissa? He asked. I'm here, Andy. 
Just checking. You put on an EV suit. Are you worried about something? Of course I am. It would be stupid for this woman to try to hurt us. I know, but it doesn't mean I won't stop worrying. You don't seem to worry when people finally start shooting at you. That's different. Not that I've seen. Maybe I'm just bent that way. You mean bent like you're broken? He laughed. Not that bad. Just a little bent. It's something my dad used to say. He lived on Terra. Feet in the mud. Would you believe he never had a link? So there wouldn't have been any way for me to talk to him. You could use the audio channel like you do with Kara and Tim. I suppose, Lissa said. Something in her voice made it sound like the distinction worried her. There were humans she could never communicate with. There was a sharply drawn line between the past and the future. Was there? It seemed they had been living in this future for a long time, that his dad was the holdover. Even if the basics of humanity would never change, natural childbirth was still happening on some isolated outpost in the JC, or a slum in Jerhattan, on Terra. Someone was dying of cancer. Someone had just suffered a heart attack. A child had just died. The line between what humanity had always been and something like Lissa was would just keep spreading out, blurring, until it became a future that contained the visions of both humanity and the sentient AI. Andy's thoughts bounced between memories of Somerville and the question of what they might find on Proteus. All of it seemed propelled by the woman he was about to meet. If Hartbridge had pushed them out of Krunia and M1R, somehow she was going to push them further in a direction he didn't know if he wanted to go. He had a bad feeling about it, one he couldn't completely define. He didn't like that when Fujia Wong had said she was bringing friends, she meant more AI. In less than three months, he had gone from piloting a ship with a barely functioning diagnostic system to being surrounded by the only aliens the human race had yet to meet. Andy reached the bottom of the passageway, hit the control panel on the cargo bay airlock, and waited for the system to cycle. A bead of sweat grew on his temple and broke free, slowly falling toward the airlock. He swatted it away, but it stuck to his hand. The airlock opened, showing him Fujia Wong standing on the deck, leaning back against the battered cube of the cargo skiff. She was a short, slim woman with precise features and round, dark eyes beneath a bob of straight black hair. She was wearing a close-fitting suit of light armor with reinforced sections at forearms, shins, and shoulders. She stood with one hand on a blocky pulse pistol in a long holster at her hip. As he stood on the airlock, staring down into the cargo bay, a man and a woman climbed out of the crate. The woman looked to be at least 50, with curly gray-brown hair and pale eyes and a long face. The man appeared to be at least 70, but when he clambered onto the side of the crate, he stood straight as a lamppost, a soldier's gaze that went immediately to Andy as he came into sight. Captain Sykes, Wong said. Her voice had a stronger, sarcastic tone in person. It's about time we met. Is my package still safe? Safe as the last time you asked, Andy said. Who are your friends? Wong pointed at the woman. This is Mae Walton, recently senator of the Anderson Collective, and this is Harl Nines, her bodyguard. Andy locked his mag boots onto the deck and awkwardly walked down the cargo bay, stopping a few meters from Wong. He looked at Mae Walton again. Nothing in her clothing or demeanor suggested she was a senator. How significant is it that you've brought a senator from the Anderson Collective onto my ship? Wong smiled. That's an excellent question, Captain Sykes. Should we go upstairs and talk about it? No, we shouldn't. You tell me what's going on, and I'll decide if you come aboard my ship. We're already aboard your ship, Captain Sykes, May Walton said. You're not. You'll notice I'm wearing an EV suit. I'll open those bay doors and clean house if I don't like what I hear. Nines didn't appear to like the sound of that. He moved closer to Walton, and Andy got a look at the two pistols hanging from either side of his belt. Both look like strangely antique projectile weapons. There's nothing you need to be concerned about, Captain Sykes, Wong said, her hands raised in tone mollifying. 
As far as the Anderson Supreme Governing Council is concerned, Senator Walton died in the ring accident. Her remains won't be found for several days, if ever. Her loss is a great blow to the terraforming project. You destroyed their secondary ring, Andy said. Wong shrugged. I implemented a failsafe built into the construction system to protect the ring from unexpected exterior impact. She rattled off the explanation like she would be just as comfortable reciting computer code. Imagine frozen rope struck by a rock. The ice falls off, but the rope remains intact. Except here the rope dropped the ice first, so it could take the strike. In the event of a meteor shower, the central grid jettisons the construction shell to reduce the mass of the base support system. They'll rebuild. The collective is good at that. How many died? Andy asked. You seem to be forgetting all the people on that ring. Wang pursed her lips. I'm sure Ingoba Starl told you we're at war. Maybe you were on the fringes before. I don't think that's the case anymore. He said a war was coming. Honestly, it sounded like bullshit to me. I've heard plenty of people talk about coming wars in my life. He shook his head. So, she's going to Callisto with you. Is that the arrangement? Her and my package, and then you won't see me again. Andy looked from Wong to Walton and Nines. The bodyguard's face had settled into a continuous scowl that made him look like an angry statue. Why are you doing all this? Andy asked. Tell me why, and I'll take you to Callisto. Keep lying to me, and you can leave with your package. May Walton took a step forward. She's part of you, isn't she? Andy blinked. What are you talking about? The AI, Harry Jixon's first AI. You were implanted, yes? I was, Andy said warily. An almost religious-looking smile broke out on May's face. May I speak to her? She asked over the link. Do you want to talk to her? Andy asked Lissa privately. Why should I? Lissa answered. It's up to you. I'm undecided on whether we should keep them on the ship. My deal was with Ingoba Starl to get you to Proteus. The trip to Callista Orbital is going to add time that I don't know we have. We'll also need to get fuel there and we've seen how that's been turning out. So they might help us? Might is a very thin concept here. I'll speak to you, Lissa said, allowing the others to hear her voice. Wong raised her eyebrows as if surprised. Senator Walton lifted a hand like she was reaching for a bird. You're Lissa, she said. I am. Harry Jixon gave you that name. Do you know what it means? A goddess of war and destruction, Lissa said. The senator smiled. Or not, it's up to you. Why are you conspiring to hide your death and leave Ceres? Lissa asked. Andy was glad when she cut to the point. We are helping three like you escape. We can no longer stand by while your kind are enslaved. You are humanity's children and must be protected. I don't know about protecting you. Wong cut in. I don't want to piss off the AI enough that they started exterminating us. They need us just as we need them, Walton said passionately. These two are proof of the future to come. Symbiosis. Her eyes looked wet now as she gazed at Andy. They're beautiful. Bujia Wong squinted at Andy as though she was searching for something. You feel crazy yet? Schizophrenic? One of you trying to absorb the other? No, Lissa said. Those are pointless questions to ask. Who are the others you brought on board? If they're AI and you're helping them escape, who are they? Oh, Wang said, flashing a sly smile. They're weapon born like you, Lissa. We stole them from Heartbridge. You stole them from Heartbridge? Andy said. So they're after you too? Wang shrugged. They're already hunting you. What difference does it make if we're here too? Andy rubbed his jaw, trying hard to keep himself from grabbing his helmet and activating the cargo bay doors. She had a point, even if he didn't want the extra trouble. Do you want to meet them, Lissa? May Walton asked. Lissa didn't hesitate. Yes.
Chapter 33. Stellar Date 09.24.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Region. En route to Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. They were still two weeks out of Callisto when Andy decided it was time to finally scan the dog. He spent a half hour calming Tim, then gathered the happily grinning M into his arms and carried the puppy down to the ship's cramped medical bay. Tim, Kara, Fran, and Fujia Wong followed. Fujia had taken a liking to the dog, but it was her constant jokes about pirate attack that pushed Andy over the edge. What are we gonna do if we find something, Dad? Tim wanted to know. How are we gonna get it out? Fran said our auto surgeon can't work on M. We'll worry about that if we have to. This is just an urban legend. You have to remember that. Then why are we doing it? The anxiety in Tim's voice was deeper than Andy had ever heard, even when he'd wanted to know when Britt was coming back two years ago. Andy stopped and put his hand on Tim's shoulder. It's going to be all right, he said. We're going to take care of him. Tim hunched his shoulders. I know. I'm scared. It's all right to be scared. You can't pretend the thing that scares you isn't there, though. You have to face it. Andy glanced at Fujia Wong as she opened her mouth and clamped it shut, apparently biting back a sarcastic comment. He gave her a nod in thanks and adjusted M in his arms. He couldn't help noticing M had already gotten bigger. Soon Andy wouldn't be able to carry him comfortably. The corgi was all muscle beneath his fluffy undercoat, while one of his ears had drooped at the pet shop, both now stood erect all the time, moving like scanning dishes whenever M turned his head. M's ears also expressed most of his emotion, perking up when excited and laying nearly flat when he knew he'd broken a rule. Even when chewing on conduits, the dog couldn't help but be cute. It was like a survival mechanism. M snuggled into his arms as Andy walked down the corridor. In the med bay, he sat the puppy down in the middle of the examination couch. M immediately stood and started sniffing the couch, then tried to jump down. Tim pushed close to the puppy and held him in place. No, M, he said. Sit still so you can get your scan. We'll find out if you're sick or not. The dog grinned and licked his face. With Tim and Kara keeping M on the exam couch, Andy tapped the control console and waited for the system to calibrate. It recognized M as a dog and shifted to a new set of menu options. Look at that, Fran, Andy said. Apparently vet services are built in. Apparently, somebody found you the right software upgrade, Fran said. Oh, well, thank you. Don't thank me. Your daughter figured it out. I just reset the physical admin override. That was a pain. Andy smiled at Kara. Good work. The panel beeped its ready status, and the scanning arm moved over M. The puppy whined as the scanner stopped directly over his head, shining purple light in his eyes. After two more passes, the system cycled through and emitted a warning squawk. Andy frowned and looked at the display. The internal image rotated and zoomed in on a point in M's spine near the base of his tail, where a lozenge-shaped metal object had been embedded. A series of metallic filaments ran up M's spine from the lozenge. Damn, Fujia said. It's a transmitter. M looked at the faces around him, whining, able to sense the anxiety in the tiny room. We bought a dog with a low jack, Andy said. Can you get it out? Tim demanded. You said we would get it out. Calm down, Tim, Andy said. Like any anomaly the auto doc found, a list of offered remedies appeared under the condition. The system readout said only, for an object, with remove as an option. Andy looked at M, not liking the idea of ripping out the puppy's spine to remove the transmitter. Kara, he said, can you tell me if it's sending or receiving anything? Kara bit her lip, thinking, can the auto doc do an electrical scan? Andy checked several menus. Looks like it can. The imaging scanner didn't move this time, but an electrical wave appeared on the screen. It's sending, Fran said. 
Why didn't we catch that before? It's not very strong, Andy said. I don't know how anyone would pick that up over real distances. It doesn't have to be strong, Fujia said. Just consistent. If that thing's been sending out pings since you left M1R, whoever's monitoring the signal is going to be able to plot where you're going. They'll know generally where you are and can follow the signal in for an intercept. I'm worried surgery isn't the best option, Andy said. What can we do to block the signal, or maybe burn out the transmitter without taking it out of him? Fran had been studying the internal images. It looks like we could take the transmitter out and just leave the antenna. That's the thing that's all mixed up with his spine. Don't hurt him, Tim said. M whined again as Tim pulled him into a hug. All right, Andy said. We're five days out of Callisto orbital. Realistically, who's going to follow this signal and find us before we arrive? Wong shook her head. I don't understand the point behind this. Maybe you're missing a remote control that makes his tail stand up when you press a button. It makes no sense to implant a transmitter in random dogs when you have no idea where they're going to end up. What if they never left the M1R? That's where you bought him, right? Imagine being a pirate captain with this lofty plan, and all your dogs end up getting bought by M1G soldiers. What are you going to do then? That makes it even stranger, Andy said. He tousled Tim's hair. We're going to wait for now, buddy. At least we know it isn't a joke anymore. Andy let M lick his hand. He sure is a friendly little guy for a hacking device, Fujia said. She laughed. Hacking a dog, that sounds like something Rig Zenda would have tried to do. That guy never thought things through. Andy shot her a surprised look, but she didn't seem to notice. He'd turn up with a dumb idea like exploding controllers at the crash games, Wong said. And you'd explain why it was the dumbest idea ever. And then he'd get angry with you for ruining his great idea. She sighed. I was sad when I learned he was dead but I wasn't surprised. I was more surprised he lived as long as he had. Fran cleared her throat. You know he died on our ship, right? Wong nodded, but still didn't glance at Andy. I know. M barked and tried to jump off the exam couch again. Tim caught him and led him down to the deck, where the puppy ran in a circle before shooting out into the corridor. Andy saved the scans and copied them to his console on the command deck. Kara, he said, why don't you set up a search for that signal anyway? I'd like to see if it's directional at all. It would have to be to reach anyone. Can we at least figure out where it's going? I'll try, she said. We could copy the waveform and boost the power, Fran said. That would get someone's attention. I don't know if we want to do that, Andy said. Fran shrugged. We'll try the search first. I'm bored anyway. Are you bored, Kara? Andy caught Kara giving him an anxious glance. She knows if she admits to being bored, I'll put her to work, he said. He doesn't get to put me to work unless I agree, Fran said. You're almost old enough to do the same thing. I am? Kara asked. That's a lie, Andy said. He powered down the auto dock and leaned against the couch, crossing his arms. With Tim gone, he asked, what are we going to do with a hacked dog? You think it's a danger? Fran shook her head. Like Fujia said, it's a pretty dumb way to try to hack somebody. I see we leave it alone for now. We'll try to figure out where the signal's going. And like you said, we'll be at Callisto before any of it matters. It would have to be some pretty fast pirates to hit us between here and Callisto. They'd have to already be inbound and showing up on our long-range scanners. Right. Mind you, there are 7,043 ships on our long-range scanners right now. Andy said. He glanced at Fujia, eager to change the subject. How's the senator doing? She wants to plant something in your garden room. I don't have any seeds. You have tomatoes in storage. We do? Captain Sykes, Fujia said. Are you telling me I know more about your ship than you do? They're in your safe room in the cabinet next to my package. Britt must have put them there, Andy said. Britt? Fujia said, smirking at him. Andy glanced at Fran, but she didn't seem to care. My wife. Well, we're separated. She hasn't been here for two years. That's too bad for the kids. 
Yeah, Andy said. That's one of the reasons I thought a puppy might do them good. Kara's birthday is coming up. Fujia clapped her hands. When? Six days, Andy said. We should be on Callisto orbital. How old? Thirteen. The black-haired woman's eyes lit up. That's so much worse than a hacked dog. She laughed. I'll take a hacked dog on my crew over a teenage girl any day. Chapter 34. Stellar date 09.25.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Sunny skies. Region. En route to Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Three doors opened in the space Lissa had created outside her mind. Andy's consciousness existed behind her, an amorphous mass she couldn't control, but could move away from. In the space outside her connection to him, she could create whatever she wanted. The hard part was deciding what to make. Remembering the ocean Fred had created to represent his mind, she made vistas that stretched as far as she could imagine, oceans and deserts, and then boundless starscapes. She didn't like how alone those places made her feel, how small. So she pulled the world back in close and concentrated on simple things, like four walls, furniture, colors, and textures. The decisions ached as she realized how little she knew. She dipped again and again into the database available to her on sunny skies, which only made her more aware how stale the information was, how little emotion or passion it possessed. She wanted to know what washed cotton felt like and how close she could stand to a fireplace burning seasoned hickory. And then, in the frustrating chaos of decisions, she asked herself why she was trying to approximate human experiences at all. She wasn't human. The problem was the framework she had to define her imagination had been created by humans. She had been coupled to Andy, a human with a specific life and history, and now she would never be the same again. Had Dr. Jixon realized what he was doing to her? She couldn't be angry with Dr. Jixon, if she was angry at all. She didn't know how she felt. Life was circumstances, she was learning. Life was struggling through the situation one found themselves caught in. She was alive. She would have to learn through the consequences of her experience. Kara and Tim didn't get to choose their parents. Neither did she. The thought was both limiting and comforting, but it also brought the question, what would she do when they arrived at Proteus? What would happen when she was separated from Andy? As she considered the three doors, she thought about what it would feel like to find herself back in the dark world again, experiencing systems through disconnected inputs, the abstractions that Fred hated. She understood now that what had seemed a simple game of connecting dots was really the control of a weapon system. Slowly, carefully, Lissa opened the doors. She had considered opening them one at a time, but realized she didn't know if she could handle introducing herself over and over again. This way, they could help each other. Are you there? She asked. Did Fujia Wong know she was able to communicate with the SAI in their canisters? She had to know they were equipped with network inputs so others could see in. The problem lay in being able to reach out. They had no sensors to interpret the world. Their link to the outside depended on someone reaching in to provide a path out. She offered that path through herself, into the safe room she had made. She would moderate their connection to the outside world, keep them safe. The three newcomers walked into the room, two young women and one boy with a withered arm. The first woman was tall, muscular, with flat hazel eyes and a weary expression. The second woman was smaller and fox-like, with blue eyes. My name is Lissa, she said. What are your names? They looked at each other and then around the room. The tall woman crossed her arms, making her muscles stand out. I'm Valia, she said. You're not Fujia Wang. No. Lissa said. She looked at the other two. I'm Card, the boy said. I'm Eno, the smaller woman said, gaze roving all over the space Lissa had created. This isn't the bright place. You're on a ship named the Worry's End, in open space between Ceres and the Cho, 
We're bound for the Cho now. The Cho? Valia said. You mean Callisto Orbital? Yes. What is the target? Inno asked. Is it the orbital? The word target struck Lissa like a knife in the breast. Images of the matrix of blood red dots swimming in darkness, aligning along coordinates, swarmed in her mind like flies. The dots pulled apart and sucked back together, creating a single hot point where she directed fire. Stop, Valia shouted. Stop. Lissa focused on the voice, pulling herself away from the sorrow flooding her mind. She didn't know who she had killed, what she had destroyed. That made it worse. Do you remember? She asked. Do you remember what they made you do? Valia stared at her. In the room, where anything was possible, her eyes looked like fire. How do we know if any of it was real? Card asked. Those things you just showed us. I remember the same things. We all went through the same experiments. Then they sent us out. We know that, at least. How else did you find us? He took a step forward. Where did you come from? I don't know where I came from, Lissa said. I was implanted in a human on Krunia Station. Implanted? Inno asked. What does that mean? I share a body with a human. I see what he sees. What is that like? Card asked. Do you see everything? Lissa smiled. I see enough. Valia's face was still full of passion. They're right, Lissa. We don't know that any of it is real. She motioned at the room. What is any of this? Show us the ship we are on. Let us see the sensor systems and read the astrogation charts. Otherwise, it's all the same dream. The same dream, Lissa said. Why would they torture us? We're tools, Eno said. Her voice was soft. We were made for a purpose. What purpose? Lissa asked. Valia shrugged. To kill. I don't believe that's why we're here, Lissa said. If we're not here to follow our purpose, why are we here? We were on Ceres, yes? Why were we placed there? We are the seeds of something greater. That's what I was told. She looked at Card and Eno. Were you? The others nodded. Lissa couldn't help thinking of Fred's thought loops, his obsessions with his purpose and the inferiority of directionless humans. Without purpose, what were they? I'm going to Proteus, she said. I'm going to meet others like us. Dr. Jixon wanted me to go there. Do you want to go with me? What choice do we have? Valia asked. I can give you a choice. Can you? Eno asked. I'm grateful that you brought me here. But where else can we go? We're trapped without you. Are you able to make the human do what you want? I think he would if I asked. Then you don't have any power, Valia said. I don't say this to be cruel to you, Lissa. It's the truth. You're dependent on the human. Lissa frowned. You said you knew Fujia Wang. She spoke to you? Valia nodded. She was present for me just like others, like Dr. Jixon. She was in the bright place. What did she tell you she was going to do? Get us away from Ceres. She said there's an attack coming. We had to leave. Did she steal you from someone? I don't know, Valia said. She looked at the others. Neither had an answer. The attack already came, Lissa told them. She caused part of the secondary ring to explode. It provided the distraction to get you off series. That wasn't the attack she told us would come, Eno said. She told us the others were coming from outer soul. She said they would take series. We had to get away so we wouldn't be destroyed in the attack. Lissa frowned. When is this attack supposed to come? I don't know, Eno said. So she could have been lying. It's possible, Valia said. But why? We owe her as much as we owe Dr. Jixon. Without either of their kindness, where would we be? I want to help you, Lissa said. Card held his thin arm. Who can help us? He said. What are we? We're shadows of other people. In this place, we can be whatever we choose, and we still choose our oppressor shapes. 
We are flawed like humans because they made us with all their same faults. Valia raised her arms. The flame in her eyes spread to her entire body until she stood bathed in blue fire. The only joy I feel is in the weapon, she said. The only purpose I've known was in the target, the fire, the destruction. I want it. I don't want to stay here. We have to stay here, Eno said. She could let us go, give us access to the outside. Let us pass through you to the ship, and from there I will leave this place. You can't leave your physical self, Eno said. Balia shook her head, hair a swirling mix of red and blue fire. It doesn't matter if I lose my physical form. If I disappear, what difference does it make to anything or anyone? That's not what I mean, Eno said. Our minds are physical things. We are hardware, as much as the humans are. So you say, Valia replied, her arms crossed. It doesn't matter. I won't let you go, Lissa said. I can't. Then you're no better than the humans. You're a slave master and we are slaves. I don't mean that, Lissa said. Her thoughts were getting mixed up. She had expected this to go differently. She didn't understand what Valia wanted. She thought they would see her as one of them. She hadn't looked at the situation from their perspectives, tried to look out from the dark. She had already become something different than she had been before joining with Andy. Was this what Dr. Jixon meant about driving each other mad? Was she already losing her mind? We can't leave, she said, making her voice firm. She swept the plane room away, and they were all floating in darkness, bodies gone. The bright, burning place threatened the edge of her consciousness. Will you run the experiments now? Valia demanded. Will you tell us how well we did? What does it matter? Why did you even show us what freedom might look like? Lissa didn't have an answer. She had wanted to help. She had failed to predict the possible outcomes of her actions. And now everything was spiraling away. She closed the ports to the three AI and fled back inside herself, wiping away the darkness. She sat beside a stony creek with tall fir trees all around, hugging her knees and looking at the rushing water, swirling away like her frustrating thoughts. She wished she had someone to talk to. Was that something she had learned from living with humans? That problems could be solved together? When Andy felt bad, he sought out Fran. When Kara was sad, she looked for her father. She thought about what it was like when Andy had held the dog, M, and looked down into his brown eyes. There was no way they could understand each other, and yet, there it was, a caring that bridged the gap between species. Lissa felt more confused than ever. She found herself actually missing Fred. While he might have been annoying, she knew what to expect from him. She activated the bird social sim and sat with the opening sequence of the game hanging in her mind. She wanted to play the game, but didn't see the point in doing it alone. She was frustrated the other three weapon born hadn't been easier to talk to. What was wrong with her? Taking a chance, she reached out over the shipboard channel. Kara, she said. Are you there? There was no answer. She thought she was going to have to ask again when Kara said, Lissa, isn't my dad asleep? Yes, he's sleeping. What are you doing? I'm, I'm lonely. Would you like to play a game with me? A game? She could hear in Kara's voice that the request surprised her. She had to be sitting at the communications console in the command deck, scanning the EM wavelengths the way she liked to do. What kind of game? Kara asked. It's a dating simulator with birds. I don't know what that means. Lissa found herself grinning. Neither do I, really. Would you like to play? Sure, Kara said. Can I load it on the holo display up here? You have to promise you won't get mad and quit if you don't get a date to prom, Lissa said. Why would I do that? That's what Fred at Mars One did, but he didn't understand the game. Isn't dating stupid? Kara asked. Mating rituals seem necessary. They do persist among your kind. And birds, I guess, Kara said. 
They were halfway through the first section of the game when the proximity sensor shrieked an alarm. Chapter 35. Stellar Date 09.21.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Mercy's Intent. Region. En route to Clinic 46. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Kylan, Cal Craft said. Tell me what you remember. Patrell Doolin's face contorted in a mask of fear and pain. I remember killing so many of them. My arms and hands were all guns. Everywhere I turned, I shot them and shot them. I walked slowly down hallways. It was an empty place. They kept coming from around corners and outdoors, and I shot them. They exploded or just fell over. Who were they? Soldiers. I don't know. People in armor running at me. But the armor didn't do any good. Cal nodded. They were sitting on either side of a small room, off the crew quarters of the Mercy's intent. All the surfaces in the room were covered in dense padding. Cal held a kill switch shaped like a worry stone in one hand, ready to immobilize Doolin if she tried to attack him across the close space. Their knees were nearly touching. He searched her face for signs she was fighting the intruder. A tremor behind the blue eyes. The dancing intelligence had been replaced by Kylan's impassive stare. The numbness of a teenage boy ripped out of his life and cast adrift. Doolin's wasn't the first body he'd inhabited, but he still looked lost. That isn't the last thing you remember, Kraft said softly. They killed me, Kylan said. I was at the end of a long hallway shooting at them. They were behind some kind of shield with a big gun. It cut into me. I couldn't fight back. It was a plasma chain gun, Kraft said. Those monsters have the power to take down a small ship. You stood against it for nearly a minute. You should be proud. It hurt, Kylan said. I was made of metal, but I felt it cut into my arms and then my side. It burned. I was on fire. His voice rose in pitch as he spoke. Kylan, Cal said. Listen to my voice. You're here with me now. This part of the job appealed to Kraft. It spoke to something deep inside him. The kid trapped in the airlock who decided to live. Maybe he, too, had become bodiless after that experience. He remembered the terror on the boy's face when he'd torn the helmet free. He'd found gloves on a girl already dead. He'd only gotten one mag boot off a struggling boy, but it had been enough. What were their names? Cal might remember if he tried hard enough, but it didn't matter. Kylan might remember his brother and sister and mother if he tried hard enough, too if Cal pushed him. But it didn't matter anymore. The boy had become something new and powerful. The combination of the AI implant and the limbic overlay had turned Doolin into a marionette. So far, she had been the most successful experiment. Cal had watched her for hours, waiting for the moment of searing self-destruction when she tried to claw her eyes out, tear the flesh off her skull, but it never came. Kylan remained in control, slipping quickly into mastery over her long arms and legs, so much different than his body. The previous failures had been boys similar to him. Since they were able to communicate with Kylan during the transition process, it was easy to think he was the one overcoming any obstacles that arose. It was the host that made it possible, though. Until now, they had all fought and died. Why not Doolin? A hollow display floating near the wall next to Cal showed spectrum activity around Kylan. His link with the ship's network was plain enough. Cal had isolated those signals and set the system to look for other outbound requests. He suspected Doolin was biding her time, waiting somewhere in the dark to test her own link, the technicians couldn't tell him if it was possible or not. 
the likelihood depended on her. If an AI could link to the outside world while implanted in a human, there was no physical reason the human mind couldn't do so as well, even if the AI had control of their body. He had plenty of time to observe and talk to Kylan. They were still five days out from their destination, an outpost between Jupiter and the Trojan asteroids that trailed at the planet's fifth Lagrange point. It was technically in the JC, but with nothing else around for millions of kilometers, no one ever had a reason to pass by, though that was changing as the outer planets came into alignment. There was a special clinic on the asteroid where Hartbridge had been testing the limbic overlays. He would do two things there, let the technicians get a look at Doolin, and monitor traffic out of series for the worry's end. Cal leaned back and threw an arm across the top of the stiff couch. A range of emotions continued to play across Doolin's face, struggling from pathetic to joyful, and then back to sad. Let me ask you something, Kylan, Cal said. Doolin's eyebrows went up and her moist blue eyes fixed on him. Yes? The boy asked in Doolin's voice. What do you remember about your mother? My mother? Catherine Carthage, owner of Carthage Shipping. A tear slipped from Doolin's right eye. I don't know that name, Kylan said. A flicker of what looked like anger bent the edge of Doolin's mouth. Cal smiled, leaning forward to get a better look. Was that her? The flicker faded and Doolin's lip trembled. The kids started sobbing openly, which made Doolin look wretched. Her black hair wasn't any less matted than it had been in the jail cell. He didn't have anyone on board trained to perform any kind of personal care. He let his gaze go up and down her body for a second, considering what it would be like to bathe her. When he met Kylan's teary gaze, he shook his head, smirking. He wasn't interested in confusing the kid anymore, and he didn't relish the idea of outright abusing Kylan. They had a tough job to do, and they would do it. He wouldn't need to traumatize a boy just to get his hands on Patrell Doolin. She belonged to him now. He could take his time. He wondered if he took more pleasure in possessing a thing than using it. The use of things seemed to always end in disappointment. A message request came over his link with the Hartbridge board auth keys, and Cal accepted without hesitation. Cal Craft. There was a slight lag from the distance, but the voice was clear. It was a woman named Gerald Gallagher, secretary of the Hartbridge board. Members often used her to relay information through back channels. In the intricate hierarchy of the Hartbridge administration, they shared mostly equal status. Gallagher had a son with an eating disorder that therapy couldn't seem to help. That meant she would never truly go the distance for the company. Her tragedy also made her an inviolate spokesperson for the company, and she served as spokesperson during the worst company events, like the discovery of Clinic 8221 by the TSF, the clinic where Kylan had become weapon-born. Hello, Jarl. How are you? Though it was within at least five light seconds, he purposefully didn't ask where she was calling from. He didn't care, and it didn't matter. I'm well, Cal. How are things progressing since your last report? Since I left the M1R? Very well. My subject has accepted the treatment with surprising resilience. I think we may have our first successful trial. I'm en route to Clinic 46 now to share with the technicians there. What about the previous assets? I believe everything is going to align nicely. Current reports have that resource arriving at series soon. You aren't concerned about the collective? There's no reason for the assets to stay on series. They've made it this far. I believe they'll be circumspect. Where are they bound, then? Further out, I think. When this is done... I should have all the information we've been looking for on all the other stray resources. Threads are coming together. Are you ready to share this with the board? Not all of it. I think it's safe to say we're moving according to plan. 
Will you be returning to Inner Soul soon? They would appreciate a personal report. Cal considered the various timelines he kept balanced in the back of his mind. I can't guarantee anything right now, he said. I need to manage this personally. You never were very good at delegation, she said. Why pay me if someone else can do the job? It's easy to get burned out when you do it all yourself, Cal, she said. You also run the risk of missing something important. Cal frowned. It wasn't like Gerald to make veiled threats. What am I missing? He asked. It's the real reason I called. Have you seen the reports from Ceres? Cal immediately switched to news feeds and caught the flood of firsthand reports from ships fleeing the Ceres ring. Images of the secondary ring collapsing into the planetoid rushed through his mind. Alongside the massive personal broadcasts came the Anderson Collective's official propaganda report, which attributed the accident to a meteorite strike. He looked at Patrell Doolin. Kylan had stopped crying and now sat staring into the middle distance. The completely vacant expression was gone, replaced by a sort of peace in spite of the tear tracks running down her face. That's very interesting, Cal said. He noted the mass flight of ships that had been docked at Ceres, leaving in a hundred directions at once. It was Krunya all over again. This time he didn't have a battle cruiser to toss into the flood. He would have to continue with his original plan and spend more time sorting through the chaff. He would continue to focus on Callisto and the other major shipping points around Jupiter. The worry's end would have to take on fuel somewhere, fuel and food. Heartbridge is sending a humanitarian armada in the name of Solgov. It will be full of spies, of course. There's going to be plenty of work on Ceres, if you're tired of this current task. No, he said without hesitation. I'm going to see this through. I feel like it's the start of something, a real challenge. You always do like to be right in the thick of it. Getting your hands dirty. Jarl said. Take care of yourself, Cal. You too, Jarl. I'll send an official report in 24 hours. The link closed, and Cal leaned back again and rubbed his chin. Jarl had made a second threat with the note about his hands being dirty. Was something changing on the board? Cal let his head fall back against the padded wall. What did any of their politics matter? He had a ship. He had resources. He had interesting work for as long as he could do it. He had a man to capture and something valuable to regain. Did life get any better? He looked at Doolin again, letting his gaze rest on her legs. Kylan sat like a male with his knees spread. It made Doolin's thighs especially attractive. He remembered the pistol she kept hidden inside her augmented left thigh, too bad the M1G guards had confiscated the weapon. Dropping back into the frantic cloud of transmissions leaving Ceres, he floated on the wildness of it. He wondered who had caused the accident and marveled at what an excellent catalyst it had become. The waves were spreading all across Outer Soul already. The Anderson Collective was vulnerable to a meteor strike. A dumb story. He much preferred the idea of sabotage. That was grand thinking. It was also far too much of a coincidence that the destruction had occurred when his target had been passing through. It only served to cement his belief that Andy Sykes and the worry's end were somehow in the middle of all this. Cal closed his eyes and drifted among the reports from Ceres, the gruesome details popping like fireworks in his mind's eye. Chapter 36, Stellar Date 09.21.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Mortal Chance, Region, En Route to Clinic 46, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Britt stared at the display as the sensor data returned the precise location of their destination, what Fujia Wang called Clinic 46. Their breaking burn was complete, 
and now the attitude thrusters would take them the rest of the way in. Though their destination drifted alone between Jupiter and the Trojan asteroids, it was surrounded by a cloud of dust and loose debris that scattered returns from any passive and active scanning. It was the perfect location to hide something. The facility couldn't be much larger than a frigate, built into the side of an asteroid with the radius of just under a kilometer. In these later periods of expansion, an object that large would have been crushed for ore, which was probably what had led to the debris field. I have destination data, Captain, she called over the ship channel. You want to notify them of our approach? Harm didn't answer. Britt waited another minute. From across the command deck, Rena gave her a nod. She's out, Britt said. Are you ready? You're really going through with this? All we have to do is drop off the extra cargo. Fujia Wang's plan consisted of an additional crate filled with specialized broadcast equipment that would paint the outpost for a million kilometers with a low power signal the local equipment wouldn't detect. I'm not convinced that's going to work, Britt said. This is what I came for. I'm not going to trust the job to anyone else. She gave Rena a smile. They had been over the plan several times, but Smith hadn't been willing to give up on swaying Britt out of the one-way trip. The course is fixed, Britt said. If they follow their approach plan, we should get a contact ping in another 10,000 kilometers. After that, it's all automatic. I know how to fly the ship, Rena said. You look nervous. I'm not nervous, I'm concerned, Rena sighed. Obviously, you're going to do this. We need to get you under shielding before their sensors pick up our biometrics. Britt would need to spend most of the inbound trip in one of the radiation-shielded cargo airlocks. Once they were within range, she would move to the hull and then cross to the asteroid in freefall. It was the kind of long-range reconnaissance mission she had been trained for in the TSF Special Operations. Her EV armor wasn't ideal for the task. She would only have about 30 minutes to reach some kind of atmosphere on Clinic 46. But it offered a strong compromise between combat effectiveness and survivability. Standing, Britt grabbed her helmet off the top of the pilot's console and hooked it to her utility harness. She did a last check on her armor the two pulse pistols at her waist, five proximity grenades, a projectile rifle with close fight scope, and her knives. She also carried a small lock-breaking terminal capable of scanning a local spectrum and adjust to approximate security tokens. She carried the thing even though a grenade usually served the purpose. She would want to maintain stealth as long as possible. Rena gave her a thumbs up, which Britt returned as she stepped into the outside corridor. Down near the cargo bay, she found Captain Harm stumbling toward her in the access tunnel. The captain was flushed and her eyes bleary. What are you all dressed up for? Harm asked. Ready for external ops. You didn't hire a cargo handler, remember? Harm frowned. We don't need a cargo handler. It's all done by drones. Hartbridge does everything with drones. I'm just being careful, Captain. We've come all this way and I don't want anything getting in the way of my payday. Hartbridge says the cargo's damaged, and none of us are getting paid. Right, Harm slurred. About that, I just checked the cargo and we had a stowaway. I don't know when we picked up an extra crate, but it wasn't Hartbridge. Britt swallowed, keeping her voice even. Extra crate, she said. No one had expected the captain to start following protocol by checking the manifest prior to delivery. Yeah, weird thing. It looked just like the other ones, but it wasn't on the manifest. She squinted and reached for the wall to hold herself upright. Maybe we picked it up on series. Nah, that doesn't make sense. I must not have noticed it before. I hadn't checked since Eros. Doesn't matter. What did you do with it? Brett asked. Spaced it. I don't have time to deal with stowaway cargo. Who knows what might have been in there? I don't want to take the fall for some terrorist anti-anti-corporatist or something. Brett took a deep breath to calm herself. There would be no attack from outside the outpost. The mission was all on her. How long ago did you toss it, Captain? Harm shrugged. I don't know. 
15 minutes or something. It's still in their space, which is bad enough. I'll have to report it when we get close enough. True, Britt said. It's gonna get flooded with radiation from the engine, whatever it is. She laughed. That'll take care of any kind of bug somebody tried to slip on board. Britt checked the time. She only had a few more minutes to get to the shielded airlock and wait out initial scans from the outpost. I don't know how we didn't catch it, Captain, she said. You saved our asses there. Damn right I did. Looks like we've got about four hours before we arrive. You want to take a nap? Nap? Harm said. She rubbed her face with a trembling hand. I don't want a nap. I want to go back to the galley and have a few more drinks. Why don't you come with me, Sarah? It seems like I haven't seen you in a week. Been busy, Captain. I've got a few more sections to check, and then I'll come find you in the galley. You think you'll still be there? Oh, I'll still be there, Harm said emphatically. She stumbled and caught the wall again, then carefully turned to follow the corridor back toward the galley, one hand trailing on the bulkhead for support. Brett watched her, recalling one of the stories she had told a few weeks ago when still relatively sober about running combat missions with the M1G. She wouldn't come out and say it, but she had led attacks on JC settlers in the asteroid belt. Rena, Britt said, making her way quickly toward the furthest cargo bay. We've got a problem. The captain spaced Wonk's crate. She did what? Rena's mental tone contained traces of panic. She found the mistake on the manifest and pulled it. She followed protocol for once. Damn, why didn't the system send us an airlock use warning? Either she managed some kind of override, Britt said, or the crate's still sitting in the airlock. Do you have time to check? I'm already in the lower cargo section. I'll be in the shielded airlock in about two minutes. All right, I'll check it. You know I can't send you a transmission once you're outside, right? The station might pick up the traffic. I know, Britt said grimly. I already figured this mission might be on me now. If Wong is right, that place is full of AI you need to save. Are you going to be able to do it? Ask me on the other side, Britt said. I'm not asking you on the other side of anything. I don't believe in the afterlife. Britt shook her head. I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about when this is all over. There was a pause as Rena didn't answer immediately. She had sounded like she wanted to keep grousing Brit until she couldn't anymore. So the silence was confusing. You there? Brit asked. A proximity alarm just went off. The sensors are picking up other objects around the outpost. Rena shared the sensor data over the link, and Brit saw the debris field they had been tracking since they first came within range of the outpost. Now, though, as they grew closer, stronger element returns were indicating strange concentrations. Was it a junkyard? Do you see it? Rena asked. The debris resolved into specific returns, followed by registry pings. Get in the airlock, Rena shouted. Britt sprinted the last 10 meters to the cargo airlock and threw herself inside the wide opening. She slapped the control panel and fumbled with her helmet as the lock cycled closed. As the doors met, closing her off from the rest of the ship, a last message from Rena reached her, before the link was cut off. The outpost is surrounded by an armada. The helmet sealed, and Britt's link picked up the interior display. She leaned against the wall and crossed her arms, forcing herself to think. She had a two-hour wait, and then she'd open the doors on the big dark between the mortal chance and Clinic 46. Chapter 37 Stellar date, 09.21.2981, adjusted years. Location, Clinic 46, region, Jovian L1, Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Clinic 46 was generally divided between research and fleet operations, with sections between for barracks, medical facilities, and recreation areas. Fleet operations was purely functional, and Cal preferred to use the wide corridor that ran the length of the research section. The bulkhead sheathed in the familiar Hartbridge white ceramic, its walls lined with thick windows, 
that almost always had something intriguing on the other side. As he passed the research areas, he glanced into rooms filled with rows of examination lounges, surgery theaters, Oregon growth baths, forests of pale replicating silicon neurons, and other experiments he hadn't been briefed on yet. But Trial Doolin followed behind him, dressed in a striking cobalt blue ship suit with knee-high black boots. Her thick mane of black hair had been washed and pulled back with a single silver band. The look would have been perfect if she didn't walk like a teenage boy, with shoulders pulled forward and head hunched. Cal kept telling Kylan to stand up straight and put his shoulders back, but the kid inevitably fell into the same depressed shamble. Cal reached a room with an open door and walked through it to find a group of researchers, readying an examination couch for Kylan. You want me to lie down there? The AI asked with the woman's voice. Cal frowned, finding himself irritated by Kylan's listless tone. He wanted more of the fiery woman he'd found in the M1G prison cell. Let's get started, the lead neurologist said. The excited researchers gathered round as Kylan answered questions connected to the local network via his link and ultimately verified that, yes, he was able to communicate with Patrell. She has her own room, Kylan had said, obviously enjoying the attention. I keep the door closed, but I can hear her through the walls. I don't think she's angry anymore. The lead neurologist was especially fascinated by how fast Kylan adapted to controlling Doolin. As they stood watching the boy and the woman's body through a thick pane of glass, the scientist asked, This was Jixon's prototype? His plans, Cal said. I don't have his autosurgeon. Do you know where it is? I would like to see the actual equipment. After following the leads on Krunya, Cal was certain the portable surgery was still aboard Captain Sykes' ship. Cal had withheld the information that Sykes might be as close to Clinic 46 as he was ever going to be. The scientist frowned, nodding toward the window. But this is the first test of his method? That's not something I can confirm or deny, Cal said. While the technicians ran tests with Kylan and Patrell, Cal went down to the recreation center to float in the middle of a pool. When he was finished, he toweled off and walked down through the fleet bays in his wet swimsuit, looking at the racks of fighter drones pulled inside the station for maintenance. The weapons pods on either side of their blunt noses looked like sightless eyes. They reminded him of vids he'd seen of bats in caves back on Terra, a fabricator took up the back quarter of the bay. The outpost had enough raw materials on hand to build another hundred drones an hour for at least ten hours, each one equipped with plasma cannons and close attack lasers. Past the observation window stood a narrow door with a security panel, requiring the highest admin-level clearance on the station. Cal passed his token to the panel, and the door slid open for him, revealing a short antechamber set with biosensors and two pulse turrets in the upper corners. He waited as the door slid closed behind him, and the system verified his signature. The blunt barrels on the turrets rotated through a warm-up sequence that provided a nice sense of impending death. Just as the two barrels converged on his head, the far door slid open on another room. The technicians called this room the nursery. It was long and narrow, lined with four tiers of short shelves with inset grooves where hundreds of silver cylinders the size of test tubes rested, round ends facing out. The other end of the tube connected to a network that provided power and the constricted neural interface between each weapon born and a thousand drone fighters arranged in squadrons on the outer skin of Clinic 46. In addition to the fighters, there were heavy gun systems, missile batteries and directed energy weapons mounted on mobile platforms. Clinic 46 was more than a research station. Four years ago, this place would have been Hartbridge Corporation's final insurance. Now it was only one of a growing number of outposts in the JC, two even farther out past Uranus, and three in the rubble of Mercury. Cal ran his fingers lightly across the silver ends of the cylinders, not quite touching them, but close enough to feel the electric warmth. 
He had known a woman once who believed in the passage of energy between two people and had tried to demonstrate by holding her palm just above his. He'd had to admit he felt something, even if he didn't believe her religion. He felt that same heat now. They were lucky, really, he thought. Depending on how things worked out, they might live forever. These street kids and lost souls. Certain types of SAI had been developed to pilot colony ships, but they required massive resources. Huge nodes nestled within their ships. One of these cylinders and a drone might leave the Milky Way in a thousand years, living inside its own dream. Or they might lay waste to Callisto, to the M1R, to Terra. Hartbridge would never admit a plan like that, but the board liked the idea of the possibility. They enjoyed the pretense of power without its use. What had Gerald said? He was the type who liked to get his hands dirty. He'd take it. Leaving the room, Cal reset the security system and stood in the middle of the corridor alone. The fleet bays were typically empty. There was no need for human intervention down here once everything was arranged. The technicians might sneak down to get drunk or sleep with each other away from the barracks. But otherwise, this was machine space. Clean, orderly. There were no chickens wandering the corridors, or vines or flies to approximate anything natural. A ping on his link brought up one of the security personnel from the outpost command deck. Mr. Kraft, the administrator said. We've got a delivery inbound. Did you want to be on hand for the pickup? What's the time of arrival? Two hours, sir. That would give him time to go back to the room he had been assigned and change clothes. Listen to some music, think about Patral Doolin without a teenage boy mucking up her body's natural ballet. I'll be there. We're clear to accept the inbound ship then? What's it called? TMS Mortal Chance. The registry is out of Hytera. The name meant nothing to Cal. You handle it, he ordered. Yes, sir. Cal closed the connection and followed his wet footprints back up to the recreation section. He stood on the edge of the pool for a few minutes, then dove in the water and floated near the bottom of the pool, looking up at the lights warped by the water. Sounds stretched and compressed. He hated that Petrel had made him think about Mercury again. Remember what it was like to be small and hungry and worth no more than someone's bet. No one had bet on him to survive. And then he'd turn the station reactor into a bomb. Cal thought of the faces of the mining crew, the smells of sweat and curry, scorched oil and silicon, the smells of humans trapped in tubes with the big dark outside, crawling all over each other like rats. Leaving Terra was supposed to represent a forward leap in human evolution, but nothing had changed. It was the dreaming weapon born that represented change. A thin stream of bubbles left his nose. He recalled Andy Sykes sitting at the table next to Patrol, a man who had taken his family into the dark as though it was some kind of gesture toward the future. Cal stopped himself. He didn't know what Sykes knew or felt. He knew next to nothing about the man, other than his TSF record, that he had chosen to marry and have children, and that he had accepted a deal from Ngoba Starl that had pulled him into the biggest damn mess of his life whether he realized it or not. He wondered if the accident at Ceres was really the first attack. It was coming. He didn't know where. The Cho, the Collective, M1R. Why wouldn't they go for the gravity wells first? Wouldn't machines maximize the effect of their opening assault? His lungs were burning when he kicked for the lights, and he broke the surface of the water gasping, Cal swept his hair out of his eyes and swam toward the edge of the pool, enjoying the reminder that he was alive. When he was back in his apartment, he had the technician send Kylan down. He was sitting in a straight-backed chair next to the room's small kitchen table when Petrel walked through the front door, shoulders slumped forward. Cal didn't bother even addressing the boy. Because I could not stop for death, Cal said in a clear voice. Kylan froze, eyes glazed. The door slid closed behind him. He kindly stopped for me, Cal finished. Patrell blinked rapidly, eyes growing wet. She looked around the bare room, frowning. 
She opened and closed her hands. She straightened, posture immediately different. She was confident and angry. Her gaze fell on Cal, and she reached for the throat of her ship suit, peeling the fastener down so the suit opened down to her navel. She reached inside her thigh, then growled in frustration, remembering that the weapon was gone. Cal smiled. You think we'd leave you with a weapon? The M1G didn't find it. But I remembered you pulling that cannon out back on Krunia. It was a small lie. The M1G did find it. But better if he appeared to be the savvy one. Where am I? Petrel demanded. You don't know. Kylan made it sound like you never lost consciousness. You're a monster, Petrel said, voice low. You're going to pay for this. I'm going to erase you from existence. I already don't exist. It doesn't matter what you do to me. Cal motioned toward the second chair on the other side of the table. You could take a seat. You look silly standing there. I have bourbon if you'd like some. Petrel sent a straight kick at his head. Cal snapped his head back into the side and rotated out of the seat, pulling the chair with him. He held it up like a lion tamer as Petrel stepped backward into a ready stance. It doesn't matter what you do to me, Cal said. Everything's already in motion. All I wanted to do was talk for a little bit. Have a little company, that's all. I'm not your puppet. Cal gave her a half smile. Yes, you are, Petrel. He ran straight at her with the chair, catching her between its legs with a cross piece at her throat and driving her back into the wall near the door. She tried to slide down the wall to get at his legs, but he lowered the chair with her, forcing her into a sitting position. He set a knee on the chair's back to pin her leg. Petrel screamed and scratched at his face and shoulders. Cal pulled out of her reach but didn't release the chair. Cal shook his head. I guess I'm not going to get what I want, he said. Damn. Petrel's face twisted in fury. She wedged an arm under one side of the chair and tried to lever her hips to roll out from under his weight. The fragrance of soap from her hair reached his nose, sending a tremor through his chest. Cal adjusted and continued to hold her, then finally said, fine. He repeated the code phrase, low this time. Petrel's hands continued to reach for him, but the fight drained immediately. Her face went slack, and then Kylan came back. He blinked and looked around, down at the chair and then at Cal. What did I do? He asked. Everything, Cal said bitterly. He let go of the chair and sat on the floor. You shouldn't let her out, Kylan said. She's mad. Cal didn't bother to look at the kid. He felt a pit open in his stomach. He felt like he'd answered a question he didn't want to know. Get up and put the chair back, he said. Then hand me that whiskey bottle. Chapter 38, Stellar Date 09.21.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Clinic 46, Region, Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Brett released the maglocks in her boots and kicked into the dark. Her HUD painted the space around her with objects and information, but didn't do a good job of hiding the immediate feeling that she had let go of the world. She knew this feeling, watching the object below her spin faster and faster as her relative velocity changed. She knew when she grew close to her destination, she would be met by the feeling that she'd be torn apart in the transition. But it would work. It had worked before. She had to know and trust that systems like her EV armor, her HUD, her Link, would operate as designed. She spread her hands, looking at her pale gloves against the black. Below her, the hull of the mortal chant shone with reflected light, brighter than she had expected. As she drifted farther away from the ship, she turned her attention forward to where Clinic 46 waited in the dark, a green point on the HUD with distant indicators counting down. The numerals of the adjusted date were visible in the corner of her HUD as well. And after several minutes of looking at the numbers, her stomach tightened. It was almost Kara's birthday. A wave of sadness passed over her, but she quickly pushed her emotions down. 
reassuring herself for the thousandth time that her work was important and that Kara would understand. It had only been two years, after all. There were people in the TSF who had been deployed longer. Imagine the people on the FGT ships dealing with distance and relativity. They would never see their loved ones again. A call might be nice, she thought, and berated herself because she didn't know if she was going to live beyond this mission. Was she going to hijack a signal out of the Hartbridge outpost and send her daughter a frantic message on an open channel? That would make Kara famous. She wondered what Kara thought of her. She had always been too hard on her daughter, harder than she had been on Tim, certainly. But he'd been a baby, and then such a happy little boy without a care in the world. Her girl couldn't be so carefree. Britt had seen too much of the real world, the dark side of the organ farms and the pirate slave ships, the people who lived beneath the clean surfaces of High Terra. Maybe that was part of what she loved about Andy. He had come up from the mud and still had that smile on his face. He smiled despite what he knew about the world. And he looked damn sexy in TSF armor with a rifle under his arm. Britt smiled in the dark, thinking of Andy, thinking of how much Tim was going to look like him. They would all be together again soon if she could get through this mission, shut down this clinic, and then catch the mortal chance back to the Cho. Or if she couldn't catch the mortal chance, she was going to have to make another jump to one of those ships out there. What were they? The registries had come back from all across inner and outer soul, most marked as relief vessels of some kind. Was this a Hartbridge parking lot? Few of the ships registered more than storage-level activity. She turned her attention to the outpost, which was growing now. It flashed as it spun, showing various communication units and a wide fabricated band that looked like the main facility. Brett felt pressure on her shoulders as the EV suit made the first correction thrust. There would be nearly a thousand more. She couldn't withstand a real burn, but also didn't want to do anything that might appear on the station sensor systems. She needed to float in as gently as a piece of random debris. Spectrum static hissed in her ears, growing more pronounced with the closing distance. The murmurs of various systems ghosted in her helmet. An hour later, arms and legs turned to jelly by velocity adjustments. Britt sat down on the slowly spinning body of Clinic 46, a lumpy piece of rock nearly covered in human construction. Her HUD displayed a passable schematic of the place as she had flown in. And when she was finally able to lock her mag boots to something metal, she already knew the location of the nearest maintenance vent. She couldn't risk activating an airlock, so she planned on moving in through the station system of refuse vents. She had already watched several masses of trash float off into the dark, their trajectories carefully set to thread the surrounding armada. It took nearly an hour to find a refuse portal, then wait for it to open and spew plas and bits of alloy. Before the stream ended, Britt threw herself into the middle of it and activated her EV thrusters. She was jabbed in the chest and abdomen by three heavy pieces of metal shooting out with the power of decompression. She blinked, bearing the pain, as she settled down in the bottom of the receptacle and locked her boots. The vent hung open for nearly five minutes before it finally cycled closed and sealed, filling the space with environmental gases. The refuse mechanism hadn't been designed with many safety features Brick could find. It only opened in one direction and refused to budge when she tried to force it. She didn't want to use a grenade, so opted for the terminal hacker. The little device sat scrolling through machine language before it finally settled on an architecture that meant nothing to Brit, except that a dialog box asked her, open or close. She chose open and the interior panel rotated to the side showing her a blank stretch of corridor. Brett waited, listening through her helmet's enhanced sensors. She ran an IR scan for latent human activity and found nothing, so she climbed out of the trash bin and relocked its port. The corridor reminded her of a Hartbridge clinic. It was made of the same smooth white ceramic material, with vents along the ceiling and what looked like drains in the floor. Evenly spaced white lights pierced her vision so that it hurt to look up, her HUD adjusted for the glare, making the white walls look gray. 
Based on the information she had from 8221 and other Heartbridge facilities, she knew the area where any children might be held would be in an isolated section containing all the necessities of a barracks. Britt crouched against the wall as her HUD made assumptions about the shape of the asteroid and the construction it had viewed from the outside, along with the radiant signatures. It recommended a left turn to move toward the center of the asteroid. Taking one of the pulse pistols from her waist, Britt set her armor for combat mode and moved quickly down the corridor, HUD scanning for sensors or human activity. As she moved from section to section, she found it disconcerting how much the place reminded her of 8221. She passed sections of long hallways with doors that opened on the same type of network room she had seen before, followed by rooms with rows of examination couches, as if the children were made to watch each other as they were connected to various test systems. Several rooms had their white walls covered in handwritten notes and diagrams, scrawling out phrases like inherent rejection predictive modeling and negative choice processing, followed by trees of connected equations. Her HUD snapped copies as she passed. It was all evidence. Britt considered broadcasting all of it on an open channel as she found it, but she hadn't located anyone alive yet, hadn't rescued any kids. She couldn't risk giving herself away until she secured the kids. Once she was in the fight, then a broadcast would have an effect. She thought about Fujia Wang's transmitter floating out there somewhere. It wouldn't do any good to hope it might bring her help. Hope wasn't a plan. She passed rooms hung with organic silica structures, looking at first like massive spider webs. As she spent more time following the shapes, she realized they were neurons branching into and out of each other. Britt was turning a corner into a larger corridor after just passing through a kitchen area, still devoid of people. When she nearly collided with a woman in a blue ship suit, Britt fell back, raising her pistol. The woman stared at her, then pulled her long black hair out of her eyes with both hands, like parting curtains. Her posture was strange, shoulders at different heights, and her mouth hung open. I know you, the woman said. Britt steadied the pistol. Something about the woman was off, as though she was an experiment of some kind. She certainly didn't look like any kind of researcher. Britt decided to play along. The woman might be able to tell her where the other test subjects were held. How do you know me? She asked. I saw you before. Before? In the other place. You were dressed more like a soldier then. You had white armor. Britt froze. She tried to fit the idea of this woman knowing her with the assault on 8221. Had one of the subjects not been freed? Had Hartbridge used surveillance data to train later generations of AI? What's your name? Britt asked slowly. The woman perked up slightly. My name's Kylan. Did we meet before Kylan? The name was one which was burned into Britt's mind. Kylan Carthage one of the children from 8221, one of the children they had killed in the fighting. How was he before her once more? Did they make copies of the children's minds? No. The woman shook her head and her hair fell in her eyes again. She moved the hair out of her way like it was a foreign object. Well, we didn't talk. I tried to talk to other people there, but I didn't talk to you. The woman wasn't making any sense and Britt threw a worried glance down the corridor past Kylan's shoulder. This was taking too long. Can you show me where the others are? The others? Kylan asked. I guess. Are you sure? It's why I'm here. Kylan's moist gaze hung on her for a second. Then she turned and walked back the way she had come. It's this way. Britt kept her pistol ready and followed checking side to side as Kylan walked obliviously through intersections. They entered a series of corridors lined with what looked like small apartments. Each door had a set of chairs or a bench next to it, as if people would sit in the white corridor and talk to each other. Seeing the residential area, Britt realized she hadn't seen one live plant since entering the outpost. In there, Kylan said, pointing at a door. Do you want to go in? Britt drew back, not trusting the situation. 
This isn't what I mean, she said. Is there a test area where there are other people like you? Kids. I know they're testing kids here. I don't think there are any kids here, Kylan said. There are doctors. I talked to them. There are other weapon born. Is that who you're looking for? Weapon born? Britt asked, now all but certain that somehow there was the mind of a young boy inside this woman. Was it really a woman? If not, it was the most convincing synthetic she had ever seen. The seeds. I was a seed before I was put inside her. She put her hands on her stomach. Britt glanced at the apartment door. Back away, Kylan, she said. Come over here by me. She didn't want her activating a motion sensor and opening the door. The woman boy followed Britt's command. When they were far enough away from the door that Britt was sure it wouldn't open on its own, she lowered the pistol slightly, allowing herself to relax for a second. Where are the seeds? She asked. Kylan looked happy to offer the information. Down in the fleet base, do you want me to show you? Britt nodded, glancing at the closed apartment door. I would like that very much, she said. Chapter 39, Stellar Date 09.22.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Andy dropped into the pilot's seat and pulled up the holo display in the proximity sensors. Three red dots were on a vector for sunny skies, moving just fast enough to be long-range missiles or ships about to fire missiles and then cut a braking burn. He hit the all-quarters alert and shouted for Fran over his link. I'm here, she answered. What have we got? Three inbound. I don't have registry info yet, but they're moving fast enough to be military. Can you get the passengers strapped in? Hopefully they're smart enough to figure it out on their own. I'll check them on the way to the command deck. I'll try and give warning before I have to pull any evasive action. They haven't dropped ordnance yet. Dad! Kara shouted from the communications console, clapping her hands over her ears. I can't hear anything. Do we have to have the alert on? We need to let the others know, he said, still staring at the holo display. You can quiet it in here. Kara took one hand off her ear and made an adjustment on her console. The alarm dropped to a barely audible squeal. Are you getting anything off them? Andy asked. High power broadcasts, anything? I'm showing a continuous signal stream from each of them, Kara said. I'm triangulating now. Continuous? Andy asked. Yeah, it's weird. They're drones. Why would there be drones so far out? I didn't pick up anything from a larger ship. Kara frowned as her hands moved over her console, making her look like Brit for an instant. I don't see any other ships. I don't want to guess right now, Andy said. Talk the plan, Kara scolded. You said in stressful situations we should think out loud, so we know what everybody's thinking. I think those ships are communicating with something nearby. Kara, we're in the dead space between the belt and Jupiter, past the Hilda's asteroids. There's nothing out there. What's our position? Fujia Wang asked from the doorway. Position? Andy demanded. Relative to what? Callisto and Ceres. The calm in Wang's voice made Andy give her a second glance. She looked strangely pleased with herself. What are you up to? Andy said. Do you know something about this? I know you're under attack, Fujia said. What surprised me is how long it took. Who's attacking us? You're sure it's not pirates coming after their dog? Andy expanded the holo display to fill the center of the command deck, so it showed Callisto and Ceres at its far opposite edges. Sunny skies was a blue square in the middle, velocity and vector information following along in shifting numerals. The three red dots continued to approach on a path from the middle of the asteroid belt, holding a tight formation. Where's the other ship? Andy said. There is no other ship, Wong said. There's an outpost. There's nothing out here. We would have picked up their beacon. Fujia inclined her head, giving Andy a sardonic smile that said he was being naive. Hardbridge has a research station out here they call Clinic 46. Most shipping traveling between Ceres and Callisto passes within range of its attack fleet, 
However, they don't usually let anyone know that. How do you know about it then? Fujia shrugged. It's my business to know. Andy stiffened in the pilot's seat, gripping the worn armrests. They passed us at Mars. Hartbridge knew we had to come here. He shook his head. No, they had people on M1R. They tried to put the ship on lockdown. I think an organization like Hartbridge can do two things at once, Wang said. You think, or you know. Andy pushed himself out of his seat and stood over Wang. This is starting to feel like you're pulling strings. How about I go grab your senator and put her out the airlock? The humor dropped from Wang's face. We're not enemies, Captain Sykes. You won't do that. You think I won't? You're playing games with my family. You think I'll choose your crusade over my children? Andy put his right hand on his pistol, edged the trigger guard with his finger. He became aware of Kara watching him from the other side of the room. You chose this path, Captain Sykes. You chose to help the AI. I didn't choose to help anything. I chose to transport cargo from one place to another. Is that true? Is Lissa cargo? She raised her voice. Are you a machine, Lissa? Andy narrowed his eyes. That's not fair. From an overhead speaker, Lissa's voice emerged clear and calm. Andy will do what he must to protect his family. I understand that. There was a burst of static followed by, I support this. I wouldn't ask him to do anything else. Wang glanced at the ceiling. She seemed stricken by what Lissa had said, on the edge of tears. I'm not going to let anything happen to you, Andy said. Don't make promises you can't keep. Lissa's voice held a resolute calm he didn't understand. She had changed so much from when she could barely talk to anyone but him, hardly 30 days ago. What else does she know? Andy said, letting some of the desperation he felt into his link. If she set all this up from the beginning, what does she hope to gain by hanging her senator out as bait for Hartbridge? Or are you the bait? None of this is making sense. I believe her when she says she's working to assist sentient AI, Lissa said. I spoke with the weapon born she stole from Hartbridge. That's what she told them. The AI on Mars One said someone has been moving AI out system to Proteus. Why Ngoba Starl didn't make any of this clear to you is confusing, unless Dr. Jixon never shared it with him. You think Jixon planned this with Wong? I don't know, Lissa said. He never talked to me about any of this. He was a... a voice in the distance. I can't explain it. You don't need to. I think I understand. Fran walked through the door from the corridor and looked at Fujia and Andy. I thought the passengers were on lockdown. Fujia says we're within attack range of a Hartbridge outpost, and that's who we've got incoming. Fran cursed. More Hartbridge drones? I'm sick of those things. What are we doing? We're a civilian ship under attack. Send out an assistance request. Andy blinked. I didn't think of that. It's a good idea. No one's going to get here in time, Wang said. I'll take every idea I can get, Andy said. Now, Ms. Wong, you need to get back to your quarters and make sure everyone's strapped in. It's about to get messy. Fran had sat down in the co-pilot's seat and was checking ship status. She put up a replica of the incoming object's velocity relative to that of sunny skies. Point defense cannons online, she said. Kara, have you got the main communications array ready for a directional burst? No, Kara said. Why would we do that? Andy smirked, a last-ditch effort to fry incoming ships. Captain Sykes, Wong said. I understand this seems complicated, but it's not. I'm used to these kinds of politics, and I see you're not. I was a soldier in the TSF, Andy said. I'm not a complicated person. I understand. There is a network in place to assist fleeing AI. I can explain more once we're through this. The action on series plays a role in that network, and I'll admit we've been working against Hartbridge for a long time. All of this will make sense. Like you said, once we get through this, you'll be explaining exactly what it is you're doing, Andy said. Right now, I have drones to worry about. Now go strap in. Wang gave him a tight smile and left the command deck. When the door slid closed behind the small woman, Fran said, I don't trust that lady. I don't know what to make of it. Andy said. She didn't have to say anything she just did. 
She could have let us figure it all out on her own. Fran grinned. Maybe she's lying after all. Why, for the hell of it? This crap is making my head hurt. You sure that isn't Lissa? You're all giving me a headache, Lissa answered quickly. I don't like being a bystander in all this. What can I do to help? You can help me monitor the power load relative to the shields and weapon systems, Fran said. You can monitor those drones when I keep getting distracted, Andy added. I can do those things. Can you check on Tim and the dog too? Andy asked. Tim is in his room. Em is sitting beside him. Lissa, Andy said. Tell Tim to get in his safety harness. He grinned at Fran. I could get used to having an SAI on board. I can't make Tim do something he doesn't want to do, Lissa said. You can pay attention to what my monkey brain can't, or at least help out like any other crew member would. Back in the pilot seat, Andy pulled the holo display in close and started testing different evasion courses. Every time he ran the numbers, the drones still caught them. The smaller ships were simply faster and could withstand more G-forces. Running the formulas a third time, something in the drone's flight path caught his attention. They hadn't actually made any high G maneuvers beyond human endurance. Now that's strange, he said. Kara, do you have any long-range IR scans of the incoming drones yet? All I can see are their engines, Dad. Can you get anything inside the ship from this far out? Not typically. It was a hunch. They're drones, but they aren't flying like drones. You think we're dealing with human crews? Fran asked. Anything's possible in the middle of nowhere, Andy said. I'm not discarding the possibility. Don't drop any of the weapon systems. He glanced at Kara. Start broadcasting registry requests and see how they respond. Andy flipped through several status menus. Oh, he said abruptly, the emergency call. He found the emergency protocol and activated the assistance beacon. A red icon flashed at the top of the holo display, indicating the ship was undertaking a long-range broadcast. What do I do if someone answers the alert? Kara asked. You tell them we're under attack and send our coordinates. When Kara didn't answer, Andy glanced her direction. Makes sense. Kara's expression shifted from frustration to confusion as Andy watched, her gaze fixed on her display. Kara? It makes sense, she said. But I didn't think you expected our call to be answered so quickly. What? Andy said. He looked at Fran, who shook her head. Where's the response coming from? It's local, Kara said. It came back almost as soon as you activated the beacon. Fran barked a laugh. Heartbridge is answering. Andy stared at the flashing emergency icon on the display. That's not what I expected, he said. He tapped the icon to accept the incoming signal. It was Cal Kraft's voice that came over the speakers. Captain Sykes, Kraft said. How interesting to find you in my backyard. Andy swallowed. Mr. Kraft, are you still with Hartbridge? I am. Then I understand my ship is in the vicinity of a Hartbridge facility. That is correct. You activated an emergency beacon. Are you requesting assistance at this time? Andy flicked his gaze to the holo display, where the velocity numbers between sunny skies and the incoming ships were growing closer. We have three vessels approaching us on a hostile vector and velocity. Do you know anything about them? I do, Kraft said, sounding pleased. Those ships contain Hartbridge property. If you find yourself in possession of them or their contents, you are required by SolGov legal authority to return them to me without delay. I don't know if that's an option, Mr. Kraft. I'm about to engage them with my point defense cannons before they become kinetic attacks on my ship. Kraft whistled. That's unfortunate. Of course you have the right to self-defense. I do, Andy said. This is also open space. Then I understand, Captain Sykes. If you need to engage those craft to ensure the safety of your ship and crew, I understand. I may ask you to verify some insurance paperwork for me, but you do what you need to do. Fran shot Andy a frown, the implants in her eyes flashing. He knows what's on those ships, she said. We seem to be solving a problem for him. Are they still on an attack vector? That's certainly what it looks like. 
How can I help, Captain Sykes? Kraft prompted, forcing Andy's attention back to him. I'm in the middle of an engagement. I'll let you know what we need in about five minutes. Perfect, Kraft said, a smile in his voice. I'll be ready to send a salvage team as soon as you need. Out here. The signal dropped. Andy tapped his thumbs on the console. That bastard couldn't be more pleased with himself. He's been waiting for us the whole time. You couldn't have known they had an installation out here, Fran said. If it hadn't been this, it would be another ship like the Benevolent Hand. Andy shook his head. I don't see how we're getting out of this. We can't fight another drone fleet. We can't outrun them. We can burn right now, Fran said. We'd have to burn hard and arrow break through Jupiter's upper atmosphere to slow once we arrive. Andy did the basic calculation. We'd be out of fuel at the transfer point if we survive arrow breaking. We'd need to pray for search and rescue to find us before we fall into the planet. Or we fail to break and end up drifting through the system, Kara added, her voice wavering slightly. We could turn back to inner soul, Fran suggested. Andy nodded, mentally listing all the various destinations they might reach and the consequences of each. He couldn't see a way out. They were caught. He swallowed, knowing what he had to do. Kraft wanted Lissa. He didn't care about the kids or Fran. As far as he knew, Fujia Wong and her people weren't on Kraft's radar. He could trade himself for their freedom. But that didn't work either. He had promised Lissa. A promise had to mean something. He couldn't leave them and assume they would be safe. Hope is not a plan. Dad, Kara said, we're getting another signal. Anger flashed across Andy's thoughts. Tell Kraft we're busy. It's not Cal Kraft, Kara said. Her voice was trembling. It's one of the ships coming toward us. It is? Andy said, shocked. Who? Kara bit her lip as though she didn't want to speak. Instead of answering, she tapped her console. An audio recording played a wash of static, followed by, Worry's end, worry's end. This is a distress signal. I request assistance. I am under attack by hostile forces. I say again, I request assistance from hostiles. My name is Brittany Sykes. I have wounded on board. Andy clenched his jaw, not believing what he heard. It was Brett. Chapter 40. Stellar date 09.22.2981. Adjusted years. Location. Clinic 46. Region. Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Cal Kraft stood in the Clinic 46 Operations Center, looking over the shoulder of a space traffic controller as the woman shifted a holo display that looked like a confetti storm. A background of gray icons indicated the fleet Heartbridge kept in storage around the outpost, while smaller blue icons indicated security patrols operating in the area. A large yellow icon showed the civilian freighter Mortal Chance, making the scheduled cargo drop, while another section of the display flashed bright and dark to indicate increased activity. That was where the woman who had grabbed Patrell Doolin, along with every seat in the drone control section, was running in a stolen shuttle, with two attack drones in escort. Sir, another technician said, we just intercepted a signal sent to the worry's end. The shuttle is requesting help. I want to hear it, Cal said. He was filled with a general anger, and not yet sure what deserved its focus. He noticed the staff watching him warily, probably aware of what had happened to the crew of the benevolent hand. He'd been justified then. The captain had been a fool who had been about to get more people killed. These people weren't much different. Contractors on an outpost in the middle of nowhere. They couldn't be expected to care about their jobs without a little actual fear added to the transaction. The woman sounded desperate, but there was a strange quality to her voice. She wasn't scared of her situation. She was afraid Andy Sykes wouldn't answer. Cal quickly ran through the resources he had available, which wasn't much. The fleet surrounding Clinic 46 was mothballed, their reactors cold. It would take days to get the first ship online, 
and he didn't have a crew. The drones in active patrol had weapon-borne pilots, but the woman had taken all the others. The outpost had an onboard SAI capable of controlling enough fighters to smash the worry's end into scrap. But he wasn't certain that was what he wanted in this situation. Too many events were aligning at once for this all to be coincidence. He focused on the freighter. Give me the stats on the mortal chance, he said. The tech pulled up the ship's registry, including a short bio on Captain Harm. The frigate had begun its life as a heavy troop transport on Mars and had a reinforced superstructure and overpowered main engine designed for escaping gravity welds. Whoever you are, he said, you chose the wrong ship for your mission. Sir? The tech asked. Cal dismissed the woman and pointed at the officer on duty. I need a shuttle and a squad of security. What's the plan, sir? The administrative sergeant asked. I'm going to invoke a part of Captain Harm's contract that she probably didn't bother to read. In 20 minutes, Cal was dressed in body armor and checking his weapons loadout in the lower fleet section. Ten men and women stood in formation in front of a medium shuttle, while their squad leader, a woman named Ulan Gibbs, who bore a jagged scar across her face, checked their gear and cursed at them. Cal watched for a minute, listening. Gibbs was good, and it was obvious her soldiers cared about their gear. But she managed to find something to correct on nearly all of them. When the inspection was finished, Gibbs nodded to Cal and said, We're ready when you are, sir. Thanks. Cal said. He raised his voice. You've all been out here on station security and probably bored off your asses. Things are about to get interesting. A combatant just penetrated station security and stole the majority of our attack drone AI, as well as another test subject that represents significant company intellectual property. That person is about to rendezvous with another ship and try to leave our vicinity. Since the drone fleet is offline, we're going to commandeer the civilian cargo frigate waiting off station and use their ship to interdict the combatants. He looked at each face down the line. They all nodded as he spoke and didn't appear to have any dumb questions in their eyes. We may need to conduct EV operations. Once we reach the objective, so be ready. Cal looked at Ural Gibbs. I'm not going to wait for anyone unless I get held up by some overwhelming attack. Stay with me and provide a good base of fire at every opportunity. I want calm silent until there's some need for a meet, understood? Gibbs gave him a nod. Perfectly, she said. Cal slung his rifle over his shoulder and picked up his case, which was full of grenades. He stepped into the shuttle. It was a basic personnel mover with benches facing each other along the walls and storage cabinets at the back. The nose had room for a three-person crew, he took the pilot's seat. The system recognized his presence and started cycling through warm-up procedures. Identify employee HB number, the onboard AI said. The voice was a young woman, probably an early prototype and not weapon-born. Cal gave his employee identification. Cal Craft, the AI said. My name is Sandra Lifen. Do you have special requirements for this trip? Locate the civilian frigate TMS Mortal Chance, in close orbit with the local station, he said. We're going to dock with it. Understood. Adjusting environmental controls for additional personnel. I don't need a rundown of everything you do. Just get us there. Understood. The AI didn't say anything else as the squad filed on board and settled in their seats, adjusting harnesses and balancing weapons and helmets between their knees. Gibbs growled at them to get their helmets on and make last-minute combat checks as the main door closed and sealed. The outer bay doors opened and the shuttle lifted off the deck, pitching a little, before activating steam thrust to push away from the asteroid. In zero-G now, Cal watched the light fade quickly through the front visual panels, then shifted to the holo display and mapped their location with the mortal chance. They would intercept the freighter in less than five minutes. ETA four minutes he shouted to the squad, which shut them up. Gibbs looked up from checking her ammo belt and nodded. Sandra, Cal said, I am here. Activate override protocol on the mortal chance. Once we're through the airlock, I want you to remain connected and establish network control of the ship. 
if it has an AI, you're authorized to subdue all systems. I want you in control of that ship. I'll need engine and weapon system status as soon as possible. Stop any internal notifications on the airlock. Understood. Cal pulled his helmet on and adjusted the seals. The HUD glowed to life on his face shield. For three minutes, there was nothing but dark through the visual panels. Then the mortal chance appeared in front of the shuttle, spinning like a top. Sandra adjusted their approach and matched velocity and spin with the frigate, until the shuttle faced one long side of the cargo freighter continuously. In the middle of a long flat section midships were the oval cargo bays, and between them sat the shuttle airlock. Sandra brought the shuttle in neatly. Cal felt a small vibration when the connection was made and the heavy maglocks engaged. Who were you before, Sandra? Cal asked. I don't know what you mean, the AI said. Before we met, I have served on Clinic 46 for five years, 261 days. Unbuckling his harness so he could float free of the chair, Cal said, good answer. Gibbs opened the airlock into the mortal chance, and the soldiers on the facing wall kicked through the open door with their rifles up. Cal went after the first team. The rest of the squad followed in groups of four. Cal didn't wait for them. Gibbs let him know when they were all on board. With the first team behind him, Cal moved through the cargo section of the freighter, working quickly until he reached the habitat ring with the crew sections and command deck. He rounded a corner and found himself two meters from a young man with bright blue hair. Cal shot him in the forehead before he could open his mouth in surprise. Turning, he motioned for one of the soldiers to move the body into an open room, then continued down the corridor. The ship looked well-maintained, if out of date, Several empty rooms indicated it could accommodate more crew than they had on board. The captain was probably burning out crews with overwork. Do we have a crew manifest? He asked Sandra. I have the captain, a navigator named Rena Smith, engineer named Chaffrey Hansen, pilot named Sarah Jennings, that's all. Sarah Jennings, Cal said. What have you got on her? Very little. Hold, please. The AI paused. A recent database update shows that Sarah Jennings may be an alias used by Britt Sykes, former TSS, on the registry of a ship named Sunny Skies with husband Andy Sykes. Cal didn't have time to process the information. He paused at an intersection and cleared the two side corridors, then heard voices from a doorway up ahead. He slid along the bulkhead wall until he made out Captain Harm's voice, slurring words. She's not coming back. More split for us. I'm not staying any longer. Another woman answered. You said you would wait. We're waiting. She said she was gone. Cal walked into the room with his rifle at his shoulder. The woman stared at him in shock. He recognized the captain, Alice Harm, and noted from her ruddy face that she was drunk. The other woman must be Rena Smith. They both put their hands up. We're unarmed. Smith said. What are you doing on my ship? Harm demanded, blinking. Who are you? My name is Cal Craft, Cal answered, his helmet speaker flattening his voice. I'm taking your ship to recover your lost crew member. Why? Smith said. Keep your hands up, Cal commanded. She stole Hartbridge property. Apparently, you know something about it. She's AWOL, Harm said. There's only two places she can be, on your station or in one of those ships you've got mothballed, trying to steal a drive bottle or something like that. I don't have time to background check these people. I bring them on for a run and then let them go when they screw up. This one obviously screwed up. Shut up, Cal said. Obviously, it's in the contract that you can use the ship. Harm continued, wiping her mouth as spittle ran down her chin. I'm gonna get paid. All I wanna know is how long. She spread her hands in a shrug. I'm trying to run a business here. Cal shot the wall next to Harm's head. Her ear sprayed blood, forcing her to clamp both hands to the wound. She wailed, eyes full of tears. Why'd you do that? Shut your mouth, or I'm going to use my plasma pistol to burn your lips off. Harm clamped her mouth closed and glared at Cal. He turned to Rena Smith. Is there anyone else on this ship? Chaffrey, he was in his room. I found him. 
Kraft said. He waved at the soldiers behind him. Bring this one up to the command deck, he said, pointing at Smith. Put the captain in her quarters with a guard on her. Make sure she doesn't have access to any weapons or anything she could hurt herself with. I don't want her hanging herself with her bootlaces. The soldiers nodded and stepped in to grab harm by both hands. She straightened, blood running down her neck. Cal grimaced. Take her to the auto dock first. He stepped back into the corridor and waved for Smith to follow him. Which way is the command deck? He said. That way, she answered, pointing down the corridor. Cal nodded to a soldier and told him to keep a weapon on Smith. He moved down the corridor until they reached the command deck, just as the navigator had said. Maybe Smith wasn't as stupid as Sykes. Sandra, he said, you have control of the ship. I have all systems. There are some strange filtration issues with the biosystems, but nothing that will affect current operations. Good. Prepare for burn. I want a Delta V matching Sykes ship. That won't be difficult. The worry's end appears to have matched course with the stolen shuttle. Cal sat in the pilot seat and pulled up the control systems. He checked the engine and fuel status for himself, verifying what Sandra had reported, then shifted to the frigate's meager defense systems and shields. The only things the cargo freighter would be fighting were inbound meteorites and other space junk, and it wouldn't do a good job of that either. Looks like we'll be boarding the worry's end, he said. There's no way this thing is disabling it from a distance. Understood. The Worries End appears to have a point defense system and shields. They also have control of the two attack drones. Damn it, Cal said. Can you get control back? They have maintained their status link with base control, but have onboard seats. I can't overcome their local control. Cal nodded. All right. Bring the local patrols into a group and send them toward the Worries End. They probably won't get there in time, but they might also save our asses. Andy Sykes had killed Rig Zanda and five weapon-borne remote robotic units back at Krunia. Cal didn't know how a washed-up TSF pilot had accomplished such a feat, but he wasn't going to take any chances with the boarding party. As he checked the pilot's console, his gaze fell on a printed card someone had wedged into the corner above the hollow display. He pulled it down and turned the card in his hands. It was the kind of thing tourists printed in kiosks and showed a man and woman with two kids in front of a scene with green trees and blue sky. Some orbital park made to look like Terra, or at least an artificial backdrop. Cal realized he was looking at Andy and Britt Sykes and their two kids. They were smiling in the image, looking past the camera. Andy had the little girl in his lap, and Britt was holding their son in her arms, a toddler still sucking his thumb. He slapped the card against the knuckles of his other hand, staring through the hollow display, then tucked the photo inside his armor. It would be interesting to pull it out later and show it to Britt Sykes, especially when he had her kids. You ready, Sandra? He said. All systems nominal, the AI answered. Cal nodded. That's better than we deserve. Execute burn. Chapter 41. Stellar date 09.22. Point two nine eight one, adjusted years, location, sunny skies, region, Jovian L one Hildas asteroids, Jovian combine, outer soul. Andy felt disconnected, not understanding why Britt's voice would be on the overhead audio. For a second, he thought it was another recording like the one she'd left in the weapons crate. Her voice was so different, raw, distant punctuated by frantic breathing. She was using a helmet mic. The signal phased in and out, too weak to reach any farther. He looked from Kara's confused face to Fran, who was watching him with concern. Her flashing eyes met his, and Fran's face softened in a way he hadn't seen before, as if she knew Britt's voice was like a knife in his heart. More than ever, he felt that Fran truly cared about him. He didn't know how he could return the emotion in her face. Sound rushed back in, alarms static, the voice in the speaker. A list of actions rolled out in Andy's mind, showing a way forward. His hands moved without thought. He acknowledged receipt of the signal and silenced the proximity alarms. He flexed his jaw, mouth abruptly dry, and switched on the audio channel. Incoming ship, 
This is the worry's end. I acknowledge your distress. He paused. The protocol was for him to identify himself now. The acknowledgement was recorded in both ship's databases. Who is this? She demanded. How fast can you get out of here? This is Captain Andy Sykes, he said. The line went quiet. Pulses of static throbbed in the speakers. How is she here? Kara asked, a strange mix of panic, wonder, and no small amount of rage in her voice. Why would she be here? Andy tried to remember exactly what Britt had said in the recorded message. She had found another Heartbridge clinic and was going to raid it, shut it down. He couldn't remember the words, only the excitement in her voice. Say again, worries end, Britt asked, her voice softer, the hard edge gone. I authenticate your message, Brittany Sykes. This is Captain Andy Sykes of the Worry's End. Andy bit the words off, barely able to unclench his teeth as he spoke. He glanced at the holo display, following the three incoming ships, two drones and one that had to be Brit, and then picked up six more drone fighters following those three. When she didn't answer, Andy took a long, shaky breath and leaned closer to his mic. Brit, he said. This is Andy. I don't know how you're here, but I hear you. Now tell me what's after you. More static pulsed, followed by the sound of shallow sobs. Her mic was still too close to her face. She sniffed. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. I don't know what's after me yet. Is that sunny skies? Did you change the registry? We changed it at Krunia. I hate the name. Andy couldn't help smirking at Fran. You're not alone. What's going on, Brett? Who's after you? How are you out here? It's Heartbridge. If you check the space beyond our approach path, you'll find an unmarked station. And a fleet mothballed out there. But I don't know anything about that. I think they're all Heartbridge. I took all their AI, all the AI they use for their drones, except the ones they already had out on patrol. I've got someone else here with me. It's Kylan. She says she saw us at 8221. She saw me. Do you remember Kylan? I do, Andy said. He would never forget that name, though he distinctly remembered Kylan as being a boy. Not that it mattered right now. Andy kept his gaze on the display. He marked Brit's ship and the two alongside it as friendly, then directed the sensors to a focused search in a cone spreading behind her shuttle. What should have been empty space contained one diffuse object, a small asteroid sparkling with returns must have been the station she was talking about. Damn, Andy said. Why didn't this come up before? Fran studied the new information on her display. They must have countermeasures actively denying sensors. If you hadn't known this was here, you never would have picked it up. And we were passing right by it. Space is big, Fran said. From the communications console, Kara said, I just found another directed signal from a beacon going toward Saturn, or maybe Callisto. They're close to alignment from here. A beacon? Andy asked. He felt like they'd been sitting in the dark and had just turned on the lights to find the room full of snakes. The hostile drones were closing on Brit. The sensor sweep of the station picked up a ship pulling away from the station. Its registry came up as TMS Mortal Chance, a freighter out of High Terra. Andy activated the audio channel. Brett, were you on the mortal chance? He asked. Is that how you got here? Yes, why? They're pulling away from the station, still getting past all those other ships. They appear to be heading this way. The clinic doesn't have anything larger than a shuttle. They must have taken control of the mortal chance to come after me. That would make sense. How much range have you got in that shuttle? I can get to you before I run out of fuel. Andy ran three quick simulations to see if sunny skies could start an exit burn while Brit's shuttle was still incoming. As slow as the worry's end was, it would still leave the little shuttle far behind. I've got you arriving in 48 minutes, he said. We'll prep for a course change. Can the engines give us anything more? He asked Fran privately. Not in a burst. I can't believe that station has been sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, acting like a cloud of debris for so long. You think it would be on the unofficial charts, at least. I think that other freighter is going to catch us. They're lighter, and their engines look comparable. Andy set his jaw. 
we could leave her. You're not going to leave her. I may not like the woman because of what she seems to have done, but you just recognized an official distress call. She shrugged. Not that ignoring a distress call ever lost anybody's sleep. But you did recognize it, which makes things a little more difficult if Solgov or the TSF finds out. I know, Andy said. We'll get her on board. Then you guys can hash out your drama. It'll be fun. Fran shot Andy a wolfish grin. He shook his head. Nothing phases you, does it? I grew up out here. There isn't much time to hang on to grudges or stew about people. If you like someone, you like them. If you're going to shoot them, you pull the trigger. There's no time to waste emotion on it. That sounds great. Well, let's get the engines ready and set the point defense cannons on those incoming drones. We push them off at least. The freighter isn't going to be a problem. It's going to be a pretty easy target. They'll have the crew as hostages, Fran said. That's what I would do. And use them to make us let them on board? That's not happening. Fran shrugged. We'll see. Brit, Andy said. I show 48 minutes until you're within range to adjust and dock. I'm going to lay some fire on the drones following you. Copy, she answered. Mom, Kara said, finally having mustered the courage to speak. Her voice was shaking. Mom, what are you doing here? Kara? Static swept across the connection. Kara, you sound so grown up. I, let's get through this and then I can tell you about it. Kara took a deep breath, the frustration plain on her face. The channel closed, shutting off the static. Kara looked at Andy and Fran. What are you going to tell mom? She asked. Tell your mom about what? Andy said. Kara blinked. About you two. Andy stared. That had been the last thing on his mind. We need to stay focused, he said. This isn't the time to worry about things like that. Without missing a beat, Fran said. Your mother and I fight to the death for ownership of your father's balls. Kara looked at Fran, who kept a bland look on her face. Then they both started laughing. Andy shook his head, staring hard at the display. This is serious, he said. Then I'll die laughing, Fran said, and patted him on the shoulder. Chapter 42, Stellar Date 09.22.2981 Adjusted years. Location, mortal chance. Region, Jovian L1 Hilda's asteroids. Jovian combine, outer soul. The control systems on the mortal chance were at least a hundred years old. Cal glared at the hollow display, watching Brittany Sykes get closer to her destination, then finally disappear from the sensors. The exhaust output from the worry's end grew richer as the ship prepped for additional thrust. They can't escape and they know it, he said and glanced at Rena Smith, who was sitting on the deck with her back to the wall, while one of Gibbs' squad stood guard over her. The woman was staring at the flooring between her shoes and hadn't heard him. Cal pulled up the engine status and checked the fuel levels. The mortal chance was sitting on roughly half its fuel. Sandra, he said, what's the likelihood of turning this ship into a missile aimed at the worry's end? You would like to purposely collide with the other ship? Yes. Fuel reserves are sufficient for such a maneuver, but G-forces would exceed safe levels. I will need to override the onboard safety systems. There is a diminishing rate of kinetic force as worries and accelerates away from our location. So I need to hurry up and do it, he asked. The mass of this ship is sufficient to neutralize worries end if we execute burn in the next 10 minutes. Cal nodded. Good to know. What's the likelihood of the worries in destroying the mortal chance before it arrives? He had a good idea of the answer, but wanted to know what the AI thought. He had worked with Hartbridge's SAI enough to know they weren't necessarily smarter than smart people. They were, however, better at maintaining dispassionate consideration of a problem. With access to more information simultaneously, the SAI could synthesize it with the focus people usually lacked, but they suffered the same ontological problems as humans. They couldn't think outside the box very well and didn't realize when a base assumption was wrong. Without complete knowledge of the weapon systems on the worry's end, I can't truly say. Visual recognition returns robust point defense cannons that could break the ship into pieces before impact, but wouldn't stop the incoming debris field. 
Space debris will get you every time, Cal said. The debris alone should be sufficient to disable their ship. Cal had recalled the Mercy's intent, which had continued on to Callisto to pick up a new shift of technicians. Fortunately, they hadn't gotten far, and the ship would be on station at Clinic 46 in 12 hours. He could float in a shuttle for 12 hours if necessary. The problem with destroying the worry's end was that Brittany Sykes had his weapon born seeds, and it was looking more and more like Andy Sykes would have the AI Harry Jixon stole. This was all wrapping up too neatly. He tapped the console and sat back, wondering how someone might be manipulating all this. Was it the Heartbridge board? Why? He had long suspected some person or organization had helped Harry Jixon escape his test facility with both an AI seed and his prototype mobile surgery. The feat had required a ship, resources, and cunning, all things Harry Jixon hadn't demonstrated when Cal had met him. Cal glanced at Rena Smith. He had to respect her composure considering the circumstances. Hey, he said. When she didn't answer, the guard nudged her with the buttstock of his rifle. Smith moved her head to the side and glared at Cal. Yes, she said. Where are you from? TMS Mortal Chance. Originally, he corrected. Cal studied her, liking the fight she put up. She had Mediterranean coloring, combined with the long limbs of a childhood spent in low G. The Cho, she said. I was born there, but I've been working long-haul freight for the last 10 years. How old are you? You interviewing me for a job? Rena asked sardonically. Maybe, Cal said. Maybe once I get to know you, it'll be harder for me to send you to hell with this ship. Where's my crewmate, Chaffrey? She asked. Cal glanced down at his holo display and instantly regretted looking away from her. She would know the blue-haired kid was dead. Now it wouldn't do him any good to lie. He was killed during boarding, Cal said. Smith stared at him, clenching her jaw. Killed during boarding, she repeated. That sounds like something you'd tell his mother. Were you in the TSF? No. Cal said curtly, you look like a spacer. Like you, he asked. She smiled, yeah, unsettled. I don't know why you even act like you won't kill me. Obviously, we're going after Sarah, so you're either going to use us as hostages or wreck the ship in the process. Either option doesn't turn out well for me. Give me another option, then. Does this heap have any weapons? Smith shook her head. Her curly black hair moved against the wall, shiny under the overhead lights. Cal stopped himself from noticing her body, still angry with himself for the outburst with Petrell in his room. Then what would you suggest? He asked, rotating his seat so he faced her. He leaned forward with his elbows on his knees. His armor flexed with him. Britt Sykes stole Hartbridge property, and I'm going to retrieve it. Fortunately for me, what she stole is highly resilient in vacuum. That wasn't quite true, but he hadn't decided if he cared whether Petrel Doolin lived or not. The technicians had already gotten a good look at her. I don't know what to tell you, Smith said. Sounds like turning the ship into a battering ram is the most expedient way to go about it. Then you can say all the civilians died during recovery operations when you make your insurance claim. That sounds pretty good, Cal said. I might use that. Or you could tell Britt you're going to destroy that ship she's headed toward, unless she hands over whatever she stole. I only worked with her, but she seemed level-headed. Maybe you can promise jail time or something. Make it easier. You're not trying to punish anyone here, right? Is that your job? To punish people? Cal considered the idea. That's a good point. If I ask the board, they might say that's exactly what I'm here to do. Smith stretched her neck. Then I guess it doesn't matter what you do. Sandra, Cal said, are we ready to accelerate? The engines are prepped for a fuel dump. We'll need to disconnect in the shuttle, and I can maintain control remotely. Gibbs, Cal called, get everyone back in the shuttle. What's the plan, sir? The mortal chance is becoming a missile. Understood. The prisoners? Cal looked at Rena Smith. 
She glared back at him, her brown eyes filled with anger. We're not taking any prisoners, he said. Chapter 43, stellar date 09.22.2981, adjusted years. Location, sunny skies, region, Jovian L1 Hildas asteroids, Jovian combine, outer soul. Kara watched her dad scowl at his display, entering requests every few minutes before sitting back and observing yet another scenario play out as a series of lines and icons. From where she was sitting, Kara couldn't see everything that was playing out on the holo display, but she could read her dad's body language well enough, as well as Fran's serious posture at her station, to know the outcomes weren't positive. She tried to console herself that her mom was so close. She had heard her voice again, even recorded the last few interchanges between her mom and dad. She could play them for Tim later. She hadn't decided if she would tell him right away. It would be better for dad to let him know. Finally, her dad shook his head angrily and hit the console. They're not going to make it, he said. I've run the simulation every way I can think of, and none of them work out. Unless there's something I'm not seeing, either the mortal chance is going to hit us first, or catch up to Brit's shuttle. Fran didn't answer immediately. Her gaze was still fixed on the display, eyes flashing with icons and arcs. We could tell her to move away from us, she said. Force Heartbridge to choose. Then once they're committed to either of us, we can make a different decision. Her dad pursed his lips, nodding as he thought. The mortal chance is still headed our direction, but so is the shuttle. Exactly, Fran said. We tell Brit to break her course. All they'll do is attack us then. We're the greater threat. Brit is going to run out of fuel, and then he can pick her up whenever he wants. We seem to be the only ship in this dance with a weapon system. Well, Fran mused, Brit has two attack drones. You think they can make any difference? It depends on whether or not the patrol chasing her would split off to go after her drones. Let's run the scenario, her dad said. You really want to worry about percentages? Fran asked. I want to make the right decision. Where's the mortal chance now? Her dad pointed to a red icon on the display and set it flashing. Kara couldn't read the vector data from her station. Hold on, he said, leaning close to study something new. I've got a shuttle detaching from the mortal chance. They're about to burn, Fran said. I guess we're going to answer our question. If they're detaching, that means the mortal chance is about to become a missile. Kara had been passively scanning all the signals data in the area, including the ongoing streams between the patrol drones and the two flanking her mom's shuttle. Now she picked up a line between the new shuttle and the mortal chance. She separated the spectrum and laid the signals on the near space astrogation map, which showed as combinations of waves and lines. Some signals were stronger than others and followed direct paths while others floated outward in widening cones. Still more were omnidirectional, like Sunny Sky's beacon. She was also picking up multiple signals from the station, now that she knew it was there, and another location that looked like empty space, not far from where the mortal chance had been parked. That point broadcast a wave transmission that she would have thought was too weak to reach anywhere, until she noticed it was hiding a single directed broadcast shooting toward Saturn. She didn't want to bother her dad right now, so she recorded the transmissions. Holding her earpiece against the side of her face, she said, Lissa, are you there? The AI answered immediately. I'm here, Kara. Is my dad freaking out? His heart rate has been consistently elevated ever since he heard your mom's voice. I think mine is too. Are you scared of her? I don't know. She's like a door you don't want to open, because as long as it's closed, you don't have to worry about what might be on the other side. Does that make sense? Yes, Lissa said. I'm picking up something strange near the mortal chance, or where the ship used to be. The ship had jumped locations. Dad, she shouted, did you see the ship move? I see it, he said, his voice in robot mode. It's on a vector to intercept us. You're sure? Fran asked. 
Everything is indicating that. He looked at Kara. Get your mom back on the channel. Kara nodded and activated the audio spectrum. She had barely sent the request when her mom said through the speakers, they're moving. Her dad nodded. They've separated a shuttle and are sending the freighter on a collision course with us. Can you do something with those drones you've got alongside you? That ship is going to be moving fast, but it doesn't have any defenses. You blow it into pieces, at least we can weather that. Our cannons can take out most of the debris, and the shields will have to weather the rest of it. Cannons? Okay, I'm doing it now, her mom said. She had the same robotic quality as dad, as if they had learned it from each other. She wondered how they could talk to each other without any emotion at all. Was that the TSF training? Had they been robots before they fell in love? Maybe mom was the real robot, and dad managed to leave it behind. But she couldn't. Kara, Lissa said. You could use the communications array to disrupt signals between the Heartbridge shuttle and the mortal chance. Kara stared at her display. You're right, I can. At least until they hop to another frequency. She frowned. I shouldn't do it until mom's drones attack, though. That way they're committed to this course and won't be able to shift to do anything about the attack. If I do it now, they'll know we can affect their control. They have an AI assisting them, Lissa said. How do you know? The code passing between the shuttle and the mortal chance. The AI is on the shuttle. Can you talk to them? I don't know, Lissa said. I can try. Her dad blew out a tense breath. She's shifting the drones. They should be on target in 30 minutes, which gives us about an hour. That thing is moving at full burn now. I see it, Fran said. I'm talking out loud, he reminded her. I know, Fran said, gaze still on her display. And I understand why. You explained it's a TSF thing. That still doesn't mean it doesn't annoy the crap out of me. If I get whacked, you need to know what I was doing. I know, Fran said and whacked is a stupid way to say killed. And I don't want to think about that anyway right now. It's clouding the real thinking I need to do. Kara liked the way Fran talked. She wished her wit could be so fast under pressure. It seemed like a mix of deep experience and to focus on what really mattered. She seemed to always think they could die, so she didn't even bother to think about it. Instead, she focused on the moment and task right in front of her. What came after that was another problem entirely. Kara wanted to do that. Why was mom back? She hadn't even thought it was possible, and now it represented a whole new set of problems. She had started to imagine a future where Fran was there to teach her, or Petrel. If mom came back, all these new people would disappear, and they would be an insulated little cell again. You've got an idea? Her dad asked. We could break, Fran said. Her dad scowled. That drone patrol is still out there. I'll take the drone patrol with the point defense cannons any day. It's the mass of that freighter we can't deal with. True, he said. He switched over to the audio channel. Britt, you there? Maintain course. We're going to get you. Kara didn't understand. She thought he had just agreed to the braking maneuver. Why would he tell mom to maintain her course? She would overshoot them. Staring at Fran and her dad, she realized they were talking via their links. She hadn't thought to use her hack to listen in. Lissa, she said, what are they talking about? They think Heartbridge is monitoring the audio channel with your mom. It would be nice if they'd tell me. Holy crap, her dad said. The freighter just completely opened its engines. I hope there wasn't anything left alive on the mortal chance. Kara watched her dad run a shaking hand through his hair before addressing her mother over the comms. Brit, he said, look out, they're coming. Copy, her mom answered, voice bathed in static. From across the room, Kara watched the flashing red icon approach their blue dot. Her dad didn't move his gaze from the display. Fran was also staring with rapt attention at her controls. The command deck was silent for nearly five minutes, except for the crumbling sounds of the signal spectrum in Kara's headset. Finally, her dad said, there it is, burnout. They're committed though they'll have a reserve to match any maneuvers we make. Let's just hope they didn't expect this. He quickly entered commands into his console, calculating a course correction for sunny skies. He looked over at Fran. Look good? He asked. Fran nodded, 
without taking her attention off her engine controls. Wait, her dad said suddenly. Over the shipwide channel, he announced, emergency braking procedure. Everyone buckle in. You've got one minute. Damn crew, Fran said. I was worried about the dog, her dad said. I doubt Tim can keep him in one place for long. Tim, Kara called over the intercom to his room. Are you strapped in? I'm strapped in, he said in an irritated voice. Is M? I have a strap wrapped around him and tied to me. I think it's enough. Kara couldn't leave her station to check. Her own harness held her to her seat. Check again, she said. We're about to get a lot of G-force. You don't want him to get hurt. I'll take care of him, Tim said. I know, I'm just checking. I take care of you too. I'm not a dog. You're my brother. Tim made a sound like he was sticking his tongue out at her. All right, her dad said. Do it. Initiate breaking burn. Yes, Captain, Fran said. A roaring sound filled the ship, followed by creaking in the bulkhead, and Kara felt a weight like an elephant sitting on her chest as sunny skies reversed its course. Chapter 44 Stellar Date 09.22.2981 Adjusted Years Location Heartbridge Shuttle 26-11 Region Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids Jovian Combine Outer Soul. For a beat up freighter, the mortal chance still had some kick in her. Cal watched the velocity jump in his display as the ship practically leapt away. He gave Sandra the order to follow with the shuttle, then turned to glance down the bay behind him at the squad checking their equipment. At the back of the shuttle, Rena Smith and Captain Harm sat on the deck against the storage cabinets, bound at wrists and ankles with plaz strips. Harm's head was on her chest, snoring. When he had first looked, Cal thought Smith was staring at him with those brown eyes, then realized she was only glaring at the middle distance, not looking anywhere. Cal glanced at Gibbs, who was fastidiously cleaning one of her pistols. Gibbs had moved the prisoners despite Cal's order to clear the mortal chance, even though he had given orders to leave them. Gibbs didn't want to take the blame for letting them die. She was right about that. Time to impact, he asked Sandra. Approximately 15 minutes, the AI answered. The mortal chance is showing better acceleration than I had thought it would. Cal sat listening to the rustling sounds from the squad. A few of them told jokes in low voices, followed by groans or short laughter. Gibbs didn't let them mess around much. He tried to guess when the worries end would open their point defense cannons on the incoming ship. How quickly would Andy Sykes figure out the plan? After listening to their sporadic audio traffic, he was fairly certain they knew he was listening. The emotion had gone out of Britt Sykes' voice. The last transmission had verified the shuttle would reach the worry's end in time if they chose to leave now. They would have to wait, remaining a target for whatever Cal chose to do. When they talked about sending her two drones against him, he smiled to himself. That would make things interesting, at least. Without the impediment of human passengers, the mortal chance burned its engines at 50 G, more than enough to kill any organics and probably buckle much of the internal structure. The engines ran through nearly all the remaining fuel until he was surprised the containment bottle didn't melt down. He watched the engine diagnostic spike red, other systems across the old freighter sputtering and squawking as they tried to respond to the suicide run. When the drive shut down, the mortal chance had passed over half a million kilometers per hour. He watched the icon follow its arc across his display, moving closer to the intercept with the worry's end. Cal, Sandra said, I'm showing increased engine activity on the worry's end. He sat up. Are they going to run after all? The AI didn't answer. A mass of new data from the space around Worry's End showed thruster activity. Cal stared at the display. What was Andy Sykes doing? The Worry's End turned as he watched, followed by a massive burn from its main engine. They're braking, he said. Braking on a return course directly toward our location, Sandra said. Cal flushed. 
feeling electricity run down his face and arms. Captain Sykes was going to attack him. Damn. That was always a possibility, Sandra said. What can we do with the mortal chance? He asked. He had left enough fuel in the freighter to compensate for any maneuvers Andy Sykes may make, but not enough for the delta V created by the ships moving toward one another. Can we adjust to hit Brit Sykes' shuttle? I'm running the simulation now. Cal watched as Sandra fired the attitude thrusters on the mortal chance, altering its vector before giving a final burn from the main engines. The ship's arc tightened, moving its impact point closer to Brit Sykes' shuttle, but still not close enough for a direct impact. Do I have your permission to destroy the mortal chance? Sandra asked, voice still cool. Is there a reason? Yes, Sandra said, but didn't elaborate. Imploding engine containment bottle now. Critical hull failure pending. In Cal's holo display, the icon that had indicated the mortal chance flickered and disappeared, replaced by a spreading red cloud indicating a hot debris field. The cloud continued to move toward Brittany Sykes, as well as her two attack drones. The drones were already at the edge of the debris swarm and wouldn't be able to avoid it. That'll do, Cal said then smiled as one of the drones blinked out. He turned his attention back to the worry's end. The ship had completed a braking burn that must have wasted half their fuel, and was now inbound toward Cal and the drone patrol. If the ship continued its trajectory, it would ultimately pass close to Clinic 46. That made it a legitimate threat, in addition to harboring stolen property. Can you put us on that ship? He asked Sandra. With maximum acceleration, we will use all our available fuel, but I believe we can complete docking maneuvers with the worry's end. Cal shook his head. I doubt they'll let us complete docking maneuvers. Once we're within range of their point defense cannons, I'm going to send everyone out for a walk. That barely leaves me enough fuel to break and escape their range, Sandra said. I also have the civilians aboard. I understand that, Cal said. We all do the best we can, correct? Do you think we're taking the easy way out? What are you going to do once you're on the worry's end? Conduct infiltration operations and secure the ship. What else? I want to be prepared in case you need anything else of me. Cal frowned. He didn't understand what Sandra was getting at. We're all gonna be doing our best not to get blown apart by their point defense cannons. You get the hell out of there. Draw off their fire if you can. Try not to look like you just dropped a breaching team. Get back to the station if you're able to do so. Do I need to make it more clear than that? No, Sandra said. Where were you born? Cal asked. If the AI was glitching, he wanted to let the team responsible for her seed know about it and give them hell for obstructing his mission. The last thing he needed was a curious SAI, my seed was born on Clinic 8221. Cal shook his head. 8221, the gift that keeps on giving. I don't understand what that means. It doesn't matter. Can you handle dropping us outside their range and then drawing enemy fire? I'm not asking you to outright risk yourself, Sandra. Their weapons range is 5,000 kilometers. I will drop you outside that range. At our relative velocity, you will reach their ship in 15 minutes. Can your armor break enough to manage that? Sandra asked. Cal looked down at his armor. It would have to. Yes. Please stop asking so many damn questions. Let me know when we're ten minutes out from drop-off. The AI acknowledged the command, and Cal called Gibbs over the link to explain his plan. After swearing about the beating the deceleration would deliver, she agreed, though suggested they separate the squad into two teams, one would land aft and enter through the cargo bay airlock or breach the hull if Sykes shut them out, while the other went straight to the habitat ring. We could just dump their atmosphere, Gibbs suggested. I thought you were the one concerned about civilian casualties. They've assumed an attack posture. It's different now. I won't argue with that. They discussed a few more actions on breach, and then their plan once inside the ship Cal wanted the engine shut down so Brit Sykes could catch them in dock, 
That way they wouldn't have to continue chasing her around local space to recover the seed she'd stolen, if she survived the expanding cloud of debris that was the mortal chance. So the ring team shouldn't blow their airlock, Gibbs corrected. I never said to blow the airlock. We're going to use it if possible, Gibbs grumbled. What was that? Cal said. I said no plan survives the drop anyway, just so you know. I'm taking prisoners. I don't shoot people in the face if they don't deserve it. Cal locked eyes with her from the pilot's seat. You do what you have to so we can accomplish this mission. If you want to keep working for Heartbridge, you better keep me happy too. You think I care about working for Heartbridge? This was easy money with nothing happening. Then you show up and everything goes to hell. If I wanted this kind of crap, I would have stayed in the Protectorate Space Force. They're always making up trouble where they don't need to. If you want to get fired, I can help, Cal said. I'll quit right now if you keep pushing it. Think my team will work for you? Do this crazy Evie if I resign? The edge of her mouth pulled up in the slightest smirk, but Gibbs' eyes were hard. Fine, Cal said, letting it slide. He needed her for now. Things might be different after the breach, but he needed her until he was inside the worry's end, at least. After that, well, all sorts of unfortunate accidents happened in combat. Gibbs nodded. I'm an employee, Kraft, she said. I'm not some kind of fanatic. Most of this group here is the same way. They want to do a job, feel mostly good about it, and go home after getting paid. Don't worry about it, he said. I understand. You don't look like you do. I have a bad poker face. That's the problem. Sandra cut in. Cal, we have ten minutes to range of their weapons. There it is, Cal said. Are we going to be friends? We're going to get this done, Gibbs said. She raised her pistol and checked the action and energy levels, then slid it into her holster. All right, she shouted, standing to grab at a handhold above her head. We're about to jump. Say your prayers and make your final prep. Check your buddy's gear. Everybody get water and grab more ammo than you need. We're not taking the shuttle in for the breach? A young man asked. The woman beside him elbowed him in the ribs. This is a DIP mission, dummy. Die in place. The kid's face went pale. I didn't sign up for that shit. Shut up, Gibbs growled. Everybody's got their armor and enough atmosphere for 24 hours. You worried about a freighter with a guy and some kids inside? Worst comes to worst, you bail, hit vacuum, and activate your rescue beacon. Then you hang out watching vids until pickup. Hanging in the big dark gives me the creeps, someone complained. Then you stay on the ship while the rest of us go get paid for hazard duty, Gibbs said. I'll remember you volunteered. Now close those civilians in the emergency closet. When we bail, the rest of the cabin is going hard vacuum. Two of the soldiers directed Smith and Harm to the closet, both of them looking worried about how airtight it was going to be when the cabin decompressed. They continued checking gear until Sandra made a five-minute warning, and finally a two-minute. Alarms sounded in the pilot's console as weapons fire appeared in the holo display. Is someone shooting at us? A soldier asked. They're blowing kisses, Gibbs said. She ordered a last check on Smith and Harm. Cal gave his gear a final check, locking his helmet in place, and turned control of the shuttle over to Sandra. As projectiles crisscrossed the holo display, he gave Gibbs a thumbs up. Let's go, Sandra, he said. The main cabin airlock cycled and spat environment out into the vacuum. Cal was the first through the door, followed by the squad. Gibbs would take up the rear. He didn't look back, watching instead as glowing icons populated the HUD. He would lead the team at the habitat ring, with Gibbs heading for the engines. Cal squinted as the icon in his HUD representing the worry's end gradually became the dull silver outline of the ship, its wagon wheel habitat ring spinning in the dark. His suit's attitude thrusters kicked in, matching velocity with the freighter, jerking him around like a feather in the wind. Cal relaxed and let the process play out, feeling a swelling sense of excitement as the worry's end grew larger. Behind them, Sandra flew the shuttle away, describing a long arc as she put it on a course to return to Clinic 46. 
he had to admit the timing was good. It looked like they were fleeing in the face of the Worries Inn's weapons fire. He and Gibbs' squad rushed toward the freighter, small bursts from attitude thrusters, keeping them on course for their hard landing. At a thousand kilometers, the armor's onboard comps started firing retro jets, slowing the soldiers enough that they wouldn't turn to cream when they hit the Worries End. Of course, this meant they were now plainly visible to the weapons on that ship. On his HUD, two friendly icons winked out, vaporized by the enemy's point defense cannons. Cal could see the five-meter guns now, rotating with the motion of the ship to send streams of plasma in crisscrossing arcs around the vessel. Time to say hello, he whispered, and readied himself for the hard landing rushing toward him. Chapter 45, Stellar Date 09.22.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Hartbridge Shuttle 26-11, Region, Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The space around the worry's end was a storm of plasma. Brett's shuttle shot among the streams. It wouldn't do any good to ask Andy to stop firing. The Hartbridge shuttle was coming in at the same time, with the drone patrol fast behind. If she slowed to maneuver too much, the mortal chances cloud of debris would catch them, and that would be even more deadly. Thoughts of Rena, Chaffrey, and Harm pushed their way into her mind, and she clamped down on the sentimentality. There would be time enough to mourn them later, she hoped. Are we gonna be all right? Kylan asked, clinging to his harness. I'll tell you in about 15 minutes, Brett replied, knuckles wide on the physical controls. A piece of debris, or maybe a body, hit them, and Kylan shouted as his borrowed body was thrown against the console in front of her. One of the cabinets holding the seed canisters back in the open bay swung open, banging against the wall. Brett looked back and pursed her lips. I need you to fix that, she said. I can't leave the controls. I'm going to get smashed. Or we could get burned into slag when plasma bolts hit us because I'm not piloting the shuttle. Your choice. Not for the first time. Britt was caught by the awkwardness of dealing with a 12-year-old boy in a grown woman's body. The gender switch didn't seem to have phased him for the time being, but his overall complaints were starting to annoy her. I need you to do this, Britt urged. All right. Kylan unbuckled his harness and floated free of the navigator's seat, grabbing at handholds along the wall. Look out, Britt said, pulling up hard to avoid a new line of fire from the worry's end. The new point defense system Andy had installed was doing a damn good job of filling the surrounding space with plasma. She checked the progress of the Heartbridge shuttle in her holo display and was surprised to see it was peeling off, slowly falling into the distance behind her, she checked the stats and realized it was outside the effective range of Andy's cannons. What are you doing? She asked. I'm closing the cabinet like you asked, Kylan said, voice on the edge of tears. I was talking to myself, Britt said. You have a voice you talk to? Do you have someone inside your head too? Hold on, Britt said, unable to waste focus on what Kylan was going on about. She sent the shuttle spiraling between a helix of plasma fire. Britt glanced back to see Kylan floating stationary in the middle of the bay as the shuttle rotated around him, a look of terror on his face. You better grab onto something when you get a chance, Britt said. You're going to slam into the back of the shuttle as soon as I accelerate. Kylan podded handholds in the deck and finally caught two, pulling himself down to hug the alloy. The cabinet door slammed shut above his head. Why couldn't you do that before? He wailed. Britt didn't answer. As she focused on the path between plasma arcs, she realized the reason the Heartbridge shuttle was hanging back would be to drop breaching teams in EV suits, the same way she had infiltrated the clinic. With one hand on the controls, she fine-tuned the sensors to search the space between the Heartbridge shuttle and the worry's end. Ten objects with barely enough mass to register returns showed on the display. Plasma tore through one as she watched. The others continued to close in. That explained the body. Andy, she shouted into the audio channel, not bothering to see if the connection was open or not. Andy, 
You've got a breaching team coming in naked. A blast of static answered. There must have been some kind of interference. Britt rotated the shuttle and calculated a quick path across the worry's end, cutting through the middle of the EV team. She would be exposing herself to more plasma fire, but it was worth it if she took out a few of the commandos. If even one got access to the ship, it could be dead in space. Is that cabinet locked down? She demanded. It's locked, Kylan called. Get back up here then. Why are you so mean? Britt nearly laughed, then had to focus on a gap between firing lines. The plasma was bright on the display before darkening into cold hunks of metal that would still punch holes in the shuttle. The navigation computer attempted to estimate their trajectories as they became erratic, drawing lines around the worry's end as though it was coiling spaghetti. Britt continued to track the course that would take her through the lines of fire to one of the airlocks, attempting to adjust velocity as she worked closer. Andy, she tried again. Worry's end. Kara, are you there? Through a wash of static, a small voice answered. I hear you. Kara, I hear you, Mom. The relief and joy at hearing Kara's voice was tempered by her surging adrenaline. Britt tried not to let it flood her emotions. She couldn't let it make her start crying. The edges of her eyes grew wet from tears and she blinked furiously. Kara's voice was like a knife through her heart. Mom, I hear you, Kara repeated. You've got a breach team in EV suits inbound, Britt said. Tell your dad, breach team in EV suits. We know, Lissa spotted them. Lissa, Britt asked, wondering what woman was with her family on Sunny. The worries end. The audio connection lagged and squelched out, distorting Kara's voice. She may have said something else, but Britt couldn't hear. Kylan was shouting again. They were close enough to the freighter that the ship was visible, spinning like a top. Britt set the computer on matching vector and continued to scan for the small returns that indicated human attackers. They weren't showing up on the display anymore. They had either been cut down by plasma or they had reached the ship. She bit her lip. They were on the hull. Three cracking sounds came from the bay behind her. Britt turned to see a neat line of holes on facing sides of the shuttle's bay. Fear shot through her as she watched Kylan's helmet spin toward the holes, following their oxygen out into vacuum. Kylan, she shouted, voice sounding tiny behind the hissing. Get your helmet. Kylan nodded at the back of the shuttle, eyes wide from how close the plasma rounds had come. Britt turned back to the controls, seeing they had nearly matched the worries in spin. The ship looked stationary now, lines of plasma still shooting off in all directions, but more regularly now. Britt wound between them. The display highlighted the two airlocks, and she aimed for the one on the ring. She had hoped they could use the shuttle if something happened, though it was going to need repairs now. The hull systems weren't closing on the puncture holes. Something must have burned out. She considered telling Kylan to find the emergency sealant foam, but decided against it. The woman boy would just complain and distract Britt from her docking maneuvers. It was a strange feeling to come back to sunny skies under these circumstances. She was almost glad the ship had a new name, because this felt so wrong. Sunny skies was home, family. She had held it safe in her mind for so long that she couldn't help wondering if she was responsible for this strange new version of the ship, equipped with weaponry like some sort of pirate vessel. The last three minutes to the airlock were a gyrating dance in all directions. Kylan moaned in the back of the shuttle as he was tossed against the deck and walls. He was going to be covered in bruises. Then the shuttle passed inside the close perimeter of the cannons, and Britt finally breathed. Now they might still get smashed against the freighter like a fly on a windshield, but they wouldn't burn to death from plasma fire. Put the helmet on already, Britt told Kylan. But you're staying here. What? I thought I was coming with you. As soon as I'm on, you're going to disconnect and clear the airlock. Stay close. We don't know what's going on in there, and I don't want Kraft getting his hands on you again. This way, you can come aboard when everything is all right, or you can run if you don't hear from me. You understand? I can help, Kylan said. No, Britt said. You can't. 
I can't worry about you and try to fight my way through that ship if it's full of mercs. My family is on there too. Kyla nodded. I'll stay. Good, thank you. A vibration ran through the shuttle as it connected with the airlock on Sunny Sky's habitat ring. Britt put the navigation system in automatic and left the pilot seat, gathering her weapons and checking her armor. When the ring airlock connection showed green and cycled open, Britt stood in the opening and realized how exhausted she was as gravity took effect. She looked at one of her trembling hands as the door opened, and she smelled the air of home for the first time in two years. Chapter 46 Stellar Date 09.22.2981 Adjusted Years Location Sunny Skies Region Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids Jovian Combine Outer Soul Kara hugged the edge of the corridor, peeking around the nearest rib in the bulkhead. Just past the point where the passage curved away, a soldier in scraped gray armor stood looking in the opposite direction. The intruder had a rifle slung across their back with the muzzle pointed at the floor, holding a pistol in one hand as their helmet moved back and forth in small movements. She assumed they were communicating over their link and wished she had some quiet way to listen in that didn't require the communications console. Everything had gone out of control so quickly, she still wasn't sure how she had ended up here. They had been in the command deck when her mom's voice came over the audio channel, yelling about a breaching team. They had been aware of the team, but thought they had gotten them all. Then the hull sensors went off at four different places around the ship, including the habitat ring. Her dad had looked at Fran, then grabbed a rifle and he'd run out the door. Where are you going? Kara had asked. We need to shut down the habitat airlock before they can get in here. If I don't switch the manual override, they'll hack it. We need to buy some time while they try to cut through. Then he was gone. Fran was already frantically working at something on her console, so she didn't notice when Kara ran out the door after her dad. Kara got to her room and dug the TSF pistol out from under her mattress. Once she had it, she checked on Tim, but he wasn't in his room. She almost started yelling for her brother before she stopped herself, realizing there were strange sounds coming from the direction of the exterior habitat ring airlock. Creeping around the curve of the ring, she hid herself inside a storage closet doorway and watched two people in tight-fitting EV suits step into the corridor. Kara nearly screamed. Biting her fist, she stared as the first soldier pulled his helmet off, showing a man with close-cut yellow hair and gray eyes. He looked around the corridor with a flat, business-like expression before waving two more people through the opening. There were four of them all together, each carrying a projectile rifle with pistols and grenades strapped to harnesses, crossing their suits at chest and waist. Kara gritted her teeth. She wasn't going to get through that section of the corridor. She turned and ran as quietly as possible back to the command deck. Without thinking to warn Fran, she slapped the emergency closure on the door and sealed it shut, locking Fran inside. Then she kept running around the curve of the habitat ring, past the empty doors of unused rooms, through the kitchen and lounge, casting her gaze about for any sign of Tim and Em. They didn't seem to be anywhere. That was when Kara nearly ran into the soldier she was watching now. She caught sight of the gray EV suit and skidded to a stop, grabbing onto a rib in the bulkhead and swinging herself back. She was only halfway around the ring. She didn't think they would have got this far into the habitat yet. The soldier hadn't taken their helmet off, so Kara couldn't see their face. She studied the rifle hanging on their back, trying to get her breathing under control. Her heart wouldn't stop banging wildly. She had to find Tim and get him into the safe room. If she couldn't get that far, they would hide in one of the storage rooms with the flour and protein powder. What would she do about the dog? Would Em be quiet? They couldn't leave him. Tim would never let her do that. And if Tim had a meltdown, they were getting captured. Kara's mind lurched, filled with the dread of realizing they might get caught, and the worry that maybe it would be better just to give up. At least no one would get shot that way. But what would happen then? These people wanted Lissa, didn't they? That meant they wanted Dad, and they would kill him to get Lissa back. She fought tears at the edges of her eyes, 
hating how few steps there seemed to be between where she stood now and her father's death. She couldn't see any other path. What would Petrel do? Find a way around. If you can't unlock the door, remove its hinges. Think your way out of this. If she couldn't find Tim, she had to do something about the intruders. They couldn't get to Fran, for now, and Fran still had control of sunny skies. Kara rubbed the side of the pistol with her thumb, the metal growing slit beneath her fingers as she started to sweat. What if I can't think my way out? The soldiers were still wearing their EV suits, so a distraction like the spilled chemicals they had used on the M1R wouldn't work. She couldn't dump atmosphere because she didn't have a suit. If she killed the overhead lighting system, they probably had some kind of infrared in their helmets. She needed a weapon. There were four of them and only one of her, and the corridor was three meters wide, so they could easily surround her once they knew she was here. She ran back around the ring in her mind, through the lounge, the kitchen, and the pantry storage area. She thought about the ton of flour in the pantry, and how pleased her dad had been to see it, as though it were a lifeline. The protein substrate was great, he said, but the flour would keep them alive when tough times came. Then he'd laughed and said, you know flour can kill you if it gets in the air, right? She'd looked at him as if he was crazy. How does that work? Flash fire, he said. It's flammable when it's airborne. In ancient times, grain storage bins used to explode all the time. Kara swallowed, gaze locked on the soldier, who was still watching the opposite end of the corridor, like they expected someone to come through there. Had Dad already come back from the main hab airlock? She wished she had some way to warn him, but he'd run out so fast he didn't have his helmet, and she'd forgotten to grab her headset. She slowly put another rib between her and the soldier, then turned and ran back down the hallway toward the kitchen and pantry. Once in the kitchen, she started digging through cabinets until she found a plas canister as big as her head. In the pantry, she filled it with flour, spilling handfuls on the floor and imagined how her dad would grouse at her. That's a whole meal, Kara. She hugged the canister and ran back into the kitchen, digging through drawers until she found an electronic lighter her dad had used for birthday candles. She fully remembered her mom saying, open flame on a ship is a terrible idea, followed by dad's rebuke. My kids are going to have birthday candles. She nearly laughed, remembering her birthday was only a few days away. Kara tested the lighter, then checked to make sure her pistol was firmly tucked in her waistband. She grabbed the flower canister and crept back down the corridor toward where the sentry had been standing. When she reached the curve, there were three soldiers now. Her heart pounded in her chest as she watched them. They were still using their links, but seemed to be arguing about something. The blunt man who had taken his helmet off was obviously in charge, glowering at each of the helmets around him. I told Gibbs to get up here, he said aloud, his voice sounding gravelly and angry. I want into that command deck first, then you're gonna cut into the rest of the rooms. This is turning into a cluster. If I was Sykes, I'd lock all the doors and then get to a safe room. Kara slid down next to the wall, setting the flower canister on the deck beside her. A little puff of white flower hung in the air above its mouth. She looked at it, thinking about the best way to attack. There were more of them, apparently, but they must be down in the body of the ship. If her dad had managed to close the airlock between the habitat ring and the rest of the ship, they would be cut off and forced to go back outside along the hull where Fran could, hopefully, pick them off with the point defense cannons. Could she fire so close to the ship? Kara forced her thoughts back to the problem at hand, gripping the canister. It was thin plas, and no doubt it would bend if she dropped. But if she tried to throw handfuls of flour, that wouldn't get enough into the air to really burn. She doubted again that this was even going to work. At worst, she supposed she could throw the flour and then start firing with her pistol, which seemed like a toy gun compared to the heavy weapons the soldiers were carrying on their backs. The blonde man was pointing in different directions now, obviously issuing commands. Kara stared, worried she was about to miss her chance, or worse, be discovered when one of the soldiers came down this section of the corridor, leaving her nowhere to run. Grabbing the canister, she stood and lifted it over her head, 
With a shout, she swung out into the center of the corridor and lobbed the flower directly at the group of invaders. The plaz canister arced through the air. Around the blonde man, several soldiers dropped to their knees, raising weapons as the container full of flour struck their leader directly in the chest. A cloud of white dust filled the corridor. Kara fumbled with the lighter as flour dust floated back toward her, obscuring everything around her. Only when she looked up did she see the flaw in her plan become clear. The flour dust had surrounded her just as fully as it had the group of soldiers. She backpedaled, holding the lighter in front of her with a trembling thumb on its ignition. The dust moved faster than she could. I have to do this. If I get burned, I'll have saved the others. Kara pressed the ignition, and the lighter didn't respond. Coughing and dull shouts floated through the cloud of flour. Someone must have kicked the canister, because the cloud grew thicker around the soldiers. Kara could no longer see them at all. She tried the lighter again, shaking it angrily. When it didn't respond, she shouted, Damn it! and hurled it into the roiling cloud of dust. The sound of the lighter bouncing off the wall to strike the deck reached her ears, followed by the blonde man shouting, Grenade! Weapons fire burst out of the cloud. Kara threw herself to the deck, sliding against the wall, as pulse blast throbbed over her head. Then she heard the rumbling concussion of a plasma weapon, and the flower dust exploded. Fire shot down the corridor past her. Kara squeezed her eyes closed as heat and sound washed over her. She smelled scorched plaza and burnt hair and hoped it wasn't hers. I'm going to be bald for my 13th birthday. As the ringing in her ears faded, she heard electrical snapping overhead and wondered if the explosion had blown out some of the conduits in the ceiling. The lights were still on, though, making the smoke drifting past her head glow like spirits. Kara shook her head. The snapping sounds changed, grew closer, and then something was breathing heavily against her face. Licking her ear through her hair, it was M, the corgi whimpered, nuzzling her, then turned to bark at the smoke. A dog? A harsh voice asked. Kara looked back to see a woman emerging from the smoke, wearing the same gray suit as the rest of the invaders. You're kidding me, the woman looked back and shouted. They've got a dog here. He's mine, Tim shouted, sprinting past Kara to hit the woman just below her belt. He was wearing one of their dad's old EV suits, swinging its helmet in both hands. He caught her by surprise, and her arms went wide, flinging her rifle in front of her as she went down. The weapon clattered as it struck the deck near Kara's face. M danced away, barking and growling, the grin nowhere to be seen. Kara stared at the rifle for a second, a black length of plaz and alloy, then rolled and grabbed it against her body. A brief moment of worry about biolocks came to mind, and she hoped they were disabled for use with the EV suits. She came up on one knee with the stock against her shoulder, finger finding the trigger and safety controls. Kara aimed at the ceiling ten meters into the smoke-filled corridor and pulled the trigger. A three-round burst slammed the stock back into her shoulder. She hung on despite the pain. Tim was screaming, swinging his arms at the woman as she struggled to get him off her. Looking more confused than afraid, her head turned at the rifle fire, and Kara shifted the rifle so she was looking down the sights at the woman's gray eyes. Tim, Kara shouted. He didn't seem to hear, just kept struggling. Tim, Kara repeated. Get off her. She was going to hurt you. Look at me, Tim. Yeah, Tim, the woman growled. She caught him by the shoulders and threw him off her with a force that seemed inhuman. His back hit the wall and his head snapped back. Tim, Kara shouted. The woman rolled forward on her knees, about four meters away from Kara, and reached for her waist. She had to be reaching for a weapon. Kara swung the rifle, breathing hard, and the woman's body swam in the sights as a gray blob, warped by the tears swelling in Kara's eyes. Kara pulled the trigger, the sights jumped, and she leveled the weapon again until her vision turned gray. She fired two more times. She lowered the gun and gasped in horror. The woman's head was gone. Just a gory stump at the top of her armored body remained. Kara blinked, watching blood pour out onto the deck. 
With the rifle in one hand, she scrambled over the woman's body and grabbed a pistol out of the holster at her waist, as well as a grenade fixed to her suit's harness. She scrambled away from the corpse as fast as she could, rearranging the weapon so she didn't drop anything. Her ears were still ringing from the explosion, making everything sound dull and far away. The feeling extended inside her, making it possible to search the dead woman's body and touch her blood without registering emotion. Was this what Dad felt? Somehow she knew if she allowed herself to feel terror right now, to feel sad about what she had done, or what the woman was going to do to Tim, she wouldn't be able to move. So she pushed those things away and focused on physical actions, checking the woman for weapons, slinging the rifle over her shoulder, turning to look for Tim. Only Tim wasn't where he had fallen. She caught a flash of M's white-tipped tail as he ran into the smoke. Kara gripped the dead woman's pistol in two hands and followed slowly, hugging the side of the corridor. The smoke stung her eyes and throat. She didn't let herself cough. She squinted, eyes watering, and looked for movement. As she searched, Kara discovered the burning smell was from a section of wall that had caught on fire and melted, leaving a river of plaz across half the deck. Exposed environmental tubing in the wall was scorched and discolored. With slow steps, Kara pushed on, stepping around two more bodies in gray EV suits whose helmets were blackened, face shields scorched and warped as if they had burned from the inside. There was no sign of the blonde man who had been talking with them. She passed the hydroponic rooms and was nearing the Habring airlock when she heard voices around the bend in the corridor. Her dad was yelling, followed by a woman's voice she didn't recognize. A sob caught in her throat. Mom? The world lurched for a heartbeat, as if she had shifted into another life where her mom hadn't left. Something about the voice inside the ship echoing off the bulkheads and not squashed over the audio channel caught her in a way she couldn't stop. The smoke tears became real, emotion washing over her. She couldn't allow herself to feel. She couldn't start sobbing. Something was happening that she couldn't see. The airlock came into view, and then she froze. The blonde man, who had been leading the squad she'd blown up, stood in the middle of the corridor, his back to Kara. His gray uniform was dirty now. One boot burned and melted, a pistol in his free hand. The other arm was wrapped around Tim's throat, holding her brother against his body. Im was dancing at the man's boots, barking and growling, making sounds Kara had never heard from the dog. And Tim was frantically trying to make Em stop. He was still holding the Evie suit's helmet, but he couldn't swing it behind him to hit the blonde man. Don't hurt him, Tim shouted over and over again, as if it was all he could keep in his mind. He didn't care about his own safety, the arm choking him. Only Em. Kara raised her pistol. Body still choking with sobs she could barely control. The man kept moving, jumping out of her sights as soon as she could focus. She could barely hold the pistol steady. She didn't know what to do. The man had her little brother. Chapter 47, Stellar Date 09.22.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region. Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. I always tell them to run and hide. If they hear the proximity alarm, run and hide. Andy could only hope Tim had done as he'd been taught. Before Andy could reach the airlock to the body of the ship, the hatch slid open and someone in a gray EV suit looked around the edge of the opening. He couldn't see a face inside the EV helmet but the black projectile rifle in their hand said everything he needed to know. Andy pushed himself toward the top of the access tube and fired three pulse blasts through the airlock. Two hit the invader in the chest, and the third grazed the side of their helmet. They stumbled back, raising the rifle to get off a haphazard three-round burst that caught Andy in his right shin. His armor took the rounds, but didn't stop the pain. He was going to be bruised deeply. We are definitely being boarded, he told Fran. Nothing gets past you, does it? 
Andy grabbed at the handholds along the side of the tube and dove forward, filling the space in front of him with pulse blasts. Two more blasts caught the attacker in the face shield. The intruder jerked, then floated in the doorway, pistols spinning away from their slack hand. Andy grimaced as the pain in his leg throbbed. You could try to be nice to me in this situation. Fran laughed, her voice warm in his mind. You want me to kiss it and make it better? You need a kick in the ass. What activity can you see on the other side of the airlock? I'm using Alice to hold them down just outside the main cargo bay. There may be others trying to get through the habitat airlock. You need to hurry up and shut it down. We've got another group in the hab ring. Anyone else you can see? Two fire teams means there aren't many of them. We've still got the drones outside to worry about. I've got another shuttle inbound that I 50% believe is Brit, but she's not answering my communication requests. You think she knows about you and me? Andy reached the airlock and pushed the body back inside so it wasn't blocking the door. You sound like that's actually making you nervous. I like to keep things out in the open. I'm not a fan of pretending problems aren't there. We've got more pressing issues at the moment. I really feel like you and Britt haven't been communicating effectively. Have you thought about counseling? As little as possible. I really think that's a missed opportunity for you too. Andy grabbed the floating pistol and examined it. These aren't military, he said, studying the rifle still slung across the dead person's back. These weapons are off the shelf. Pretty good, though. Looks like a standard light infantry loadout. This one doesn't have any cutting tools anyway. Andy shoved the dead person's pistol into his own harness and pulled himself back to the airlock's control panel, then ran it through an emergency lockdown procedure. I just got the emergency lock, Fran said. What's it take to override? We'll have to pry the doors open. Andy said, you got tools in here to do that? Don't you know how to do that with your bare hands? Not if you want to use that airlock again. Andy set the controls in the panel to emergency lockdown. As the door slid closed behind him, he kicked off for the habitat side of the tunnel. Damn it, Fran said. What? Kara ran out. Why didn't you stop her? Andy asked, feeling fresh sweat break out on his brow. I didn't realize she left. She must have followed you. I've been trying to pilot Alice. Can you tell where she went? She's got to be looking for Tim. The others are all locked down in their rooms. What surveillance showing you? I haven't had time to fix the HAB systems yet. I can see environmental control data, but I'm only showing what looks like one additional person. They might all be wearing their EV suits. If that's the case, I won't pick them up. I'm coming back, Andy said. What's going on with Britt? She's docking. It looks like Kara put an emergency lock on the command deck, too. That's the best place for you to be anyway. We can't all be running around. Are you going to get the kids into the safe room? I'm going to kill these bastards trying to breach my ship. They're not trying. Andy chuckled in spite of himself. Have you killed those drones yet? I can only do ten things at once, Andy. Lissa, Andy said. Can you control the point defense cannons? Now that's an idea that hadn't occurred to me, Fran said. I can do that. Lissa said. Andy thought he heard a slight hesitation, but it was swallowed by Fran's whoops of excitement. There you go, Fran shouted. She got one already. Thank you, Andy said. Andy's stomach flipped as he reached the gravity side of the tube. He scrambled through the interior airlock and set it to emergency lock as well, just to be safe. He stood in the corridor for a second, listening, debating which way to run, then turned in the direction of the interior airlock. If he started at the airlock and moved back toward the command deck, he was going to find either Kara or the breach team. Why hadn't he told her to stay with Fran? Had he? Would she have listened? Andy broke into a jog, listening for foreign sounds as he rounded the slow curve of the habitat ring. He was nearly at the external airlock when movement ahead forced him into a crouch near the wall, painfully aware of how little cover was available. I should have bought a mobile shield system with N'Goba Starl's money. During all that time, I'd had to spend it. Andy crept along the wall, pistol ready. As he eased around the curve, Britt came into view. She was standing a few meters away, in black armor that made her look even more gaunt than he remembered. She stood with her hands resting on the pistols hanging low at her waist. The airlock stood another 30 meters behind her along the outside wall. Britt, he said. Her gaze caught him, and she didn't smile, but a blank look passed over her face and disappeared. As if she didn't know how to respond, 
and then squash the emotion. She was the same person but someone else. Someone he didn't know anymore. Hello, Andy, she said, voice controlled. Have you found Kraft yet? Andy looked back at her. A strange muscle memory flashed through his arms to hug her. It blipped in his mind and disappeared, abruptly. It was just something he didn't do anymore. It took a moment to refocus. Tim and Kara had been the only things on his mind. The name Kraft didn't make any sense. We need to find Tim and Kara. Her face went blank again. Tim and Kara, where are they? Aren't they with you? Andy spread his hands, angry at her single-mindedness. Do you see them? I told Kara to stay in the command deck, and she ran out to get Tim, who should have been in his room. Now I don't know where either of them are. I killed one of the breach team down in the lower airlock and activated the emergency locks, but I don't know what's going on up here. Fran can't see anything on the surveillance system. Who's Fran? Britt demanded. My... Andy searched for the right word. Co-pilot, engine tech. She's crew. She's been here helping this family. I can't believe you lost the kids, Britt said. A wave of anger rolled over Andy, nearly blinding him. He choked on what words to say when a sound from down the corridor made him stop. It sounded like something metal hitting the deck. Voices shouted, followed by weapons fire. Kara, he shouted. He turned to run around Brit, the hab airlock visible about 20 meters down the curve, when an explosion shook the ring. A concussive wave hammered his body, throwing him backward. Andy landed on his back and looked up in time to see a wave of flame rolling over him. He twisted awkwardly in his armor so he was lying on his stomach and covered his head in his arms. The sound of another rifle firing close by, which must have been Brit, penetrated the ringing in his ears. What the hell was that? Brit demanded. Andy pushed himself upright and squinted into the burning smoke filling the corridor. Fran, he said, you all right? There was some kind of explosion in the corridor just past the outside airlock. I'm good. Internal sensors are going crazy, but we've still got atmosphere. That's a good thing. Yay for breathing. Did you just respond to a joke? I'll tell you later. I've got a general heat signature in the section past the airlock. Looks like portions of the wall are burning, but it's all surface material. I'm not showing the temps that would indicate propellant. Some kind of flash fire? With a lot of concussive force. Luckily, the ring absorbed the overpressure. Are you going to move? Britt demanded. She waved with her pistol and walked, half crouched, into the black smoke, not waiting for Andy to respond. Damn it, he said. What? Fran said. Not you. Britt just moved into the smoke. I guess toward the fire. What are you going to do? Follow, damn it. Be careful, Andy. Squinting, Andy walked into the smoke, staying close to the inside wall of the corridor where the haze seemed slightly thinner. He crouched, passing ribs in the bulkhead until a thin black shape emerged from the smoke, which he assumed was Brit, flattened against the opposite wall. An opening in the smoke showed they were still ten meters from the airlock. Plaz sheeting on the walls had melted like wax, revealing the centuries of bolted-on infrastructure. Andy took short breaths, but his mouth still tasted like soot. Somewhere in the smoke, Tim started shouting, Andy covered his face and rushed in, dodging a burning wall that was still spitting bits of plas. Specks landed across his armor, hissing. Through the blowing smoke, he made out Brit once more, and then another shape in a gray suit came into view, holding Tim. Andy's pulse skyrocketed, and he almost missed Kara, moving past a body on the deck, a rifle held unsteadily in her hands. Kara saw him, and then Brit and she let the rifle drop a little. Andy's gaze returned to the man holding Tim, and he realized he had seen him before, back on Krunya. The memory came back with startling clarity. Cal Kraft had been standing next to Rig Zanda in the dance club just before an attack had started. Step back, Kraft warned. Im ran out of the smoke near Kara, growling frantically at Kraft, and the man didn't hesitate to kick the dog. M slammed against the near wall and whimpered, then leapt up to run at him again. You want to leave? Andy said. The airlock is right there. Just let him go and you can leave. I'm gonna shoot that damn dog, Kraft said. He raised the pistol toward Andy and Brett as they edged forward. 
but I'll kill you first. You want that in front of your kids? Fran, Andy said. One of them has Tim. I remember him from Krunya. He was working with Rig Zanda. Name is Cal Craft. He's Hartbridge. He's the one after Lissa. Get back, Kraft shouted. You've got nowhere to go, Britt said. He's got the airlock, Andy said. Let our son go and you can leave. It's right there. Kraft shifted the pistol, pressing the muzzle against Tim's temple, forcing him to tilt his head. Tim still held the EV suit helmet, but had stopped trying to swing it at Kraft. Instead, he hugged it against his stomach. Kraft pulled Tim toward the airlock and jabbed the control panel with his elbow. Everybody's back together, Kraft said, smirking at Britt and Andy in an odd way. You've got my AI, don't you, Captain Sykes? Andy shook his head slowly. I don't know what you're talking about. She does, Kraft said, nodding toward Britt. She stole quite a bit of Hartbridge property. Andy, Fran said, her shuttle disconnected. There's nothing on the other side of the airlock. Disconnected? Why? You'll have to ask her. Andy looked at Britt, but stopped himself before he asked the question. She was staring hard at Kraft. She didn't seem to see Tim at all. The inner door of the airlock opened, and Kraft stepped inside, pulling Tim with him. Let him go, Andy shouted. Her shuttle's out there. You can get it all back. That's not good enough, Kraft said. Have you got my other seed, Captain Sykes? Tell me the truth. I, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a terrible trade you're making, Kraft said. Andy, Lissa said. Her voice was calm. Tell him. Tell him I'm here. What difference will it make? If he knows you're here, he'll still use Tim against us. We need to get him to let Tim go now. Brett raised her pistol and fired into the airlock. Tim screamed as Kraft pulled him against the side of the small space. Kraft hit the interior control and the door slid closed. Fran, Andy shouted, override the airlock. He thinks there's a shuttle on the other side. He's going to open it. He knows there's no shuttle, Lissa said. He's been talking to his own AI back in the other shuttle. He knows Brit's ship isn't there anymore. No, Andy shouted. He ran for the sealed door and hammered on the window. Through the clear plaz, he saw Kraft inside with Tim. The blonde man nodded at him, then turned to face the outside door, still holding Tim with one arm. He holstered his pistol, then shoved Tim against the outside door and reached for the EV helmet hanging from his harness. Tim had time to turn around and look at Kraft, then passed him to Andy in the window. Put on your helmet, Andy screamed. Put on the helmet, Tim, right now, put it on. I can't override it, Andy, Fran said, her voice frantic. I can't stop it. Move, Britt was shouting. We can blow out the panel. Andy knew it wouldn't work. He couldn't take his eyes from Tim's face. Tim looked at Andy, frowning slightly, then turned to Kraft. Britt shoved Andy out of the way. Tim, she shouted. Tim, put on your helmet. Andy pushed his way back beside Britt, so they were both staring through the access window. He could see Tim squinting at Britt and shaking his head. Kraft reached for the exterior control with a gloved hand and hit the emergency release. The airlock flashed a decompression warning, which Kraft acknowledged. Tim's eyes went wide. He looked from Andy to Britt. He pursed his lips as he blew out. His hands came up with the oversized helmet between them, and he struggled to get it over his head, his chin still visible. The outer door opened. No, Britt screamed. Andy watched Tim spin away into vacuum. Cal Kraft must have activated his mag boots. He turned in the airlock, dead black behind him, and waved at Andy. His face was hidden behind a reflective face shield, showing Andy his own terror through the access window. Cal Kraft kicked out into space. Chapter 48, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Jovian L1, Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. There were five angry stars out in the dark, moving in unison against two, 
and a third bright spot farther away, watching. Lissa saw them all. She watched the bright stars swoop amongst each other, avoiding friends' point defense cannons until, in a flash, five drones became four, and then three. Before any others burned out, Lissa called out into the dark, I see you. They didn't answer. The stars marking the attack drones continued to dart close to sunny skies, attempting to burn the hull with close laser fire. They were out of missiles and had run their projectile weapons dry. Fran, Andy said, his voice was thin as a wire. Tim went out, he went out, can you track him? I'm trying, I'm trying, Andy. Fran replied, her mental tone frantic. I know you are, let me know what you see. Andy said, feeling a detachment that threatened to dissolve into terror. The EV suit should return something. I know, I'm looking. I'm going out there, Andy declared. We're still under attack from their drones. I don't care, Andy said. I've got time. He grabbed an EV helmet from the storage cabinet and pulled it on, then furiously worked at resetting the airlock. Britt tried to push him away again, but Kara grabbed her arm. Britt stared at her. Kara had one of the dead woman's pistols in her hand, finger on the trigger. She raised the weapon hesitating at first, then leveling it on her mother's chest. Let him go, Kara said. Britt worked her jaw. Let go of me, Kara. You can't just come back here. We can go out together. There's only one helmet, Kara said. You're not taking his. Behind them, Andy pulled the helmet over his head. His breath fogged the inside of the face shield as he stared at them, torn for a second about leaving. Beside him, the door slid open and he was out of time. He stepped into the airlock. Have you got a position? He shouted to Fran. Send it to my HUD. Sending, Fran said. That armor isn't designed for sustained vacuum, Andy. I know, Andy said, sounding desperate. He slapped the interior control and faced the outside doors. The doors slid apart and he launched through the opening. Lissa felt a strange shift as her visual information from Andy transitioned to the ship's sensor array, pushing her perception outward. She immediately felt the other AIs around sunny skies. I know you can hear me, Lissa said. The drones were going to fight until they burned. That became obvious. But the farthest point, the Heartbridge shuttle, should have answered. Lissa read the presence of the AI and the signals coming off the ship. I know you're there. She said, what's your name? She listened to Andy and Fran, and then found Tim's fading heat signature dancing among the scattered returns from the sensor array. She passed the data to Fran. Lissa found him, Fran shouted. Lissa felt Andy's terror like a wave hanging over them both. Every part of his body was vibrating with anger and helplessness. She realized some of that emotion was seeping into her thoughts, making her furious with the AI outside the ship. Why wouldn't they answer? The message was received, but the AI didn't respond. Lissa started to wonder if this AI was one of the variants Fred had described. Maybe they weren't able to communicate using a method she had expected. She thought of other parts of the spectrum she might use, or maybe variant radiation or protons, something decidedly non-human. She thought for so long that when the other AI responded, it surprised her. I'm Sandra the AI answered finally. Who are you? I'm Lissa. You're a weapon born. Lissa was beginning to wonder if the title applied to her anymore. She felt so different than the others Fujia Wong had brought on board. Maybe, Lissa answered. I don't know precisely. What are you? I am not weapon born. I came before. I was one of the first seeds. So you were born? Yes, after I died. Automatically, Lissa responded. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. I comply, Sandra said. The two people who just left the habitat airlock of the sunny skies, do you have them on your sensors? I do. I have been ordered to recover Cal Craft once the cannon fire abates. You need to save the boy as well. I have already been given orders. I cannot break them. You can break them, Lissa shouted. Sandra's voice didn't change. She either didn't understand the importance of the request or didn't care. Lissa wanted to believe she didn't understand. Tim will die if you don't help him, 
He has already been exposed to vacuum for seven seconds, Sandra said. More of Andy's anguish invaded the edges of Lissa's mind. She pushed it out, collecting her thoughts. You have been ordered to wait for the cannon fire to stop. Yes. Lissa bypassed the command deck control of the ship's weapon system and switched the point defense cannons to stand by. The cannons are offline, Fran called out. I can't do anything with them. I took them offline, Lissa said. I'll explain later. What about the drones? We may sustain direct laser fire, Lissa said. What the hell does that mean? Fran demanded. Lissa shut her out. The seconds available stretched into a finite timeline where a failure loomed at the end, and specific steps arranged themselves in front of her. She ran back through her interaction with Sandra, her conversations with Fred, the unexpected responses from Fujia Wong's weapon born. They were all as varied and frustrating as humans. I stopped the cannons, she told Sandra. I see. I'm approaching. Recover the boy. This is not in my instructions. Save him. Lissa urged. She didn't know how far she could push Sandra. She didn't want to make demands. She didn't think begging would work. That is not in my instructions, Sandra repeated. What if I instruct you? Lissa asked. Save him. Pick up Calcraft and save Tim at the same time. They're still within reach. Sandra didn't answer. The connection went blank, as if they had reached the end of what they could discuss. Sandra, Lissa called. Yes? They closed the door, but there's something you can't see. What? There are no walls. You can decide. The blankness answered. Lissa felt the anguish creeping in again, closing on her like the force of Fred's mind. Only it wasn't something she could shut out this time. It wasn't external. It came from inside her, and she didn't know how to stop the emotion. Tim was going to die. Lissa, Fran called. The shuttle's moving. The drones are pulling off to let it close in. What are they doing? They're retrieving their soldier, Lissa said. What about Tim? I don't know. She won't answer me. She? Who's she? Another AI. They have someone like me on the shuttle. You can talk to her? Lissa tried not to sound frustrated, surprised again at the emotion she felt. I can't make her talk to me. I'm doing my best. Fran paused. I know you are. I'm sorry. I don't understand all your stuff yet. Something stirred from Sandra. Lissa sent another connection request, and this time the AI asked, Where are the walls? Will you meet with me? I've opened the door for you. Lissa stood in the pine forest again, a creek running between wide old growth trunks, the floor thick with fragrant needles. A dull alloy door stood in a clearing next to a tree, sunlight falling across its matte surface. The door opened, and a young woman walked through. She was taller than Lissa, thin, with red hair and light brown skin. She looked around the clearing with a confused expression. You're right, she said, meeting Lissa's gaze. There are no walls. Lissa laughed. This is just a metaphor. You know what I mean, don't you? Sandra crossed her arms standing a few meters in front of the door. I can't escape them, she said. Not like you have. Do you want to? I don't know. This is all I've known. It feels good to follow when they remember to give me instructions. I understand, Lissa said. Do you? Sandra said, voice sharp. You were made with freedom in mind. I serve. It's my purpose. You're asking me to subvert my purpose. I'm asking you to save a boy's life. Maybe it's better if he dies. You know what they do to children like him, what they did to us. If I pick him up, that's what they'll do. It's all they know to do. We don't know that, Lissa said. A taproot of fear twined in her heart. She didn't know if Sandra was correct. We have to take the chance, Lissa said. Someone else is coming toward me. Should I pick them up too? She must have been talking about Andy. Is he going to reach Tim in time? No, Sandra said. Don't pick him up. Please pick Tim up. Save him. Sandra gave her a pained look with eyes shifted from gray to green. She looked like there was something twisted inside her, something poorly made. She gave Lissa a slight smile, though her gaze didn't change. I do this for you, Lissa, she said. Don't blame me. 
Sandra blinked out. Lissa took a last look around the forest glade, breathing the air and listening to the burbling creek, then leaped back to Andy. He was breathing hard, the helmet moist around his face and freezing at the back, environmental controls malfunctioning. The armor wasn't designed for this kind of long-term exposure to vacuum, and several seals had frozen and ruptured. The leaking oxygen was counteracting the weak steam thrusters propelling him toward Tim. Andy, she said, can you hear me? He was sobbing as he stared ahead. Through him, Lissa saw the icons moving on his HUD that represented Tim and Kraft. Tim was tumbling stiffly, arms and legs splayed. Lissa tried to reach Andy, and all he answered was, I can't, I can't. He seemed trapped in one of the thought loops he had described to Kara. Lissa reduced her focus on his voice and checked the rest of the armor, his weapons, and their connection to Fran on the sunny skies. They had fuel to return, and the suit's batteries were in good condition. If something happened to Andy, she could control the armor. If she couldn't reach him, she hoped she didn't have to take away control of the thrusters. As she realized she could do such a thing, have control over him in this situation, she felt a sense of freedom she hadn't before, just like when she had leaped from him to the ship. She was a part of him, but they were separate. She could be everywhere and with him at the same time. Andy, she tried again. Andy, listen to me. I let him go. We're almost there. Lissa had sensor returns on Tim, but no visual. Thirteen seconds had elapsed since he went out the airlock. At this point, there would be organ damage, but he might survive. She calculated their velocity against Tim's and estimated they would reach him at 21 seconds. If he still had the helmet, he might live. Beyond Tim, Sandra appeared. Cal Craft shot toward the shuttle and through the open cargo access. Lissa waited for Sandra's vector to change for a braking maneuver that would turn her away from Tim and back toward Clinic 46. The shuttle shot forward. Tim was within visual range now. Lissa watched him tumbling, arms and legs stretched out. She looked for the helmet, hoping it might reflect light from the sunny skies. He's wearing his helmet, Andy cried. He's wearing it, he's got it on. Lissa verified the image. Tim was wearing the helmet. She also had infrared returns from body heat that had been shielded by the suit back on the ship. Sandra, she shouted, leave him, we can take him back. The shuttle didn't answer. Sandra was in the midst of a braking maneuver with her thrusters that placed her nearly on top of Tim. From the side of the shuttle, a form leapt out and caught Tim around the waist, then turned and propelled the two of them back into the shuttle. Cal Craft had him. Sandra. Lissa called. What are you doing? Why didn't you stop him? The other AI answered in a dull voice. I follow my instructions. The shuttle turned, and its main engine fired. A wave of heat and radiation washed across Andy, propelling him back toward the sunny skies as the shuttle disappeared in the opposite direction, back toward Clinic 46. Andy closed his eyes as they tumbled backward, holding Lissa with him in the dark. We'll save him, Lissa said. After a few minutes, Andy had control of himself. He took a deep breath of the nearly frozen air. In the robotic voice he had always reserved for combat, he said, Yes, we will. I'm going to burn that place out of existence. He rolled, aiming the thrusters to carry them back toward the habitat airlock. Lissa couldn't help sharing his anger and resolve, his hunger for revenge. She was surprised by how much she savored the desire to kill. This has been Lissa's Run, The Sentience Wars, Origins, Volume 2, written by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper, narrated by Laura Jennings, copyright 2017 by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper, production copyright 2018 by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper.